Chapter 44 Well, that went pretty well, I thought, Your Grace. Andrea Jarowalski was trying very hard not to preen in satisfaction, and Honor smothered a smile. Jarowalski, Brigham, Rafe Cardonis, and Yolanda Harriman had joined her for dinner, and now they all sat back from the table, nursing after-dinner coffee, or cocoa, as the case might be. I suppose you could say that, Honor said slowly, pursing her lips with a dubious expression. Of course, there were a few little glitches. There always are, Brigham pointed out. Personally, Your Grace, I found myself wondering just who programmed the simulation to throw that extra squadron of super dreadnoughts at us. She gave Honor an intensely speculative look, which Honor returned with one of total innocence. The chief of staff transferred her speculation to Commander Harriman, who suddenly seemed to find the bottom of her coffee cup extraordinarily interesting. It occurred to me, while I was wondering, Brigham continued, that whoever might have decided to do it, and I trust you'll note I name no names, would have needed a minion somewhere in the flagship, preferably someone with access to the tactical computers. Of course, once that ignoble suspicion occurred to me, I womanfully put it behind me as one unworthy of our open and forthright command staff. Mac? Honor called through the pantry hatch. Yes, Your Grace? Bring me my hip waders, would you? It's getting deep in here. Of course, Your Grace, McGinnis replied with perfect aplomb. Would you like your snorkel mask as well? I don't think it's going to get quite that deep, Honor said as her guests laughed. Very good, Your Grace, McGinnis said as he stepped back out of the pantry and set a second serving of peach cobbler in front of Honor. She smiled her thanks and picked up her dessert fork again. Your Grace, Brigham said wistfully, watching Honor dig in. There are times when I positively hate you and that metabolism of yours. She patted her own reasonably flat stomach and shook her head sadly. You should try the downside of it sometime, Mercedes, Honor told her. You may envy the way it lets me pander to my sweet tooth, but try waking up with the sort of -of middle-of-the-night munchies I got as, say, a twelve-year-old. She shuddered. Trust me, as an adolescent, I seem to spend all my time shoveling in food, not just half of it. She felt a sudden jab of darker emotion from behind her and glanced over her shoulder. Andrew LaFollet stood inside the dining cabin hatch. Before the attempt on Honor's life, he would have been content to stand his post outside the hatch, given the guest list. These days, that was out of the question as far as he was concerned, and she recognized the somberness radiating from him. He was remembering Pianist Tepish and her own half-starved gauntness when he, Jamie Candless, and Robert Whitman broke her out of a state sec holding cell. She caught his eye long enough to smile gently at him, and he smiled back, shaking off his mood. Then she turned back to her guests, none of whom had picked up on that particular bit of byplay. Actually, Andrea, getting back to your original comment, I have to agree. Things did seem to go quite well overall. I was especially pleased with the way mistletoe worked. I was too, Your Grace, Cardona said. At the same time, I can't help worrying a little bit about the simulation's parameters. If it turns out mistletoe doesn't work as well in practice, or, even worse, gets picked up early, we could be in a world of hurt against another missile attack like the one they threw at us at Solon. You're right, of course. Honor nodded. She forked up another bite of cobbler, chewed and swallowed, then continued. We deliberately used the more pessimistic set of assumptions from Admiral Hempel's testing programs, but we won't know for certain until we test it against active Havenite defenses. For the most part, though, Buweps has done a pretty good job of simulating enemy threat levels for quite some time now. I didn't say my worries were all that reasonable, Your Grace, Cardona said with a smile. I just said I had them. Personally, Skipper, Harriman told him. I'm looking forward to seeing Apollo in action. Imperator's tactical officer smiled almost beatifically. Their point defense better be really good if they expect to go home with a whole hide this time. I only hope they don't figure out how few of the new pods we really have, Brigham said. Unless their spies have managed a lot better penetration than Owen I thinks they have, they shouldn't realize that, Anna replied. 
And if they do have that kind of penetration, we're in so much trouble already that it won't really matter if they figure out that particular point. Brigham chuckled. You're right, Your Grace. I... Excuse me, Your Grace. Honor turned, eyebrows lowering, as McGinnis stepped back out of his pantry. What is it, Mac? Communications just buzzed. A special admiralty courier boat just cleared the junction. According to her captain, she has emergency dispatches on board. The levity and confidence of Honor's dinner guests was notable for its complete absence as she sat in her flag briefing room once again. Only Cardonis, her staff, and Andrew LaFollet and Nimitz were physically present, but the huge comm display above the conference table was divided into quadrants, showing the faces of every squadron and divisional commander of her enlarged and more powerful Eighth Fleet. The enlarged and more powerful fleet which wasn't going anywhere after all, she thought grimly. I'm sorry to get you all up this late, she began. Unfortunately, the Admiralty's news isn't good. She saw no surprise on the tense faces in the display. That much, at least, they'd all obviously guessed. This afternoon, the Admiralty received an emergency dispatch from Admiral Kumalo and Talbot, she continued evenly. A copy of that dispatch was included in the Admiralty download I received an hour ago. Commander Reynolds, she waved a hand at her intelligence officer, will put together copies of most of the material and distribute it to all of you immediately after this conference. For the moment, to summarize, Admiral Kumalos informed the Admiralty that Captain Ivars Tarakov has deduced that the apparently unrelated terrorist incidents in the cluster have in fact been carefully orchestrated by outside elements. Specifically, the terrorist Norbrand and her Freedom Alliance of Kornati are being armed with modern weapons by Mesa. The same apparently holds true for the terrorists operating in the Montana system as well. She clearly had everyone's attention, she noted with bitter amusement. Apparently, Captain Tarakov has physical proof of that part of his theory. He intercepted and captured a Jessic Combine slaver being used to run in the weapons. Before he did so, however, it used a laser cluster to destroy one of his pinnaces and kill everyone aboard it. She closed her eyes briefly in pain, recalling the bright promise and eagerness of midshipwoman Ragenhild Pavletic. Then she opened them once more and continued. After interrogating the slaver's surviving crew and breaking into its computers, Tarakov concluded that the Republic of Monica is also involved. He believes the Monacans are being provided with modern warships in sufficient numbers to provoke a crisis in the cluster. And he believes the Office of Frontier Security is also involved, and that OFS is prepared to commit Sully Fleet units to restore order in the cluster after the Monacans have acted. Every eye was riveted on her now, and she looked back steadily. At this moment, the last thing in the universe the Stark Kingdom needs is a shooting incident with the Solarian League Navy. Captain Tarakov is clearly well aware of that, because, on his own initiative, he's assembled a small squadron of cruisers and destroyers and moved directly on Monica. He's what? Alistair McKeon asked sharply. Honor looked at him on the display, and he shook his head. He's launched an unauthorized invasion of a sovereign star nation in time of peace. Is that what you're saying, Your Grace? It's exactly what I'm saying. Anna replied flatly. His report was obviously written with an eye towards publication. He's very careful to make it clear he's operating solely on his own, without authorization from any superior. He doesn't say so, but it's clear he's deliberately setting himself up to be disavowed if necessary. At the same time, he intends to personally investigate the situation in Monica, and, if his suspicions are confirmed, to neutralize the threat by any means necessary. There was total silence, and her eyes moved across the display, examining the face of each of her senior subordinates in turn. Admiral Kumalo, she continued after a moment, dispatched a courier boat to Admiralty House as soon as he received Tarakov's report to him. In his own dispatches, he informed the Admiralty that he fully endorsed Tarakov's actions and was moving to support him with all available units. 
She wondered how many of her officers were as surprised by that as she was, but she allowed no sign of the thought to show itself. Under the circumstances, Admiral Kumalo felt he had no option but to request immediate reinforcement. Since it's possible Terakov or Kumalo, or both of them, may find themselves in a shooting incident with Solarian units, the Admiralty felt it had no option but to dispatch a significant reinforcement from home fleet. Those units are already on their way to Monica. Obviously, all of these moves have implications for us. The most immediate one is that Home Fleet is now going to be under strength, and one of the functions of Eighth Fleet, like Third Fleet, is to serve as a ready reserve for Home Fleet. There's also the possibility that the Star Kingdom is about to find itself engaged against Solarian units, and no one is prepared to predict the possible ramifications of that. Because the entire strategic situation suddenly been thrown into such a state of flux, Admiralty House has ordered the temporary stand-down of Operation Sanskrit. For now, we're postponing the execution date by three weeks. That should give us time to receive dispatches from Terakov or Kumalo from Monica. Hopefully, those dispatches will confirm that Terakov was either wrong or that he and Kumalo have managed to defuse the situation. In either of those cases, Sanskrit will be reactivated, although we'll probably face some delay because of our need to factor in intelligence on any changes which may occur in the meantime. She sat very still looking at her flag officers, and her face was grimmer than any of them remembered ever having seen it. People, in my judgment, the Star Kingdom is now facing the greatest danger we have ever faced, she said quietly. It's entirely conceivable that we could find ourselves simultaneously at war with the Republic of Haven and the Solarian League. Should that occur, our strategic situation would be about as close to desperate as any I can conceive of. The next month to six weeks may very possibly determine the fate of our kingdom. You wanted to see me, Kevin? Eloise Pritchard asked warily. I wouldn't put it exactly that way, Kevin Usher said almost whimsically. I'd say I needed to see you. Which means you're about to tell me something I don't want to hear. Which means I'm about to tell you something you don't want to hear, Usher agreed. Actually, Senior Inspector Apriu is about to tell you. Senior Inspector? The president turned to the petite FIA officer, and Danielle Abreu returned her look with an unhappy expression. Madame President, she said, I'm sorry, but the director and I both feel we've hit a stone wall. We've tried everything we can think of, and we can't give you the smoking gun you need. Why not? Pritchard shook her head quickly. I'm sorry, that came out sounding almost accusatory, and I didn't mean it that way. What I meant was, why is it a stone wall? Because both our original suspects are dead, and we haven't been able to identify a single additional damned accomplice. Usher replied for Abreu. Grok Lord still looks like a suicide, although Danny and I are both positive it was actually homicide. Giancola, damn his black soul to hell, was a genuine accident, but no one's going to believe it. And Roclaude's so-called evidence is an obvious, if fairly clever, forgery. Those, unfortunately, are the only out facts we have. We've tried every avenue, short of opening a very public exhaustive investigation, without being able to move beyond those points. And frankly, I don't think going public would let us turn up anything we haven't already found. My own theory, and I think Danny agrees with me, he glanced at Abreu, who nodded vigorously. Is still that Giancola pulled the entire thing off basically on his own, and that he's responsible for the forgeries in Croclaude's personal files. He needed Croclaude to make these substitutions, and I can't escape the suspicion that he had someone else helping him out at this end as well, at least with the computer access he needed. Unfortunately, there's no clue as to who that someone may have been, assuming he actually existed at all, and that he's not simply someone I desperately want to exist, so I can find him and choke a confession out of him with my bare hands. But 
Even if he existed, it was Giancola's show. And you're convinced he never meant it to go as far as it did? I'm not as certain of that as I was, Usher said slowly, and Pritchard straightened in her chair, looking at him intently. Why not? What's changed? Danny pointed something out to me the other day, Usher replied. The Monte lieutenant who tried to kill Harrington three months ago was apparently acting under some form of compulsion. From all the information available to us, he was very close to Harrington. He'd been with her for quite some time, and Navin's dossier on her suggests that her inner circle is almost always intensely loyal and personally devoted to her. So, whatever the compulsion was, it had to be powerful enough to overcome that sort of personal devotion and push him into committing what was ultimately a suicidal act. But the Mantis, whose medical and forensic establishments, let's face it, are both better than our own, haven't been able to come up with any explanation for how he was compelled. Doesn't that sound like what happened to Groclaw to you? You think the same people who killed Croclaude, or at least gave Arnold whatever he used to do the job, also tried to kill Harrington? Let's just say I strongly suspect that whatever technique is being used came from the same source. Now, as the nasty and suspicious sort I am, it occurs to me that if it came from the same source... It's very possibly being used in support of some unified strategy. It's possible, I suppose, that it's simply a case of someone marketing the technology to whoever needs it and can afford it, but I'm beginning to doubt that's the case. Usher shook his head. No, Eloise, there's a pattern here. I just haven't been able to figure out what it is yet, but what I have seen of it suggests that whoever is behind it doesn't much care for either us or the Mantis. So now you're saying Arnold may have been actively working for someone else to provoke fresh hostilities between us and the Mantis? Pritchard wished she'd been able to sound more incredulous than she did. I think it's possible, Usher agreed but there are still way too many unanswered questions for me to suggest exactly why someone might want that. Did they have enough information on Bortol to expect us to roll right over the mantis for them? In that case, presumably Manticore is the primary target, and we're simply the blunt instrument. Or did they expect the mantis to roll over us, which would make us the primary target? Or do they, for some reason I can't currently envision, simply want the two of us shooting at one another again, which would make both of us the target of some third party with a completely unknown agenda of his own? Jesus Christ, Kevin! Pritchard stared at him in something very like horror. That's so... so... so twisty just thinking about it makes my head hurt. What good could sending us back to war with Manticore do any hypothetical third party? I just said I couldn't envision what their motives might be. If I could, I could make a pretty fair stab at figuring out who they were as well. And it's entirely possible I'm totally out to lunch with the old theory. It could be no more than my spook experience making me see things because Danny and I have exhausted all of the potential domestic avenues we could see. I just don't know, Eloise. But I do know this. My instincts all tell me that so far, all we've seen is the tip of an iceberg. Chapter 45 Good morning, everyone. Eloise Pritchard said as she walked briskly into the sunlit chamber. The cabinet room was on the eastern side of the president's official residence, and the tide of morning light which flooded in through the extensive windows on the room's outer wall gleamed on the expensive, polished conference table, inlaid with half a dozen exotic species of wood. 
The thick natural fiber carpet was like a deep pool of cobalt water, with the presidential seal floating on it like a golden reflection. All of the chairs, except for Pritchard's own, were upholstered in black. Hers was the same blue as the carpet, with the seal of her office emblazoned on its back. Glasses and expensive crystal carafes of ice water sat at each place, and optical pickups on the roof of the building fed the chamber's interior smart walls, which were configured to give a panoramic view of the city of Nouveau Paris and its morning traffic. "'Good morning, Madam President,' Thomas Theismann, as her cabinet-acknowledged senior member, replied for all of them. According to the presidential succession established by the Constitution, Leslie Montreux, Arnold Giancola's successor as Secretary of State, was technically senior to Theismann, but no one in this room was under any misapprehensions. Theismann's devotion to the Constitution and his personal determination to avoid the office of president had been accepted by even the most cynical cabinet secretaries. In a way, however, that only enhanced his power base. They knew he had absolutely no personal ambitions and that he stood squarely behind Eloise Pritchard, the Republic's first elected president in three centuries, and that the Republic's military stood squarely behind him. Pritchard crossed to her chair, drew it out from the table, sat, and waited a moment while it adjusted to her body. Then she leaned forward very slightly and swept the members of her cabinet with her eyes. I know you're all wondering what this unscheduled meeting is about, she began. You're about to find out. You're also about to discover some things which only a few people in this room already knew. Those things are going to be shocking and probably more than a little upsetting to most of you. Despite that, I believe you'll understand why the details have been kept confidential, but I have a policy initiative in mind that's going to require the full and fully informed cooperation of every senior member of this administration. I hope you'll give me that cooperation. She had their full attention, she observed, and smiled almost whimsically. Dennis? She looked at her attorney general. Would you ask Kevin and Wilhelm to join us? Of course, Madame President. Dennis Lepic pressed a key on his terminal. A moment later, a door opened in the western wall like a gap ripped from the heart of the living, breathing image of Nouveau Paris. Pritchard always found that particular image rather disturbing, and today it seemed more ominous than usual. She nodded in greeting to them, then indicated the empty chairs provided to either side of Lepic. They settled into them, and she returned her attention to her cabinet, several of whose members were clearly perplexed and not a little apprehensive. Kevin and Wilhelm are here to help explain things, she said. In particular, Kevin is going to be briefing you on something which he brought to my attention almost sixty months ago. The short version of it, ladies and gentlemen, is that the Irish government did not falsify our diplomatic correspondence. The handful of people who had already known that, like Rachel Hanrio, took it fairly calmly. The rest only stared at her, as if their minds simply weren't up to understanding what she'd said for the first several seconds. After that, it was hard to say whether consternation, disbelief, or anger was the most predominant emotion. Whatever the emotional mix might have been, however, what it produced was something very like pandemonium. She let them sputter and wave their hands for fifteen or twenty seconds, then rapped sharply on the tabletop. The crisp sound penetrated the upheaval, and people sank back in their chairs once again, still stunned-looking, but also more than a little embarrassed by their initial reactions. "'I don't blame you for being surprised,' the President said into the renewed silence with generous understatement. "'My own reaction when Kevin brought me his hypothesis was very similar. I'm going to ask him to brief you on a black investigation which I authorized. It was off the books,' and, frankly, probably not particularly constitutional. Under the circumstances, however, I felt I had no choice but to greenlight his efforts, just as I now have no choice but to bring all of you into it. She looked at Usher. Kevin, if you would? She invited. So, that's about the size of it, Pritchard said thirty minutes later. Usher's actual briefing had taken less than ten minutes. 
The rest of the time had been occupied in answering questions, some incredulous, some hostile, most angry, and all worried from the rest of the cabinet. But it's all still just speculation, Tony Nesbitt, the Secretary of Commerce, objected. As one of Arnold Giancola's strongest allies in the cabinet, he still seemed much inclined towards incredulity. I mean, Director Usher just told us there's no proof. No, he didn't, Tony, Rachel Henriot said. Nesbitt looked at her, and she returned his gaze with one that was almost compassionate, although they generally found themselves on opposite sides of the power struggle between Pritchard and Giancola. What he said, she continued, is that there's no way to prove who on our side did it, although given Arnold's position at state, it's impossible for me to believe he wasn't the prime mover. But even if the Crocolaw documents are forgeries, they're very convincing proof that somebody in the Republic's government falsified the correspondence. At any rate, they seem to me to clearly demonstrate that the Mantis have been telling the exact literal truth about their correspondence, which strongly suggests they're also telling the truth about the correspondence they say they received from us, which again points the finger squarely at Arnold. But, but my cousin Jean-Claude is, was Arnold's security chief, Nesbitt protested. I can't believe Arnold could have managed something like this without Jean-Claude at least suspecting. He looked at Montreux. Leslie, have you found anything at state to support all these allegations? Montreux looked acutely uncomfortable. Despite her position in the official hierarchy, she was the newest member of the cabinet, and she cleared her throat a bit nervously. No, I haven't, she said. On the other hand, Tony... It never would have occurred to me to look for any evidence of such incredible criminal activities. I will say this, however, she added reluctantly. The security measures in place at state may still be a bit too much like the ones the legislaturalists and the committee had in place. What do you mean? Nesbitt asked. I mean, too much control passes directly through the secretary's hands, Montrose said bluntly. I was frankly astonished when I found out how much access to and control of the department's security processes goes directly through my office. It would never have occurred to me that Secretary Giancola might have done any such thing, but looking at the access I have, and assuming, as Director Usher does, that he had access to the Mantis foreign office validation codes as well, he really could have done it. And I'm afraid that so far, at least, I can't think of anyone else who could have. Nesbitt sat back in his chair, clearly dismayed. Pritchard regarded him thoughtfully, but as far as she could tell, he was at least as astonished as anyone else in the room. More to the point, he seemed horrified. Obviously, she said after a moment, I've had to proceed very cautiously where this entire incredible bucket of snakes is concerned. As Kevin and Dennis have just explained in answer to your questions, we don't have, and probably never will have, the sort of smoking gun we'd need to convince Congress and the public that what we believe happened actually did. Without that sort of proof, going public would still be a highly risky decision, I believe. It may be the only option available to us, Madam President, Nesbitt said after a moment. Everyone looked at him, and he shrugged unhappily. Don't think I like saying that. God knows if there's anyone in this room Arnold completely fooled, it's me, and I'm going to look like an utter idiot when the newsies finally get hold of this. But if you're right about what happened, then we're fighting a war we were maneuvered into by a member of our own administration. He shook his head. We can't possibly justify not telling the truth. But the president's right. Henrietta Barloy, the Secretary of Technology, objected. No one's going to believe us, and given what happened to Arnold, everyone is going to think we had him eliminated. But why would we have done that? Nesbitt demanded. I'm afraid I can come up with several scenarios, Mr. Secretary, Kevin Usher said. Everyone looked at him, and he shrugged. If I were a conspiracy theorist, or just someone with personal political ambitions— or a desire to restore the old regime, my interpretation of what happened might well be 
that Secretary Giancola figured out what that arch-traitor President Pritchard had done to justify seeking a declaration of war. When he learned the truth, she, and by extension all of you, ordered his execution. Now, however, we're afraid the truth is going to leak out, and so we're attempting to fasten the blame on the man who's safely dead because we murdered him all of which demonstrates that our high-flown principles and devotion to the rule of law are so much crap. Which means this entire government, not just the administration, is a corrupt edifice built upon a constitution which is nothing but yet another huge swindle perpetrated on the long-suffering people. That's insane, Nesbitt protested. Of course it is. Usher snorted. The best conspiracy theories usually are. How do you think Odelia Rance managed to stay in front of the mob as long as she did? But if you don't like that one, here's another. Someone else, someone in the security area, probably me or Wilhelm here, did all of this. Giancola found out, we killed him, and now, through a sinister cabal, for reasons of our own, we're trying to bring the war to a less than fully successful conclusion, and we've spun this old theory of Giancola's responsibility as a way to do that. Or, if you don't like that one, it's all an attempt by someone, probably an alliance of some of the cabinet secretaries and Wilhelm and me, to sabotage the president's fully justified and so far successful war against the evil mantis. Unfortunately, we've managed to pull the wool over her eyes, and she actually believes our preposterous tale about Giancola's doctoring the correspondence. Really, the Montes did it all along, and we murdered him because he was the one man who could have proved they had. Or... Nesbitt was looking more than a little cross-eyed by then, and Pritchard raised her hand at Usher. That's enough, Kevin, she said. Then she turned her attention fully to Nesbitt. Gavin can't quite forget he used to be a spook, Tony. He's used to thinking in this kind of twisted, convoluted way. But the point is making that God only knows how this entire thing can be spun by power seekers or people simply hostile to the Constitution is, unfortunately, valid. And don't any of you believe for a moment that there aren't people out there who fall into those categories. They're not just all ex-SS goons who've gone to Earth, hoping for a change in the political climate more favorable to their objectives, either. Unless I'm very much mistaken, Arnold himself was one of the people who see themselves as players under the old legislaturalist rules and would love to see the Constitution overturned or at least gilded, so they can get on with it. There are more of them out there, and this situation could play directly into their hands. But if we can't go public, what can we do? Nesbitt asked, almost plaintively. And, Walter Sanderson, Secretary of the Interior, asked, his eyes narrow. Why tell us about it now? Some of us, like Tony and me, were very close to Arnold. You can't be certain none of us were involved in whatever he was up to. You also can't be certain we're not going to leave this room and immediately spill what you've just told us to the newsies. You're right. Pritchard nodded. In fact, any or all of you could make an excellent case for having a constitutional responsibility to go public with it, whatever I ask you to do. There's no official investigation into it yet, but I'm pretty sure a case could be made for my decisions to date amounting to an attempt to obstruct justice. So why tell us? Sanderson pressed. Because we may have a window of opportunity to negotiate an end to the war, Pritchard told them all. What sort of window, Madam President? Stan Gregory, the Secretary of Urban Affairs, asked, and several other people sat more upright, looking almost hopeful. According to Wilhelm and Nevind, Pritchard said, nodding towards Trajan, the Mantis are having serious problems in the Talbot cluster. We don't have anything like complete information, you understand, 
but what we do have suggests they're looking at at least the possibility of a shooting confrontation with the League. Someone inhaled audibly, and Pritchard gave a very thin smile. The Solarian League was the galaxy's eight kiloton gorilla. Although she strongly suspected that the League Navy had no idea what sort of vibroblade it would be reaching its fingers into, if and when it tangled with the Royal Mantecaran Navy, the possibility of the Star Kingdom successfully standing up against such a towering monolith in the long term was remote, to say the least. No one wanted to take on the Sollies. This presents us with two separate possible opportunities, she continued. On the one hand, if they do get into a war with the Solarian League, our problems, militarily speaking, are solved. They'd have to accept whatever peace terms we chose to offer if they were going to have any hope at all of resisting the League. On the other hand, if we offer to negotiate with them now and let them know we're aware of the pressures they're under in Talbot, then they'll also be aware we aren't actively moving to take advantage of this diversion— but that we could if we wanted to. So my idea is to propose a direct summit meeting to be held at some mutually acceptable neutral site between myself and Queen Elizabeth. Madam President, I don't think... Wait, are you suggesting... But they'll feel like we're holding a pulse to their heads, and I think it could work if... Pritchard rapped on the tabletop again, harder than before, until the babble subsided. I'm not suggesting this is going to be some sort of silver pulsar dart, she said. And yes, Walter, I'm aware that they're going to know we're holding a pulsar to their heads. I don't say I expect them to be very happy about the idea, but if I can ever sit down across the table from Elizabeth Winton, I may have a chance of convincing her to agree to terms acceptable to both the Star Kingdom and to our own public. Excuse me, Madam President, but how much of that is realism and how much is wishful thinking? Nesbitt asked almost gently. Leslie? Pritchard looked at the Secretary of State. That's very difficult to say, Madam President, Montrose said after a moment. I take it you're thinking in terms of signing a peace treaty first, and then, after peace has had a chance to take hold, Going public with our suspicions and holding an open investigation into them? That's pretty much what I have in mind, yes. Well, it might actually work. Montreux frowned at the Nouveau Paris skyline, rubbing the tips of her right hand's fingers on her blotter. For one thing, you're right about the pressure the mantis are going to be under, assuming whatever's going on in Talbot is as serious as you're suggesting. They won't like that, but they'll have to be realistic, and in the final analysis, talking is less dangerous to them than shooting, especially if they're looking at the possibility of a two-front war. In addition, she continued with mounting enthusiasm, a face-to-face -face meeting between the two of you would be such a traumatic departure that even if you came home with terms which might not be as good as our current military advantage could secure— the public would probably accept them. Which also means, of course, that you could go even further towards what the Mantis consider acceptable than you've already offered. That's what I was thinking. Pritchard nodded. And I'm also thinking that if and when we do go public with this in the wake of a peace settlement, we candidly admit the way in which we allowed ourselves to be maneuvered and offer fairly hefty reparations to the Mantis. She started to go further, then stopped. This was no time to admit that she was seriously considering at least a partial admission of their current suspicions to the Mantikaran Queen, if the talk seemed to be going well. One or two of the people around the table looked outraged at the suggestion she'd already made, but she shook her head firmly. No, she said. Think about it first. First, it's the right thing to do. Second, if we want any peace settlement with the Mantis to stand up over the long haul, and if it turns out someone on our side was responsible for manipulating our correspondence with them, then we're going to have to make a substantial gesture towards them, especially since we're the ones who reinstituted hostilities. And finally, 
If we find what we all, I think, expect we'll find, it's going to do enormous diplomatic damage to us. By acknowledging our responsibility and by offering to make amends as best we can, we'll have the best shot at damage control and rehabilitating ourselves in terms of interstellar diplomacy. Most of the outrage faded, although several people still looked profoundly unhappy. May I make a suggestion, Madam President? Thomas Theismann said formally. Of course you may. In that case, I'd suggest one additional point to include in your suggestion of a summit. Pritchard raised an eyebrow at him and he shrugged. I'd recommend that you specifically request Duchess Harrington's presence at the conference as a military advisor. Harrington? Why Harrington? Sanderson asked. Several reasons, Theismann replied, including, in no particular order, the fact that our sources indicate she's consistently been a voice of political moderation, despite her position as one of their best fleet commanders, the fact that she's now married to the First Lord of their Admiralty, which also makes her a sister-in-law of their Prime Minister, the fact that although she and her Queen are clearly not in agreement where we're concerned, she remains one of Elizabeth's most trusted confidants, plus a Grace and Stead holder, and probably the one Benjamin Mayhew trusts most of all. The fact that she and I, and she and Lester Tourville, have met, and I think established at least some sense of rapport. And the fact that all reports indicate she has a rather uncanny ability to tell when people are lying to her. Which suggests she can probably tell when they're telling the truth as well. In short... I think she'd be a moderating influence on Elizabeth's temper and the closest thing to a friend in court we're going to find. Madam President, I think that's an excellent idea, Montreux said. It wouldn't have occurred to me, because I tend to think of her as a naval officer first, but Secretary Theismann's made some very telling points. I recommend you follow his advice. I agree too, Madam President, Rachel Hanrio said. Very well. I think we can consider that a part of our suggestion. Pritchard looked around the table again. And may I also assume we have a consensus that the summit ought to be pursued? Yes, Nesbitt said, not without a certain obvious reluctance. Pritchard looked at him and he shrugged. I've invested so much in seeing the Mantis beaten after what they did to us in the last war that a part of me just loathes the thought of letting them off the hook now. But if Arnold did what it looks like he did, we have no choice but to stop killing each other as quickly as we can. Just please don't expect me to ever like them. All right. Pritchard nodded. And as I'm sure I don't have to remind any of you, it's absolutely essential we keep our suspicions about all the rest of this to ourselves until after I've met with Elizabeth. Vigorous nods responded, and she leaned back in her chair with a smile. Good, and since we're in agreement, I think I may have exactly the emissary to carry our offer to Mantico. Chapter 46 Skipper, we've got an unscheduled type of footprint at six million kilometers. Captain Jane Timmons, CO HMS Andromeda, spun her command chair towards her tactical officer. Six million kilometers was inside single-drive missile range. She opened her mouth to demand more information, but the TAC officer was already providing it. It's a single footprint, ma'am, very small, probably a dispatch boat. Anything from it? Timmons asked. Not FTL, ma'am, and we wouldn't have anything light speed for another... He glanced at the time chop on the initial detection. Another couple of seconds. In fact... Captain, the comm officer said in a very careful voice, I have a communications request I think you'd better take. The communicator buzzed in the darkened cabin. Honor sat up quickly with the instant wakefulness which had become the norm over the years, except perhaps, she thought with a fleeting smile, even as she reached for the comm when she was home in bed. Then her finger found the dimly illuminated voice-only acceptance button, and she pressed it. Yes? 
Your grace, I'm sorry to wake you. Honor's eyes narrowed. It wasn't McGinnis, who almost always screened her after-hours calls. It was Mercedes Brigham. I don't suppose you did it without reasonably good cause, Honor said when Brigham paused. Yes, Your Grace. Honor heard the chief of staff clear her throat. One of the perimeter patrol battle cruisers just relayed a transmission to us. It's from an unscheduled courier boat. She paused again. A peep courier boat. A Havenite courier? Honor repeated carefully. Here? That's correct, Your Grace. There was a very strange note in Brigham's voice, Honor noticed, but before she could probe, the chief of staff continued. I think you should probably view the transmission we received from it, Your Grace. May I patch it through? Of course, Honor said, feeling just a bit mystified, and pressed the button to accept a visual feed as well. The display blinked alive with Imperator's communications systems wallpaper, and then Honor twitched as a most familiar face appeared. I suppose this is all a bit irregular, Rear Admiral Michelle Hankey said, but I have a message for Her Majesty from the President of the Republic of Haven. Honor was waiting behind the side party as Andromeda's pinnace settled into the boat bay docking arms. She managed to look completely calm, although the slow, steady twitching of Nimitz's tail as he sat on her shoulder gave away her inner mood to those who knew the cat well. The personnel too ran out, the green light blinked, and then Michelle Hankey swung gingerly through the interface from the tube's microgravity into Imperator's internal grav field. She obviously favored her left leg as she landed, and Honor could taste her physical discomfort as she came to attention and saluted through the twitter of bosun's pipes. Battlecruiser Squadron 81 arriving. Permission to come aboard, sir? She requested from the officer of the deck. Permission granted, Admiral Hankey. Both hands fell from the salute, and Hankey stepped past the BBOD with a noticeable limp. Mike, Honor said very quietly, taking her friend's offered hand in a firm clasp. It's good to see you again. And you, Your Grace. Hanky said, her always husky contralto just a tad more husky than usual. Well, Anna released her hand at last, stepping back a bit from their mutual joy at the reunion. I believe you said something about a message? Yes, I did. Should I get Admiral Cusack out here? I don't believe that will be necessary, ma'am, Hanky said formally, aware of all the watching eyes and listening ears. Then why don't you accompany me to my quarters? Of course, Your Grace. Honor led the way to the lift shaft with an improbably wide-awake-looking Andrew LaFollet coming along behind. She pressed the button, then smiled faintly and waved Hanky through the opening door before her. She and LaFollet followed, the door slid shut behind her, and she reached out and gripped Hanky's upper arms. My God, she said softly. It is good to see you, Mike. Honor Alexander Harrington had never been one for easy embraces, but she suddenly swept Mike Hankey into a bear hug. Easy, easy, Hankey gasped, returning the embrace. The leg's bad enough, woman. Don't add crushed ribs to the list. Sorry. For a moment, Honor's soprano was almost as husky as Hankey's contralto, but then she stood back and cleared her throat while Nimitz buzzed a happy, welcoming purr from her shoulder. Sorry, she repeated in a more normal voice. It's just that I thought you were dead. And then when we found out you weren't, I still expected months or years to pass before I saw you again. Then I guess we're even over that little Cerberus trip you took, Hanky said with a crooked smile. I guess we are, Honor agreed with a sudden chuckle. Although you at least weren't dead long enough for them to throw an entire state funeral for you. Pity. I would have loved to watch the HD of it. Yes, you probably would have. You always have been just a bit peculiar, Mike Hankey. You only say that because of my taste in friends. No doubt, Honor said dryly, as the lift doors opened and deposited them in the passageway outside her quarters. Spencer Hawk was standing guard outside them, and she paused and looked over her shoulder at La Follet. 
Andrew, you and Spencer can't keep this up forever. We've got to get at least one other armsman up here to give the two of you some relief. My lady, I've been thinking about that, but I haven't had the time to select someone. I'd have to go back to Grayson, really, and... No, Andrew, you wouldn't. She paused to give him a moderately stern look. Two points, she said quietly but firmly. First, my son will be born in another month. Second, she continued, pretending she hadn't noticed the flicker of pain in his gray eyes, Brigadier Hill is quite capable of selecting a suitable pool of candidates back on Grayson and sending them to us for you and me to consider together. I know you have a lot on your mind, and I know there are aspects of the situation you don't really like, but this needs to be attended to. He looked back at her for perhaps two seconds, then sighed. Yes, my lady. I'll send the dispatch to Brigadier Hill on the morning shuttle. Thank you, she said gently, touching him lightly on the arm, then turned back to Hanky. I believe someone else is waiting to welcome you back, she said, and the hatch slid open to show a beaming James McGinnis. So, Mike, Honor said fifteen minutes later, just what induced the Havenites to send you home? She and Hanky sat in facing chairs, Hanky with a steaming cup of coffee, and Honor with a mug of cocoa. McGinnis had seen to it that there was also a plate of sandwiches, and Honor nibbled idly on a ham and cheese, taking advantage of the opportunity to stoke her metabolism. Hanky, on the other hand, was content with just her coffee. That's an interesting question, Hanky said now, cradling her cup in both hands and gazing at Honor across it through a wisp of steam. I think mostly they picked me because I'm Beth's cousin. They figured she'd have to listen to a message from me, and I imagine they hoped the fact that they'd given me back to her would at least tempt her to listen seriously to what they had to say. Which is? Or is it privileged information you can't share with me? Oh, it's privileged, all right, for now at least. But I was specifically told I could share it with you, since it also concerns you. Mike, Honor said, with just a trace of exasperation, as she tasted the teasing amusement behind Hanky's admirably solemn expression. If you don't come clean with me and quit tossing out tidbits, I'm going to choke it out of you. You do realize that, don't you? Home less than an hour and already threatened with physical violence, Hanky observed in tones of profound sadness, shaking her head, then cowered dramatically as Honor started to stand. All right, all right, I'll talk. Good. And, Honor added pointedly as she settled back, I'm still waiting. Yes, well, Hanky's amusement faded into seriousness. It's not really a laughing matter, I suppose. But, put most simply, Pritchard is using me as her messenger to suggest to Beth that the two of them meet in a face-to-face -face summit to discuss a negotiated settlement. Honor sat abruptly further back in her chair. Despite the dramatic nature of Henke's return, the unanticipated radicalness of Pritchard's proposal was almost stunning. Sudden glittering vistas of an end to the killing spread out before her, and her heart leapt. But then she made herself step back and draw a deep breath of reality. That's a very interesting offer. Do you think she really means it? Oh, I think she definitely wants to meet with Beth... Just what she intends to offer is another matter. On that front, I wish you'd been the one talking to her. Henke glanced significantly at Nimitz, who raised his head from his comfortable sprawl on the back of Honor's chair. What sort of agenda did she propose? That's one of the odd parts about the offer, Henke said. Basically, she left it wide open. Obviously, she wants a peace treaty, but she didn't list any specific set of terms. Apparently, she's willing to throw everything into the melting pot if Beth will agree to negotiate with her one-on-one. -on -one. That's a significant change from their previous stance, at least as I understood it, Honor observed. I hate to say it, but you're probably in a better position to know that than I am, Hanky admitted. She shrugged with a slightly sheepish grin. I've been trying to pay more attention to politics since you tore a strip off me, but it's still not really a primary interest of mine. Honor gave her an exasperated look and shook her head. 
Hanky looked back, essentially unrepentant, then she shrugged again. Actually, it's probably a good thing you are more interested in politics and diplomacy than I am, she said. Why? Because one specific element of Pritchard's proposal is a request that you also attend the conference she wants to set up. Me? Honor blinked in astonishment, and Hanky nodded. You? I got the impression the original suggestion to include you may have come from Thomas Theismann, but I'm not sure about that. Pritchard did assure me, however, that neither she nor anyone in her administration had anything to do with your attempted assassination, and you can believe however much of that you want to. She'd almost have to say that, I suppose, Honor said thoughtfully, her mind racing as she considered Pritchard's proposal. Then she cocked her head. Did she say anything about Ariel or Nimitz? No, she didn't, and I thought that was probably significant, Hanky said. They know both you and Beth have been adopted, of course, and it was obvious that they have extensive dossiers on both of you. I'm sure they've been following the articles and other presentations on the cat's capabilities since they decided to come out of the closet. Which means, in effect, that she's inviting us to bring a pair of furry lie detectors to this summit of hers. That's what I think. Hanky nodded. I guess it's always possible they haven't made that connection after all, but I think it's unlikely. So do I. Honor gazed off into the distance, thinking hard. Then she looked back at Hanky. The timing on this is interesting. We've got several factors working here. I know, and so does Pritchard, Hanky said. Honor looked a question at her, and the other woman snorted. She made very certain I knew they know about this business in Talbot. She made the specific point that her offer of a summit is being made at a time when she and her advisors are fully aware of how tightly stretched we are. The unstated implication was that instead of an invitation to talk, they might have sent a battle fleet. Yes, they certainly could have. Have we heard any more from the cluster? Hanky asked anxiously. No, and we won't hear anything back from Monica for at least another ten or eleven days. And that's one reason I said the timing on this was interesting. On the chance that the news we get may be good, I've been ordered to update our plans for Operation Sanskrit. That's the successor to the cutworm raids, Honor explained when Hanky raised an eyebrow. With a tentative execution date 12 days from tomorrow. Well, she brought up the date-time display in her artificial eye. From today, actually, now. You're thinking about the way San Juice derailed Buttercup by suggesting a ceasefire to High Ridge. Actually, I'm thinking about the fact that Elizabeth is going to remember it, Anna replied, shaking her head. Unless they've got a lot more penetration of our security than I believe they do, they can't know what our operational schedule is. Oh, they've probably surmised that Eighth Fleet was just about ready to resume offensive operations, assuming we were going to do that at all, when Kamalo's dispatch arrived. And if they've done the math, they probably know we're about due to hear back from him. But they must have packed you off home almost the same day word of our diversions from Home Fleet could have reached them. To me, that sounds like they moved as quickly as possible to take advantage of an opportunity to negotiate seriously. I'm just afraid it's going to resonate with Buttercup in Elizabeth's thoughts. She's not entirely rational where peeps are concerned, Hanky admitted. With justification, I'm afraid, Honor said. Hanky looked surprised to hear her say that, and Honor shook her head, wondering if Mike knew everything about her own family's experiences with various Havenite regimes. Well, I hope she doesn't get her dander up this time, Hanky said after a moment. God knows I love her, and she's one of the strongest monarchs we've ever had, but that temper of hers... It was Hanky's turn to shake her head. I know everyone thinks she's a warhead with a hair trigger, Honor said a bit impatiently. And I'll even acknowledge that she's one of the best grudge holders I know, but she isn't really blind to her responsibilities as a head of state, you know. You don't have to defend her to me, Honor. I'm just trying to be realistic. The fact is that she has got a temper from the dark side of hell when it's roused, and you know as well as I do how she hates yielding to pressure, even from people she knows are giving her their best advice. And speaking of pressure, 
Pritchett was careful to make sure I knew she knew the goings-on in the cluster of given the Republic the whip hand, diplomatically speaking. Not only that, Hanky added, with a combination of frustration and grudging admiration. She told me to inform Beth that she's releasing an official statement tomorrow in Nouveau Paris, informing the Republic and the galaxy at large that she's issued her invitation. Oh, lovely. Honor leaned back, resting the back of her head lightly against Nimitz's warm, furry weight. That was a smart move. And you're right. Elizabeth is going to resent it. But she's played the interstellar diplomacy game herself. Quite well, in fact. I don't think she'll be surprised by it, and I doubt very much that any resentment she feels over it would have a decisive impact on her decision. I hope you're right. Hanky sipped coffee, then lowered her cup. I hope you're right, she repeated, because hard as I tried to stay cynical, I think Pritchard really means it. She really wants to sit down with Beth and negotiate peace. Then let's hope she manages to pull it off, Honor said softly. And I think I don't trust them as far as I could throw a super dreadnought, Elizabeth III said angrily. The power of her emotions was like a black thundercloud to Honor's perceptions, looming over the pleasant council chamber in Mount Royal Palace. None of the other humans could sense it, but all of the tree cats were only too obviously aware of it. She reached up to stroke Nimitz's spine, watching as Prince Justin did the same for Monroe. Ariel's half-flattened ears were an accurate barometer of the queen's emotions, and Honor could sense Samantha buttressing herself against them from Hamish's chair back. "'Your Majesty, Elizabeth,' William Alexander said. "'Nobody is asking you to trust them, certainly not on no more basis than the fact that they've returned Michelle and that Pritchard is requesting a meeting with you. That's not really the point.' "'Oh, yes, it is,' Elizabeth shot back. "'No, it isn't, Your Majesty.' Sir Anthony Langtree disagreed firmly. The Queen glowered at him, and he shrugged. Willie's right. The point is, whether it's better for us to talk to them or shoot at them when we don't know what's happening in the cluster. Which we'll know in another week or so. Honor very carefully did not sigh. Elizabeth had proven far more intransigent than she'd hoped over the four days since Michelle Hankey's return to Manticore with Honor from Trevor Star. Elizabeth, Honor said now, calmly, four days from now is the soonest we could really hope to receive a dispatch boat, assuming Terakov sent one off within 24 hours of his planned arrival at Monaco. But the fact that we haven't already received one is a bad sign, and you know it. Elizabeth looked at her, and Honor shrugged. We've known for two weeks from the last dispatch boat he sent off that Copenhagen confirmed his initial assumptions, at least in part, when she met him at his rendezvous point after scouting Monica. And? Elizabeth said when she paused. We also know from the same dispatch that he did continue to Monica, where he almost certainly violated Monacan territorial space. Let's assume he managed to carry out his best-case plan without firing a shot and the Monacans agreed to halt whatever preparations they were making until we could assure ourselves they had no designs against the cluster. That's the best message we could be receiving in the next week. In which case the situation is under control, Elizabeth said. In which case we're effectively in control of Monacan space, Honor corrected gently. For now, it's also possible his dispatch is going to tell us he's fought a battle. In that case, he either won or he lost. In either of those cases, we have a shooting incident with a sovereign star nation with a long-standing relationship with the Office of Frontier Security. In that case, it's going to be weeks, even months, before we know whether or not OFS is prepared to commit solid naval units against us. In fact, even if no shots were exchanged, if Terakov and Kumalo have occupied the Monica system under threat of force— we could still be looking at OFS intervention. And whatever Terakov's dispatches might tell us a week from now, we're still going to be facing the same wait until we can be sure which way OFS is going to jump. Precisely what I'm trying to say. Baron Grantville looked gratefully at his sister-in-law and nodded vigorously. 
I'm sure Pritchard didn't make it because of how much she loves us, but her point about the value of a ceasefire, while we find out whether or not we're at war with the Solarian League, is completely valid. He turned back to the Queen. That's the same point Tony and I have been trying to make ever since Mike got home, Elizabeth. There was raw appeal in his eyes. We're in serious trouble. The peeps alone outnumber us two to one in ships of the wall. We all hope Terakov and Kumalo have managed to nip whatever was happening in the cluster in the bud, and that Admiral O'Malley's task force will be enough to keep a lid on things if they did, but we don't know that, and we won't know it until we know absolutely that OFS is going to back down. And don't forget the Mason element in all this. We know they've got a cozy deal with a lot of frontier security commissioners, but we don't really know how much pressure they're going to be able to bring to bear to try to salvage whatever they were up to, if Terakov and Kumalo have spoke to their wheel. And whether you trust them or not, and whether or not Pritchett really intends from the outset to negotiate in good faith, there's always the possibility a peace treaty would emerge anyway, Hamish Alexander Harrington pointed out in a neutral tone. Elizabeth's eyes flashed at him, and he looked back steadily. She's the one who told the newsies about the proposed summit, he said. That means the onus to make some sort of progress is at least largely on her if you do agree to meet with her. Unless the two of you are going to sit down somewhere all alone in a smoke-filled room and negotiate some sort of private deal, the whole thing's going to go forward in a positive glare of publicity. So if you make a reasonable offer, she may find herself hoist by her own petard and forced to entertain it seriously. You tell Emily not to try to manage me by remote control, Hamish, Elizabeth snapped. I've got enough official advisers trying to do that. Honor started to protest, then kept her mouth firmly closed. This being married business had its own complications, she discovered. The last thing she needed was to sound as if she were weighing in in concert with her spouses. Oh, be reasonable, Elizabeth, the seventh human seated at the table said in a voice of considerable exasperation. The queen turned her glare upon the speaker, only to be met by glittering eyes exactly the same color as her own. Stop pitching such a snit, Kytrin Winton Henke told her niece sharply. You don't like peeps, you don't trust peeps, fine, neither do I, and you know exactly why I don't, but you're the queen of Manticore, not a schoolchild, act like it. Honor felt several people wincing in anticipation of a furious explosion from the queen, but it didn't come. Instead, Elizabeth looked into her aunt's eyes, and the tight shoulders and rigid spine of the woman the tree cats had named Soul of Steel seemed to droop. Honor felt her own eyes soften in sympathy, but she understood what Michelle Hankey's mother had just done. The Dowager Countess of Goldpeak was Elizabeth's one-time regent. She was also the only person at the conference table who had lost even more deeply and personally to the peeps than Elizabeth had, as she had just reminded her niece. And don't forget, Elizabeth, Honor said, as she felt the Queen's adamantine resistance waver. If you attend this summit, and if I attend it with you, there'll be at least two tree cats present. Don't you think it would be worth getting Ariel and Nimitz close enough to taste Pritchard's mind glow, whatever else happens? Elizabeth's eyes darted to Honor, and she frowned thoughtfully. She was obviously thinking about the fact that it would also get Honor close enough to do the same thing, and Honor was cautiously pleased by the evidence that the Queen was finally stepping back far enough to think. Beth, Prince Justin said quietly. His wife looked at him, and he reached out to rest one hand lightly on hers where it lay on the tabletop. Beth, think about it. Every single one of your advisors disagrees with you. Even he smiled. Your husband. I think you need to factor that into your decision, don't you? She gazed into his eyes for several seconds, then sighed. Yes. She obviously hated making that admission, but Honor tasted her unwilling sincerity. The queen looked around the council chamber, then shrugged her shoulders. Very well. I'm sure you've all made valid points, I can even appreciate most of them, intellectually at least. That doesn't mean I like it, because I don't. I hate it. But that doesn't make you wrong, however much I'd like it to. So I'll meet with Pritchard. 
Thank you, Your Majesty, Grantville said with quiet, thankful formality. Which raises the question of where you should meet, Langtree said. Pritchard did invite you to name the site. Yes, and she suggested a neutral one, Grantville agreed. Although just exactly where she thinks we can find one is a bit of a puzzle. Nonsense, Elizabeth said with a hard little laugh. That's the easiest part of all. If she wants a neutral meeting site, where better than Torch? I don't know, Grantville began. The security aspects would worry me, and security would probably be the least of our worries, Honor interrupted. Grantville looked at her, and she grinned. A planet full of freed slaves, Willie, invited to play host to the heads of state of the two star nations with the best track record for enforcing the Cherwell Convention? You'd need a couple of divisions of battle armor to get through them. That, Langtree said, is almost certainly true, Willie. They might not have the same technological capabilities we would, but they'd certainly have the motivation. Yes, they would, Grantville agreed. And I suppose there'd be ample time for us to make additional security arrangements. And, Elizabeth pointed out, it would be an opportunity to draw Erewhon into the process— I know we've all been pissed off with the Erewhonese for the technology they transferred to the peeps, but let's be honest. Highridge did everything humanly possible to push them into doing it. If we ask them to dispatch units of their fleet to provide a neutral security umbrella in Congo for both sides, without either of us bringing in our own battle squadrons, it would be a demonstration that this government and the House of Winton both trusts them and desires to patch up our differences— Grantville looked at her with a slightly surprised expression, and she chuckled almost naturally. I may still have my reservations about this entire idea, Willie, but if we're going to do it anyway, we might as well accomplish as many objectives at once as we can. Chapter 47 Aldona Anisimovna tried to remind herself that she was one of the most successful organizers and executives Manpower Incorporated had ever produced, that she had a very nearly unrivaled record of successes, that she was a wealthy and powerful individual who represented one of Mesa's star bloodlines. None of it helped particularly. She and Isabel Bardesano followed the butler— who sprang from a bloodline with far higher combat enhancements than the Anisimov genome, down the splendidly furnished hallway, past light sculptures, bronzes, paintings, and hand-loomed textile wall hangings. The designer had deliberately eschewed smart walls or other modern visual technology, aside from the light sculptures, but soothing, unheard sonic vibrations seemed to caress her skin. It was all very gracious and welcoming, but she drew a deep breath trying to settle her nerves unobtrusively and hoping the invisible surveillance systems weren't noting her heightened pulse rate as their guide opened the old-fashioned door at the end of the corridor. "'Ms. Anisimovna and Ms. Bartosano, sir,' he said. "'Thank you, Heinrich,' a familiar voice said, and the butler, who was actually a rather deadly bodyguard when he wasn't being an assassin, bowed and stepped aside." Anisimovna walked past him without even acknowledging his presence, but she was grateful when he closed the door behind her and Bardesano from the other side. Not that she'd really expected his services to be required, she told herself firmly. Well, ladies, Albrecht Detweiler said from behind the desk workstation, without inviting either of them to be seated, things don't appear to have gone very well in Talbot after all. No, they haven't. Anisimovna agreed, her voice as level as possible. Detweiler regarded her thoughtfully, as if waiting for her to add something more to that bare agreement, but she knew better than to offer any hint of an excuse, especially not when he'd kept the two of them waiting and stewing in their own juice for almost three standard days since their return from the Republic of Monica. Why not? he asked after a moment. Because of a chain of circumstances we were unable to predict, Isabel Bardesano said, her voice as level as Anisimovna's had been. I was under the impression that proper planning allowed for all contingencies, Detweiler observed. Good planning allows for all the contingencies the planner can think of, Bardesano corrected in an amazingly calm tone. 
This particular set of contingencies was impossible to anticipate, since no one can allow for freak circumstances which are inherently impossible to predict. That sounds remarkably like an excuse, Isabel. I prefer to think of it as an explanation, Albrecht, Bardesano said, while Anisimovna tried to focus her attention on one of Detweiler's pre-space oil paintings. Under certain circumstances, explanations are also excuses, of course. You asked us why things didn't work out as planned, however. That's why. Detweiler gazed at her, his lips very slightly pursed, his eyes narrowed, and she looked back squarely. One thing about her, Anisimovna thought, she didn't lack nerve. Whether her lack of fear was completely sane or not was another matter. Very well, Isabel. Detweiler said finally. Explain what happened. We don't know yet. Not fully, she admitted. We won't know for some time. The only hard fact we have at this time is that somehow a Manti cruiser captain named Terakov and Bernardus von Dort figured out what was happening. Terakov put together what I strongly suspect was a completely unauthorized attack on Monica and as Aldona and I told you at our last meeting, the program to refit the battlecruisers we, or rather Technodyme, were providing had fallen behind schedule. You also informed me that there was ample cushion in your timetable, Detweiler interrupted in a deceptively pleasant voice. If he'd intended to put Bardesano off her pace, he failed. She simply looked at him for a moment, then nodded. Yes, we did, and it was an accurate statement— in fact, Israk Levakinich and the Monikins had managed to get three of the battlecruisers completely refitted and manned before Terakov showed up, and the biggest unit he had was a heavy cruiser. Had he delayed his arrival for another week, four more indefatigables would have been ready for action as well. Under normal circumstances, however, I believe most people would have felt three Solarian League battlecruisers, with up-to-date electronics and weapons fits, ought to have been able to deal with five cruisers and four destroyers. Apparently they would have been wrong, Detweiler said. And I might point out to you, if I were inclined to pick nits, that one of the objectives of the operation was to obtain specimens of Manti hardware specifically because we knew it was better than Solly equipment. Granted, Bardesano replied. I would submit, however, that its degree of superiority was greater than anyone had anticipated, including Technodyne. I'm much less well-versed in technical matters than Isabel, Albrecht, Aldona said, speaking up in support of her colleague. But we did discuss this with Lovakinich. He felt confident of maintaining Monica's security with the combination of missile pods he'd deployed and the battlecruisers already in commission— that part of the operation was his responsibility, and we relied on his expert opinion. Detweiler switched his gaze to her, and she made herself look back calmly. He appeared to consider her words for several seconds, then gave a tiny shrug. I suppose that was reasonable enough under the circumstances, he said. However, he continued before Anisimovna's nerves could begin to unknot themselves, even granting that, the fact that the Mantis and this Van Dort somehow tumbled to what was going on speaks poorly of your operational security. At this point, Bardesano said, we don't know how our security was penetrated. I see two possibilities. One is that the penetration took place on the Monacan side. President Tyler and his closest advisors had to be brought fully into the picture, at least as far as their part of the operation was concerned. Their security arrangements were beyond our control, and we don't know how or where they might have been breached. The second possibility, she continued unflinchingly, is that the penetration was on our side of the operation. In that case, the most likely scenario is that this Terakov literally stumbled over the Marianne. Marianne? Detweiler repeated the special ops ship we were using to deliver weapons to our proxies, Bardesano explained. We've used her and her crew dozens of times before. They're reliable and experienced in this sort of covert operation, and using our own ship and our own people let us maintain a far lower profile and avoid an entire additional layer of potential leaks. 
So why do you think she could be involved? Because she's the only direct link between our terrorist proxies and Monica. Bartosano shrugged. Israq needed emergency transportation for additional shipyard technicians. Marianne was already headed for the cluster. He asked me if we could transport them for him, and I agreed. Apparently, I shouldn't have. She made the admission without flinching, and a flicker of what might have been approval showed in Detweiler's eyes. If she is the clue the Mantis picked up on, she continued, they must have taken at least some of her personnel and sweated them. They don't actually know anything about the Monacan side of the operation, but they do know they delivered technicians to Monica. That could have been enough. Unfortunately, we probably won't know whether or not that's what actually happened for some time. Marianne's movement schedule means we don't expect contact with her for another couple of weeks. This is all speculation, Detweiler remarked, and Bartisano and Anisimovna both nodded. We barely managed to get out of Monica and take the only frontier security personnel directly involved in the operation with us, Anisimovna said. We couldn't afford to wait around for any more details. If they'd captured Isabel or myself... She broke off, and it was Detweiler's turn to nod. Point taken, he acknowledged. He considered them silently for several more seconds, then seemed to reach a decision. Sit he said, pointing at two of the chairs facing his desk, and Anisimovna hoped her enormous relief didn't show as she obeyed the command. None of us are happy about what's happened in the cluster, Detweiler said. I trust you're both prepared for the fact that you're going to face a lot of recrimination and accusations of incompetence? Anisimovna bobbed her head, and this time she didn't try to disguise her glum expression. Whatever else came of the Talbot fiasco, she'd be a long time rebuilding her prestige and repairing her damaged power base. Having said that, and assuming no new revelations suggest it really was your fault, I'm inclined to agree that the failure almost certainly stemmed from factors outside your control. He shrugged. As I said at the beginning, it was always a crapshoot, and apparently we crapped out. So starting from that, what's your feeling as to whether or not OFS is going to let this stand? I think they are, Anisimovna said. Managing the Sali bureaucracies was her own area of expertise. Verrocchio is livid, and he's going to be even angrier if the Mantis are able to prove his involvement, but he doesn't have the forces under his own command to take unilateral action, and the other frontier security commissioners won't support him, not after something as spectacular as what the Mantis did to Monica— and especially not if Tyler or any of his cronies roll over on us and cooperate with a Manti investigation. We don't need him to win, Detweiler pointed out. You say he's livid over this? Is there any probability of playing on that anger to maneuver him into a direct military confrontation? Whether the other commissioners approve or not, that would be something our friends in the League could probably spin into the pretext for intervention we need, especially if he gets the crap shot out of him. I don't see any way to do it, Anisimovna replied. Angry as he is, he's not going to risk his own position. Neither is his vice commissioner, Hongbo, who, unfortunately perhaps in this instance, has a great deal of influence with him and is far less likely to let anger shape his decisions. I was afraid of that. Detweiler tipped his chair back, folding his hands, fingers interlaced across his midsection, and Anisimovna felt a sudden, fresh pang of anxiety. That relaxed posture normally indicated that Albert Detweiler was quietly, icily, dangerously furious about something. Three weeks ago, he said, Eloise Pritchard sent an invitation to Elizabeth Winton. She suggested the two of them meet in a face-to-face -face summit in a neutral location of Winton's choosing. Anisimovna felt her eyes widen and fought a sudden urge to turn and look at Bartisano in shock. Pritchard was proposing a peace conference? We found out about it from our mole in the Manti's foreign office, Detweiler continued. The proposal itself arrived on Manticore nine days ago, and our mole's control did very well to get it to us this quickly, although he had to use the Beowulf conduit to do it. I'm not exactly delighted at that. That conduit is too valuable to lose— 
In this case, though, I think our man's decision was justified. Excuse me, Albrecht, Anisimovna said, but do we have any idea what prompted Pritchard to do something like this? Not specifically, no. Detweiler frowned. At the moment, my best guess is that she found out about what was happening in Talbot. She's demonstrated she's a very shrewd politician, and she may well have calculated that the pressure of a potential conflict with the Solarian League would force Winton to accept terms. Anisimovna nodded, but very carefully said nothing. From Detweiler's tone, it was unlikely he would have appreciated the observation that it might have been their own efforts which had offered the Republic the wedge which might bring their carefully nurtured war to a premature conclusion. According to our mole, Detweiler went on, it took two days to convince Winton to accept the offer. In the end, however, she did. And guess what neutral site she proposed for their little get-together? Anisimovna frowned, but Bartisano snorted harshly. Verdant Vista, she said flatly, and Detweiler's chuckle was even harsher than her snort. On the money, he agreed. Do we have a date for this summit? Bartisano asked. Not yet. I'm sure the Mantis will be proposing one in their reply to Pritchard, but our mole doesn't have that level of access. Even after they propose one, messages are going to have to go back and forth between Manticore and Haven, and transit time is almost 11 days each way, even for a fast dispatch boat via Trevor Star. So it's not going to happen next week, but it looks like it is going to happen. Elizabeth Winton hates Haven's guts, Anisimovna said. Even if the summit meets, how likely is it to result in an actual peace treaty, especially after Haven initiated the attack and given that everyone's convinced Haven was behind the Harrington assassination attempt. Under normal circumstances, I might think along the same lines, Detweiler said. But Winton's been adopted by one of those friggin' tree cats, and you can bet she won't attend a conference without the little monster. Oh. Anisimovna grimaced. Yes, we can't afford to overlook the little bastards any longer, can we? Detweiler growled. It was unusual, to say the least, for him to allow his ire to show that clearly, but Sphinx's tree cats had been a sore point with manpower and mesa literally for centuries. The possibility of unlocking the secret of telepathy had been impossible for the bioengineers of mesa to resist, but they'd been remarkably unsuccessful in obtaining specimens. In fact, they'd managed to obtain only one living tree cat in over 300 T years, and they discovered quickly that a tree cat in captivity simply died. They still had some of the creature's genetic material, and some work continued with it in a desultory fashion, but without much prospect of successfully building the ability into humans. The fact that the wretched little animals were even more intelligent than Manpower's own worst-case assumptions had come as an unpleasant revelation. And the ability of a fully functional telepathic to communicate its observations about the mental state of someone on the other side of high-level diplomatic negotiations was something political analysts were going to take some getting used to. We know, even if Winton doesn't, that Pritchard never wanted to go back to war in the first place, Detweiler continued. If some damned tree cat gets a chance to communicate that to Winton, it's entirely possible the two of them will agree to a joint examination of the disputed diplomatic correspondence, in which case peace is likely to start breaking out all over. Not exactly a desirable outcome, Bartisano murmured, and Detweiler rewarded her with a tight grin and another hard chuckle. <laughs> Nicely put. Now, what do we do to prevent it? Killing Winton or Pritchard would be the most effective solution, Bartisano said thoughtfully. On the other hand, if we could get to either of them easily, we'd have already done it. Hmm. She thought for several seconds, then nodded to herself. I see one possibility, she said. Which is? I've already prepared the operation you wanted on Old Earth, she told him. I haven't scheduled a date for it yet, however, and I've also set up the groundwork for Operation Rat Poison— I can activate both of them immediately and set them up to happen simultaneously, or at least in close succession. Given Elizabeth Winton's existing attitude towards Haven, I'd say there's a pretty good chance it would destabilize any summit arrangements. 
especially rat poison, Detweiler agreed, his eyes lighting with pleasure at the prospect. Then they narrowed. Probability of success, he demanded. On old earth, very high, Bartisano said promptly. Probably approaching a hundred percent. Rat poison's more problematical, I'm afraid. Our choice of vehicles is much more limited, and all the ones we're currently considering are outside the inner circle, so access is going to be more of a problem. To make it work with one of the present vehicles, we'll have to use a two-stage control, and that's going to up the chances of something going wrong. I'd say probably 60%, plus or minus 5% either way, if we mount the op immediately. I'd really rather wait, at least until we could get better odds, Detweiler murmured. We can do that, Bartisano told him. In fact, given a few more months of prep work, I could improve the odds significantly. But if we wait, we lose the opportunity to derail the summit, and we also increase the risk that even Winton would blame us for it. If the attempt hits at the same time as someone with an obvious Havenite connection kills Webster, though, the Mantis are almost certain to connect the two ops and blame both of them on Haven. And I might point out, Albrecht, that even if the attempt itself fails, the mere fact that it was made ought to accomplish what we want. There is that, Detweiler agreed. He sat motionless for perhaps fifteen seconds, obviously thinking hard. Then he nodded his head sharply. All right, do it. Chapter 48 What do you think the Sollies are going to do, Your Grace? Rafe Cardonis asked quietly. He and Honor stood side by side in the lift, along with Mercedes Brigham, Andrea Jarowalski, Francis Hirschfield, Andrew LaFollet, Spencer Hawk, and Sergeant Jefferson McClure, one of the two Harrington Steading armsmen Andrew LaFollet had finally chosen to reinforce Honor's personal detail. Nimitz rode on Honor's shoulder, and even the spacious lift car felt more than a little crowded. That's hard to say, Rafe, Honor replied after a moment. The long-awaited courier from Ivar's Terakov and Augustus Kumalo had finally arrived the day before, with news of Terakov's crushing victory over the Monacan Navy, and of the horrific price his hastily organized squadron had paid for it. It's pretty obvious, she continued after a moment, that at least some Sollies had to be in on this up to their necks. The Solarian Navy doesn't just lose more than a dozen modern battle cruisers. You think the League Navy was directly involved? Cardonis was more than a little worried by the thought, and Honor didn't blame him. Not the Navy as such. She shook her head. I'm more inclined to think it was some rogue element within the Navy, or else some private interest— one of their big builders, like Technodyne or General Industries of Terra. Either of them could have provided the ships if they'd been willing to run some risks, although I'd bet on Technodyne, given their involvement with Mesa at Tiberian. We won't know who it was for certain for quite a while, though. Admiral O'Malley's detachment won't even get there for another four days, and until he arrives, Terakov and Kumalo are going to have all they can do just to keep the system nailed down they certainly aren't going to be able to start conducting any investigations. Cardonis nodded thoughtfully, and she gave a small shrug. On the other hand, Frontier Security must have signed off on this operation, at least unofficially, she pointed out. Without assurance of OFS support, this President Tyler would never have run the level of risk he was prepared to court. Not only that, I can't see Mesa providing this kind of logistical and financial support— unless they were pretty darn certain one of their pet frontier security commissioners was going to back their play. Probably the question comes down mainly to how quickly their OFS stooges can react. If they can get in before O'Malley gets there, they might have enough locally deployed firepower to force Kumalo and Terakov out of Monica. If they can't get themselves organized quickly enough for that, though, I don't think they're going to want to tangle with his task force. And if they blink... The longer they delay a counterattack, the less likely they are to be able to mount one at all. So I'm actually reasonably confident that if they haven't hit us by the time O'Malley gets into position, they won't. Not unless somebody on their side screws up by the numbers. Cardonis nodded again. 
And what about this summit? Anno didn't really need her empathic ability to feel the hope in his question. You think it could really lead to something? I think there's always that possibility. How likely it is, I can't say. But like you, I spent a lot of time hoping. The lift came to a halt, the door slid open, and Honor stepped out, leading the way towards her flag briefing room and yet another conference with her senior officers. And the time I don't spend hoping, she said just a bit grimly, I spend planning for what we're going to do if it doesn't work out. Thank you for seeing me, Madame President. Secretary of State Leslie Montreux shook Eloise Pritchard's hand as the President walked around her desk to greet her. Pritchard smiled and waved for the secretary to be seated in one of her office's armchairs, then sat herself facing her guest. Given the general tenor of your message when you requested a meeting, Leslie, I was delighted to make room for you in this morning's schedule. I take it we've heard back? Yes, Madame President. Montreux opened her thin briefcase and extracted a sheaf of old-fashioned hard copy. There were several documents, each with the matching electronic documents chip attached, and she laid them out on the coffee table. Basically, she went on, we've gotten a very favorable response overall. This, she tapped one document, is a personal letter from Queen Elizabeth to you. It's mainly polite formulas, but she does specifically thank you for the care our people have taken of our POWs and for releasing her cousin, Admiral Henke, as your messenger. This one, she indicated another thicker document, is an official response to a proposal drafted by their foreign office over Foreign Secretary Langtree's signature. There's quite a bit of diplomatic boilerplate in it, but what it boils down to is that they officially welcome our suggestion of a conference and they accept our offer of a military stand-down until after the summit— to begin 24 standard hours after the expected arrival time of their response here in Nouveau Paris. I think you'll want to read it for yourself, especially since there are a couple of passages which are just a bit testy. Most of them, I'm afraid, refer to our decision to launch Thunderbolt without formal notice we intended to resort to military action, but I think it's significant that they don't mention our dispute over who did what to the official diplomatic correspondence. In addition, she went on in a slightly different tone, they've responded to our request that they nominate a neutral site. Which is? Pritchard asked as Montreux paused. Touch, Madame President, the secretary said, and Pritchard sat back in her chair with a suddenly thoughtful expression. You know, she said after a few seconds, that really should have occurred to us. It's the one neutral port where we both have contacts. She chuckled suddenly. Of course, if it had occurred to me, I probably wouldn't have suggested it anyway. I'd have figured they wouldn't want to risk their monarch anywhere near our half-tame lunatic, Kashat. Then you feel this site's acceptable? Montreux asked, and Pritchard cocked her head to one side. You don't? I think it's very inconveniently placed for us, Madame President, the Secretary of State replied after a brief hesitation. Their delegation could make the trip in less than a week, thanks to their junction and the Erewhon Junction. It's going to take over a month for our delegation to make the trip from Avon. And it's going to take over three weeks for our acceptance and their acknowledgement of our acceptance to travel back and forth between here and Manticore. So the absolute earliest we could actually sit down with them is the next best thing to two months from today. That sort of time constraint's going to be part and parcel of any peace conference, Leslie, Pritchard pointed out. It always takes time, and finding a suitable site we can both agree to is worth going a little out of our way. I suppose, she smiled thinly, that we could always ask them to guarantee our safe conduct and take even one through their junction that would cut about a week off of our total transit time. And Thomas Theismann would have me shot at dawn if I proposed any such thing, Madam President. Probably not, Pritchard disagreed. 
If it's all the same to you, Madam President, I'd prefer not to find out. Wise of you, I suppose. Pritchard sat for another moment, studying the Secretary of State's expression, then frowned very slightly. Somehow, though, Leslie, I don't think the time element is the only issue you have. Well, Montreux began, then stopped. She seemed uncomfortable, but finally she inhaled and started again. Madam President, I have to confess I'm just a little anxious about the notion of the President of the Republic attending a peace conference on a planet inhabited almost exclusively by freed genetic slaves. As far as I can tell, at least half of them have some connection with the Audubon Ballroom, and their Secretary of War is probably the galaxy's most notorious terrorist. Then there's the fact that they're a monarchy, with a queen who's the adopted daughter of one of Manticore's leading politicians, and a man who used to be one of the Star Kingdom's best spies. And that same man is basically running Torture's intelligence community, with the queen of Manticore's niece as his assistant. She shook her head. Madam President, I question whether or not this planet can really be considered a neutral site, and I have some fairly severe reservations about your personal security and safety on Torch. I see. Pritchard leaned back in her chair, her own expression thoughtful, and considered what Montreux had said. Then she shrugged. I can see why you might be concerned, she said. I think, though, that you're making a not unreasonable mistake by failing to recognize that Torch is something new and unique. Yes, Queen Berry is the daughter of Anton Zilwicky and Catherine Montagne. She was born on Old Earth, though, not Manticore, and I'm quite confident her primary loyalty is to her new planet and her new subjects. I have certain highly covert contacts within the Torch government, which keep me quite well informed in that regard. As for my personal security and safety among a bunch of ex-terrorists, you might want to recall just exactly what the Aprilists were. Her smile this time was thin and cold. I was a senior member of the Aprilists, Leslie. I personally killed over a dozen men and women, and insect labeled all of us terrorists. I'm not going to worry all that much about my safety among people someone like manpowers labeled terrorists, simply because they chose to strike back violently at the butchers who made their lives living hells. And while Anton Zilwicky may head their intelligence services, I have complete and total faith in the young woman who commands their military." Montreux looked at her. Pritchard suspected the secretary wanted to press her objections, but she had the good sense not to. Very well, Madam President, she said instead. If this site's acceptable to you, I'm not going to raise any more objections. Although, with your permission, I intend to discuss my specific concerns with the Attorney General and Presidential Security, as well as my own security people. Of course you have my permission, Leslie. Thank you. The secretary smiled, then tapped the last stack of hard copy. This was perhaps the most surprising part of the entire package, she said. It includes a copy of two official messages to everyone. One is from Foreign Secretary Langtry, and the other's from Queen Elizabeth. They're proposing that both sides agree to bring no military units into the Congo system, aside from a single escort vessel for the ships transporting our delegations, and that the Erewhonese Navy assume responsibility for the system's security during the conference. They've requested that neither we nor the Star Kingdom announce the actual site of the conference. Instead, they've asked us to leave the announcement up to Erewhon, to be made only after the summit is officially agreed to, and everyone is confident that it has all of its security arrangements in order. The official messages they've copied to us are requests to everyone to agree to undertake that role. Now that, Leslie, was a clever move on someone's part, Pritchard said almost admiringly.
Heilrich blotted Manticore's copybook so thoroughly with Erewhon that he almost drove them into our arms, and he managed it mainly because he was too stupid to understand how Erewhonese think. Obviously, whoever came up with this notion doesn't suffer from that particular form of blindness. Given that the Star Kingdom knows Erewhon provided us with significant technology transfers before hostilities resumed, this is Manticore's way of telling Erewhon the current government recognizes its predecessor's mistakes and that it trusts the Republic of Erewhon to keep its word. That it trusts Erewhon enough to put the life of its queen into Erewhonese hands, even after what happened when Elizabeth visited Grayson, or for that matter, when Princess Ruth visited Erewhon. She shook her head, smiling. Whatever comes of the peace conference, asking Erewhon to guarantee our security is going to move it almost all the way back to a truly neutral position between us and Manticore. Should we object to the suggestion, then? Montro asked, and Pritchard shook her head again more violently. Certainly not. Objecting to the suggestion, especially after Elizabeth and Langtry have already issued their request, would be the same as saying we don't trust the Erewhonese to play the role of honest neutral. Right offhand, I can't think of anything that would be more destructive to our own relationship with them. Then I take it you're prepared to approve the Manticoran proposal? Yes, I think I am. As you suggested, I'll want to read over the correspondence myself, and we'll have to have cabinet approval before I take the entire notion officially to the Senate. Under the circumstances, though, I don't see anyone raising any objections if I'm agreeable. Frankly, I don't either, Madam President. So, with your permission? Mantra stood. I'll get back to my office. Colonel Nesbitt and I need to begin considering our own security recommendations. So the President is really serious about this, Madam Secretary? Jean-Claude Nesbitt asked. She certainly is, Colonel, Secretary of State Montreux replied. And while I admit I have a few reservations about the site myself, this initiative of hers also strikes me as our best chance for a negotiated settlement. I see. Nesbitt frowned, and Montreux looked at him questioningly. He saw her expression and gave himself an impatient little shake. Sorry, Madam Secretary, I'm just thinking about all the things that could go wrong. And, if I'm going to be honest, I suppose I'm also thinking about the relative military positions. Given our current advantages, and the fact that the Mantis appear to be tangled up with the Sollies and Talbot, I hope President Pritchard's planning on taking a fairly hard line. Our exact position at the summit is going to be up to the president's direction, Montrose said just a bit coolly. Of course, Madam Secretary, I didn't mean to suggest it shouldn't be. It's just that, especially after Solon and Zanzibar, I'm afraid the man in the street's in a fairly bloodthirsty mood. I know. On the other hand, formulating long-term diplomatic policy on the basis of public opinion surveys isn't exactly a good idea. Of course, Madam Secretary, Nesbitt said again, bobbing his head with a pleasant smile. In that case, suppose I go and pull everything we have on torch. I'll request a full background download from Director Trajan over at FIS as well. Let me spend a few days reviewing it with my senior people and possibly get a few of your senior staffers involved for input from their side of the aisle. After that, I'll be able to delineate specific areas of concern and formulate proposals for dealing with them. That sounds like the best way to proceed, Montreux agreed, and Nesbitt smiled again and climbed out of his chair. I'll go and get started then. Good afternoon, Madam Secretary. Good afternoon, Colonel. Nesbitt let himself out of the Secretary's office and started towards the building's lift shafts, then paused. He stood there a moment, then turned and crossed the hall to knock lightly on the frame of an open door. Oh, good afternoon, Colonel, Alicia Hampton said, looking up from her workstation. Good afternoon, Miss Hampton. Nesbitt stepped into the fairly spacious, comfortably furnished office. 
I was just finishing up my meeting with Secretary Montro, and I thought I'd poke my head in and see how you're getting along. Thank you, Colonel. That's very thoughtful of you. Hampton smiled a bit tremulously. It hasn't been easy. Secretary Montro's a perfectly nice person, and she takes her job seriously, but she's just not Secretary Giancola. Her eyes were suspiciously bright, and she shook her head. I still can't hardly believe he's gone, him and his brother, both at once, just gone like that. It was all such, such a stupid waste. I know exactly what you mean, Nesbitt said feelingly, although not for quite the same reasons. And he was such a good man, Hampton continued. Well, Miss Hampton, Alicia, Nesbitt said, when we lose a good man, a leader, we just have to hope someone else can step into the gap. I think Secretary Montro is going to try very hard, and I hope all of us can help her as she does. Oh, I certainly agree, Colonel, and it was so good of her to keep me on as her administrative assistant. Please, I think we've known one another long enough now for you to call me Jean-Claude, he said with a pleasant smile. And it was good of her to keep you on. Of course, it was also smart of her. Secretary Giancola often told me how much he relied on you to keep the department running smoothly. Obviously, your background knowledge and experience must have been very valuable to Secretary Montreux during the transition. I like to think so, anyway, Jean-Claude, Hampton said, her eyes dropping shyly for just a moment. Then she looked back up at him and returned his smile. I've tried, and she's beginning to delegate a little more than she was willing to when the Senate first confirmed her. Good. Nesbitt nodded vigorously. That's exactly what I was talking about, Alicia, and I hope you'll keep me in mind as well. Secretary Giancola was more than just a boss to me, too, and I'd really like to see his work carried on. So if there's anything I can do for you or Secretary Montro, any security or intelligence matter, or anything of that sort, please let me know. After all, part of my job is being able to intelligently anticipate what the Secretary is likely to need before she actually gets around to asking me. Of course, Jean-Claude, I'll bear that in mind. Fine. Well, I've got to be on my way now. I'll check back with you in a day or so, once this whole conference idea has had a chance to shake down a little more. Maybe we could discuss the secretary's needs over lunch down in the cafeteria. I think that would be a good idea, Jean-Claude, she said. Chapter 49 Honor Alexander Harrington stood between her husband and her wife. Her left hand held Emily's right, and her right hand held Hamish's left, while the three of them watched through the outsized window as Dr. Knipschid's technicians carefully rolled the artificial womb into the room beyond. Dr. Franz Illescu and his team stood waiting, gowned and prepared outside the sterilizing field. Honor felt her hands tightening on her spouse's and forced herself to relax, physically at least, before she did any damage. Hamish leaned towards her, pressing the side of his head briefly and gently to hers, and she smiled. Then she bent beside Emily's life support chair and pressed her own cheek against Emily's. I never thought I'd see this, Emily whispered in her ear. Just wait a couple of months, Honor whispered back, and Emily looked up at her with an enormous smile. It'll be hard, but at least it looks like you'll be able to be here then, too. We can hope, Honor agreed and straightened back up. She glanced over her shoulder, and her lips twitched as she glanced at Nimitz and Samantha. Dr. Illescu and she weren't exactly friends, and she doubted they ever would be, but their relationship had become much more cordial since his apology and her acceptance of it. Still, he and Briarwood had seemed a bit nonplussed by the notion of having a pair of six-limbed furry arboreals in attendance during a birthing. And the passel of armed security personnel standing behind the parents, all three of them, and the living grandparents, seven-year-old aunt and uncle, plus the unofficial aunts and uncles and the godparents, had only added to the staff's consternation. They were accustomed to having the immediate family present at such times, but this immediate family had challenged them. 
which was why they were gathered in the observation gallery of a full-scale operating room rather than one of the smaller, more intimate delivery rooms normally used. Briarwood simply hadn't had a regular delivery room large enough to accommodate the crowd. Colonel Andrew LaFollet, Captain Spencer Hawk, Sergeant Jefferson McClure, Sergeant Tobias Stimson, and Corporal Joshua Atkins stood between the parents' family and the observation gallery's single entrance in a solid wall of Harrington Green. Alfred and Allison Harrington stood side by side, each with an arm around the other, to Emily's left. Faith and James stood in front of their parents, watching with huge eyes and most imperfectly suppressed excitement. Lindsay Phillips, their nanny, stood beside them, keeping a watchful eye peeled, and Miranda LaFollet and James McGinnis stood to Hamish's right, with Farragut cradled in Miranda's arms. Willard Newstyler and Austin Clinkscales had arrived from Grayson for the event, accompanied by Catherine Mayhew and Howard Clinkscales' widows, and Michelle Hankey, Alice Truman, and Alistair McKeon completed the party. Almost, that was. The Queen of Manticore and her consort were also present, along with their tree cats, and half a dozen of the Queen's own to bolster the Harrington security cordon. Not to mention the additional security clamped around the outside of the building. No wonder Illescu's people seemed a bit boggled by the guest list, Honor thought, suppressing a sudden, almost overwhelming temptation to giggle. Nerves, she told herself sternly. That's nerves talking, Honor. As if Illescu had felt her thinking about him, the doctor looked up at the observation window, nodded once, and beckoned his team forward. It's a routine procedure he performs every day, Anna reminded herself. A routine procedure, nothing to worry about. Shut up, Pulse. She breathed deeply, drawing on decades of martial arts training, but it was hard, hard, She wanted to stand on tiptoe, press her nose to the glass, to strain for the first glance, the first sight. She wanted to wrap her arms around Emily and Hamish, to sing. She felt Nimitz and Samantha with her, sharing her excitement and her joy, and she suddenly realized no other human being had ever shared the moment of her child's birth with a mated pair of tree cats. On the other side of the glass, Illescu and his team opened the unit. The inner chamber rose smoothly, and Honor found herself holding her breath, knew that despite her best efforts she was crushing Hamish's hand, she'd engaged the governor on her left hand to protect Emily, as she saw their unborn son floating in the amniotic fluid. The child stirred, kicking, drifting, and she felt the thread of his own sleepy, unformed wonder, as if he sensed the impending moment, even through the corona of joy rising about her. The emotions of her family and friends were like some enormous sea, deep, intense, and powerful, yet focused. Not precisely peaceful, yet equally not tempestuous. They were vibrant, quivering with anticipation like a strummed guitar string, and so brightly, warmly supportive, so happy for her, that tears blurred Honor's vision. Illescu tapped buttons on a console, and the top of the inner chamber slid open. A fibrous-looking mat floated on the fluid, and he used a vibroscalpel to slice it open. The umbilical cord had been attached to the mat, and it coiled lazily as his gloved, sterile hands reached down and lifted the tiny, fragile, infinitely precious body. Honor's lungs insisted that she breathe. She ignored them, her entire being focused on Illescu's gentle, competent hands, as he and his team severed the umbilical and cleaned the air passages— and the baby's emotions shifted abruptly. She closed her eyes, reaching out with mental hands, trying to touch the infant mind glow, as drowsy contentment turned into fear and confusion, shock as he left the soft, warm safety of the womb for the cold and frightening unknown. She felt him protesting, squirming, fighting to return, and then, in a fashion she knew she would never be able to explain to another human being— Nimitz and Samantha were with her, and so was Farragut, and behind him came Ariel and Monroe. The tree cats reached out with her as the first thin squall of protest sounded, and suddenly, as easily as slipping her hand into a glove, she touched him. Touched him as she had never touched another human being, even Hamish. It was as if her hand had reached out into the dark, and a smaller, warmer, utterly trusting hand had found it with unerring accuracy. 
the squalling complaint stopped. The infant eyes moved, unable to focus, and yet sensing the direction of the warm, comforting welcome, the love and the eagerness flowing from honor into him. His was an unformed presence, and yet he knew her. He recognized her, and she felt the unhappiness and fear flowing out of him as he nestled close to her. Her outer vision wavered, vanishing into the blur of tears, and she felt Hamish's arms around her. She tasted his love for her, for their son, for Emily, rising to engulf her. She clung to him without ever releasing Emily's hand, and in that moment she knew her entire life had been worthwhile. The baby squirmed, protesting the intrusion of other hands, of instruments, as he was weighed, examined, evaluated. But even as he squirmed, face wrinkled in newborn concentration, tiny mouth moving, eyes squeezed indignantly shut, she cuddled him in immaterial, steel-strong hands of love. And then he was a tiny, red-faced, neatly wrapped bundle in Illescu's hands as the doctor carried him out of the delivery room to his waiting parents. Illescu stepped into the gallery, his face one huge smile, and for once honor tasted no trace of his prickly personality, his innate sense of superiority. There was only the pleasure, the sense of wonder and renewal, which had drawn an arrogant aristocrat into the world of medicine's most joyous specialization in the first place, and she smiled back at him, holding out her hands eagerly as he crossed to her. "'Your Grace,' he said softly, "'meet your son.' Honor's lips trembled as she gathered the tiny, tiny weight carefully to her. She could have held him stretched along one forearm, his head cupped in the palm of her hand, and she stared down at the ancient, eternally new miracle in her arms. His eyes slipped open once again, moving unfocused and yet seeking the loving presence wrapped about him like another blanket, and she lifted him to her breast. She held him close, inhaling the indescribable newborn smell of him, feeling the incredibly smooth, fragile skin against her own cheek. She crooned softly, and his lips moved, nuzzling her. Perhaps he was only searching for a nipple with newborn hunger, but fresh tears of joy spilled down her cheeks. "'Welcome to the world, baby,' she whispered into his ear, then lowered him and brushed a kiss across his forehead. She turned to Hamish and Emily, stooping beside Emily's life support chair, holding him out to them, and Emily brushed aside her own tears so that they could see their son together. Honor looked up as her father and mother stepped close behind her, and her mother rested both hands on her shoulders. "'He's beautiful,' Alison Harrington said, and smiled tenderly as she reached past her daughter to touch her first grandchild's cheek. "'You may not believe that right this minute,' she continued, brushing the tip of her finger across the screwed-up, still somehow indignant face. But give him a little while. He'll knock your socks off. He already has, Emily said, and looked up at Honor and Hamish. My God, he already has. Honor smiled at her, blinking on her own tears, and then she straightened and turned. She stepped past Emily and Hamish, past a beaming Elizabeth Winton and Justin Zerwinton, past a crooning Nimitz and Samantha, and faced Andrew LaFollet. This is my son, she said to them all, her eyes locked with the man who had been her personal armsman for so many years. Raoul Alfred Alistair Alexander Harrington. Flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone, heir of heart and life, of power and title. I declare him before you all as my witnesses and gods. He is your son, Austin Clinkscales replied, bowing deeply. So witness we all. This is my son, she repeated more softly, speaking only to La Follet. And I name you guardian and protector. I give his life into your keeping. Fail not in this trust. La Follet looked back at her, then dropped to one knee, resting his hand lightly on the blanket-wrapped baby, and met her eyes unflinchingly. "'I recognize him,' he said, his voice soft yet clear as he spoke the ancient formula. "'And I know him. 
I take his life into my keeping, flesh of your flesh, bone of your bone, before God, maker and tester of us all, before his Son, who died to intercede for us all, and before the Holy Comforter, I will stand before him in the test of life and at his back in battle. I will protect and guard his life with my own. His honor is my honor. His heritage is mine to guard, and I will fail not in this trust, though it cost me my life. His voice fogged in the final sentence, and his eyes were suspiciously bright as he rose from his knee. Honor smiled at him and worked one tiny, preposterously delicate hand free of the swaddling blanket. La Follet extended his own hand, fingers opened, and she placed her son's palm against his. I accept your oath in his name. You are my son's sword and his shield. His steps are yours to watch and guard, to ward and instruct. La Follet said nothing more, only bent his head in a slight yet profound bow, and then stepped back. Honor bent her own head to him, tasting and sharing both his joy and his deep, bittersweet regret, and then she turned back to the others. Faith, James, she said to her brother and sister, going down on one knee. Come meet your nephew. This is still going to take some getting used to, Hamish murmured into Honor's ear as they walked slowly down the central aisle of King Michael's Cathedral on either side of Emily's life support chair. What? Honor murmured back, looking down at the sleeping infant clasped carefully in his arms. Fatherhood? That too, he said from the corner of his mouth, and then somehow managed to flick his head without actually moving it to indicate the four green-uniformed men walking behind them. Honor didn't have to look. Andrew LaFollet was there, of course, as Raoul's personal armsman. Spencer Hawk walked directly behind her, and she tasted the combination of his pride and apprehensive sense of responsibility at his promotion to her personal armsman. But she knew it was Tobias Stimson and Jefferson McClure to whom Hamish actually referred. "'I warned you and Emily both,' she whispered to him as they approached the baptismal font." and at least you each got off with only one armsman. Emily snorted quietly between them, and Hamish glanced across at both of them, eyes twinkling, then smoothed his expression into solemnity as they reached the font and Archbishop Telmachy turned to face them. Father O'Donnell stood beside the Archbishop, prepared to assist, and Telmachy smiled and opened his arms in an inviting gesture. There was a stir behind them as Raoul's godparents assembled. Beloved, Telmachy said, we have gathered here to baptize this child. As he is the child of two planets, so also is he the child of God in two traditions. We have examined the doctrine of the Church of Humanity Unchained, as the Church of Humanity Unchained has examined that of Mother Church, We find no irreconcilable conflict between them, and as this child stands heir to high office and titles in both of his worlds, we baptize him here in God's most holy name for both Mother Church and the Church of Humanity Unchained. He paused a moment, then smiled and turned his attention to the parents. Has this child been already baptized or not? He has not. Honor, Hamish, and Emily replied in unison, and Telmachy nodded. Dearly beloved, inasmuch as our Savior has said none can enter into the kingdom of God unless he be regenerate and born anew of water and the Holy Ghost, I beseech you to call upon God that through our Lord Jesus Christ he will, of his bounteous mercy, grant to this child that which by nature he cannot have, that he may be baptized with water and the Holy Ghost, and received into Christ's holy communion, and be made a living member of the same. Let us pray. Honor bowed her head, 
and Telmaki's beautifully trained voice continued. Almighty and immortal God, the aid of all in need, the helper of all who flee to you for succor, the life of those who believe, and the resurrection of the dead, we call upon you for this child, that he, coming to your holy baptism, may receive remission of sin by spiritual regeneration. Receive him, O Lord, as you have promised by your well-beloved Son, saying, Ask, and you shall have. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. So give now unto us who ask. Let us who seek find. Open the gate unto us who knock, that this child may enjoy the everlasting benediction of your heavenly washing, and may come to the eternal kingdom, which you have promised by Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen, the response came back, and he smiled, looking directly into the parents' eyes. Hear the word of the gospel written by St. Mark in the tenth chapter at the thirteenth verse. They brought young children to Christ that he should touch them, and his disciples rebuked those who brought them, but when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased and said to them, Let the children come to me, and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God like a little child, he will not enter therein. And he took them up in his arms, put his hands upon them, and blessed them. And now, being persuaded of the good will of our heavenly Father towards this child, declared by his Son, Jesus Christ, let us all faithfully and devoutly give thanks to him and say, Almighty and everlasting God, Telmaki prayed, joined by the gathered celebrants' voices, Heavenly Father, we give you humble thanks that you have vouchsafed to call us to the knowledge of your grace and to faith in you. Increase this knowledge and confirm this faith in us forever. Give your Holy Spirit to this child that he may be born again and be made an heir of everlasting salvation. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the same Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Telmaki paused, then beckoned once more. In the Grayson tradition, there were four godparents, two godfathers and two godmothers, and Honor smiled as Elizabeth Winton, Justin Zerwinton, Catherine Mayhew, and Alistair McKeon stepped up on either side of the parents. Dearly beloved, Telmaki said to them, you have brought this child here to be baptized. You have prayed that our Lord Jesus Christ would receive him, would release him from sin, would sanctify him with the Holy Ghost, and would give to him the kingdom of heaven and everlasting life. Do you, therefore, in the name of this child, renounce the devil and all his works, the vain pomp and glory of the world, and all covetous desires of the same, and the sinful desires of the flesh, so that you will not follow nor be led by them? I renounce them all, the godparents replied in unison, and by God's help will endeavor not to follow nor be led by them. Do you believe all the articles of the Christian faith as contained in the Apostles' Creed? I do. And will you be baptized in this faith? That is my desire. Will you obediently keep God's holy will and commandments and walk in the same all the days of your life? I will, by God's help. Having now in the name of this child made these promises, will you also on your part Take care that this child learn the Creed, the Lord's Prayer, and the Ten Commandments, and all those things which a Christian ought to know and believe for his soul's health? I will, by God's help. 
Will you take care that this child, so soon as he may be sufficiently instructed and of an age to reaffirm these vows in his own right and of his own will, be brought before the bishop or reverend to be confirmed by him? I will, by God's help. O merciful God, grant that as Christ died and rose again, so this child may die to sin and rise to newness of life. Amen. Amen. Grant that all sinful affections may die in him, and that all things belonging to the Spirit may live and grow. Amen. Amen. Grant that he may have power and strength to have victory, and to triumph against the devil, the world, and the flesh. Amen. Amen. Grant that whoever is here dedicated to you by our office and ministry may also be imbued with heavenly virtues, and everlastingly rewarded to your mercy, O blessed Lord God, who lives and governs all things, worlds without end. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to God. Let us give thanks to our Lord God. It is meet and right to do so. It is very meet, right, and our bounden duty that we should give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Everlasting God, for your dearly beloved Son, Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of our sins, did shed out of his most precious side both water and blood, and gave commandment to his disciples that they should go teach all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Receive, we beseech you, the supplications of your congregation, sanctify this water to the mystical washing away of sin, and grant that this child, now to be baptized therein, may receive the fullness of your grace, and remain always in the number of your faithful children. Through the same Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory now and forever. Amen. Amen. Telmaki reached out and Raoul stirred, rolling his head as the archbishop took him into his arms and looked once again at the godparents. Name this child. Raoul Alfred Alistair. Elizabeth Winton replied clearly, and Telmaki bent to the font, cupping up some of the water in his palm. He poured it gently over Raoul's dark fuzz of hair, and the baby promptly began to wail. Raoul Alfred Alistair, Telmaki said through Raoul's lusty protests, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. I've been wondering what to get Raoul for a christening gift, Elizabeth III said quietly to Honor as they walked out of the cathedral onto its well-guarded front steps. You already gave it, Honor said equally quietly, turning to look at her queen. I did? Elizabeth quirked one eyebrow. Yes, you did, Honor smiled. It should be arriving in Nouveau Paris in about three more days. Oh, that. Elizabeth couldn't quite restrain a slight grimace, but Honor only nodded. I can think of much worse christening gifts than a peace treaty ending an interstellar war, Elizabeth. Chapter 50 It's on, Tom. Thomas Theismann looked at the smiling face on his calm and felt himself smiling in response. "'The official reply is here?' he asked, and Eloise Pritchard nodded. "'The dispatch boat got in about five hours ago. The Manticorin delegation will meet us on torch in two months. We'll have to depart in about three weeks, twenty days to be precise, to meet them.' "'That's wonderful, Eloise!' "'Yes, it is,' Pritchard agreed, but then her face sobered. In a way, though, it's even worse. Worse, Theismann repeated, surprised. 
I've got to sit down across the table from a woman who detests everything she thinks the Republic of Avon stands for and somehow convince her to make peace with the people who attacked her star nation on my personal orders. She shook her head. I've had easier chores in my life. I know, he replied, but we've got to try. We've got to do more than try, Tom. Pritchard's expression firmed up and she shook her head again, this time with a completely different emphasis. I'm coming home with a peace treaty, one way or the other, even if it means telling Elizabeth what we suspect about Giancola. Are you certain about that? About telling her, I mean. It could blow up in our faces, you know. We've all heard about her temper, and if anyone ever had a right to be pissed to the max, she does. If she finds out we let Giancola manipulate us, especially after we accused her government of being the guilty party, Lord only knows how she may react. She's going to find out eventually anyway, Pritchard pointed out. And as you suggested, Harrington's going to be present. Hopefully, she really will have a moderating influence. But I actually suspect the three cats are going to be even more important, assuming the Monty reports on their capabilities are accurate. I think I'm willing to take a chance on telling her the truth, as long as I can do it face to face, with the three cats there to prove to her that I am telling the truth. I hope you haven't mentioned this particular brainstorm to Leslie. Thysman's smile was only half humorous, and Pritchard chuckled. She's unhappy enough about going to torch for the summit in the first place. I don't think she needs to know exactly what sort of diplomatic faux pas I'm prepared to commit if it seems necessary after we get there. Admiral Sir James Bowie Webster, Baron of New Dallas, and the Star Kingdom of Manticore's ambassador to the Solarian League, regarded his morning schedule with scant favor. This is goddamned ridiculous, he grumbled to Sir Lyman Carmichael, his assistant ambassador. What's ridiculous? Carmichael responded, as if they hadn't had this identical conversation every Monday morning since Webster's arrival on Old Earth. This. Webster thumped a rather large fist on the hard copy printout of his agenda, then opened his hand and waved it around his palatial office. All this crap. I'm a naval officer, not a friggin' diplomat. Traditional prejudices aside, Carmichael replied mildly, a career in diplomacy isn't quite the same as seeking employment in a brothel, and don't, he raised an admonishing index finger as Webster opened his mouth, don't tell me that's because whores have more principles. All right, I won't. Especially, Webster grinned, since you already appear to realize that yourself. One of these days, Carmichael promised him, one of these days. Webster laughed and leaned back behind his desk. Actually, my cousin the Duke would be better at this than I am, Lyman. You know that as well as I do. I've had the pleasure of knowing your cousin for many years now, Carmichael said. I have immense respect for him, and he really is a skilled diplomat. Having said all that, I truly don't think he could do the job you've been doing. Now that, Webster said, really is ridiculous. No, it isn't. Your status as a naval officer, especially one who's held the offices you've held, is part of the reason, of course. Carmichael smiled. One reason the Star Kingdom's traditionally assigned military officers and ex-military officers as our ambassadors to the League is the fact that they have a certain fascinating effect on solely politicos. They don't see very many real military people at this level, and that rather blunt directness you Navy types seem to acquire contrasts quite nicely with the mouthfuls of platitudes and careful political maneuvering they're accustomed to. But mostly, in your case, to be honest, it's the fact that you don't lie worth a damn, Jim. I beg your pardon? Webster blinked and Carmichael chuckled. I said, you don't lie worth a damn. In fact, you're so bad at it that the two or three times I've seen you try, the people you were talking to simply assumed you were deliberately pretending to lie in order to make a point. Webster regarded him narrowly, and Carmichael shrugged. You're simply an honest man. It comes across, and that's rare, very rare, for someone operating at the level you currently are, 
especially here. Carmichael grimaced. There's a taint of decadence in the air here on Old Earth, which may be why honesty's so rare. But why ever it is, they don't really understand you in a lot of ways, because you do come out of the military, and very few of them do. But when you say something, personally or as the Queen's representative, they're confident that you're telling them the truth. At the moment, especially with the dispute over our correspondence with the peeps and the shenanigans in the Talbot cluster, that's incredibly important, Jim. Don't undervalue yourself. Webster waved one hand as if he were uncomfortable with Carmichael's explanation. Mm, maybe, he said, then shook himself. Speaking of the peeps, how do you feel about this summit meeting Pritchard's proposed? I was surprised, Carmichael admitted, accepting the change of subject. It's a very unusual departure, especially for the Havenites. In fact, it's so unusual, I'm inclined to think she really must be serious. God, that would be an enormous relief, Webster said frankly. I don't like this Talbot business. There's more going on than we think, I'm sure of it. I just can't put my finger on what it is. But it's there, and I can't shake the feeling that in the long run it may be even more dangerous to us than the peeps are. Carmichael sat back in his chair, even his trained diplomat's face showing surprise, and Webster barked a harsh laugh. I haven't lost my mind, Lyman, and I'm not blind to the current military situation. Trust me on that one. But the Republic of Haven is small beer compared to the Solarian League, and if Mesa— and you know as well as I do that Terakov is right about Mesa's involvement, can maneuver frontier security into doing its dirty work, the situation will be a thousand times worse, and the Sollies are arrogant enough that a lot of their so-called political leaders wouldn't even care. You're probably right, Carmichael said, forced to concede the point, however much he disliked doing so. But you seriously think there's more to what's going on in Talbot than Mesa's traditional efforts to keep us as far away from them as possible? Look at the scale of their effort, Webster said. We're talking billions, lots of billions of dollars worth of battle cruisers. Somebody ponied up the cash to pay for them, not to mention obviously orchestrating the efforts of OFS, local terrorists, and an entire star nation as a proxy. That's a huge effort— and it's also more direct than Mesa or manpower have been in the last couple of centuries. Hell, since Edward Saiganami. But couldn't that simply be because of how threatening they find our proximity, and because they know how distracted by Haven we are? I mean, they know we don't have a lot of resources to commit against them. I'm convinced that's an element in their thinking, Webster agreed, but they're still coming further out of the shadows, not just with us, with the Sollies as well. They're running the risk of coming to the surface, and they've always been bottom feeders before. He shook his head. No, there's a whole new flavor to this one, and that makes me nervous. Now you're making me nervous, Carmichael complained. Can't we just deal with one crisis at a time? He added rather plaintively. I wish. Webster drummed on his desk for a moment, then shrugged. Actually, I suppose we are, assuming this summit idea produces something. And in the meantime, I'm afraid it also means we have to make nice with the Peep Ambassador and his people, at least in public. Well, we'll have the opportunity tonight, Carmichael said philosophically. I know, Webster said glumly, and I hate the opera, too. Are we ready? Yes. Roderick Tallman thought of himself as a facilitator, and he was good at his job. Despite the fact that he was required to maintain an extremely low profile because of the nature of the things he facilitated, there was always work waiting for him, and he knew without any sense of false modesty that he was indispensable. The money's in place? Yes, Tallman said, managing not to sound wearily patient. He did know how to do his job after all. The credit transfers have been made, backdated, and then erased, mostly. I handle the computer side myself. He smiled and shook his head. 
The Havenites really ought to hire a good Solarian firm to update their system security. It shouldn't have been this easy to hack. Count your blessings, his current employer said sourly. Their accounting software may be vulnerable, but we've tried about four times to break into their other secured files without much luck. Actually, I suspect you got into their banking programs from the Salian, didn't you? Well, yes, Tallman admitted. I invaded their interface with their banks. That's what I thought. His employer shook her head. Don't take this personally, but a lot of Sollies make some rather unjustified assumptions about their technological superiority. One of these days, that may turn around and bite all of you on the ass. Hard. I suppose anything's possible. Tallman shrugged. It wasn't as if anyone could threaten the League, after all. The very idea was preposterous. Well, his employer said, if that's all taken care of, I suppose you'd appreciate your fee. You suppose correctly, Tallman told her. The most important thing of all, she said, not hurrying to hand over the untraceable hard copy bearer bond certificate, is that this particular manipulation be completely untraceable. The only place it can lead is back to the Havenites. I understood that from the beginning. Tallman leaned back slightly in his chair. You know my reputation. That's why you came to me in the first place, because my work is guaranteed and I've never had a client burned. The hard part wasn't making the actual changes. The hard part was simultaneously infiltrating four separate secure storage sites to get at the bank's backup files. Well, that... He allowed himself the lazy, arrogant smile of a top professional and leaving exactly the right footprints... When the bank examiners pull their files, they're going to find that the Havenites managed to infiltrate three of their sites, but failed to spot number four. That's where I nested the backup file that does show the transactions. It's actually rather neat if I do say so myself. If they look really closely, they'll discover that those nasty Havenite hackers managed to erase the transactions from the sites they knew about, but the fourth file, that one is going to hang them. Trust me, when the examiners track this one back, they'll even be able to identify the terminal in the embassy where the transactions were supposed to have been entered. Good, she smiled. That's exactly what I needed to hear. And now for your fee. She reached into her smartly tailored jacket, and Tallman let his chair come back fully upright, reaching out his hand, then froze in shock. What? he began, but he never finished the question, for the pulser in her hand snarled. The burst of darts hit him at the base of the throat and tracked upwards across his neck and the left side of his face, with predictably gruesome results. His employer grimaced with distaste, but she'd been careful to sit further back than usual. She was outside the splatter pattern, and she dropped the pulser on the desk, straightened her jacket fastidiously, and let herself out of the office. She walked down the hallway and took the lift to the parking garage, where she climbed into her air car and flew calmly off. Five minutes later, she landed several miles away from the late, lamented Tallman's office building. This parking garage was in a much less desirable part of town. Most of the vehicles parked here were old, battered, the sort of things youth gangs looking for a quick credit would turn up their noses at. She parked her own new-model expensive sports vehicle in a stall beside one such battered, grimy air car and climbed out into the shadows. She looked around carefully, then took a small handset from her pocket and pressed a button. Her face seemed to ripple and shudder indescribably, and her complexion, not just on her face but everywhere, shifted abruptly, darkening and coarsening, as the nanotech which had coated every millimeter of her body turned itself off. The invisibly tiny machines released their holds, drifting away on the morning breeze, and in place of the rather tall blonde woman who had murdered Roderick Tallman, there stood a dark-faced man, slightly below the average in height, with a wiry, muscular build and a bosom. He grimaced and reached inside his shirt, removing the padding, and tossed it into the back seat of his air car. A quick squirt from a small aerosol can, and the padding dissipated into a wispy fog. 
He adjusted his clothing slightly, then unlocked the grimy vehicle beside the air car in which he had arrived. He settled himself at the controls, brought up the countergrav, and flew calmly away. He inserted the vehicle into one of the capital city's outbound traffic lanes, switched in the autopilot, and leaned back in his seat, wondering idly whether or not the vehicle he'd abandoned had been picked up and stripped yet. If it hadn't, it would be very shortly. Of that, he was confident. Sir James Bowie Webster smiled pleasantly, despite the fact that his teeth badly wanted to grit themselves as he stepped out of his official diplomatic limousine in front of the greater New Chicago Opera House. He'd never liked opera, even at the best of times, and the fact that the Sollies prided themselves that they did this, like everything else, better than anyone else in the known universe, irritated him even more. If pressed, Webster was prepared to admit that the citizens of planets like Old Earth and Beowulf at least met well, the fact that they had little more clue than a medieval peasant about things that went on outside their own pleasant little star systems was unfortunate, but it didn't result from any inherent malevolence, or even stupidity, really. They were simply too busy with the things that mattered to them to think much about problems outside their own mental event horizon. But the fact that they complacently believed that the Solarian League, with its huge corrupt bureaucracies and self-serving manipulative elites, was still God's gift to the galaxy made it difficult sometimes to remember that most of their sins were sins of omission, not commission. At least he and Carmichael were making some progress dealing with the bloody events in Talbot. Accounts of the Battle of Monica were really only just beginning to trickle into Old Earth, and from everything he'd seen so far, the revelations were going to get worse before they got better. The good news, he supposed, was that it was remotely possible even the Solarian public might get exercised over such flagrant... Webster never saw the pulser in the hand of the Havenite ambassador chauffeur. What? What did you say? William Alexander, Baron Grantville, demanded incredulously. I said Jim Webster's been shot, Sir Anthony Langtry said, his face ashen, his voice that of a man who couldn't or didn't want to believe what he heard himself saying. He's dead? Yes. He and his bodyguard were killed almost instantly, right outside the opera house of all goddamned places. Jesus! Grantville closed his eyes on a stab of pain. He'd known James Webster most of his life. They'd been personal friends, but not nearly so close as Webster and Hamish had been. This was going to hit his brother hard, and the entire Star Kingdom was going to be stunned and enraged by the highly popular Admiral's death. What happened? he asked after a moment. That's the really bad part, Langtry said grimly. The foreign secretary had come to Grantville's office in person with the news, and something about his tone sent a chill down Grantville's spine. Just the fact that he's dead is bad enough for me, Tony, the prime minister said a bit more tartly than he'd really intended to, and Langtry raised a hand, acknowledging the point. I know that, Willie, and I'm sorry if it sounded like I didn't. I didn't know him as well as you and Hamish, but what I did know about him I liked a lot— Unfortunately, in this instance, the way he was killed really is worse. The foreign secretary drew a deep breath. He and one of his bodyguards were shot and killed by the Peep Ambassador's personal driver. What? Despite all his years of political training and a basic personality which remained calm in the face of disaster— Grantville erupted to his feet behind his desk, leaning forward over it to brace both hands on its top. Eyes of Alexander Blue blazed with consternation and rage, and for just a moment it looked as if he intended to vault physically across the desk. Langtree didn't reply. He simply sat, waiting for the Prime Minister to work through his shock the same way he had when the news first hit his office. It took several seconds... And then, slowly, Grantville settled back into his chair, still staring at Langtree. That's what happened, Langtree said finally, after the Prime Minister had seated himself once more. In fact, it's pretty damned open and shut. The driver's dead, of course, 
Webster's second security man nailed him, and three solid cops at the opera as additional security saw the whole thing. In fact, one of them got his sidearm out in time to put at least one dart of his own into the driver, and one of the others got the entire thing on his shoulder cam. It's all on chip, and they sent the visual record out with the dispatch. My God, Grantville said almost prayerfully. Wait, it gets better, Langtree said grimly. The driver wasn't a Havenite national. He was a Solly, provided by the limo service with the transportation contract for the Peep's new Chicago embassy. A Solly, Grantville repeated carefully. A Solly, Langtree confirmed, who's received the equivalent of just over 125,000 Manticoran dollars over the past half T year, 75,000 of them in the last three weeks, in unrecorded, unreported credit transfers from a Havenite diplomatic account. Granville stared at him, far beyond consternation and into the realm of pure shock. What could they have been thinking? He shook his head. Surely they didn't think they could get away with this. I've asked myself both those questions, but to be frank, there's another one that's far more pressing at the moment. Grantville looked at the foreign secretary, who shrugged. Why? he asked simply. Why should they do this? God damn them! Elizabeth Winton snarled as she stormed back and forth like a caged tigress, pacing the carpet behind the chair in which she should have been sitting. Her fury was a living, breathing thing in the conference room, and Ariel crouched on the back of her chair, ears glued flat to his skull, scimitar claws shredding its upholstery like kneading scalpels. Samantha was in little better condition, her eyes half-closed as she crouched on the back of Hamish Alexander Harrington's chair and fought to resist the other cat's blazing rage. "'Don't these fuckers ever learn a goddamned thing?' Elizabeth hissed. "'What the hell did they—' "'Just a minute, Elizabeth.' The queen whirled back towards the table, her face still suffused with rage as Whitehaven spoke. What? she snapped. Just calm down for a second, he said, his own expression that of a man who'd taken a physical wound. Think. Jim Webster was my friend for over seventy T years. You can't possibly be more furious about his murder than I am, but you just asked a very important question. What question? she demanded. Don't they ever learn, he said. She glared at him, and he looked back steadily. Don't misunderstand me, and don't think for an instant, if it turns out the peeps did this, that I won't want them just as dead as you do. For God's sake, Elizabeth, they already tried to kill my wife. And your point is? she asked in a slightly more moderate tone. And my point is that this whole thing is stupid. Assume the peeps have access to whatever they used to make Timothy Mears try to kill Honor. In that case, why in hell would they choose their own ambassador's driver as their assassin? They could have picked someone with absolutely no connection to them, so they used his driver? Does that make any sense to you at all? I... Elizabeth began. Then she paused, obviously beginning to think at last. All right she said after a moment. I'll grant that that's a legitimate question, but what about the credit transfers the Solly police turned up? Ah, yes, Whitehaven said. The credit transfers. Transfers made directly out of Havenite diplomatic funds. Not exactly the least incriminating payment method I've ever heard of. And if they used whatever they used against Honor, why bother to pay him at all? Let's not forget, that killer was on what anyone but an idiot must have recognized would be a suicide mission. Like the reports say, there were police eyewitnesses. At the very least, he was looking at certain arrest and conviction for murder. Would you do that for less than $150,000? How much good would the money do you lying dead on the sidewalk, or after it was confiscated by the courts when they convicted and sentenced you for murder? So if they could get him to do the job under those circumstances, the amount they could pay him certainly wasn't the controlling factor. And if it wasn't, why hand him money and establish a direct link between him and them in the first place? Those are excellent questions, my lord, Colonel Ellen Chimay acknowledged. 
Shumei's job as the head of Elizabeth's personal security detachment was at least half that of a spook. As a consequence, Elizabeth had made the colonel her liaison to the Special Intelligence Service as well as her chief bodyguard. "'What do you mean, Ellen?' the queen asked now. "'I mean, Earl Whitehaven's objections are extremely well taken, Your Majesty,' Shumei said. "'It's got to be the stupidest way to arrange an ostensibly deniable assassination I've ever heard of, and the queen's own is something of an authority on the history of assassination.' "'But according to this,' Grantville said, tapping his own copy of the hard-copy report from Old Earth. They thought they'd erased all records of the payment. In fact, they did. It was only pure luck that they didn't pick up on the bank's extra security backup and change it as well. I agree that it's possible we lucked out in that regard, Prime Minister, Shimei replied. But the fact remains that they'd paid this man out of an official embassy account and then went back and erased the records. If they were going to pay him anything, why not pay him through a third-party cutout in the first place? For that matter, the Old Earth shadow economy is riddled with conduits they could have used to pay him without leaving any record at all, much less one they'd have to go back and erase. Judging by the preliminary reports on the quality of the work they did on the backups they knew about, I'll grant that they probably felt completely confident that they'd buried their tracks. But why leave those tracks in the first place? And if they had a traceable connection to this man to begin with— Why in God's name pick him as their assassin? They might as well have had their ambassador pull the trigger himself. According to the last report Owen and I shared with the Foreign Office, Langtree said, we still don't have a clue how they did whatever they did to Lieutenant Mears. There are all sorts of theories going around, but nothing solid. Still, at least one of them suggests that the lieutenant wasn't chosen just for his proximity to Duchess Harrington, but also because there was something unique about him. Possibly something in his medical or genetic background made him more vulnerable to whatever technique they're using. Is it possible that this fellow was the closest person they could lay hands on that fit whatever medical profile they need? Possible, I suppose, Mr. Secretary, Shimei said. And they did or at least obviously thought they'd managed to, erase the direct financial connection between him and them. If it was a case of their needing someone with his specific profile, at least they went to a lot of effort to sanitize him. But to use their own ambassador's driver? She shook her head. Even granted that their hacker could eliminate the record of direct clandestine payments, the connection between him and their ambassador had to jump out and hit any investigator squarely between the eyes. Could they have counted on that? Grantville wondered aloud. Everyone looked at him, and he shrugged. If there's something to Tony's suggestion that this man may have had some quality they needed if they were going to use him the way they used Lieutenant Mears, then maybe they decided to make the best of a bad bargain. If they had to use him, maybe they figured we'd be asking ourselves exactly these questions. A double blind, you mean, Prime Minister? Shimei said thoughtfully. You're suggesting that they want us to think the connection is so obvious, no halfway competent covert operations planner would go near it with a three-meter pole? Something like that, Grantville agreed. I suppose it's remotely possible. Shimei frowned. I don't say I think it's likely, though, but the bottom line is that either they didn't do it, and someone's gone to enormous lengths to convince us they did— or else they deliberately set it up this way to point a too obvious finger at themselves. Why would they do that, Ellen? Elizabeth asked skeptically. As the Prime Minister already suggested, Your Majesty, making the best of a bad bargain. If there was some reason they had to use this particular man to pull the trigger, then they may have hoped the surface connection between them and him would be so blatant that they could scream they were being framed by a third party— which, she admitted almost against her will, I personally might have been inclined to place some credence in if it weren't for the history of payments and the fact that they went to such obvious pains to erase that history. Unfortunately for them, there was a previous financial relationship, plus the fact that, according to the bank investigators and the Solly police, they doctored the bank records at least a week before the assassination. Someone else might have found out that the man was on their payroll, which could have made him even more attractive from the prospect of framing them, but altering the records when they did indicates that they knew this was coming and wanted to be certain they'd cut the obvious linkage well ahead of time. So you think it was them, Colonel? Langtree asked. 
I don't know what I think, Mr. Secretary. Not yet, the colonel said frankly. I'd have to say there's a lot of circumstantial evidence indicating they did do it. As I say, the timing on the computer hack strongly suggests that they knew it was coming. But the tradecraft on this, assuming it was them, isn't just bad, it's atrocious. It's not just unprofessional, it's clumsy, especially for someone with as much institutional experience setting up assassinations as the old People's Republic. I suppose it's possible Pritchard's purge of the old regime's security services cost them some expertise, but still... But if we're going to entertain the possibility that it wasn't them, who else could have wanted Jim dead? Grantville asked. I can't answer that one, Prime Minister, Shimei admitted. There could be any number of other people who might have had an interest in killing him, but an analyst can get herself into a lot of trouble by wandering off into too much speculation based on too little hard data, and there are two salient points which stand out to me. First, the timing. It could simply be a coincidence, but I'm naturally suspicious of coincidences, and while we're in the middle of a war with another star nation, the reasons that nation might want one of our ambassadors dead go to the head of my own queue. And second... This entire affair certainly does sound very similar to the attempt on Duchess Harrington's life. In that case, unlike this one, there's not much question about why the peeps wanted her dead, but it's the similarity of technique that strikes me so strongly. When we think about who else could have wanted Admiral Webster dead, we also have to think about who would have the resources and technical capability to put his assassination together this way. From what happened in Duchess Harrington's case, it seems evident that the peeps have it, but we don't have any evidence that anyone else does, and if it wasn't them, someone went to an awful lot of trouble to convince us it was. I don't think it was anyone else, Elizabeth growled. She was marginally less furious, and Ariel allowed her to lift him from the sadly shredded top of her chair as she seated herself at last. She settled the cat in her lap and frowned harshly. I'm willing to admit at least the theoretical possibility that it wasn't the peeps, she said, but I don't believe it was someone else. I think it was them. I think they did it for some reason we can't know, possibly something Webster had found out on Old Earth that they didn't want us to learn about, maybe even something he hadn't realized yet that he knew. Like you say, Ellen, we can't know what might have seemed like a logical reason to them, and as for the credit transfers... They could have had him doing something else before they picked him for this one. But, Hamish began, only to have her cut him off with a quick, sharp shake of her head. No, she said, I'm not going to play the think-and-double-think game. For now, for the moment, I'll operate on the assumption that it may not have been the peeps. You've got that much. We'll go ahead with the summit, and we'll see what they have to say— I'd be lying if I said what's happened wasn't likely to make me a lot less willing to believe anything they say on Torch, but I'll go. But I'm getting incredibly tired of having these bastards murder people I care about, members of my government and my ambassadors. This is it, as far as I'm willing to go. Anthony Langtree looked as if he wanted to argue, but instead he only closed his mouth and nodded, willing to settle for what he could get. Elizabeth glared around the conference room one more time, then climbed back out of her damaged chair, nodded to her three cabinet secretaries, and left, accompanied by Colonel Chimay. Chapter 51 Where's Ruth? Barry Zilwicky, Queen of Torch, asked plaintively. Saboro says she's running late, girl, Lara said, shrugging with the casual informality which was such a quintessential part of her. The ex scrag was still about as civilized as a wolf, and she had a few problems grasping the finer points of court etiquette, which, to tell the truth, suited Barry just fine, usually at least. If I've got to do this, the queen said firmly, Ruth has to do it with me. Barry, Lara said. Kaya said she'll be here, and Saburo and Ruth are already on their way, we can go ahead and start. No. Barry flounced, that really was the only verb that fit, over to an armchair and plunked down in it. I'm the queen, she said snippily, and I want my intelligence advisor there when I talk to these people. But your father isn't even on torch, Laura pointed out with a grin. 
Tandi Palan's Amazons had actually developed senses of humor, and all of them were deeply fond of their commander's little sister, which was why they took such pleasure in teasing her. You know what I mean, Barry shot back, rolling her eyes in exasperation. But there was a twinkle in those eyes, and Lara chuckled as she saw it. Yes, she admitted. But tell me, why do you need Ruth? It's only a gaggle of merchants and businessmen. She wrinkled her nose in the tolerant contempt of a wolf for the sheep a bountiful nature had created solely to feed it. Nothing to worry about in that bunch, girl. Except for the fact that I might screw up and sell them torch for a handful of glass beads. Lara looked at her, obviously puzzled, and Barry sighed. Lara and the other Amazons truly were trying hard, but it was going to take years to even begin closing the myriad gaps in their social skills and general background knowledge, just as it had for her. Never mind, Lara, the teenage queen said after a moment. It wasn't really all that funny a joke anyway, but what I meant is that with Webb tied up with Governor Borregos' representative, I need someone a little more devious to help hold my hand when I slip into the shark tank with these people. I need someone to advise me about what they really want, not just what they say they want. Make it plain anyone who cheats you gets a broken neck. Lara shrugged. You may lose one or two early, but the rest will know better. Want Saburo and me to handle it for you? She sounded almost eager, and Barry laughed. Saburo X was the ex-ballroom gunman Lara had picked out for herself. Barry often suspected Saburo still didn't understand exactly how it had happened, but after a brief, wary, half-terrified, extremely direct courtship, he wasn't complaining. On the face of it, theirs was one of the most unlikely pairings in history. The ex-genetic slave terrorist, madly in love with the ex-scrag who'd worked directly for manpower before she walked away from her own murderous past, and yet, undeniably, it worked. There is a certain charming simplicity to the idea of broken necks, Barry conceded after a moment. Unfortunately, that's not how it's done. I haven't been a queen for long, but I do know that much. Pity. Lara said and glanced at her chrono. They've been waiting over half an hour, she remarked. Oh, all right, Barry said. I'll go, I'll go. She shook her head and made a face. You'd think a queen would at least be able to get away with something when her father is half a dozen star systems away. Harper S. Ferry stood in the throne room, arms crossed, watching the thirty-odd people standing about. He knew he didn't cut a particularly military figure, but that was fine with him. In fact, the ex-slaves of Torch had a certain fetish for not looking spit and polish. They were the galaxy's outcast mongrels, and they wanted no one, including themselves, to forget that. Which didn't mean they took their responsibilities lightly. Harper, for example. Looking at him, a casual observer would have seen a man, probably in his late thirties, of relatively average build, maybe just a bit more wiry than most, with dark hair and eyes, a swarthy complexion, and an expression arranged out of reasonably pleasant features. That same casual observer almost certainly wouldn't have realized that Harper S. Ferry had been one of the Audubon Ballroom's most efficient assassins since he was fourteen. In fact, Harper would have had to think very hard and consult his diary to recall all of the men and women he'd killed in his lifetime. Nor did he regret what he'd done. Still, after long enough, a man got tired of killing, even when the scum he was removing from the universe were genetic slavers. Men and women who'd made fortunes off of the systematic sale, abuse, and torture of millions of genetic slaves just like Harper S. Ferry, literally for centuries. If he could find another way to hurt them, he was prepared to embrace it, and the notion that jabbing a jagged pointy stick directly into Manpower Incorporated's eye involved keeping an immensely lovable young girl alive had appealed to him from the beginning. And however casual he might look, he took absolutely no chances with Barry Zilwicky's safety. And not just because she was so lovable. It wasn't often that a girl barely seventeen T years old was critical to the survival of an entire planet of refuge, yet that was precisely what Barry Zilwicky was. Judson Van Hale walked casually across the throne room, angling a bit closer to Harper. Judson had never been a slave himself, but his father had. 
Fortunately, the senior Van Hale had also found himself aboard a slave ship intercepted by a Royal Manticoran Navy light cruiser. The slaver in question had been equipped to jettison its crew of human beings into space to avoid embarrassing questions, and its crew had suffered a series of fatal exposures to vacuum themselves shortly after its interception. Most of the liberated slaves had become Manticoran subjects, and Judson had been born on Sphinx. He was also one of exactly three of Torch's present citizens who'd been adopted by a tree cat. That made him an extremely valuable asset for the relatively small bodyguard force Queen Barry was prepared to tolerate. In addition, Harper suspected that the fact that Judson had come from Manticore also helped make him more acceptable to the Queen. He was like a breath of home, a reminder of the first place, the only place really, where Barry Zilwicky had ever felt completely safe. This is a lively bunch, Judson murmured disgustedly out of the corner of his mouth as he stopped beside Harper. Genghis here is downright bored. He reached up and caressed the cream and gray tree cat riding on his shoulder, and the cat purred and pressed his head against Judson's hand. Boring is good, Harper replied quietly. Exciting is bad. I know. Still, I'd sort of like to earn my magnificent salary— Nothing too exciting, you understand. Just enough to make me feel useful. Well, to make us feel useful, he corrected, scratching Genghis's chest. Tandy thinks you're useful, Harper pointed out. That's good enough for me. I'm not going to argue with her at any rate. Judson laughed. Harper, unlike the Sphinx-born Judson, had rather fancied himself as a deadly hand-to-hand -hand fighter. Having watched him in the training cell, Judson was inclined to agree with him. Unfortunately for Harper, Tandi Palan wasn't a deadly hand-to-hand -hand fighter. She was a lethal force of nature who laughed at the merely deadly. As she demonstrated rather conclusively to Harper the first time he swaggered onto the mat with her. She'd hardly hurt him at all, really. With quick heal, the broken bones had healed in just a few weeks. I think not arguing with Tandi is turning into Torch's planetary sport, Judson said now, and Harper chuckled. Aren't they running late? Judson asked after a moment, and Harper shrugged. I don't have any place else I need to be today, he said. And if Barry's running true to form, she's dragging her heels waiting for Ruth. And Tandy, if she can get her here. Why aren't they here? They're going over something to do with security for the summit, and according to the net, Harper tapped his personal calm. Tandy's sending Ruth on ahead while she finishes up. He shrugged again. I'm not sure exactly what it is she's working on. Probably something about setting up liaison with Kashat. Oh, yeah, liaison, Judson said, rolling his eyes, and Harper slapped him lightly on the back of the head. No disrespectful thoughts about the great Kaya, friend, not unless you want her Amazons performing a double orchidectomy on you without anesthesia. Judson grinned, and Genghis bleaked a laugh. Who's that guy over there? Harper asked after a moment. The fellow by the main entrance? The one in the dark blue jacket? That's the one. Name's Tyler, Judson said. He punched a brief code into his memo pad and looked down at the display. He's with New Age Pharmaceutical. It's one of the Beowulf consortiums. Why? I don't know, Harper said thoughtfully. Is Genghis picking up any sort of vibes from him? Both humans looked at the tree cat, who raised a true hand in the thumb-folded two-finger sign for the letter N, and nodded it up and down. Judson looked back at Harper and shrugged. Guess not. Want us to stroll a bit closer and check him out again? I don't know, Harper said again. It's just... He paused. It's probably nothing, he went on after a moment. It's just that he's the only one I see who's brought along a briefcase. Hmm? Judson frowned, surveying the rest of the crowd. You're right, he acknowledged. Odd, I suppose. I thought this was supposed to be primarily a social occasion, just a chance for them to meet Queen Barry as a group before the individual negotiating sessions. That's what I thought, too, Harper agreed. He thought about it for a moment longer, then keyed a combination into his calm. Yes, Harper? a voice replied. The guy with the briefcase, Zach, 
You checked it out? Ran the sniffer over it and had him open it, Zack assured him. Nothing in it but a microcomputer and a couple of perfume dispensers. Perfume? Harper repeated. Yeah, I picked up some organic traces from them, but they were all consistent with cosmetics, not even a flicker of red on the sniffer. I asked him about them, too, and he said they were gifts from New Age for the girls. I mean, Queen Barry and Princess Ruth. Had they been pre-cleared? Harper asked. Don't think so. He said they were supposed to be surprises. Thanks, Zach. I'll get back to you. Harper switched off the comm and looked at Judson. Judson looked back, and the ex-ballroom assassin frowned. I don't like surprises, he said flatly. Well, Barry and Ruth might, Judson countered. Fine, surprise them all you want, but not their security. We're supposed to know about this kind of crap ahead of time. I know. Judson tugged at the lobe of his left ear, thinking. It's almost certainly nothing, you know. Genghis would be picking up something from him by now if he had anything unpleasant in mind. Maybe, but let's you and I sashay over that way and have a word with Mr. Tyler, Harper said. William Henry Tyler stood in the throne room, waiting patiently with the rest of the crowd, and rubbed idly at his right temple. He felt a bit odd. Not ill, really. He didn't even have a headache. In fact, if anything, he felt just a bit euphoric, although he couldn't think why. He shrugged and checked his chrono. Queen Barry, he smiled slightly at the thought of the Torch Monarch's preposterous youth. She was younger than the younger of Tyler's own two daughters, was obviously running late. Which, he supposed, was the prerogative of a head of state, even if she was only seventeen. He glanced down at his briefcase and felt a brief, mild stir of surprise. It vanished instantly in a stronger surge of that inexplicable euphoria. He'd actually been a bit startled when the security man asked him what was in the case. For just an instant, it had been as if he'd never seen it before, but then, of course, he'd remembered the gifts for Queen Barry and Princess Ruth. That had been a really smart idea on marketing's part, he conceded. Every young woman he'd ever met had liked expensive perfume, whether she was willing to admit it or not. He relaxed again, humming softly, at peace with the universe. All right, see, I'm here, Barry said, and Lara laughed. And so graceful you are, too, the Amazon said. You who keep trying to civilize us. Actually, Barry said, reaching out to pat the older woman on the forearm, I've decided I like you all just the way you are. My very own wolf pack, well, Tondi's, but I'm sure she'll lend you to me if I ask. Just do me a favor and try not to get any blood on the furniture. Oh, and let's keep the orgies out of sight, too, at least when Daddy's around. Deal? Deal, little Kaya. I'll explain to Saburo about the orgies, Lara said, and it was perhaps an indication of the effect Barry Zilwicky had on the people about her that an ex scrag didn't even question the deep surge of affection she felt for her teenage monarch. A slight stir went through the throne room as someone noticed the queen and her lean, muscular bodyguard entering through the side door. The two of them moved across the enormous room, which had once been the ballroom of the planetary governor when Torch had been named Verdant Vista and owned by the planet Mesa. The men and women who'd come to meet the Queen of Torch were a little surprised by how very young she looked in person, and heads turned to watch her, although nobody was crass enough to start sidling in her direction until she'd seated herself in the undecorated powered chair which served her for a throne. Harper S. Ferry and Judson Van Hale were still ten meters from the New Age pharmaceutical representative when Tyler looked up and saw Barry. Unlike any of the other commercial representatives in the room, he took a step towards her the moment he saw her, and Genghis's head snapped up in the same instant. The cat reared high, ears flattened and fangs bared, in the sudden tearing canvas ripple of a tree cat's war cry, and vaulted abruptly from his person's shoulder towards Tyler. Tyler's head whipped around, and Harper felt a sudden stab of outright terror as he saw the terrible fixed glare of the other man's eyes. There was something insane about them, and Harper was suddenly reaching for the panic button on his gun belt. The pharmaceutical representative saw the oncoming cat, and his free hand flashed across to the briefcase he was carrying. 
the briefcase with the perfume of which no one at New Age Pharmaceuticals had ever heard, and which Tyler didn't even remember taking from the man who'd squirted that odd mist in his face on Smoking Frog. Genghis almost reached him in time. He launched himself from the floor in a snarling, hissing charge that hit Tyler's moving forearm perhaps a tenth of a second too late. Tyler pressed the concealed button. The two canisters of perfume in the briefcase exploded, expelling the binary neurotoxin which they had contained under several thousand atmospheres of pressure. Separated, its components had been innocuous, easily mistaken for perfume. Combined, they were incredibly lethal, and they mingled and spread, whipping outward from Tyler under immense pressure, even as the briefcase blew apart with a sharp percussive crack. Genghis stiffened, jerked once, and hit the floor a fraction of a second before Tyler, left hand mangled by the explosion of the briefcase, collapsed beside him. Harper's finger completed its movement to the panic button, and then the deadly cloud swept over him and Judson as well. Their spines arched, their mouths opened in silent agony, and then they went down as a cyclone of death spread outward. Lara and Barry did their best to maintain suitably grave expressions, despite their mutual amusement, as they walked towards Barry's chair. They were about halfway there when the sudden high-pitched snarl of an enraged tree cat ripped through the throne room. They spun towards the sound and saw a cream and gray blur streaking through the crowd. For an instant, Barry had no idea at all what was happening. But if Lara wasn't especially well socialized, she still had the acute senses, heightened musculature, and lightning reflexes of the scrag she had been born. She didn't know what had set Genghis off, but every instinct she had screamed threat, and if she wouldn't have had a clue which fork to use at a formal dinner, she knew exactly what to do about that. She continued her turn, right arm reaching out, snaking around Barry's waist like a python, and snatched the girl up. By the time Genghis was two leaps from Tyler, Lara was already sprinting towards the door through which they'd entered the throne room. She heard the sharp crack of the exploding briefcase behind her just as the door opened again, and she saw Saburo and Ruth Winton through it. From the corner of her eye, she also saw the outrider of death scything towards her as the bodies collapsed in spasming agony, like ripples spreading from a stone hurled into a placid pool. The neurotoxin was racing outward faster than she could run. She didn't know what it was, but she knew it was invisible death, and that she could not outdistance it. Saburo! she screamed and snatched Barry bodily off the floor. She spun on her heel once like a discus thrower, and suddenly Barry went arcing headfirst through the air. She flew straight at Saburo X like a javelin, and his arms opened reflexively. The door! Lara screamed, skittering to her knees as she overbalanced from throwing Barry. Close the door! Run! Barry hit Saburo in the chest. His left arm closed about her, holding her tight, and his eyes met Lara's as her knees hit the floor. Brown eyes stared deep into blue, meeting with the sudden stark knowledge neither of them could evade. I love you, he cried, and his right hand hit the button to close the door. Chapter 52 Not one word, Elizabeth Winton said flatly. Not one word about why they might have done it or who else might have wanted to do it. Her prime minister and his cabinet sat silently as she surveyed them with eyes of frozen brown ice. The different distances and travel times from the Sol system via Beowulf and Congo via the Erewhon Junction meant the messages had arrived just over 24 hours apart, and Queen Elizabeth was beyond fury now. She had entered a frozen realm where hate burned colder than interstellar space. They killed Sir James and tried to kill Barry Zilwicky and my niece on the same damn day. All the available evidence from Old Terra says it was a peep operation, and who else knew we were planning a summit meeting on Torch? The peeps and the Erewhonese. And does anyone in this room believe the Erewhon Honor Code would have let them do something like this, even assuming they'd had any conceivable reason to? Hamish Alexander Harrington inhaled deeply and looked around the cabinet room. It was unusual for the monarch to come here instead of being attended upon at Mount Royal Palace by her chief minister and perhaps one or two of his colleagues. In fact, it had only happened seven times in the entire history of the Star Kingdom. Well, eight now. 
but Elizabeth hadn't wanted to speak only to her prime minister. She wanted all the members of his cabinet to hear what she had to say. He closed his eyes briefly, his face wrung with pain, and not just for his murdered friend. The heroic determination of Barry Zilwicky's bodyguard had saved her and Ruth Winton from certain death. The ex-slave who'd closed the door in the nick of time had literally dragged the two girls out of Barry's palace. He'd had to drag them. Barry had been hysterically trying to pry the door open with her bare hands. Every individual in the throne room had died within 15 seconds, and another 226 other people had died as the neurotoxins spread beyond the throne room through other doors, windows, and the air conditioning system and the death toll would have been at least three times that high if the security man who'd first noticed the assassin's briefcase hadn't sounded the alarm with his panic button. The almost immediate shutdown of the air conditioning had slowed the poison spread long enough for the rest of the people in its path to evacuate. And the agent used was apparently as persistent as it had been fast-spreading. According to early reports, it was going to be simpler to simply burn the palace down and start over than to decontaminate it. I don't understand, Baroness Mourncreek, Grantville's Chancellor of the Exchequer, said in a troubled voice. Why did they do it? I mean, what have they accomplished? They've managed to kill our ambassador to the League, Elizabeth said coldly. Admiral Webster was highly trusted by his contacts in the League. He'd become a relatively well-known media figure from his appearances on various talk shows as well, and he'd been very effective in moderating the more extremist newsies' versions of what's been going on in the Talbot Cluster ever since Norbrandt started killing people. They probably figured he'd be equally effective in controlling the League's reaction to Terakov's actions at Monica. By killing him, they intended to remove that possibility and increase the odds the League will take military action against us in Talbot. And what happened on Torch, Your Majesty? Morn Creek said. They invited us, me, to a summit meeting. I don't think they actually expected me to accept. I think it was essentially planned as yet another of their damned diplomatic lies. They probably intended to publish the correspondence of their invitation and my refusal as proof that they're the reasonable party in this war. It would have bolstered their claim that they've been telling the truth about our diplomatic correspondence from the beginning— but then I accepted their invitation, and we nominated Torch for the site and invited Erewhon to provide security, with the possibility of repairing the damage to our relations with the Erewhonese. They hadn't counted on that, and even though they'd probably never expected to sit down and negotiate seriously, they found themselves in a position where they might actually have to do that, where it was even possible we'd sound like the voice of reason— so they decided to avoid the entire problem by killing Barry and Ruth. After all, what's the death of two more teenaged girls to bastards like Peeps? For that matter, if the girls' schedule hadn't slipped, they probably would have killed Tandy Palan and decapitated the Torch military as well. Obviously, the confusion and chaos which would have resulted would have made Torch completely impossible as a conference site. And even if it hadn't, they could always point to their concern about security issues and the safety of their precious President Pritchard as reasons they couldn't possibly meet with me there. After, of course, sending me their lying condolences for my niece's death, just like Saint-Just did after he murdered Uncle Anson and Cal. Hamish felt a protest hovering on the tip of his tongue. Not because he wasn't almost as certain of Haven's complicity as Elizabeth herself, but because it still didn't make sense to him. The way Haven had attempted to kill Honor certainly seemed to indicate they saw assassination as a perfectly legitimate tool, and that accorded with the traditional policies of the legislaturalists and the Committee of Public Safety as well, not to mention the fact that Pritchard herself had been credited with more than one assassination during her revolutionary days. Not only that, he could follow Elizabeth's reasoning where James Webster's death was concerned. Webster had been effective, and his death certainly wasn't going to help manage the crisis in the Talbot Cluster. Given how the threat of that crisis hung over the Star Kingdom, inhibiting Manticore's freedom of action, preventing its resolution had to be attractive to Haven. But her theory about Haven's motives for what had happened on Torch, that he found much harder to accept, or at least to understand. There was no need for the Republic to resort to Machiavellian diplomatic maneuvering, if anyone knew that, it was Hamish Alexander Harrington. 
The sheer scale of the peep's numerical advantage was terrifying, and it was going to get only worse. It was possible new innovations like mistletoe and Apollo would go a long way towards equalizing those odds, but Pat Givens swore there was no way Haven could have penetrated the security screen around those projects. So as far as Thomas Theismann and Eloise Pritchard knew, the weapons mix wasn't about to change radically, which meant they should have been supremely confident their advantage in numbers would prove decisive. So why worry about diplomacy? Why not simply issue an ultimatum? Surrender now or face an overwhelming offensive from our side at the same time you're confronting frontier security in Talbot. And yet... And yet... Elizabeth had put her finger on the single most damning point. Who else had a motive? If not for the similarity of the technique employed in this attack, Webster's assassination, and the attack on honor, he would have been inclined to wonder if the torch attack had been a mason operation. After all, an attack on Barry Zilwicky might well have made perfectly good sense from a mason perspective, given the fact that Torch was the only planet which had openly declared war upon Mesa and Manpower and Mesa could conceivably have wanted Webster dead for exactly the same reasons Elizabeth had just ascribed to Haven. But was that his reason talking, or simply his desire to find someone else, anyone else, to blame if it would preserve the possibility of a negotiated peace settlement? If only the three assassination attempts hadn't been so damned similar. Yet, there it was. Three separate attacks— each of them a clearly suicidal assault by someone with absolutely no personal reason to want the intended victim dead and no chance of surviving his own attack. And if Mesa clearly had reasons to want Barry Zilwicky dead and possibly had reasons to want Jim Webster dead, what reason did they have for the attack on honor? Try as he might, he couldn't come up with an answer for that question. Occam's razor, he thought. The simplest answer that covered all the observed facts was most likely to be the truth. And the simplest answer was that the same people had to be behind all three attacks. And given the timing on Webster's murder and the attempt to kill Barry, whoever it was must have wanted to derail the peace conference. But for them to do that, they had to know where the conference was to be held, and no one had known outside the cabinet and the highest echelons of the foreign ministry. The Kingdom of Torch, the Erewhonese and Eloise Pritchard's administration. Everyone had known the conference was to be held, but not where, and he simply couldn't believe Erewhon would have allowed the information to leak. Not when they knew how sensitive Manticoran sensibilities must remain in the wake of their transfer of so much technological information to Haven. Torch certainly wouldn't have leaked it, and there hadn't been so much as a whisper of it in the Star Kingdom's press. And the peeps are the only people I can think of who'd want honor dead as well. For that matter, even if the Masons might somehow have discovered the location, could they have found out in time to mount an operation like this? Besides, despite any delusions of grandeur on manpower's part, Mesa is nothing more than a semi-legitimizing front for little more than common criminals. And would even manpower be stupid enough to assassinate the Star Kingdom's accredited ambassador to the Solarian League on Old Earth itself at the very moment proof of Mason involvement in Talbot is starting to come out? No, there was a hell of a lot more involved here than just Manpower's failed operation in Talbot. And the only people who could have known when and where the summit was to be held and had a reason to want honor dead were the peeps. Elizabeth's theory as to why they might want to sabotage their own peace conference might not be completely logical, yet no other plausible theory offered itself at all. I suppose, William Alexander said heavily, that the real question before us isn't whether or not we hold the peeps responsible for their actions, but what we do about it. Hamish, he turned to his brother, what are our military options? "'Essentially what they were before Pritchett's invitation,' Hamish replied. "'One thing that's changed is that Eighth Fleet's had longer to receive munitions and train with them. "'We've got a few new wrinkles we think are going to make our ships considerably more effective, "'and the additional training time will stand Eighth Fleet in good stead. "'However, at this time, Eighth Fleet is the only formation we've got which is fully trained with the new weapons.' It's also the only formation that's equipped with the new weapons, 
because only the Invictuses and the Grayson's late-flight Harringtons, he smiled wryly at the class name, despite his somber mood, can operate them without refitting. Why is that? Grantville asked. I thought the pods were the same dimensions. They are, but only the ships built with keyhole capability from the outset can handle the Mark II platforms, and they're essential to making the new missiles work. We can refit with Keyhole too. In fact, the decision to build that in is part of what's delayed the Andamani refits, but it requires placing the ship in yard hands for at least eight to ten weeks, and frankly, we can't stand down our existing ships that long when we're this tightly strapped. All our new construction is being altered on the ways to be Keyhole 2 capable, and when it starts coming into commission, we can probably start pulling the older ships back for refit. But at the moment, only Eighth Fleet is really equipped to handle them, and even they have only partial loadouts in the new pods. We're attempting to get into full production on them as quickly as possible, but we've hit some bottlenecks, and security issues have restricted the number of production facilities we could commit to them. But Eighth Fleet could resume active operations immediately? Yes, Hamish said firmly, trying to ignore the icy shiver which went through him at the thought of honor going back into combat when he'd allowed himself to hope so hard for a diplomatic solution, and trying not to think about her bitter disappointment and Emily's if she found herself unable to be there for their daughter's birth after all. And what does our defensive posture look like? That, too, is essentially what it was, but there are improvements on the horizon— we're pressing ahead with the system defense version of Apollo, and we ought to be able to begin deploying it very soon. We're still looking at some production bottlenecks, but once we get the system defense pods deployed in numbers, we'll have much greater security at home. We're in a little better shape in Talbot as well, because O'Malley's on station at Monica now. Given O&I's current estimates of Solarian capabilities— and bearing in mind Terakov's after-action report on the performance of the solely battlecruisers the Monacans used, O'Malley can almost certainly destroy anything Verrocchio could assemble to throw at him for at least the next two to four months. In fact, Verrocchio would have to be heavily reinforced before he'd have any chance at all of evicting us from Monica, much less the cluster as a whole. As far as direct action against the home system by the League is concerned, Sheer distance would work in our favor. They aren't going to invade us successfully through the junction, not with the number of missile pods we've got covering the central nexus. That means they've got to do it the hard way, which leaves them with something on the order of a six-month voyage just to get here, which doesn't even take into consideration the fact that they're going to have to mobilize, bring together, and logistically support a fleet with overwhelming numerical superiority if they expect to offset our tactical and technological advantages. To be honest, I'm reminded of something a wet Navy admiral from Old Earth once said. For eighteen months to two years, possibly even twice that long, we'd run wild. It's unlikely the Solis recognize just how much things have changed in the last five to ten T years, which probably means they'd commit grossly inadequate force levels, at least initially. Eventually, they'd realize what was happening, though, and if they had the stomach for it, they could use their sheer size to soak up whatever we did to them while they got their own R&D to work on matching weapons and cranked up their own building capacity. The bottom line is that my current estimate is that we could do enormous damage to them, far more, I'm certain, than any of their strategists or politicians would imagine was possible— but quantity has a quality all its own, and we simply aren't big enough to militarily defeat the Solarian League if it's prepared to buckle down and pay the cost to beat us. We don't have the ships or the manpower to occupy the number of star systems we'd have to occupy if we wanted to achieve military victory. They, on the other hand, have effectively unlimited manpower and productive capacity— in the end, that would tell. And even if that weren't true, it overlooks the fact that the peeps already have, or soon will have, enough wallers with broadly equivalent capabilities to pound us under. 
especially if we're distracted by dealing with the League. But what I seem to hear you saying, Granville said intently, is that whatever the League ultimately does, nothing it can do in the next, say, six months is going to have a significant impact on us? That time estimate's probably a bit optimistic, assuming we take any heavy losses against Haven, Hamish replied. Overall, though, that's fairly accurate. Then it seems to me we've got to take the position that that six months, or whatever shorter period we actually have, represents our window for dealing with the peeps, the Prime Minister said. Except for the fact that by the end of that window, their numerical advantage in SDPs will be on the order of three to one or even higher, Hamish said. Nothing we can do will change that, Elizabeth said flatly. We're building as quickly as we can. They're doing the same thing. The threat zone until the ships we've laid down can equalize the numbers is beyond our control, unless we can do something to whittle the peeps down. You're thinking about Sanskrit, Hamish said equally flatly. Most of the people in the cabinet room had no idea what Sanskrit was. Grantville, Hamish, the Queen, and Sir Anthony Langtree did, and Elizabeth nodded. You just said Eighth Fleet has the new weapons. If we use them, if we can convince the peeps we've got more of them, that we've re-equipped with them across the board, that's got to affect their strategic thinking, it may force them to do what we wanted all along and fritter away their wall of battle defending rear area systems, or it may even convince them they've gotten their sums wrong and they don't have sufficient numbers to offset our individual superiority, in which case the bastards may actually have to sit down and talk to us after all. It's possible, Hamish agreed. I can't predict how probable it might be. A lot would depend on how their analysts evaluate the situation after they run into mistletoe and Apollo. They might not draw the conclusions we'd expect them to, since they won't have the same information we have about the system's capabilities and availability— and I don't think anyone at Admiralty House would be prepared to predict exactly what their military reaction might be. That's a given, Elizabeth said, nodding. But you say we'll be deploying the system Defense Apollo shortly. That would bolster our rear area security, wouldn't it? Considerably, Hamish replied. But we don't have them deployed yet. Still, Eighth Fleet already has Apollo, and it's part of Home Fleet's strategic reserve, isn't it, Haim? Grantville asked. Yes, it is, but it can only be in one place at a time, Hamish pointed out. If it's outraiding Peep Star Systems, then it can't be here defending the home system. But if we launch Sanskrit, then immediately bring Eighth Fleet home to Trevor Star, it would be back in its covering position before Theismann could react to the new weapon systems, wouldn't it? I mean, one of the advantages of basing Eighth Fleet at Trevor Star is that it's 90 light years closer to Haven than Manticore is. So even if we hit a target like Love It, Eighth Fleet can be back in position to cover the home system a good three weeks before Theismann could get a fleet here to attack us, even if he sent it straight from Haven the instant he heard about Sanskrit, right? That's the theory, Hamish agreed, with a silent curse for the Admiralty contingency studies his brother had clearly been reading a bit too closely. Then he gave himself a mental shake. Willie and Elizabeth were right. The possibility of a direct confrontation with the Solarian League was a far more deadly strategic threat to the Star Kingdom than the Republic of Haven's possible reaction to the new weapon systems. We don't have enough time to waste any more of it trying to talk to these people, Elizabeth said flatly. We've just had fresh proof of the fact that we can't trust them, and given the situation in Talbot, we have to allow for a worst-case scenario. That means we have to make our plans with the understanding that we could be at war with the Solarian League at any time, and that, as Hamish says, they could have a fleet in the Talbot cluster in weeks, and another all the way out here in six months. Not only that, but if the war drags on, then somebody like Verrocchio is more likely to push when he shouldn't, 
on the theory that we'll be too distracted by the threat closer to home to respond forcefully to something far away in a place like Talbot. We can't afford that possibility, and the only way to avoid it is to achieve a decision quickly. Do you see any approach, any military approach, which would give us a better chance of attaining that decision, Hamish? No. Hamish shook his head. Hitting them hard with Sanskrit and Apollo will have to make them stop and think, and even if they wanted to counterattack immediately, it would take them weeks at least to plan, deploy for, and mount an attack heavy enough to break the defenses covering our critical star systems. Their losses would be massive, even against our existing defenses, and we've seen no evidence that Theismann is prepared to launch some sort of do-or-die kamikaze attack or throw his people's lives away on forlorn hopes. I'm not saying that that couldn't change, but, as Willie suggested, there's still the time factor involved. We'd have at least a month, probably two, to get the system defense Apollo pods into initial deployment while he organized any attack in response to Sanskrit. And Willie's right. We'd have Eighth Fleet back in its covering position at Trevor Star long before any such attack could come through. He looked around the conference room, his face grim. I'm not going to pretend that we aren't running a risk launching Sanskrit, he said. But unless Theismann is prepared to lose literally hundreds of super dreadnoughts, there won't be a lot he can do even against the defenses we already have in position. Against the defenses we can have in place in another couple of months, his losses would be even higher. My own preference would be to wait at least another month to six weeks before we launch Sanskrit, just to give ourselves a little longer to get Apollo fully into production, bring at least a few more Apollo-capable Wallace forward, and get the Apollo-capable system defense pods into initial deployment. But if we're going to decide we can't wait that long because of the potential for an incident, or maybe I should say another incident, with the Sollies, then Sanskrit represents our best option. Very well. Elizabeth surveyed her ministers one more time, then nodded sharply, decisively. Willie, I'm going to draft a note to Pritchett. It's not going to be pretty. I'm going to officially and publicly denounce her actions and notify her that I have no intention of meeting anywhere with someone who uses assassination as a routine tool. And I'm also going to notify her that we intend to resume active military operations immediately. Grantville nodded. Technically, he might have rejected Elizabeth's policy decisions. In fact, it was clear from her attitude that the only way he could have opposed them would have been by resigning rather than accepting them. And he had absolutely no doubt that if the Queen explained to her subjects what had happened and why she'd made the decision she had, those decisions would enjoy overwhelming support and approval. She could readily have found another prime minister to put them into effect. All that was true enough, but ultimately beside the point. Because the critical point was that he agreed with her. Tony, Elizabeth continued, turning to the foreign secretary. I want our notice that we're going back to active operations very clearly stated. Unlike them, we're not going to be launching attacks without declaring hostilities first. And I want that point made to the galaxy at large by publishing our note in the faxes at the same time we send it. There's not going to be any room for anyone to accuse us of altering correspondence after the fact this time. Clear? Clear, Your Majesty, Langtree said, and the Queen turned back to Hamish. Hamish, I want orders cut to Eighth Fleet immediately. Operation Sanskrit is reactivated as of now. I want active planning to begin immediately, and I want Sanskrit to hit the peeps as soon as physically possible. The smile she produced was one a hexapuma might have worn. We'll give them their formal notice, she said grimly, and I hope the bastards choke on it. Chapter 53 The senior members of Eloise Pritchard's cabinet sat around the conference table in stunned silence. Leslie Montreux had just finished reading the formal text of Elizabeth Winton's savage note aloud, and everyone in the room felt as if he or she had just been punched in the belly except Pritchard. 
She'd experienced that sensation 90 minutes earlier when Montreux delivered the note to her office. Now she inhaled deeply, tipped her chair slightly forward, and rested her forearms on the conference table in a posture which she hoped bespoke confidence. There you have it, she said simply. Is she insane? Tony Nesbitt's question could have sounded furious. Instead, it sounded plaintive. Why in God's name does she think we did it? What possible motive could we have had? They already blamed us for the attempt to kill Harrington, Pritchard replied. And to be fair, if the situation were reversed, I'd be convinced of our guilt in that case, too. After all... Harrington would be such a logical target for us to remove if we could. The fact that we know we didn't do it gives us a rather different perspective, of course. It's obvious to us that it had to have been someone else. That's not readily apparent to them in Harrington's case, though, and I can think of several logical reasons for us to have attempted to assassinate Webster as well, if we were willing to use assassination in the first place. The evidence that we were directly involved in the Webster assassination is pretty damning, too, even if we do know it was all fabricated. So now they have this assassination attempt on Queen Barry and apparently Princess Ruth. Who else are they going to blame for it? But we'd offered to discuss peace with them, Walter Sanderson said. Why would we have done that and then deliberately sabotaged our own proposed peace conference it just doesn't make sense. Actually, Secretary Sanderson, Kevin Usher said, I'm afraid that however angry Elizabeth may be being at this moment, her suspicions of us aren't as illogical or unreasonable, at least, as I'd like them to be. Meaning what? Sanderson demanded. Madam President? Usher looked at Pritchard with a questioning expression, and she nodded. Go ahead, Kevin. Tell them. Yes, ma'am. Usher turned back to the rest of the cabinet. Some months ago, I was going through some of the older state security files. As you know, we seized so many secure files, it's going to take literally years to sort our way through them all. These, though, carried maximum security flags from both INSEC and StateSec. That was unusual enough to pique my curiosity, so I took a look. And it turns out we have an even longer history with the House of Winton than I thought we did. Sanderson scowled, as if impatient for the Federal Investigative Agency's director to get on with it, and Usher smiled thinly. I'm sure we're all aware that St. Just organized the attempt to kill Elizabeth and Benjamin Mayhew in Yeltsin— I'm sure we're all also aware that while the Masadans missed Elizabeth and Benjamin, they did get the Mantikorin Prime Minister and Foreign Secretary. And of course, the Foreign Secretary in question, Anne Sonenki, was Elizabeth's uncle. Her first cousin was also killed, and she'd been very close, emotionally as well as politically, to the Duke of Cromarty literally from the day she first took the throne. That would be bad enough, but we might convince her to associate that only with state sec, except, of course, for the minor difficulty that we also had her father assassinated. What? Thomas Theismann jerked upright in his chair, his expression thunderstruck, and Usher nodded grimly. King Roger was the primary moving force behind the original Manticoran build-up, against the legislaturalists' Duquesne plan. They'd assumed all along that Manticore would be the toughest of their intended victims, but Roger's activities were making their projections look much worse. So they decided to decapitate the opposition. Insec already had its hooks into several Manti politicians, and it used them to kill the king. Elizabeth was still a minor at the time, and according to the INSEC files, they hoped to influence the Regency and redirect Manticoran foreign policy. At the very least, they figured putting someone as young and inexperienced as she was on the throne would hamstring opposition to them. Unfortunately for them, the operation was blown somehow. INSEC didn't have any idea how the Mantis tumbled to it, but they were convinced they had— 
The plan to influence the regency went out the window when Elizabeth's aunt Catherine was named regent. Catherine's as tough-minded as they come, and she pretty thoroughly fumigated their foreign office of anyone remotely sympathetic to the legislaturalists. And Elizabeth, despite the fact that she must have known about insects' involvement, settled for politically castrating the Manticorean politicos who actually did the dirty work, which, if you think about it, proves she knew who was really behind it, and that even then she had the brains and self-discipline to not accuse the legislaturalists before the Star Kingdom was ready for war. My God, Theisman said. They killed King Roger because they expected Elizabeth to be weaker? He barked a harsh laugh. Well, that little brainstorm certainly fucked up. I believe you could safely say that, Pritchard agreed. But you see what Kevin's driving at, don't you? The legislaturalists and internal security murdered her father. The Committee of Public Safety and State Security tried to murder her and did murder her uncle, her cousin, and her prime minister. So if two totally different overnight regimes were willing to murder members of her family, why shouldn't a third regime attempt to murder her niece? Is it any wonder she has to be thinking it's impossible for this particular leopard to ever change its spots? I had no idea about King Roger's death. Sanderson shook his head, his expression reminiscent of that of a pole-axe steer. I still can't think of any logical reason for us to have been behind what happened on Torch, but I suppose, under the circumstances, it really isn't, or shouldn't be, that surprising she's reacted this way. The thing I have to wonder, Mr. Secretary, Usher said, is whether or not whoever did kill Webster and attempt to kill Barry Zilwicky and Ruth Winton also knew the truth about King Roger's death. He glanced at Wilhelm Trajan, and the Foreign Intelligence Service's chief shrugged unhappily. They're looking into that, Kevin, he said, then turned his attention to the cabinet as a whole. As Kevin knows, we have a very good man in Erwan with extraordinarily good contacts on Torch, Unfortunately, we haven't heard from him yet, and we won't for some time. Even if he was actually on torch when it happened, which is unlikely, frankly, given how broad his area of responsibility is, it's still going to be at least a couple of weeks before a message from torch or Erevan reaches here. Having said that, it's glaringly obvious to us that someone else did know about the summit conference and didn't want it to happen. Kevin, have your people turned up anything more on Groclaude's suicide? No, Usher admitted. I was afraid of that, Trejan sighed. We've been collating reports and rumors over at FIS for some time now. We really started looking after the attempt to kill Harrington, since we knew we hadn't done it. It became apparent to us rather quickly that there were a lot of parallels between the attempt on her life and the Hofschulte affair in the Empire. In fact, it looks like whatever technique was used was identical in both cases. We haven't heard anything yet direct from Old Earth about the Webster assassination, but looking at the indictment Elizabeth attached to her note, it looks very much to me as if Ambassador de Klerk's driver may have been another application of the same technique, and the attack on Barry Zilvicki may have been yet another. Notice that in all four cases, for example, the apparent assassin had no personal motive to kill his victims and no chance at all of surviving the mission. From the outside, and bearing in mind how little forensic evidence we have, it sounds as if the same technique was used on Groclaude, not to make him kill anyone else, but to make him kill himself. Where are you headed with this, Wilhelm? Pritchard asked, regarding him intently. Groclaude was almost certainly Giancola's tool, Trajan said. Giancola was killed in what was clearly a genuine traffic accident, but Groclaude was intentionally eliminated and on the face of it, by the same unknown party 
who seems to have been wandering around the galaxy, murdering people virtually at will. As Kevin's demonstrated, it's extremely likely Groclod's death and the forged files implicating Giancola were actually intended to convince us of Giancola's innocence. So our unknown party was looking out for the late lamented Arnold's interests when he, or they, killed Groclod. Jesus! Rachel Hanriel pursed her lips in a low, soft whistle. You're suggesting Arnold was working for this unknown party of yours from the beginning? That this entire war with the Mantis was deliberately provoked by someone else? I think it's a distinct possibility, Trujan nodded. And if it is what happened, then obviously the people who wanted us shooting at the Mantis in the first place are going to do anything they can to prevent us from stopping the shooting. But who? Nesbitt demanded, his face screwed up in frustration. Who does it help for us to be killing one another? I don't know that, Trajan admitted. Given the operation on Torch, I'd be tempted to point the finger at Mesa. After all, Mesa and Manpower don't much like us or the Mantis for a lot of reasons. But I'm not sure why they would have used Hofschulte to try and kill the Andy Emperor's younger brother. For that matter, the real culprits may have figured we'd automatically assume it was Mesa if they attacked the ruler of Torch. It could have been a bit of misdirection on their part, and aside from getting us both out of manpower's hair, keeping us from inhibiting their slaving operations, at least in our respective sectors, I just don't see what sort of reason Mesa could have for committing the obvious time and resources necessary to set all of this up. Are you saying there isn't a reason? No, Secretary Nesbitt. I'm saying that neither I nor any of my senior analysts can think of what that reason might be, and that we need to be careful not to allow the torch component of what's happened to stampede us into running off after what may very well be a false scent. We can't afford to concentrate our attention solely on the Mesa manpower possibility without something more to go on than the physical location of the attack on Barry Zilviki. All of this is fascinating, Thomas Theismann said. I mean that sincerely, and I dearly want the answers to the questions that are being asked. Unfortunately, we have a more pressing problem before us, specifically Montecor's decision to resume hostilities. That's certainly true, Admiral, Leslie Montreux said. From the phrasing, it's clear they intend to resume operations at the earliest possible moment. It's even possible they're attacking us somewhere even as we sit here. Under the strict letter of international law, they'd be thoroughly justified in asserting that they'd given us notice of their intentions before they violated the ceasefire, since our original agreement to the ceasefire didn't define what timely notice would be. Do you think they are already hitting us, Tom? Pritchard asked. From a diplomatic perspective, I couldn't begin to answer that one, Theismann replied. From a military perspective, I'd be surprised if they could get an operation off the ground this quickly. I'm assuming they probably had operational plans in the works before the ceasefire, and that they've continued to do precautionary updates on their planning, but it's still going to take them some time to dust those plans off, bring their operational units up to speed, and then actually reach their targets. We've got possibly another week or so from that perspective. I could be wrong, but I think that's the most probable scenario. There's got to be some way to dodge this pulsar dart, Nesbitt argued urgently. If Wilhelm's suspicions are remotely accurate, then both of us are playing into someone else's hands if we go back to war. But if Tom's time estimate is accurate, Henrietta Barloy said harshly, there's nothing we can do. If the Mantis hit us as hard and as fast as the tone of that note suggests, we're going to get pounded somewhere before we could possibly get a note from Haven to Manticor. Even assuming Elizabeth were prepared to believe any of this, and I'm not at all sure she would be, there's no way to tell her about it before she pulls the trigger. And if she does pull the trigger, Pritchard said grimly, then it's going to be harder than hell to convince anyone in Congress to try for a second summit agreement. In addition, Montreux pointed out unhappily, 
we couldn't expect the Mantis to take any such second proposal seriously unless we badly defeat whatever operation they mount. Everyone looked at the Secretary of State, and she shrugged. Right now, Elizabeth's assuming we set this entire thing up for some unknown, underhanded, devious reason of our own. If they attack us successfully, inflict more damage, and get off unscathed or with only minor damage of their own, then, as far as she'll be concerned, we'll have even more reason to stall, or whatever the hell it is we're trying to accomplish. If we beat them severely, though, then send her another message, along with at least a partial explanation of Director Trajan's suspicions, we'll be speaking from a position of strength, tactically and psychologically. If we say to them, Look, we just knocked the crap out of your last attack, and we're telling you we think someone else is manipulating both of us. So, if you'll at least sit down and talk to us, we won't press our immediate advantage while you do it. They're a lot more likely to actually take this seriously. I see what you mean. Pritchard nodded and cocked her head at Theisman. Tom, how likely an outcome is that? That depends on far too many imponderables for me to even guesstimate, Theisman said frankly. It depends on what they decide to do, where they decide to do it, and what's waiting for them when they do. We've managed to cover almost all of the star systems we've been able to identify as possible candidates for their targeting list with the new pods and control systems. During the period of the ceasefire, I also redeployed a fair percentage of our capital ship strength to cover the more valuable of those systems. The subunits I used were able to continue their training and working up on their new stations while giving us more defensive depth. All intelligence indications are that they've been working hard to reinforce their Eighth Fleet. On the basis of that, they ought to be able to attack in greater strength. They may choose to attack a greater number of targets, but personally, I think it's more likely they'll concentrate on one, especially after what happened at Solon. So I'm betting on a heavy attack on one, or at most two, of the more valuable target systems. Assuming I'm right, and assuming we've guessed correctly about their likely targets, and assuming they pick one of the ones I've assigned fleet units to, and that they haven't come up with some new doctrine or hardware, we ought to hammer them. But please notice how many assumptions went into that statement. He shook his head and met his colleagues' gazes levelly. I'd be lying if I told you flatly that they can't punch out whatever system they pick. I expect they'll get hurt wherever they hit us, but I can't guarantee they'll be repulsed, with or without significant losses on their part. Understood. Pritchard nodded again, unhappily this time, and sat in obvious thought for several seconds. Then her nostrils flared, and she straightened slightly in her chair. All right. Personally... I think you're onto something. Wilhelm, I want all your resources committed to trying to figure out what the hell is going on and who's behind it. Yes, Madam President. Leslie, I think you're onto something about the circumstances we need before we can share our suspicions with the Mantis. All the same, I want you to begin working now on a message we might send them if we can find or create the right conditions. We can't afford to sound weak or as if their present intransigence is driving our policy, not if we expect to convince them we're telling the truth. At the same time, we need to be as persuasive as we can, so I want you and Kevin to sit down together. I want you as intimately familiar with his investigation as you can possibly be, since you're the one who's going to be drafting an explanation of it for the Mantis. Do the same thing with Wilhelm. I want a preliminary draft of the note on my desk within the next five days. Yes, Madam President. Tom? Pritchard turned to Theisman. I'm sorry to say that at this point it looks like it all comes down to you and your people. Leslie's right. We need a victory before we hand this bucket of snakes to the Mantis. I need you to give me one. Madam President... I know you just said you can't guarantee to defeat their next attack, Pritchard interrupted. I understand why that is, and I accept your analysis. On the other hand, we may kick their ass after all, 
in which case we can immediately send them Leslie's note, but if they kick our ass, then we need to stage an immediate and powerful comeback, so I need you to go back to the Octagon and sit down with Admiral Marquette and Admiral Trenny. Get back to me with an analysis of possible offensive actions on our part. I want a spectrum of options, ranging from the heaviest blow we can launch to a more graduated response we might use if they attack us and we drive them off without either side getting badly hurt. Yes, Madam President. Theismann was manifestly unhappy, but his voice and expression were both unflinching. I don't like our situation, Pritchard said grimly. I don't like it one little bit, and I like it even less every time I realize that whoever's doing the manipulating Wilhelm suggested got me personally to do exactly what they wanted. Unfortunately, at this moment, they've done exactly the same thing with Elizabeth Winton as well, and given her obvious attitude, there's no prospect of explaining that to her. So the only option we have is to hit her hard enough to convince her she has to listen to us, however ridiculous our claims sound. Chapter 54 We've got those plans for you, Eloise. Good, I think. Eloise Pritchard smiled at Thomas Theismann and Arnaud Marquette without much humor as the Secretary of War and the Chief of the Naval Staff seated themselves at the table in the small conference room just off her office. Of late, she thought, she seemed to be spending a great many hours in rooms like this. As you requested, we've put together a range of possible options, Theismann continued. In my opinion, two of them are most likely to meet your requirements— Arnaud and I have brought you summaries on all of them, but with your permission, I'd prefer to concentrate on the two I think are most likely. Beatrice and Camille. Well, the names sound nice anyway, the President said wanly, and Theismann and Admiral Marquette showed their teeth in dutiful smiles. All right, Tom, go ahead. In that case, let's look at Camille first, Theismann said. Basically... Camille is intended for a situation in which the Mantis attack one of our star systems and we fight them off with relatively light losses on either side. The consequence of a sparring match, you might say, and not a death grapple. In that situation, as we understood your directive, what we want is an operation which will punish them, but without radically raising the stakes on either side. A declaration that we've absorbed and parried their blow and that we're prepared to deliver similar blows of our own. The basic problem is that, despite the way they've been forced to divert battle squadrons to cover places like Zanzibar and Elizan, they have proportionately heavier system defense forces on most of their important targets than we do. They simply have fewer systems to defend, which lets them cover up in greater depth, despite their numerical inferiority. So even something we intend as a relatively minor attack is going to require a significant commitment of force on our side. We have the resources to do that. My only real concern is that using a task force or a fleet of the size we need is likely to be perceived by the Mantis as an escalation on our part, whether we want that or not. Bearing that in mind, what we propose under Camille is an attack on Elizan, similar to the one we launched against Zanzibar. We'd probably put Lester in command again, and we'd commit six battle squadrons, 48 podnaughts, with carrier support and screening elements. That's a significantly heavier force than the one we used against Zanzibar, but the Mantis have shored up the Elizan defenses since then, and we'll need the additional firepower to break in. Assuming our force estimates are accurate, our six squadrons should be sufficient to get the job done— but their Office of Naval Intelligence has to have at least a fair notion of our current strength. They'll recognize that six battle squadrons represents only a small portion of our total deployable ships of the wall. Hopefully they'll conclude from that that we're deliberately operating on a reduced scale, although they may not conclude that it's for the reasons we want them to think it is. In that case, we may require some diplomatic contact to underscore the point that we could have hit them harder— that's one reason we picked Elizan as our target. It's significant politically, diplomatically, and in terms of their public's morale. It's not especially significant any longer in terms of their actual warfighting ability, though. 
What we hope is that taking out Eliza's military infrastructure will underscore our capabilities without being perceived as a mortal threat. Is that about what you wanted at this end of the spectrum? It sounds like it, Pritchard replied. I'll want to read your summary on it and adjust it further, of course, but it sounds like the sort of smack in the face that will get their attention without punching their lights out. That's about what we tried to design it to do. On the other hand, Theismann continued, I hope you and Leslie are both remembering that using military operations as a way to shape a diplomatic climate is always problematical. It's much simpler, and more reliable, frankly, to think in terms of accomplishing specific military goals than it is to come up with ways to elicit specific desired political responses from your opponent. He's always going to find some way to screw up what it was you thought you were going to get, and any secretary of war or admiral who tells you differently is either a lunatic or a liar, in either of which cases you should get rid of his sorry ass as quickly as possible. I'll bear that in mind, Pritchard said, lips twitching as she womanfully resisted the temptation to smile. Good. In that case, let's look at Beatrice. Theismann sat forward slightly in his chair, his palms on the tops of his thighs as he leaned towards the president, and his expression became very serious. Beatrice is no slap in the face, Madam President, he said quietly. Beatrice is an all-out bid for outright military victory. You said you wanted one end of your spectrum of options to be the most powerful one we could put together. Beatrice is it. Pritchard felt her own expression congealing into focused attention. Basically, Beatrice is a direct attack on the Manticran home system, Theismann told her. There's not much finesse to it. We'll take 42 battle squadrons... 336 SDPs, equal to 80-plus percent of their entire modern wall of battle, including the Andes, according to Naven's current estimates, and will throw it straight at their toughest defenses and their most critical defensive objective. They'll have to fight to defend Manticore, and the system astrography is going to leave Sphinx especially exposed. Essentially, we'll be able to get at Sphinx quickly enough their home fleet will have no choice but to meet us head-on, however bad the odds are from their perspective, and the odds will be bad. Because they've had to deploy so much of their strength to cover other secondary objectives, they'll be significantly outnumbered at the point of contact. We'll take along several thousand lakhs. The attack force, which will be under Javier's command, with Lester as his second, will also be accompanied by a full-press fleet train, repair ships, ammunition ships, hospital ships, everything— We'll be prepared to repeat Lester's Zanzibar tactics, complete to reloading our SDP several times, if necessary. Even in the best-case scenario, he said soberly, our losses will be heavy. Very heavy. Don't think they won't. We'll be hitting very hard, well-prepared defenses, probably the toughest in the explored galaxy at the moment, manned by highly motivated people, and they'll still have the technological advantage, even though we've narrowed it. Not only that, but we don't estimate we'll be able to hold the system against counterattack, even after we win. Certainly not indefinitely. At the moment, their home fleet consists of about 50 SDPs and the same number of older super-dreadnoughts, according to Navent. They have another 50 of the wall in 3rd Fleet, and 8th Fleet has another 24 to 30. Against home fleet alone, we'll have a better than three to one advantage in total hulls, and seven to one in SDPs. Their fixed defenses and the lacks they've deployed for home system defense will offset some of that advantage, but not as much as you might think. According to Navin's latest reports, some of the dispositions they've been forced to make to protect Manticore B and the junction have forced compromises in Manticore A we think we can make work for us. If both 3rd Fleet and 8th Fleet are called in from Trevor Star, the numerical odds will shift from 7 to 1 in pod layers to approximately 4 to 1, but we don't really know how likely it is that both of them will be committed. They've got to worry about the fact that the force we're throwing at Manticore, big as it is, represents only a portion of our total wall of battle. That means they'll have to be worried about the possibility that we've got an additional fleet sitting in hyper, waiting to pounce on Trevor Star if they uncover it. 
They may dither at least a little and commit one of the Trevor Star forces first, hoping it will be enough. In some ways, that would be good. It would bring them in in smaller packets, easier to defeat in detail. But one variant of Beatrice we're considering, Beatrice Bravo, would try to entice them to come through together. If they stay concentrated and commit both of them, our margin of superiority will be far tighter. It should still be enough, because most of Javier's force will go in concentrated, whereas their home fleet and Trevor Star forces would have to rendezvous with one another before they can combine tactically. If Javier heads directly towards Sphinx, home fleet will have to honor the threat and move immediately to intercept him, which ought to let him engage that detachment on his own terms. After that, and if the Trevor Star detachments come in together, he may have to break off the attack if his own losses against home fleet and the fixed defenses have been significant. Otherwise, especially if we adopt the Bravo variance deployment, he ought to be in a position to engage the remaining fleet elements in succession, utilizing his numerical advantage, or ignore the forces coming up behind him while he heads directly through the system, taking out industrial infrastructure and especially their dispersed shipyards as he goes. A lot will depend on how heavy his own losses were, and whether or not he still has the firepower to deal with the inner defenses. Our munition consumption is going to be an especially ticklish problem, I suspect. If he's able to inflict heavy damage on their infrastructure, Beatrice might not prove immediately fatal to the Mantis, but the long-term effects on the strategic balance would be clearly decisive. Without the Manticoran yards, their alliance can't possibly match our construction ability, and they'll know it, which means they'll have no choice but to surrender. If he's able to engage Third Fleet and Eighth Fleet in detail, after already trashing Home Fleet, he'll probably be able to completely destroy or cripple just under half the total modern Manti wall of battle, and then take out the infrastructure. In that case, Beatrice would definitely be immediately decisive. Theismann stopped speaking and sat back in his chair, and Pritchard gazed at him without speaking for what seemed an eternity. It was very quiet in the conference room. Beatrice, she thought. Such a pretty name for something so hideous. Is this what it's really come to, Eloise? She wanted to say no, to reject the notion, yet she couldn't. She'd done her dead-level best to avoid this, and she prayed she would still be able to avoid Beatrice. But deep in the secret places of her soul, she was afraid. So afraid. Not of defeat, but of the price of the alternative. You say we'd commit almost 350 ships of the wall? She said finally. What does that leave us if things go wrong? We'll have a total of just over 620 SDPs in commission at that point, Theismann told her. There'll be another 300 or so older super dreadnoughts to support them, although by that point we'll be decommissioning the older ships steadily to provide crews for the new construction. Why not take more of them to Manticore, then? For four main reasons. First, out of that total number of pod layers, something like a hundred will still be working up. They won't be up to full efficiency, their ship's companies won't be fully integrated. In short, they won't really be fully combat-effective units. Second, the force we're committing ought to be enough to do the job, and it's going to be the biggest fleet of super-dreadnoughts ever committed to action in a single battle by anyone, including the Solarian League. Even under a worst-case scenario, it should be more than powerful enough to beat an organized retreat with minimum losses— I realize Murphy's still likely to put in an appearance, but there would have to be some truly radical shift in the basic operational parameters for the Mantis to seriously threaten its ability to look after itself. Third, we simply can't be certain where their Eighth Fleet is going to be at the moment we launch Beatrice. Suppose, for example, that they've sorted from Trevor Star on another raiding expedition. In that case, our margin of superiority at Manticore would be even greater, but we've got to cover our own absolutely essential rear areas, like Bolt Hall, although there's no indication they've figured out where Bolt Hall is yet, against whatever Eighth Fleet might be doing while we're trashing Manticore. Fourth, there's the Andamani. 
The Mantis and Graysons have lost about twenty super dreadnoughts, twelve of them pod layers, since Thunderbolt wrapped up. That's about seven percent of their total pod knots. But the Andes are still out there somewhere, and so far we've seen very few of their capital ships. There are at least a couple of squadrons of them assigned to the Mantis home fleet, but that's about it. By our estimates, they should have somewhere around a hundred and twenty pod layers by now. Just about a third of the Manticoran Alliance's total, and we haven't seen them yet. We know they aren't a Trevor Star, and intelligence suggests there's still some technical problem with them. We know they were conducting a major refit program on the Andy Wallers, and we're assuming that explains their continued absence. But it's possible more of them will come forward before we launch Beatrice. And whatever happens in Manticore, the Andy ships that aren't there can't be destroyed. So we've got to retain enough of our own forces uncommitted to provide a strategic reserve against the sudden appearance of the Andamani Navy. Pritchard considered what he'd said for a moment, then nodded. How soon could you mount these operations? Camille could go on very short notice, Theismann said. Lester's already essentially positioned to mount and execute the operation. Beatrice is going to take longer. Frankly, we'll need at least seven to eight weeks to bring ourselves up to our stipulated force levels. It will take another three weeks or so for the designated units to combine and reach Manticore. So, say we could hit Elizan within two weeks of the time you say go, and we could execute Beatrice anywhere from ten weeks to three months from today. If we begin making preliminary deployments for Beatrice now, we'd probably come out closer to the ten-week deadline. From today, Pritchard repeated with a forlorn smile. You realize this is the day I was supposed to depart for Torch, don't you? Yes, I do, Theismann said sadly. This wasn't a conversation I wanted to be having. Not today, not ever. I know that, Madam President. But he met her eyes unflinchingly. If the diplomatic option isn't available, this is the logical consequence of going to war in the first place. You're right, of course," she sighed, massaging her temples with the fingertips of both hands. And you tried to warn me before we did it, before I did it, Madam President," he said quietly. "I could have stopped you. We both know that. No, you couldn't have." She disagreed. I'd like to think you could, because then I could spread around some of the guilt I'm feeling right now. But you couldn't have stopped me without killing the Constitution, Tom, and you could no more do that than you could fly without countergrave or strangle your own child with your bare hands. We both know that. He started to open his mouth as if to continue arguing the point. Then he closed it instead, and she smiled again. But however we got here, we're here now," she said, and inhaled sharply. All right, Tom. I'll know. I'll review your summaries. On the basis of what you've said so far, I'm inclined to think you're probably right about the two we're most likely to be choosing between. Unfortunately, I hope it will be Camille. But go ahead and assume the worst. Start deploying your units on the basis that Beatrice will be necessary. Chapter Fifty Five. The warship which emerged from the Trevor Star terminus of the Manticore wormhole junction did not show a Manticore in transponder code, nor did it show a Grayson or an Andromani code. Nonetheless, it was allowed transit for the code it did display was that of the Kingdom of Torch. To call the vessel a warship was perhaps to be overly generous. It was, in fact, a frigate, a tiny class which no major naval power had built in over fifty T years, but this was a very modern ship, less than three T years old, and it was Manticoran built by the Hauptmann Cartel for the Anti-Slavery League, which, as everyone understood perfectly well, actually meant it had been built for the Audubon Ballroom before its lapse into respectability, and this particular frigate. T.N.S. Potawatomi Creek was rather famous. One might almost have said notorious, as the personal transport of one Anton Zilwicky, late of Her Manticoran Majesty's Navy. 
everyone in the Star Kingdom knew about the attempt to murder Zilwicky's daughter, and given Manticore's current bloody-minded mood, no one was inclined to present any problems when Potawatomi Creek requested permission to approach HMS Imperator and send across a couple of visitors. Your Grace, Captain Zilwicky and guest, Commander George Reynolds announced. Honor turned from her contemplation of the nearest drifting units of her command, one eyebrow rising, as she tasted the peculiar edge in Reynolds' emotions. She'd decided to meet with Zilwicky as informally as possible, which was why she'd had Reynolds greet him and escort him to the relatively small observation dome just aft of Imperator's forward hammerhead. The panoramic view was spectacular, but it was symbolically outside her own quarters or the official precincts of Flagbridge. Now, however, that odd ripple in Reynolds' mind glow made her wonder if perhaps Zilwicky wouldn't be just as glad as she was to keep this an unofficial visit. Reynolds, the son of a liberated genetic slave, was an enthusiastic supporter of the great experiment in Congo, not to mention a personal admirer of Anton Zilwicky and Catherine Montagne. He'd worked remarkably well with Zilwicky immediately prior to Honor's deployment to the Marsh system, and he'd been delighted when she asked him to meet Zilwicky's cutter— now, however, he seemed almost apprehensive. That wasn't exactly the right word, but it came close, and she caught Nimitz's matching flicker of interest as the cat sat up to his full height on the back of the chair where she'd parked him. Captain, she said, holding out her hand. Your grace. Zilwicky's voice was as deep as ever, but it was also a bit more abrupt, clipped, and as she turned her attention fully to him, she tasted the seething anger his apparently calm exterior disguised. "'I was very sorry to hear about what happened on Torch,' Honor said quietly. "'But I'm delighted Barry and Ruth got out unscathed.' "'Unscathed is an interesting word, Your Grace,' Zilwicky rumbled in a voice like crumbling griffin granite. "'Barry wasn't hurt, not physically,' but I don't think unscathed really describes what happened. She blames herself. She knows she shouldn't, and she's one of the sanest people I know, but she blames herself. Not so much for Lara's death, or for all the other people who died, but for having gotten out herself, and I think perhaps for the way Lara died. I'm sorry to hear that, Anna repeated. She grimaced. Survivor's guilt is something I've had to deal with a time or two myself. She'll work through it, Your Grace, the angry father said. As I said, she's one of the sanest people in existence, but this one's going to leave scars, and I hope she'll draw the right lessons from it, not the wrong ones. So do I, Captain, Honor said sincerely. And speaking of drawing the right lessons, or perhaps I ought to say conclusions— he said, I need to talk to you about what happened. I'd be grateful for any insight you can give me, but shouldn't you be talking to Admiral Givens or perhaps to the SIS? I'm not certain any of the official intelligence organs are ready to hear what I've got to say, and I know they're not ready to listen to my fellow investigator here. Honor turned her attention openly and fully to Zilwicky's companion as the captain gestured at him. He was a very young man, she realized, not particularly distinguished in any way physically, of average height, possibly even a little shorter than that, with a build which was no more than wiry, almost callow-looking beside Zilwicky's massively impressive musculature. The hair was dark, the complexion also on the swarthy side, and the eyes were merely brown. But as she gazed at him and reached out to sample his emotions, she realized this young man was anything but undistinguished. In her time, Honor Alexander Harrington had known quite a few dangerous people. Zilwicky was a case in point, as, in his own lethal way, was young Spencer Hawk, standing alertly to watch her back even here. But this young man had the clear, clean, uncluttered taste of a sword. In fact, his mind glow was as close to that of a tree cat as Honor had ever tasted in a human being. Certainly not evil, but direct, very direct. For tree cats, enemies came in two categories, those who'd been suitably dealt with and those who were still alive. This unremarkable-looking young man's mind glow was exactly the same in that regard. 
There was not a single trace of malice in it. In many ways, it was clear and cool, like a pool of deep, still water. But somewhere in the depths of that pool, Leviathan lurked. Over the decades, Honor had come to know herself. Not perfectly, but better than most people ever did. She'd faced the wolf inside herself, the aptness to violence, the temper chained by discipline and channeled into protecting the weak rather than preying upon them. She saw that aspect of herself reflected in the mirrored surface of this young man, Stillwater, and realized with an inner shiver that he was even more apt to violence than she was. Not because he craved it one bit more than she did, but because of his focus, his purpose. He wasn't simply Leviathan. This man was also Juggernaut. Dedicated every bit as much as she to protecting the people and the things about which he cared, and far more ruthless. She could readily sacrifice herself for the things in which she believed. This man could sacrifice anything in their name. Not for personal power, not for profit, but because his beliefs and the integrity with which he held them were too strong for anything else. But although he was as clean of purpose as a meat axe, he was no crippled psychopath or fanatic. He would bleed for what he sacrificed. He would simply do it anyway, because he'd looked himself and his soul in the eye and accepted what he found there. "'May I assume, Captain,' she said calmly, "'that this young man's political association, shall we say, "'might make him ever so slightly persona non gratis "'with those official intelligence organs?' "'Oh, I think you might say that, Your Grace.' Zilwicky smiled with very little humor. "'Duchess Harrington, allow me to introduce you to Special Officer Victor Kashat of the Havenite Federal Intelligence Service.' Kashat watched her calmly, but she felt the tension ratcheting up behind his expressionless facade. Those merely brown eyes were much deeper and darker than she'd first thought, she observed, and they made an admirable mask for whatever was going on behind them. "'Officer Kashad, she repeated in an almost lilting voice. "'I've heard some rather remarkable things about you, "'including the part you played in Erewhon's recent change of allegiance.' "'I hope you don't expect me to say I'm sorry about that, Duchess Harrington.' Kashad's voice was as outwardly calm as his eyes, "'despite a somewhat heightened prickle of apprehension. "'No, of course I don't.' She smiled and stepped back a half-pace, feeling the way Hawk had tightened internally behind her at the announcement of Kashat's identity before she waved at the dome's comfortable chairs. Sit down, gentlemen. And then, Captain Zilwicky, perhaps you can explain to me exactly what you're doing here in company with one of the most notorious secret agents, if that's not an oxymoron, in the employ of the sinister Republic of Haven. I'm sure it will be fascinating. Zilwicky and Kashat glanced at one another. It was a brief thing, more sensed than seen, and then they seated themselves in unison. Honor took a facing chair, and Nimitz flowed down into her lap as Hawk moved slightly to the side. She felt Kashat's awareness of the way in which Hawk's move cleared his sidearm and put Honor herself out of his line of fire. The Havenite gave no outward sign he'd noticed, but he was actually rather amused by it, she noted. Which of you gentlemen would care to begin? She asked calmly. I suppose I should, Zilwicky said. He gazed at her for a moment, then shrugged. First, Your Grace, I apologize for not clearing Victor's visit with your security people ahead of time. I rather suspected that they'd raise a few objections, not to mention the fact that he is a Havenite operative. Yes, he is, Honor agreed. And, Captain... I'm afraid I have to point out that you've brought the aforesaid Havenite agent into a secure area. This entire star system is a fleet anchorage, under martial law, and closed to all unauthorized shipping. There's a great deal of highly confidential information floating around, including what could be picked up by simple visual observation. I trust neither of you will take this wrongly, but I really can't permit a Havenite operative to go home and tell the Octagon what he's seen here. We consider that point, Your Grace, Zilwicky said, much more calmly than he actually felt, Honor observed. I give you my personal word that Victor hasn't been allowed access to any of our sensor data, 
or even to Potawatomi Creek's bridge since leaving Congo. Nor was he given any opportunity to make visual observations during the crossing from Potawatomi to your vessel. This, he raised one hand, waving it at the panoramic view from the observation dome, is the first time he's actually had a look at anything which could be remotely construed as sensitive information. For what it's worth, Duchess, Kashat said, meeting her eye steadily, his right hand resting lightly in his lap. Captain Zilwicky is telling you the truth. And while I'll confess that I was very tempted to attempt to hack into Potawatomi Creek's information systems and steal the information I'd promised him I wouldn't, I was able to suppress the temptation quite easily. He and Princess Ruth are both accomplished hackers. I'm not. I have to rely on other people to do that for me, and none of those other people happened to be along this time. If I'd tried, I would have bungled it and gotten myself caught. In which case, I would have gotten no information and destroyed a valuable professional relationship. For that matter, my knowledge of naval matters in general is limited. I know a lot more than the average layman, but not enough to make any worthwhile observations— certainly not relying on what I can see from the outside. Honor leaned back slightly, gazing at him thoughtfully. It was obvious from his emotions that he had no idea she could actually taste him. And it was equally obvious he was telling the truth. Just as it was obvious he actually expected to be detained, probably jailed, and... Officer Kashat, she said, I really wish you would deactivate whatever suicide device you have in your right hip pocket. Kashat stiffened, eyes widening in the first sign of genuine shock he'd given, and Anna raised her right hand quickly as she heard the snapping whisper of Spencer Hawk's pulser coming out of its holster. Calmly, Spencer, she told the young man who had replaced Andrew Lafollet, never looking away from Kashat herself. Calmly. Officer Kashat doesn't want to hurt anyone else, but I'd feel much more comfortable if you weren't quite so ready to kill yourself, Officer Kashat. It's rather hard to concentrate on what someone's telling you when you're wondering whether or not he's going to poison himself or blow both of you up at the end of the next sentence. Kashat sat very, very still. Then he snorted, a harsh, abrupt sound, nonetheless edged with genuine humor, and looked at Zilwicky. I owe you a case of beer, Anton. Told you so. Zilwicky shrugged. And now, Mr. Super Secret Agent, would you please turn that damn thing off? Ruth and Berry would both murder me if I let you kill yourself, and I don't even want to think about what Tandy would do to me. Coward. Kashat looked back at Honor, head cocked slightly to one side, then smiled a bit crookedly. I've heard a great deal about you, Duchess Harrington. We have extensive dossiers on you, and I know Admiral Theismann and Admiral Foraker both think highly of you. If you're prepared to give me your word, your word, not the word of a Manticoran aristocrat or an officer in the Manticoran Navy, but Honor Harrington's word, that you won't detain me or attempt to force information out of me, I'll disarm my device." I suppose I really ought to point out to you that even if I give you my word, that doesn't guarantee someone else won't grab you if they figure out who you are. You're right. He thought for a moment longer, then shrugged. Very well. Give me Steadholder Harrington's word. Oh, very good, Officer Kashat. Honor chuckled as Hawk stiffened in outrage. You have studied my file, haven't you? and the nature of Grayson's political structure, Kashat agreed. It's got to be the most antiquated, unfair, elitist, theocratic, aristocratic leftover from the dustbin of history on this side of the explored galaxy. But a Grayson's word is inviolable, and a Grayson steadholder has the authority to grant protection to anyone, anywhere, under any circumstances. And if I do... I'm bound, both by tradition and honor, and by law, to see to it you get it. Precisely, Steadholder Harrington. Very well, Officer Kashad. 
You have Stetholder Harrington's guarantee of your personal safety and return to Potawatomi Creek. And while I'm being so free with my guarantees, I'll also guarantee Eighth Fleet won't blow Potawatomi Creek out of space as soon as you're safely back aboard. Thank you, Kashat said and reached into his pocket. He carefully extracted a small device and activated a virtual keyboard. His fingers twiddled for a moment, entering a complex code, and then he tossed the device to Zilwicky. I'm sure everyone will feel happier if you hang on to that, Anton. Dondi certainly will, Zilwicky replied, and slid the disarmed device into his own pocket. And now, Captain Zilwicky, Honor said, I believe you were about to explain just what brings you and Officer Kashat to visit me? Your Grace. Zilwicky's body seemed to incline towards Honor without actually moving. We know Queen Elizabeth and her government hold the Republic of Haven responsible for the attempt on my daughter's life. And I trust you'll remember how my wife was killed and that I have no more reason to love Haven than the next man. Rather less, in fact. Having said that, however, I have to tell you that I personally am completely satisfied Haven had nothing at all to do with the assassination attempt on Torch. Honor gazed at Zilwicky for several seconds without speaking. Her expression was merely thoughtful, and then she leaned back and crossed her long legs. That's a very interesting assertion, Captain. And I can tell one you believe to be accurate. For that matter, interestingly enough, Officer Kashat believes it to be accurate. That, of course, doesn't necessarily make it true. No, Your Grace, it doesn't, Zilwicky said slowly, and Honor tasted both of her visitors' burning curiosity as to how she could be so confident, and accurately so, about what they believed. All right, she said. Suppose you begin, Captain, by telling me why you believe it wasn't a Havenite operation? First, because it would be a particularly stupid thing for the Republic to have done, Zilwicky said promptly. Leaving aside the minor point that being caught would be disastrous for Haven's interstellar reputation, it was the one thing guaranteed to derail the summit conference they'd proposed. And coupled with the Webster assassination, it would have been the equivalent of taking out pop-up ads in every fax in the galaxy that said, Look, we did it. Aren't we nasty people? The massive Griffin Highlander snorted like a particularly irate boar and shook his head. I've had some experience with the Havenite intelligence establishment, especially in the last couple of years. Its current management is a lot smarter than that. For that matter, not even Oscar St. Just would have been arrogant enough, and stupid enough, to try something like that. Perhaps not, but if you'll forgive me, all of that is based purely on your reconstruction of what people ought to have been smart enough to recognize. It's logical, I'll admit— but logic, especially when human beings are involved, is often no more than a way to go wrong with confidence. I'm sure you're familiar with the advice, never ascribe to malice what you can put down to incompetence, or, in this case, perhaps, stupidity. Agreed, Zilwicky said. However, there's also the fact that I'm rather deeply tapped into Havenite intelligence operations in and around Congo. He bobbed his head at Kashad. The intelligence types operating there and in Erewhon are fully aware that they don't want to tangle with the Audubon Ballroom. Or, for that matter, with all due modesty, with me. And the Republic of Haven is fully aware of how Torch and the Ballroom would react if it turned out Haven was actually responsible for the murder of Barry, Ruth, and Tandy Palan. Believe me, if they'd wanted to avoid meeting Elizabeth, they would simply have called the summit off. They wouldn't have tried to sabotage it this way. And if they had tried to sabotage it this way, Ruth, Jeremy, Tandy, and I would have known about it ahead of time. So you're telling me that in addition to your analysis of all the logical reasons for them not to have done it, your own security arrangements would have alerted you to any attempt on Haven's part? I can't absolutely guarantee that, obviously. I believe it to have been true, however. I see. Honor rubbed the tip of her nose thoughtfully, then shrugged. I'll accept the probability that you're correct, 
At the same time, don't forget that someone, presumably Haven, managed to get to my own flag lieutenant. O and I still hasn't been able to suggest how that might have been accomplished, and while I have the highest respect for you and your capabilities, Admiral Givens isn't exactly a slouch herself. Point taken, Your Grace. However, I have another reason to believe Haven wasn't involved, and given the unusual acuity with which you appear to have assessed Victor and myself, you may be more prepared to accept that reason than I was afraid you would be. I see, Anna repeated and turned her eyes to Kashad. Very well, Officer Kashad. Since you're obviously Captain Zilwicky's additional reason, suppose you convince me as well. Admiral, Kishat said, abandoning the aristocratic titles which she knew had been their own subtle statement of plebeian distrust, I find you have a much more disturbing presence than I'd anticipated. Have you ever considered a career in intelligence? No. And about that convincing? Kishat chuckled harshly, then shrugged. All right, Admiral. The most convincing piece of evidence Anton has is that if the Republic had ordered any such operation on Torch, it would have been my job to carry it out. I'm the FIS chief of station for Erewhon, Congo, and the Maya sector. He made the admission calmly, although Honor knew he was very unhappy to do so. With excellent reason, she thought. Knowing with certainty who the opposition's chief spy was would have to make your own spy's jobs a lot easier. There are reasons, reasons of a personal nature, why my superiors might have tried to cut me out of the loop for this particular operation, Kashat continued, and she tasted his painstaking determination to be honest. Not because he wouldn't have been quite prepared to lie if he'd believed it was his duty, but because he'd come to the conclusion that he simply couldn't lie successfully to her. Although it's true those reasons exist, he went on, it's also true that I have personal contacts at a very high level who would have alerted me anyway. And with all due modesty, my own network would have warned me if anyone from Haven had invaded my turf. Because all of that's true, I can tell you that the chance of any Republican involvement in the attempt to assassinate Queen Barry is effectively non-existent. The bottom line, Admiral, is that we didn't do it. Then who did? Honor challenged. Obviously, if it wasn't Haven, our suspicions are naturally going to light on Mesa, Zilwicky said. Mesa and Manpower have plenty of reasons of their own to want Torch destabilized and buried dead. The fact that the neurotoxin used in the attempt is of solely origin also points towards the probability of Mason involvement. At the same time, I'm painfully well aware that everyone in the official intelligence establishment is going to line up to point out to me that we're naturally prejudiced in favor of believing Mesa is behind any attack upon us. And, to be totally honest, they'd be right. Which doesn't change the fact that you really do believe it was Mesa, Honor observed. No, it doesn't. And do you have any evidence beyond the fact that the neurotoxin probably came from the League? No, Zilwicky admitted. Not at this time. We're pursuing a couple of avenues of investigation which we hope will provide us with that evidence, but we don't have it yet. Which, of course, is the reason for this rather dramatic visit to me. Admiral, Kashat said with the first smile she'd seen from him, I really think you should consider a second career in intelligence. Thank you, Officer Kashat, but I believe I can exercise intelligence without having to become a spy. She smiled back at him, then shrugged. All right, gentlemen, I'm inclined to believe you, and to agree with you for that matter. It's never made sense to me that Haven would do something like attack Barry and Ruth, but while I may believe you, I don't know how much good it's going to do. I'm certainly willing to present what you've told me to Admiral Givens, O&I, and Admiralty House. I don't think they're going to buy it, though. Not without some sort of corroborating evidence besides the promise, however sincere, of the senior Havenite spy in the area that he really, really didn't have anything to do with it. 
Call me silly, but somehow I don't think they're going to accept that you're an impartial, disinterested witness, Officer Kashat. I know that, Kashat replied. And I'm not impartial or disinterested. In fact, I have two very strong motives for telling you this. First, because I'm convinced that what happened in Congo doesn't represent my star nation's policy or desires, and that it's clearly not in the Republic's best interests. Because it isn't, I have a responsibility to do anything I can do to mitigate the consequences of what's happened. That includes injecting any voice of sanity and reason I can into the Star Kingdom's decision-making process at the highest level I can reach, which, at this moment, happens to be you, Admiral Harrington. Second, Anton and I are, as he said, pursuing our own investigation into this. His motives, I think, ought to be totally understandable and clear. My own reflect the fact that the Republic is being blamed for a crime it didn't commit. It's my duty to find out who did commit it and to determine why he or they wanted to make it appear we did it. In addition, I have some personal motives tied up with who might have been killed in the process, which also give me a very strong reason to want the people behind this. However, if our investigation prospers, we're going to need someone, at the highest level of the Star Kingdom's decision-making process we can reach, who's prepared to listen to whatever we find. We need, for want of a better term, a friend at court." So it really comes down to self-interest, Honor observed. Yes, it does, Kishant said frankly. In intelligence matters, doesn't it always? I suppose so. Honor considered them both again, then nodded. Very well, Officer Kishant. For whatever it's worth, you have your friend at court. And just between the three of us... I hope to heaven you can turn up the evidence we need before several million people get killed. Chapter 56 You can't be serious, Baron Grantville blurted, looking incredulously at his sister-in-law. Yes, I certainly can be, Willie, Anna replied, with just a hint of a chill in her tone. I'm not exactly in the habit of making jokes about things like this, you know. The Prime Minister colored and shook his head apologetically. Sorry, it's just that to be bringing this up at this late date, and with no evidence to support the theory... He let his voice trail off, and Anna reached up and stroked Nimitz's ears while she looked at Grantville levelly. She could hardly pretend his attitude was a surprise, but she'd given her word. Besides, she'd cherished profound doubts of her own about this war from the outset. Not that she'd really expected to magically change his mind about it. Perhaps that was the real reason she'd asked to meet with him privately, she thought. Even a profoundly unhappy Spencer Hawk had been excluded from the meeting. He and Sergeant Clifford McGraw stood flanking the other side of the conference room door, and she'd sensed Grantville's surprise and apprehension when she left them there. On the other hand, he hadn't been as surprised as he might have been. Despite the example of the High Ridge government, a total idiot didn't normally become Prime Minister of Manticore, and Honor was officially back on Manticore for a final meeting at Admiralty House before launching Operation Sanskrit. A request by a fleet commander for a direct, unscheduled personal meeting with the Prime Minister under those circumstances was, to say the very least, unusual. Willie, she said after a moment, you and I have disagreed about the fundamental nature of the current Havenite regime from the beginning. That means we've both got mental baggage at this point, and I don't want to lock horns with you on this issue. First, because you're the Prime Minister, not me. Second, because I'm a serving officer, and Queen's officers take the orders of their civilian superiors. And third, frankly, because the fact that Hamish and I are married now puts me in an uncomfortable position when I'm arguing not simply with the Prime Minister, but with my brother-in-law. Despite that, I truly believe you need to reconsider the position of Her Majesty's government on this particular issue. Anton Zilwicky's in a far better position than anyone here in the Star Kingdom to know whether or not there was direct Havenite involvement in the attempt to kill his daughter. He still has contacts in the area which we've lost— He's intimately familiar with the situation on Torch itself, 
and he has a direct relationship with a fairly senior Havenite spy. You know this man's reputation, what he's already accomplished, and you know he's going to be highly suspicious of anyone who explains to him that they didn't have anything to do with the attempt to murder his daughter, so would he kindly not shoot them on sight? Or do I have to remind you what happened on Old Earth when his older daughter was kidnapped? Grantful made a face, not of disagreement so much as of painful memory. The manpower scandal had splattered on the previous prime minister, for whom Grantful had never had anything but contempt, but the fallout had still been extreme, and Anton Zilwicky could not have cared less. The entire government could have fallen, and he still wouldn't have cared, just as he hadn't cared if he himself ended up in prison for his actions. The father who'd orchestrated that particular exercise in mayhem was unlikely to take the events on torch lightly. No, you don't have to remind me, he said. For that matter, you don't have to remind me what happened to the mercenaries who tried to kill Catherine Montagna when they tangled with Zilwicky. I'll happily concede the man's competence and the fact that he's dangerous. I'll even concede that he has the ear of the Queen, or at least of her niece, where certain questions are concerned. But what you're asking me to believe now is that some hypothetical third party is responsible for what happened on Torch, and probably for murdering Jim Webster. For that matter, probably for trying to kill you, since the technique was so similar in all three cases. And whenever you ask me to believe that, I come back again and again to the question of who had the most motive, and for that matter, who has an established national track record of employing assassination as a routine technique. I realize that, Honor said patiently. But anyone with the proper resources can stage an assassination, and everyone has to know the Star Kingdoms had painful experience with previous Havenite regimes' use of assassination. So just what would you have done differently if you were a hypothetical third party and wanted us to automatically assume the Havenites were attempting to sabotage their own peace conference? Nothing, Grantville conceded after a moment. He leaned back in his chair, regarding Honor intently. On the other hand, Honor, I've known you a long time. There's more to this than just Zilwicky's unsupported word, isn't there? Honor returned his gaze, and he chuckled harshly. You've got much better at high-stakes politics, but you still have to work on maintaining your expression of total candor while you conceal your whole cards. There is more to it she admitted. I didn't bring it up because I was pretty sure it wouldn't do your blood pressure any good if I did. Are you sure you want to hear about what I've been up to? As my sister-in-law or as a queen's officer? He asked a bit warily. Either. Both, she said with a cricket smile. If it's that bad, you'd better go ahead and tell me, he said, bracing himself visibly. Anton Zilwicky didn't come to visit me by himself, she said. He brought a Mr. Cashat with him. Cashat, Grantville repeated. It was apparent the name was ringing bells, but that he hadn't quite put his mental hand on the memory. Victor Cashat? Honor said helpfully. As in the same Victor Cashat who engineered the entire torch gambit in the first place? A peep spy? If Grantville's expression had been incredulous before, it was dumbfounded now. You had a peep spy aboard your flagship? Not just any old spy. Honor couldn't help it. Despite the anger beginning to bubble under the shock in Grantville's mind glow, she felt a certain manic glee in the admission. As a matter of fact, he's now the Havenite chief of station for their entire erawan based intelligence net. The prime minister stared at her, then he shook himself. This isn't funny, he said coldly. It's entirely possible someone could make a case for treason out of what you've just admitted to me. How? she challenged. You had a known senior secret agent of a star nation with whom we're at war aboard your flagship in a restricted military area, and from what you're saying, I feel quite confident he's not still there in a cell, is he? No, he isn't, she said, meeting his cold anger with a hard eye. And just what information did you allow him to take away from this completely unauthorized meeting, Admiral? None he didn't bring with him. 
and you're prepared to prove that before a court-martial if necessary? No, Prime Minister, I'm not, she said in a voice of matching ice. If my word isn't sufficient for you, then file charges and be damned to you. Grantville's nostrils flared, but then he closed his eyes. His right hand clenched into a fist where it lay on the table before him, and Honor tasted the enormous effort he made to pull his icy fury back under control. Interesting, she thought. So Willie has the Alexander temper, too. Your word is good enough for me, he said finally, opening his eyes once more. But it may not be good enough for everyone if word of this meeting ever gets out. My God, Honor, what were you thinking of? I was thinking of the fact that a man who'd never met me was willing to come aboard my ship knowing exactly what could happen to him that he came with a suicide device in his pocket, which he was fully prepared to use, that, in fact, he expected to use it, and he came anyway. And that he told me the truth, Willie. You know I know that everything I just told you is true. His eyes narrowed, because he did know. You say he expected to use his suicide device? The Prime Minister said after a moment, and she nodded. Then I presume you also know, or think you do, why he was willing to come anyway? Because he's a patriot, Honor said simply. He's probably one of the most dangerous men I've ever met, and not just because of how competent he is either. But the bottom line is that he takes his beliefs and responsibilities seriously. He knows the attempt to kill Barry and Ruth didn't go through his operatives— nor did he pick up on any effort by someone in Nouveau Paris to do an end run around him. And now that I've met the man, I don't doubt for a moment that he has his entire area of responsibility so tightly wired he would have known if something like that had happened. So since he knows he didn't do it, and he's virtually certain no one else in the Havenite government did it, he has to assume whoever did do it did it for reasons inimical to the Republic of Haven's foreign policy and security. So he put his life on the line, in the full expectation that he was going to lose it, to tell us. Not because he loves us, but because he's trying to protect his own star nation. Because he believes his president is trying to stop a war, and someone else is trying to sabotage her effort. And you know, Grantville waved one hand, all of this is true? I know he wasn't lying to me, and that everything he told me was the complete truth in so far as he knows the truth. Of course, it's possible he's wrong. Even the best intelligence people screw up. But what he told me was the best information he had. I see. Grantville rocked his chair slightly back and forth, his brain working hard while he gazed at her. Have you discussed this with Hamish? He asked after a moment. No. Honor looked away. I wanted to, but as I said, the fact that I'm married to him puts me in a peculiar position. I chose not to involve him. You chose not to involve him because you didn't want anything to splash on him if this little meeting blew up in your face as spectacularly as it could have. That's what you mean, isn't it? Maybe, to some extent but also because it's almost impossible for our personal relationship not to have an impact on any conversation or debate we have. To be perfectly honest, she looked back at Grantville, I didn't want to take the chance he might agree with me simply because it was me saying it. But you were willing to take the chance with me? Grantville asked with a flicker of returning humor. I had no choice where you were concerned, she said with another crooked smile. It was talk to you or go direct to Elizabeth, and frankly, I'm not at all sure how she would have reacted. Poorly. Grantville's voice was bleak. I don't believe I've ever seen her this furious. Whether it was the peeps or someone who simply wanted us to believe it was, she's out for blood, and the hell of it, Honor, is that even if every single thing Kashat told you was the truth, so far as he knows, as you yourself said, I agree with her. Even if Haven had nothing to do with any of the assassinations and assassination attempts? She asked quietly. If I could be certain they hadn't, I might feel differently. But I can't be. 
All I can know for certain is that one man who ought to know is convinced they didn't. But he's got to have a huge vested interest, whether he realizes it or not, in believing the best about his own government. I'll accept that he has no evidence this was a peep operation, but if I recall my briefings on what happened in Erewhon and Congo accurately, his superiors might have had a very good reason to keep him out of the loop on something like this, considering who would probably have been among the victims. Am I wrong? No, she admitted. So what am I supposed to do, Honor? We're in the middle of a war, we've already announced we're resuming operations, the peeps have probably already resumed operations on the basis of our note, and the fact that Kashat didn't have anything to do with the attempt to kill Barry and Ruth doesn't prove someone else from Haven didn't. He shook his head slowly, his expression sad. I'd like to believe you're right. I want to believe you are, but I can't make my decisions, formulate the Star Kingdom's policy, based on what I'd like to believe. I believe you military people are familiar with the need to formulate plans based on the worst-case scenario. I'm in the same position. I can't dislocate our entire strategy on the basis of what Zilwicky and Kashat believe to be true. If they had one single scrap of hard evidence, that might not be so. But they don't, and it is. Honor tasted his honesty, and also the impossibility of changing his mind. I'm sorry to hear that, she said. I think they're right, at least about whether or not what's happened represents the official policy of the Pritchard administration. I realize that, Grantville said and looked into her eyes. And because I know you genuinely feel that way, I have to ask you, are you still prepared to carry out your orders? Admiral Alexander Harrington? She looked back, hovering on the brink of the unthinkable. If she said no, if she refused to carry out the operation and resigned her commission in protest, it would almost certainly blow the entire question wide open. The consequences for her personally, and for her husband and wife, would be severe, at least in the short term. Her relationship with Elizabeth might well be permanently and irreparably damaged. Her career, in Manticoran service at least, would probably be over. Yet all of that would be acceptable, a small price actually, if it ended the war. But it wouldn't. Grantville had put his finger squarely on the one insurmountable weakness, the lack of proof. All she had was the testimony of two men in private conversation. At best, anything she said about what they told her would be hearsay, and there was simply no way she could expect anyone outside her immediate circle to understand or believe why she knew they'd told her the truth. So the war would continue, whatever she did, and her own actions would have removed her from any opportunity of influencing its conduct or its outcome. That would be a violation of her responsibility to the men and women of Eighth Fleet, to her Star Kingdom. Wars weren't always fought for the right reasons, but they were fought anyway, and the consequences to the people fighting them and to their star nations were the same, whatever the reasons. And she was a queen's officer. She'd taken an oath to stand between the Star Kingdom and its enemies, why ever they were enemies. If the Star Kingdom she loved was going back into a battle in which so many others who'd taken that oath would die, she couldn't simply abandon them and stand aside— no, she had no choice but to stand beside them and face the same tempest. Yes, she said quietly, her voice sad but without hesitation or reservation. I'm prepared to execute my orders, Willie. Chapter 57 What's the latest on our visitors? Admiral Alessandro Giovanni asked. Pretty much unchanged, ma'am, Commander Ewan McNaughton replied. Their starships are still stooging around outside the hyperlimit, but their platforms are dancing all over the damn place and making sure we know it. He grimaced and waved one hand at the huge display showing the Lovett system's inner planets and the space about them. The system's G6 primary floated at the display's center, orbited by the innermost cinder, which had never attained the dignity of an actual name, aside from Lovett One, and then the planets Furnace, Forge, and Anvil. 
At seven light minutes from the primary, Forge, the system's only habitable world, would have enjoyed a pleasant climate if not for its pronounced axial tilt. Although, to be fair, if you liked severe seasonal weather changes, which McNaughton didn't, Forge was still a lovely world. It was also heavily industrialized. The Lovett system had originally been settled by the Amet Corporation, one of the huge industrial concerns which had helped build the original Republic of Haven's enormous wealth and power, only to go the way of the dinosaur under the People's Republic. The current system governor, however, Havard Ellefson, was a direct descendant of the Amet Corporation's founder, and Lovett had somehow avoided the worst consequences of the PRH's efforts to kill every golden goose it could lay hands on. Despite the fact that it was less than fifty light years from the Haven system, Lovett had remained one of the unquestioned bright spots of the People's Republic's generally blighted economy, and the system's industrial concerns had played a major role in the Republic's industrial renaissance since the economic reforms Robespierre had forced through and the restoration of the Constitution. Among other things, Forge's current population of almost three billion was deeply involved in the enormous naval construction programs Thomas Theismann had initiated after going public about the existence of the Republican Navy's new ship types. To be sure, the Lovett system wasn't one of the primary yard sites. Its local industry was much more heavily committed to the construction of light units, light attack craft, and the new light cruiser classes, and fleet support vessels. Ammunition ships, personnel transports, general cargo haulers, and repair ships. Despite that, it was among the Republic's twenty or so most important star systems, and its system defenses reflected that importance. Just over eight thousand lacs were based on Forge and the system's orbital platforms. A permanent covering force of three battle squadrons, admittedly of pre-pod types, but still a total of twenty-four super dreadnoughts, was assigned. And the system was liberally blanketed with system defense missile pods. In the last six months, Lovett had also received not just one Moriarty platform, but three. The second pair to serve solely as backups for the first. And McNaughton thought, "There's also the defenses I can't see." All of which explained why Commander McNaughton was as confident as his admiral that no Manti raiding force was going to stick its nose into Lovett. We've got their arrays in several quadrants of the inner system," he continued, indicating the wavering icons representing the ghost-like sensor traces, which were the best his platforms could do against current generation Manticoran stealth technology. They've been buzzing around for over sixty hours now, and we've still got hyper footprints jumping in and out all around the periphery. It's starting to get on my nerves, ma'am. Which is exactly what it's supposed to do," Giovanni pointed out. I know that, ma'am, and so do our lack crews, but that doesn't keep it from being irritating. And Commander Lucas reports that Moriarty's gold crew is beginning to suffer from fatigue. I told the Octagon we needed more personnel. Giovanni growled. Unfortunately, we don't really have them yet. Not for Moriarty, or rather, we could have complete backup crews if we were willing to do without backup platforms. McNaughton nodded. Admiral Foraker and her bolt hole command continued to work miracles in their training programs, but the Navy's enormous expansion was taking its toll. Despite the steadily climbing educational levels of the Republic, the Navy still had to spend far more time than the Mantis did providing its recruits with the basic education needed to perform their jobs. Fortunately, Foraker had gotten very, very good at doing just that. Unfortunately, it still put a bottleneck into the availability of fully trained manpower. Shall I instruct Lucas to stand the gold platform down and bring up silver or bronze? Hmm. Giovanni ran a hand over her dark hair, eyes thoughtful, then shrugged. Go ahead and shift to silver. I doubt we're really going to need them, but it won't hurt for silver to get a little more hands-on experience anyway. Yes, ma'am. I'll get on it right away. And the rest of McNaughton's sentence was slashed off by the sudden jangle of alarms as a massive hyper footprint exploded onto the plot. Well done, Theo," Honor Alexander Harrington said. Lieutenant Commander Kagari had dropped TF eighty one, Eighth Fleet's leading task force, into normal space barely forty thousand kilometers outside the Lovett system's hyperlimit. 
That was extraordinarily precise astrogation, and Kigari smiled in appreciation of the well-deserved praise. Honor smiled back, but her true attention was focused on the huge flag bridge tactical display. She watched alertly, waiting for CIC to post any major changes, but the only differences from Skirmisher's last upload were insignificant. Not that it's going to stay that way if we've got things figured right, she reminded herself. All right, she said. Harper, pass the execute command. Aye, aye, your grace, Lieutenant Brantley acknowledged, and the eight sea lakhs of Alice Truman's reinforced carrier squadron launched almost 900 lakhs as Alistair McKeon's Batron 61 headed in system, screened by 15 Manticoran and Grayson BCPs and HMS Nike under the overall command of Rear Admiral Erasmus Miller. Michelle Hankey would have had the command, except that the terms of her parole precluded her from serving against the Republic. So she'd been sent to Talbot, where Honor knew she would prove enormously useful, and Michael Overstegen, promoted to Rear Admiral, had been given her squadron. But much as Honor approved of Overstegen's demonstrated capability, he was junior to Miller. And the Grayson Rear Admiral was more than merely competent in his own right, she reminded herself. Winston Bradshaw and Sharice Fanafi's twelve heavy cruisers, eight of them Saganami C-class ships, backed Miller up, and six light cruisers under the command of Commodore George Ullman, who'd replaced Commodore Moreau when she died aboard HMS Buckler at Solon, thickened the screen. It was a powerful force by any measure, although Honor was fully aware that it was grossly outnumbered and outgunned by the system's defenders. Just as it was supposed to be. Admiral Truman reports all lock wings away, Your Grace, Andrea Jarowalski announced. Very good. Instruct her to hype her out to the Alpha Rendezvous. Aye, aye, Your Grace. Honor watched the carrier's icons disappear, then settled herself into her command chair, a skin suited Nimitz in her lap, and watched her thirty starships accelerate steadily in system. Do you think this is another Suarez, ma'am? McNaughton asked tensely as he watched the oncoming icons move steadily across the plot. I don't know. Giovanni's own eyes were slitted in concentration, and he noticed she was wrapping a single lock of hair around her right index finger. It was a mannerism he'd grown accustomed to over the last three T years, and he waited respectfully. No, she said after several moments of consideration. I don't know why, but I don't think so. These people are really here. It seems awfully gutsy of them, McNaughton said, and she shrugged. And not especially bright after Solon. I'm inclined to agree. On the other hand, maybe they think they can get deep enough in to do significant damage and still avoid interception. This is the strongest raiding force they've sent in yet— Assuming the outer platform's analysis is correct, it's possible they figure they've got the firepower to fight their way out past the sort of interception Admiral Giscard managed at Solon. If they do, they're wrong, ma'am, McNaughton said. We think they are, Ewan, Giovanni corrected. Although, if they've got the sense God gave a legislaturalist, at least they'll stay out of our inner system missile envelope. Honor glanced at the date-time display and smiled sadly. If Illescu was on schedule, her daughter would be born in almost exactly eight minutes. Catherine Allison Miranda Alexander Harrington. She sampled the name silently, wishing with all her heart that she was there, watching the miracle of life, tasting her daughter's newborn mind glow, and not here, orchestrating the deaths of thousands. She inhaled deeply and sent a thought winging across the light years. Happy birthday, baby. I hope God lets me watch you grow up and that you never have to do something like this. Coming up on Point Sama in five minutes, Your Grace, Jarowalski said. Thank you, Andrea. Honor looked up and checked the time display. Her units had been accelerating towards rendezvous with Forge for 35 minutes at a steady 4.81 kps squared from their relatively low initial velocity. They were up to 11,750 kps, and they traveled just over 14 million kilometers. 
They were still 74 minutes from turnover for a 0-0 intercept, but the one thing she felt absolutely confident of was that none of the defenders expected her to be making any 0-0 rendezvous with Forge. Of course, they might be wrong, she thought coldly. She returned her attention to the tactical plot. The old-style super dreadnoughts, which Jarowalski had designated Bogey 1, were holding their positions in system close to Forge, but the forward sensor drones showed that their impeller wedges were up and their sidewalls were active. The massive lack force their scouts had reported was also clearly in evidence. Whoever the system commander here in Lovett was, she didn't appear to have opted for the sort of deceptiveness Admiral Belfi had displayed at Chantilly. But appearances can be deceiving, Anna reminded herself with a slight smile. I hope they are anyway. I'd hate to have wasted all this preparation if this is really all they've got. She pursed her lips slightly, looking down at the smaller repeater plot deployed from the side of her command chair. Unlike the main plot, it was configured to show the entire system, and her gaze rested on the green sphere which represented the Lovett hyperlimit. Any time now, Your Grace, if we've got it figured right at least. She looked up. Mercedes Brigham stood beside her command chair, looking down at the same repeater, and Honor nodded. If it were me, I'd figure I had the patsies right about where I wanted them, she agreed. And by now, their recon platforms have to have gotten a good enough look at us to be sure we're not just drones. Brigham nodded back, and the two of them watched the plot, waiting. Admiral, they're seventy minutes from turnover. Very good, Ewan. Send the execute to Tarantula. Hyperfootprint. We have major hyperfootprints directly astern and at system north and system south, Andrea Jarowalski reported. Designate these forces Bogey 2, Bogey 3, and Bogey 4. They're accelerating in system at 5.08 kps squared. Very well, Honor said calmly. She leaned back in her command chair and crossed her legs, stroking the plushy fur between Nimitz's ears. Admiral, Admiral Giovanni's platforms confirm that one of the super dreadnoughts matches the emission signature of the ship that got away at Solon, Marius Gozi said. So, Javier Giscard said softly, the salamander is back. He shook his head with more than a trace of sadness. Eloise had tried to hide her despair in her last letter to him, but he knew her too well. When Elizabeth Winton had accepted her offer of the summit, it had been like watching the sun come out. And when whatever the hell had happened on Old Earth and Torch crushed any prospect of a negotiated settlement, it had been like watching a late blizzard bury the frozen blossoms of a murdered spring. He supposed he couldn't really blame the Mantis for leaping to the conclusion that the Republic was behind what had happened— it didn't make sense in a lot of ways, yet people and star nations all too often did things that didn't make sense. But however well he might understand their reasoning, he still had to cope with the consequences of their actions. And so do they, he thought grimly, watching that outnumbered force go to military power. Not that it was going to do it a great deal of good. Its six super dreadnoughts were thoroughly outgunned by the sixteen STPs and four Silax in each of his three intercepting forces. The inner system's missile pods were far more numerous than they'd been at Solon, and he'd been able to plot his own translations much more closely. Unlike Solon, these mantis would be unable to avoid entering the effective missile envelope of at least one of his intercepting forces. Open fire, sir? Selma Thackeray asked but Giscard shook his head. Harrington showed us at Solon what she could do to long-range missile fire, he told the ops officer, and she's got a lot more defensive platforms than she had then. No, we'll just follow along. We're the beaters, Moriarty is the hunter. Once Giovanni chews them up, we'll worry about cleaning up the remnants. Yes, sir, Thackeray acknowledged, and Giscard returned his attention to the plot. They shouldn't have sent you out with so few ships, Your Grace, he told the light code of HMS Imperator. All right, Andrea, Honor said, glancing at the time display once more. 
Twelve minutes had passed since the Havenite ambush force had translated in behind her. Execute Ozawa. Aye, aye, your grace, Jirawalski said, her voice sparkling with excitement, and tapped a single command into her console. There's the execute signal, ma'am, Lieutenant Harcourt announced. Understood, Commander Estwick replied and looked at her astrogator. Take us out, Jerome. Aye, aye, skipper. Lieutenant Weissmuller acknowledged, and HMS Ambuscade popped back up into hyperspace. Weissmuller had plotted his translation with care, and he'd had plenty of time to position his ship perfectly in normal space before executing it. Ambuscade arrived precisely where she was supposed to be, and her plot suddenly blossomed with the light codes of capital ships. Communications? Pass the word to Admiral Yanukov, Estwick said. Hyper footprint. Javier Giscard's head snapped up at the unanticipated announcement. Commander Thackeray was bent over her console, fingers flying as she massaged the contact, and then she looked up, her face taut. Admiral, we've got 18 super dreadnoughts, or SILACs, well outside the hyper limit, directly astern of us. Range 53.9 million kilometers, velocity relative to love at 2.501 thousand kps, they... She broke off for just a moment, looking back down at her plot, then cleared her throat. Update, sir. It's 12 SDPs and 6 carriers. The carriers just launched full lack compliments. Giscard nodded and hoped he looked calmer than he felt. So she did set up her own mousetrap, by God, he thought. I wondered if she would, after what we did to her at Sullen and it looks like they've reinforced their Eighth Fleet more heavily than Navin predicted. He frowned down at the plot, his mind busy. The twelve super dreadnoughts behind him probably had the edge in total combat power, despite his numerical advantage, and the lax they were deploying would be more effective in the missile defense role. But they didn't have a big enough advantage, and their astrogation had been off. He was about to get hurt, but it was unlikely that they could have destroyed any of his wallers before he ran out of their effective range, even if their astrogation had been perfect, and it hadn't been. They had him trapped deep enough inside the hyperlimit that he couldn't avoid action, but they'd made their own alpha translation 2.8 light minutes outside the limit. At that range, even Manti-MDM accuracy was going to be significantly degraded, and he was too far ahead of them, with too great an advantage in base velocity for them to overtake him. And Harrington was still in front of him, driving steadily deeper into the waiting defensive missiles. Start rolling pods, Selma, he told his ops officer. Fire plan Gamma. The Outer System FTL platforms reported the arrival of Admiral Yanikov's Task Force 82 to Alessandro Giovanni almost as quickly as Selma Thackeray reported it to Javier Giscard. Despite a brief, instinctive panic reaction, Giovanni quickly reached the same conclusion Giscard had, and her smile was much more unpleasant than his expression had been. So, the great salamander can fuck up just like the rest of us mere mortals, she thought. Pity about that. Range from Forge? she asked. Still one one point two light minutes, ma'am, McNaughton replied. Roughly another thirty six minutes to missile range for Moriarty. Thank you, she said, and turned back to the outer system plot as the multi drive missiles began to launch. The range was almost 54 million kilometers, and Bogey 2 was running away from TF-82 at a relative velocity of more than 4,000 kps. Missile flight time was over 8 minutes, and as Giscard had demonstrated at Solon, even Manticran accuracy at that range was going to be poor, except... Sir, there's something odd about the Mantis launch, Thackeray said. What do you mean, odd? Giscard asked sharply. The attack birds are coming in... Well, clumped is the only word I can think of for it, sir. They aren't spreading out in a proper dispersion pattern. What? Giscard punched a command into his own repeater plot and frowned. Thackeray was right. His own outgoing missiles were spreading out, distancing themselves from one another to reduce wedge interference with their telemetry links to the ships which had launched them. Everyone's missiles did that, 
but the Mantis missiles weren't. Query CIC, he told Thackeray. I want an analysis of this pattern. There's got to be some reason for it. CIC's already on it, sir. So far, they don't have any explanation. Giscard grunted in acknowledgement. Actually, he realized, the attack missiles were spreading out, just not the way they should have. They were coming in in discrete clusters, spread across an attack front which would bring them all in simultaneously in the end, but making the trip in relatively tight groups of about eight or ten missiles each. No, he thought, as a preliminary analysis from the Combat Information Center came up as a sidebar to his plot. They are coming in in clusters of exactly eight missiles each, which is stupid since they have twelve missiles in each pod. It was called Apollo, after the Archer of the Gods. It hadn't been easy for the R&D types to perfect. Even for Mantikoran technology, designing the components had required previously impossible levels of miniaturization, and Bueps had encountered more difficulties than anticipated in putting the system into production. This was its first test in actual combat, and the crews which had launched the MDMs watched with bated breath to see how well it performed. Javier Giscard was wrong. There weren't twelve missiles in an Apollo pod, there were nine. Eight relatively standard attack missiles, or EW platforms, and the Apollo missile, much larger than the others, and equipped with a downsized, short-range, two-way FTL communications link developed from the one deployed in the still larger Ghost Rider reconnaissance drones. It was a remote control node, following along behind the other eight missiles from the same pod, without any warhead or electronic warfare capability of its own. The impeller wedges of the other missiles hid it and its pulse transmissions from the sensors of Giscard's ships and from his counter-missiles. But its position allowed it to monitor the standard telemetry links from the other missiles of its pod. And it also carried a far more capable AI than any standard attack missile, one capable of processing the data from all of the other missiles' tracking and homing systems and sending the result back to its mother ship via grav pulse. The ships which had launched them had deployed the equally new Keyhole 2 platforms, equipped not with standard light speed links for their offensive missiles, but with grav pulse links. Virtually every Mantikoran or Grayson ship which could currently deploy Keyhole 2 was in Eighth Fleet's order of battle, and Honor Alexander Harrington had taken ruthless advantage of the capability when she formulated her attack plans. The Graf Pulse transmissions were faster than light, although they weren't instantaneous. Actual transmission speed was only about 64 times the speed of light, but that was enormously better than anyone had ever been able to do before. The updated sensor information from the onrushing missiles crossed the distance to the tactical sections and massively capable computers of the super dreadnoughts which had launched them, and at this range, the transmission lag was less than three seconds. For all practical purposes, they might as well have made the trip instantaneously, as did the corrections those tactical sections sent back. In effect, Apollo gave the Royal Manticoran Navy effectively real-time correction ability at any attainable powered missile range. Javier Giscard's tactical officers didn't realize at first what they faced. In fact, most of them never did realize. The Manti missiles ignored their decoys almost contemptuously, and those peculiar clumps of MDMs maneuvered with a precision no missile defense officer had ever seen before. It was almost as if each clump were a single missile, one which bored in through the defensive shield of the task group's electronic warfare as if it didn't exist. Counter-missiles began to fire, and something else very peculiar happened. The EW platform seated throughout the Mantikoran salvo didn't come up simultaneously or in groups the way they ought to have. Instead, they came up individually, singly, almost as if they could actually see the counter-missiles and adjust their own sequences— Dragon's teeth activated at precisely the right moment to draw the maximum number of counter-missiles into attacking the false targets. Dazzlers blasted the onboard sensors of other counter-missiles, just as the attack missiles behind them arced upward or dove downward to drive straight through the gap the Dazzlers had burned in the defensive envelope. Not all the defensive missiles could be blinded or evaded, of course. There were simply too many of them. But their effectiveness was slashed. The twelve super dreadnoughts of Task Force 82 had rolled quadruple patterns before they launched. 
288 Apollo pods had launched 1,900 attack missiles and 400 EW platforms, along with 288 control missiles. Javier Giscard's countermissiles stopped only 300 of the attack birds. His desperate point defense clusters, in the single volley each of them got, killed another 400. 1,200 got through. Damage alarms screamed on Sovereign of Space's command deck and flag bridge. The huge ship shuddered and bucked as not one or two, but scores of Manticoran missiles ripped straight through the heart of the task group's missile defenses. Armor splintered, atmosphere spewed into space, weapons mounts and point defense clusters were blasted into shattered wreckage, and the drum roll of destruction went on and on and on. All of Judah Yanikov's fire had been concentrated on only two ships— Partly, that was because no one had really known how effective Apollo would prove against live opposition, and partly it had been because super-dreadnoughts were simply so inconceivably tough. Killing targets that rugged was hard, and Honor and Yanikov had been determined to do as much damage with the first salvo before the enemy had any chance to adjust to the new threat as they could. They did. Javier Giscard clung to the arms of his command chair, surrounded by the frantic combat chatter of his task group, listening to the shrilling alarms, the desperate reports of damage control parties fighting the tidal wave of damage. His link to Damage Control Central lacked the detail of Captain Royman's displays, but huge swaths of crimson damage blasted their way across the ship's schematic as he watched. And then there was one brief, terrible flash as something ripped into the far end of the flag bridge. His head whipped up, and he just had time to see Selma Thackeray and her tactical party torn apart by the blast front screaming towards him, just long enough for his brain to begin to realize what was happening. Hello, he began, his voice soft in the hurricane of alarms and devastation. He never finished her name. Jesus Christ, Ewan McNaughton whispered, his face white. The first Manticoran missile salvo had killed two of Admiral Giscard's super-dreadnoughts outright, including Sovereign of Space. The second salvo, rumbling in on the first launch's heels 48 seconds later, killed two more, and the one after that, two more. It took a total of 11 salvos, less than eight minutes fire, to kill every super-dreadnought in Bogey 2. How the hell did they do that? McNaughton didn't even realize he'd asked the question aloud, but Admiral Giovanni answered it anyway. I don't know, she said, her voice ugly, but it's not going to help their lead ships in another 25 minutes. CIC estimates another 20 minutes until we hit the envelope for their inner system pods, Your Grace, Mercedes Brigham said quietly, and Honor nodded. Imperator's flag bridge was oddly silent. Far astern of them, Judah Yanikov's missile batteries had just finished off the helpless Sealax of Bogey Two. He wasn't wasting any of his fire on the orphan Lax. Instead, he'd recovered his own Lax and translated back out, and Honor watched her display, waiting. Then Task Force 82 translated back into normal space yet again, this time much closer to the limit and directly behind Bogey Three. Admiral Yanikov is launching against Bogey Three, Your Grace. Jirawalski reported, and Honor nodded. Too bad he won't have time to catch Bogey 4 before it gets too far in system for him to range on as well, Your Grace, Brigham said. I'd love to make a clean sweep. Honor glanced at her, remembering what had happened to her own command at Solon. Part of her agreed entirely with Brigham, and not just because of the professional naval officer in her, but the taste of revenge had a bitter tang, and she looked back at the plot. We'll just have to settle for what we can get, she said calmly. And it's about time to see how vulnerable Balder really is. Andrea? She looked back up at Jarowalski. Yes, Your Grace? Activate the mistletoe platforms. What the? Commander McNaughton stiffened in consternation. Admiral Giovanni, we've got... Giovanni was still turning towards her display when the explosions began. The Havenite tracking crews had become accustomed to the fact that they simply couldn't localize and destroy the highly stealthy Manticoran reconnaissance platforms used to scout their star systems. It was galling, but true. 
And so, aside from a certain deep-seated irritation, they'd actually paid relatively little attention to the long-endurance Ghost Rider reconnaissance drones the Manticorans had distributed throughout the inner system of Lovett, which was unfortunate. Sonia Hempel had personally chosen the name Mistletoe in honor of the dart which had killed the god Balder in Norse mythology, and the name proved apt. Where the hell are they coming from? Giovanni demanded. I don't know, ma'am, McNaughton replied, his voice as anguished as his expression as the Manticoran laser heads ripped into the Moriarty platforms. Not just one of the platforms, all three of them. The stealth and dispersion which were supposed to have protected them obviously hadn't, he thought, and closed his eyes for a moment as the relentless avalanche of fire blew them apart. Alessandra Giovanni's face was white with shock. With the Moriarty platforms gone, she had nothing that could control missile salvos of the size needed to batter down Manticoran missile defenses, and given what the Mantis had already done to Admiral Giscard's forces, it was painfully obvious her own anti-missile defenses were going to be, at best, marginally effective. The recon platforms, McNaughton said suddenly. The bastards put laser heads on their goddamned recon platforms. Giovanni blinked, then shook her head and looked sharply at McNaughton. He was right, she realized. It was the only explanation. But how did they find Moriarty? she demanded. Unless... Unless what, ma'am? McNaughton asked when she broke off suddenly. Suarez, she said sharply. That's what Suarez was all about. They figured out what happened to them at Solon, and they used their EW drones to trick us into activating the Moriarty net at Suarez after they'd already planted their recon platforms deep enough in system to see them. They had complete, detailed fingerprints on what they were looking for. And then they mixed in armed recon drones to kill them after they found them, McNaughton said through clenched teeth. That's exactly what they did. Giovanni agreed harshly. Damn! They can't have the acceleration to be very effective against moving targets at any sort of range, but against fixed targets, especially when the attack birds know exactly what to look for. Commander McNaughton? A rating called, and McNaughton whipped back to his own displays. His shoulders went absolutely rigid for a moment, then slumped, and he looked back at Giovanni. Not just Moriarty, ma'am, he grated. It looks like we're going to have to start deploying the system defense pods further apart. They just took out three-quarters of the beta echelon and almost that many of the delta birds. How? Giovanni asked flatly. More of their damned recon platforms. It had to be. They got old-fashioned nukes. The yields are somewhere in the 500 megaton range, close enough to the pods to take them out with proximity explosions. Giovanni nodded silently. Of course, if you could put laser heads on the things, then why not regular nukes? Not that they'd really had to. Given the accuracy they'd just shown against Giscard, they could take the pods out with proximity-armed MDM launches from beyond any range at which she could possibly expect to score hits in return. Admiral Giovanni? A shaken communications officer said. Admiral Trask is asking for you. Alessandra Giovanni glanced once more at the plot where the heart and mind of her defenses had just been annihilated, then drew a deep breath. Of course Trask wanted to speak to her. His obsolescent super dreadnoughts were going to be little more than targets for Harrington's SDPs, and Giovanni wasn't optimistic about her lax chance to get through Harrington's defensive fire and damned katanas without the support of massed attacks from the system defense missile pods, which meant that if she committed Admiral Wentworth Trask's ships, he and all of his people were going to die. According to the standard recon platforms, we just took out all three of their control stations, Your Grace, Jarawalski announced jubilantly. Very good, Andrea. In that case, we'll proceed with the Alpha Plan. Let's whittle their deployed pods down as far as we can before we enter their envelope. Aye, aye, Your Grace. Honor nodded and turned back to her plot, hoping that whoever was in command over there would realize how helpless her defensive starships were and surrender before she had to kill them all. Chapter 58 How bad is it? 
Eloise Pritchard asked flatly. Thomas Theisman looked at her for a moment before he replied. She looked broken, he thought. Not in spirit, not in her determination to meet her responsibilities, but if those remained intact, something else deep inside was a bleeding wound, and his own heart ached in sympathy. She wasn't just his president, she was his friend, just as Javier had been, and Javier's death, after all he and she had been through, all they'd faced and survived under the Committee of Public Safety was a bitter, bitter blow. She returned his gaze across her desk, her eyes as flat and lifeless as her voice, and he knew she knew what he was thinking. But she said nothing more. She simply waited, motionless. It's very bad, he said finally. Love it and all the locks, support ships, and munitions we were building there are simply gone. Harrington took them all out. Not to mention destroying 32 podnaughts, four silax, and all 24 of Admiral Trask's older super dreadnoughts, and something like 10,000 lakhs. I can't even begin to compute the straight economic cost. Rachel's people are still in a state of shock just looking at the preliminary numbers, but I think you can safely assume that they just at least doubled the total economic and industrial cost of all their previous raids combined. He shook his head. Compared to this, what we did to Zanzibar was a love tap. Pritchard's face had tightened with fresh pain as the litany of destruction rolled out. Fortunately, the loss of life was much lower than it might have been, Theismann continued. Admiral Giovanni had the sense to order Trask to stand down his super dreadnoughts when Harrington started punching out her system defense missile pods with proximity warheads. He scuttled them himself to prevent their capture, but all of his people got off alive first. We lost more of the lack crews. They had to at least try, and no one can fault Giovanni for thinking there ought to have been enough of them to let them swarm Harrington's lead task force, except that every single one of the lacks covering that task force was a katana. Combined with their new counter-missiles and whatever they used on our wallers, they massacred our cemeteries, even the new alpha birds. How did they do it? she asked in that same flat, terrible voice. We're still evaluating the preliminary reports. From what we've seen so far, it looks like they used two new weapons on us. What makes it hurt worse is that both their new systems appear to be absolutely logical progressions from their damned Ghost Rider technology, and we never even saw them coming. We should have realized that sooner or later they were going to strap weapons onto their recon drones, They've demonstrated they can operate them deep inside our defended areas with virtual impunity, and they probably took a certain pleasure from applying a variant of the same technique saint Just used to destroy Elizabeth's yacht in Yeltsin. The bad news is how close they can get them. The good news, such as it is, is that even so, they can't get them all the way into attack range in stealth. They still have to get into range to execute their attacks, and not even Manti stealth systems can hide them during the last hundred thousand kilometers or so of their runs. They don't have the sort of acceleration rates missiles do either, and to be used properly, they have to attack virtually from rest, or else they can't loiter until the proper moment. So they have relatively low closing velocities when they come in, and they can be engaged by counter-missiles and standard point defense now that we know they're out there. Our intercept probabilities won't be good, especially given how little warning we'll have between the moment their drives peak and the moment they reach attack range, but we can probably cope with the threat. He paused for a moment, then shrugged. Actually, this part of it's largely my own personal fault, he said unflinchingly. Shannon warned me from the beginning that the Moriarty platform stealth wouldn't be good enough to hide them if the Montes figured out what they should be looking for. She wanted to build them into purpose-built super-dreadnoughts, or at least add them as strap-on components to larger, more heavily defended platforms. I overruled her because of the need to get Moriarty into service as quickly as possible. I shouldn't have. She was right. So were you. We did, do need them. You didn't see some sort of invisible attack coming, but neither did anyone else. Don't second-guess yourself on this one. 
Theismann bobbed his head, but he knew that was one presidential directive he wasn't going to be able to obey. The other new weapon they deployed is actually much more frightening, he continued. The accuracy it demonstrated is bad enough, but what it did to our EW capabilities and countermissiles may even have been worse. I'm trying very hard to remember we're looking at preliminary reports, but I'll be frank, Eloise, it's hard not to panic over this one. I've talked it over with Linda Trini and Victor Lewis. Obviously, we haven't been able to get Shannon's input yet, but I'll be surprised if she reaches any different conclusions on the basis of the data we have so far. They've obviously incorporated an FTL link into their missile telemetry. I'm guessing it has to be an entirely separate, dedicated platform, a roughly missile-sized bird they've managed to squeeze the graph pulse com into that serves as an advanced data processing node. Nobody ever considered doing anything like that before, because there really wasn't any point. Light speed limitations were light speed limitations, and using this sort of approach must tie all the missiles the command platform is controlling into a fairly tightly bunched cluster. That should make them more vulnerable to interception, and before the FTL com came along, any control platform would have been just as far from home and just as sluggish responding to telemetry commands as any other missile. But what they've done gives their missiles the next best thing to real-time command control input from their shipboard tack sections, Eloise. You aren't a professional naval officer, so you may not realize just what a huge advantage that is. Even with conventional single-drive missiles, there's always been a light-speed telemetry lag, which makes it impossible to exert effective shipboard control at extended missile ranges, or to get improved targeting data back from one set of your attack bird sensors and use it to update the targeting of another set. But apparently that isn't true for the Mantis anymore. They don't have to pre-program evasion maneuvers into their missiles, don't have to launch with a locked-in attack profile or even pre-packaged EW profiles. They can use their shipboard computational ability to analyze counter-missile patterns, electronic warfare emissions, and then they can make changes on the fly, adjust everything as they get steadily closer, get steadily better data on the defenses they have to penetrate. They can command their electronic warfare missiles to activate at precisely the most effective moment, decided by the capabilities of a super-dreadnought's tactical computers, not just what can be squeezed into a missile body. And, on top of that, they can direct the flight of their attack missiles to take the greatest possible advantage of the holes their EW opens up. In short, their accuracy is going to be enormously greater than ours in any maximum-range engagement, and their missile's ability to penetrate our defenses is going to be much higher as well. So they're going to get through with more laser heads, and those laser heads are going to be much more accurate when they arrive. So our numerical superiority just evaporated, Pritchard said grimly. Not necessarily, Geisman said, and for the first time since he'd entered her office, emotion flickered in her topaz eyes. It was incredulity. You just said they can kill our ships, like they did Javier's, at ranges where we can't even hurt them, she said curtly. Yes, they can, with at least some of their ships. What do you mean? She cocked her head, eyes suddenly intent, and Theismann shrugged. Eloise, this is a new weapon just deployed. Obviously, it's possible they've refitted with it across the board. I don't think they have, though. Why not? Eighth Fleet's been their first team ever since they activated it. It's got their most modern ships, and what I believe is their best fleet commander. It's also been their primary offensive weapon. But Eighth Fleet obviously didn't have this capability at Solon five and a half months ago. If they'd had it, they sure as hell would have used it when Javier blindsided them. For that matter, if they'd had it in general deployment two and a half months ago, when Elizabeth accepted your invitation to a summit, she probably wouldn't have accepted in the first place. You know how she feels about us, and why. Do you really think she would have agreed to sit down to negotiate if she'd had this broadly deployed and ready to go? He snorted in harsh, bitter derision. No, if this had been available to Elizabeth Winton on that sort of scale, she would have told us to pound sand, 
and then she would have gone onto the offensive, taken back every single thing we took away from them in Thunderbolt, and carried straight on through to Punch-Out Haven and occupy Nouveau Paris the way they should have at the end of the last war. Maybe she only accepted in the first place to buy time while they got it deployed, Pritchard countered. Possibly, Theisman conceded. In fact, that's probably effectively what happened, at least on a small scale. But look at what they did with their new weapon. They swooped down on Lovett, which, admittedly, was a far more important target than anything they'd hit before. They came in, they mousetrapped and massacred the real defensive force when it came out of hyper. A part of his mind cursed himself for his choice of verb as fresh pain flashed through her eyes, but he continued steadily. Then headed in system wiped out the locks and a batch of obsolete wallers, and wrecked the star system's industrial base, right? Yes, she said, her voice once again curt. Then why do it to love it? He asked simply. If they had enough ships capable of deploying and using this weapon, why not go directly for Haven? Hit us with their own version of Beatrice. Trust me, Eloise, Caporelli, Whitehaven, and Harrington are at least as good as strategists as anyone on our side, and if we had a weapon like this available in decisive quantities, or if we had any prospect of having it available in those quantities in the immediate future, we would never tell the other side we had it by taking out a secondary target, however attractive it might be. We'd save it, keep it completely under wraps, until we could use it in a single offensive which would end the war— Think about it. That's exactly what they did last time around in Operation Buttercup. Sat on their new ships and weapons until they were ready, then hammered us into scrap. So you're saying what they did at Lovett indicates they don't have it broadly deployed? I think that's exactly what it indicates. I think they showed it to us early because they know as well as we do what the tonnage numbers look like right now, and they're really sweating the possible Solarian threat. They're not just still trying to force us to redeploy, to fritter away our strength. They probably won't mind if they can convince us to waste time doing that while they carry out their refits, or iron out the production bottlenecks, or whatever it is they need to do to get this thing deployed throughout their wall of battle. But they'd really prefer for us to think they already have. They want this war over before the Sollies horn in, and they're hoping we'll decide we're screwed and throw in the towel— and when they do get it deployed, we will be screwed. Make no mistake about that. So what are you suggesting, Tom? I'm saying we have three options. First, get them to agree to talk to us again and settle this thing without anyone else getting hurt on either side. Second, surrender before they get their new weapon fully into service and slaughter thousands more of our personnel the way they did in Buttercup, the way they did to Javier at Lovett. Third, go ahead and hit them with the Bravo variant of Beatrice before they can get it into full deployment. My God, Tom, you can't be serious. Eloise, we're out of other options and we're out of time. He shook his head. You know how I felt about this war from the beginning. I want the first option. I want to talk to them, to tell them about Arnold, to settle this thing across a conference table, not with broadsides and gutted star systems but they've rejected that option. I know why we think they did it. I know somebody's manipulating what's going on, but if they won't even talk to us, we can't tell them that. So it's either surrender or go for outright victory. And which of those two options would you prefer? She asked softly. In a lot of ways, he admitted, I'd almost prefer surrender. I've been fighting the Manticrans for a long time now, Eloise. Hell, I started fighting them in Yeltsin before the first war ever began. My emotions where they're concerned are probably as tangled up and knotted as those of anyone else in the Republic, but I'm tired of seeing men and women under my command, men and women who follow my orders because they trust me, killed, especially when they're being killed because of a stupid fucking misunderstanding." But I'm an admiral. You're the politician. Is a surrender to them possible? I don't know. She inhaled deeply, her eyes glistening with unshed tears. I just don't know. 
I could carry the cabinet with me, but I don't see how I could possibly carry the Senate, even if I told them everything we suspect about Arnold at this point, and I don't have the power as president to declare war or conclude peace or surrender without the advice and consent of the Senate. God only knows what would happen if I tried. Our legal system and chains of authority are still so new they might shatter outright if I ordered a surrender and Congress repudiated my orders. Everything we've worked for could collapse. Even your navy could come apart. A lot of it would probably obey the order if you endorsed it, but other parts might ignore it and try to keep prosecuting the war. We might even wind up with another round of civil war. Can we send a private message to Elizabeth, then? Theisman was almost pleading. Can we tell her we want another ceasefire, a stand-down in place of all units, while we send a diplomatic mission direct to Manticore? Do you really think they'd listen after all that's happened? Pritchard said sadly. That's exactly what I proposed before, Tom, and they're convinced it was only a ploy— that I set it up for some Machiavellian reason of my own and then tried to murder two teenage girls to sabotage my own summit. If I try it again now, they're going to see it as an exact replay of the way Saint-Just derailed their buttercup offensive. It would only prove to them that their new weapons have us panicked. A single tear tracked down her cheek and she shook her head. I want this war ended even more than you do, Tom. I'm the one Arnold got to with his goddamned forge correspondence. I'm the one who started this entire fucking mess. And now look at it. Hundreds of thousands of men and women dead, star systems wrecked from one end to another, and even Javier. Eloise, it wasn't just you. Theisman leaned forward, reaching across the desk, and captured her hand and gripped it fiercely. Yes, he fooled you. Well, he fooled me, the rest of the cabinet, and the entire goddamned Congress as well. You just said it yourself. You didn't have the power to declare war without advice and consent, and you got both of them. But I asked for them. It was my policy, she said softly. My administration. Maybe it was, but the way we got here doesn't change where we are or the options we've got. So if we can't negotiate and we can't surrender, what can we do except launch Beatrice? It's an all-cost situation, Eloise, and thanks to your preliminary authorization and the forward redeployments we've already carried out, we can launch it far sooner than the Mantis probably expect any response to this. And Beatrice Bravo was specifically designed to take out Eighth Fleet as well. If we manage that, we knock out the only force we know is equipped with the new missiles— but even that's pretty much beside the point if the main op succeeds. That's really what it comes down to now. If we wait, we lose. If we attack and I'm wrong about their deployment status, we lose. But if we attack and I'm right, we'll almost certainly win. It's that simple. He looked into her eyes once again, still holding her hand. So which way do we go, Madam President? Chapter 59 Duchess Harrington! Over here, Duchess Harrington. Duchess Harrington, would you care to comment on... Duchess Harrington, did you know... Alvin Chorick, Duchess Harrington, landing Herald United Faxes. Are you going... Duchess Harrington! Duchess Harrington! Honor ignored the newsy shouts as she moved quickly across the shuttle pad's concourse. It wasn't easy. A last-minute conference aboard Imperator that ran well over its originally allotted time had her running over six hours behind her original schedule, but that had only given the mob more time to gather. Worse, someone had obviously leaked her adjusted arrival time, and the concourse was a madhouse. Capitol Field security personnel, joined by hastily mobilized drafts of Landing City Police, formed a cordon holding the reporters and what looked to her jaundiced eye like at least ten million private citizens at bay. Mostly. A trio of particularly enterprising newsies bolted suddenly out of a service doorway which had somehow been left unguarded. They charged towards her, shoulder-mounted cameras running, shouting questions, then skidded to a sudden halt as they found themselves face-to-face -face with a suddenly congealing, solid line of green-clad armsmen. 
armed armsmen, unsmiling armed armsmen. Andrew Lafollet had guessed what might happen, and he'd sent an additional 12-man team from the Bay House to the concourse. They'd reinforced Spencer Hawk, Clifford McGraw, and Joshua Atkins at the arrivals gate, and Lafollet himself could not have bettered the stony brown stare Captain Hawk turned upon the lead newsie. Uh, um, I mean... The reporter's brashness appeared to have deserted him. Hawk made absolutely no threatening gesture, but none was needed, and as Honor watched gravely, her own unsmiling expression hid an inner chuckle as she wondered if Newsy Intimidation 101 was a course listing on an armsman's training syllabus somewhere. "'Excuse me, sir,' Hawk said with exquisite courtesy. "'But you're blocking the Steadholder's way.' "'We just wanted—' the Newsy began, then stopped. He looked over his shoulder at his two fellows as if for support— if that was what he'd been searching for, he didn't find it. They were busy looking in different directions. Then, as if by the result of some telepathic communication, the three of them drifted aside as one. Thank you, Hawk said courteously and looked at Honor. My lady. Thank you, Spencer, she said with admirable gravity, and the entire cavalcade resumed its interrupted passage to the waiting air limos and escorting stingships. Spencer Hawk looked studiously out the limo window as Hamish Alexander Harrington wrapped one arm about his wife in a crushing hug. "'God, I'm glad to see you,' he said quietly as Honor sat beside him in the limousine seat, her head on his shoulder. She pressed the top of her head against his cheek, and the tree cats on their shoulders reached out to rub their cheeks together as well. "'And you,' she murmured into his ear. She let herself relax totally for a moment— then straightened and sat more upright, still in the circle of his arm, but far enough back to see his face. Emily? she asked. Catherine? Fine, both of them fine, he reassured her quickly. Emily wanted to come, but Sandra wouldn't hear of it. For that matter, Jefferson was ready to put his foot down if she'd tried. He shook his head and glanced at Hawk with a wry grin. How the hell have you managed to retain any tattered illusion that you run your own life after having had Grace and Armsman looking after you for so long? Jefferson's only doing his job, love, Honor told him primly, also watching Hawk from the corner of her eye. Her personal armsmen seemed to have become remarkably hard of hearing, however. And Sandra was probably just exercising simple sanity, given the madhouse out there, Honor continued. She jabbed her head at the spaceport buildings, dwindling rapidly behind them, and he snorted. Better get used to it, he advised her. The news broke yesterday. Coupled with what Terakov did at Monica, Lovett has public morale and enthusiasm soaring to new heights. It's actually rebounded harder because of the contrast to what happened at Zanzibar before the ceasefire, not to mention the fact that Her Majesty's subjects are in the most murderous mood I've seen since your execution over what happened to Jim and almost happened to Barry and Ruth. And since Terakov won't be back from Talbot for another month or so, all of it's going to be focusing on you, Madame Salamander. God, I hate this kind of stuff, she muttered. I know you do. Sometimes I wish you were the sort who ate it up with a spoon instead. But then you wouldn't be you, I suppose. Then Nimitz would cut my throat in my sleep, you mean? Honor laughed. You have no idea how a ravening mob of newsies affects a tree cat's empathic sense. No, but I've been basking in the reflected glow of your glory enough lately for Samantha to give me a shrewd notion the effect isn't good. To put it mildly... The limo banked, and she frowned, looking out the window. Where are we going? I'm afraid we're going to Admiralty House, Hamish told her. No, Honor said sharply. I want to see Emily and Catherine. I know you do, but Elizabeth wants... I don't give a damn what Elizabeth wants, Honor snapped. Hamish blinked, sitting back and looking at her in astonishment. Not this time, Hamish, she continued angrily. I want to see my wife and daughter. The Queen of Manticore, the Protector of Grayson, and the Emperor of the Known Universe can all get in line and wait behind the two of them. Honor, 
he began carefully. She wants to congratulate you, and she arranged to do it at Admiralty House, not Mount Royal Palace, because she wants all the rest of the Navy to be part of it. And she scheduled it originally to give you at least five hours at Jason Bay before the ceremony. I don't care. Honor sat back and crossed her arms. Not this time. I'm going to hug our daughter before I do one more thing. Elizabeth's hung all these honors and rewards and presents on me, but I've never asked her for a thing. Well, today I'm asking, and if she doesn't want to give it to me, then I'm telling instead of asking. I see. Hamish gazed at her for a moment, remembering the diffident, focused, professionally fearless yet personally unassertive young captain he'd first met in Yeltsin so many years before. That Honor Harrington would never have dreamed of telling the Queen of Manticore to get in line behind her infant daughter. This one, however? He pulled out his personal communicator and activated it. Willie, he said. Hamish, I told you not rescheduling was a bad idea. She's really, really pissed, and I don't blame her. He listened for a moment, then shrugged. You're the Prime Minister of Manticore. I think dealing with situations like this is part of the job. So you trot into your office, screen Elizabeth, and suggest ever so respectfully that we reschedule. Personally, I think she'll see the wisdom of the suggestion. I hope she does, anyway. He paused, listening again, and Honor could taste his amusement. She could also actually hear Baron Grantville's raised voice rattling the receiver pressed to Hamish's ear. Well, that's your problem, brother dear, he said with a grin. Personally, I'm not stupid enough to argue with my wife, either of my wives, over something like this. So we're going home. Have a nice day. He deactivated the comm and dropped it back into his pocket, then rapped on the partition between them and the pilot's compartment. It opened, and Tobias Stimson looked back at him. Yes, my lord? Jason Bay, Tobias. Very good, my lord, Stimson said with obvious approval, and Hamish smiled at honor as the air limo banked again. Better? Yes, she said, just a bit darkly. And the fact that you came around so quickly means you'll live to see another day, despite the fact that you were going to drag me off to Admiralty House in the first place. Hmm. He rubbed the side of his head for a moment, then nodded. Fair enough. In my defense, I'll only plead that the schedule was set yesterday, before you ran late. I'd gotten the timing into my head then. Hmm. She looked at him, then gave her head a little toss. Fair enough, I suppose, she agreed grudgingly. Just don't let it happen again. Catherine Allison Miranda Alexander Harrington was a red-faced, scowling, beautiful baby, Honor thought. And her opinion was, of course, completely unbiased. After all, Raoul Alfred Allister was at least equally beautiful, even if he was an older man. She sat with Catherine in her arms, parked in her favorite lounger on the terrace overlooking Jason Bay. Umbrellas kept the direct sunlight off the babies, and Emily's life support chair was parked beside her. They weren't exactly alone. Sandra Thurston and Lindsay Phillips had been waiting with Emily when Honor arrived. Sandra had been cuddling Catherine until Honor and Hamish got there, and Lindsay still had Raoul in her arms, with his sleeping face pillowed on her shoulder. Nimitz and Samantha had draped themselves across the umbrella-shielded table, basking in the children's mind glows, and Andrew LaFollet and Jefferson McClure had been keeping an eye on Emily and the babies. Tobias Stimson and Honor's three-man personal detail had joined them, and now the six of them stood along the outer edge of the terrace, not exactly unobtrusively, but giving them a protected bubble of privacy. "'We do good work,' Honor said, smiling as she sampled the still unformed mind glow of the blanket-wrapped infant in her arms. She reached out, stroking the impossibly soft cheek with the tip of her right index finger, then looked up at Emily. Well, Dr. Illescu and his people had a little something to do with the mechanics, Emily replied with a huge smile of her own. And your mother's willingness to kick me in the posterior played a part, too. Still... She continued judiciously. 
I'd have to say on balance, and only after due and careful consideration, you understand, that you have a point. I only wish I'd been there when she was born, Honor said softly. I know. Emily reached out and patted her on the thigh. I guess not all aspects of technology are really progress. I mean, once upon a time, the only people who had to worry about not being there when babies were born were the fathers. The mothers were always there. I hadn't really thought about it quite that way, Honor said. I had, Hamish said, coming out of the house behind them. James McGinnis, Miranda LaFollet, and Farragut followed him, and Hamish raised his right hand, flourishing the beer steins in it proudly. Hot what? his senior wife asked as he reached them and bent to give each of them a quick kiss. Thought about whether or not it was really progress, he said, plunking the steins down and watching as McGinnis carefully poured them full of old Tillman. I got to be there for both of them, he continued, and that was good, but I was really pissed at the Admiralty for sending Honor off at that particular time. In fact, I was so pissed, I decided to take it up personally with the First Lord. The conversation was a little confusing. You're always a little confused, dear, Emily told him, watching as he and Honor sampled their beers. Nonsense, he said briskly. I'm always a lot confused. Well, don't confuse the babies, Honor advised. Lindsay won't let me, Hamish pouted, and Honor looked across at the nanny in surprise. Lindsay won't let you? That sounds suspiciously like she's become a permanent fixture. I have your grace, Lindsay said with a smile. Unless you'd rather not, of course. Your mother told me you were going to need some help, especially with your schedule, and since, as she rather charmingly put it, she had me nicely broken in, she'd feel better if I was available to you and Lady Emily. Well, of course I'd rather, but can Mother really spare you from the twins? I'll admit I'll miss them, Lindsay acknowledged, but it's not like I won't see a lot of them, is it? And your mother has Jenny, not to mention their tutors and their armsmen, to help keep an eye on them. Even a pair of seven-year-olds is going to find it difficult to wear all of them down. If Mother is sure about this, I'm certainly not going to argue. And if you'd been foolish enough to do so... Hamish and I would have hit you smartly over the head and confined you somewhere until you came to your senses, Emily said tranquilly. Spencer wouldn't have let you, Anna retorted. Spencer, Miranda said, settling into an unoccupied chair, would have helped them, and if he hadn't, I would have. Farragut leapt up into her lap with a bleak of satisfied agreement, and Honor laughed. All right, all right, I surrender, Good, Emily said. Then she looked at Hamish. Was the carnage at Admiralty House very extreme when Honor failed to arrive on schedule? Not really. Hamish swallowed more beer and laughed. I just got off the comm with Tom Caparelli. From what he had to say, Elizabeth was completely in agreement with Honor. She hadn't realized how late Honor was running, and she said something about star chambers, oubliettes, bread and water, and headsmen for anyone who dragged Honor away from Catherine before tomorrow morning. Not just from Catherine, I hope, Emily said with a lurking smile, and Hamish chuckled. Probably not, he agreed. Probably not. Welcome back aboard, Admiral. Captain Welbeck said quietly as RHNS Guerriere's side party dismissed behind Lester Tourville. Thank you, Celestine. Tourville met Welbeck's blue eyes levelly as he shook her hand. He was well aware of the questions behind his flag captain's attentive expression, but he was less certain he had the answers to them all. Uncertainty and shock were two emotions he was unaccustomed to feeling, but they summed up his own initial reaction to the octagon briefing handily. He'd known Lovett had been an unmitigated disaster, and the personal loss of so many friends, including Javier Giscard and the entire company of Sovereign of Space, had hit home with excruciating force. But his worst nightmares had fallen short of the new weapons capabilities the Mantis had revealed. The reports on those had brought back other nightmares of the days when he and Javier had watched Operation Buttercup rumbling down upon them as they waited to defend the same star system where Javier had just died. 
And then, hard on the heels of that shattering news, had come Tom Theismann's proposed operation. The Octagon had been playing its cards close to its vest for weeks now, and Tourville had wondered why so many of his own units had been redeployed so far forward. Now he knew. It placed them at least fifteen days closer to the Manticore system, which was not, he conceded, an especially comfortable thought. On the other hand, he'd had to entertain quite a few uncomfortable thoughts over the past several years, and if nothing else, Theismann's Operation Beatrice showed an impressive audacity, even if the decision to actually execute it was based on the logic of desperation. Still, if Theismann's assumptions about the availability of the new weapons was valid, and op research's conclusions matched those of the Secretary of War on that head, then this all-or-nothing throw of the dice might just work. Of course, it might not, too, and although he'd regained his mental balance, questions about the proposed operation's mechanics and basic assumptions were still rattling around inside his own brain. Molly, Welbeck said, reaching out to shake Captain Delaney's hand in turn. I see you managed to get the Admiral back home again after all. It wasn't easy to drag him away from Nouveau Paris's nightlife, Delaney replied with a smile which looked almost natural, and Welbeck returned it before switching her attention back to Tourville. Everyone's waiting in the briefing room as you requested, Admiral. In that case, Tourville said heartily, let's get down to it. Of course, sir. After you? Welbeck stepped back half a pace and waved one hand at the lifts. Be seated. Tourville said briskly before the assembled staffers and flag officers could climb more than halfway to their feet. They settled back obediently, and he strode to his own place at the head of the table. He seated himself, followed by Welbeck and Delaney, and gazed out over their assembled faces. "'Our next meeting is going to be just a bit larger than this one,' he said after a moment. "'We're going to be rather substantially reinforced over the next couple of weeks.' Reinforced, sir? Rear Admiral Janice Scarlatti asked. Scarlatti was a short, sturdy, no nonsense brunette, and Tourville felt the corners of his eyes crinkle in a smile. She'd obviously heard the same rumors as everyone else. Unlike his other officers, however, she'd never heard of tact, and she'd plainly been waiting to pounce. Yes, Janice, he said patiently. Reinforced, as in additional ships assigned to our order of battle. I gathered that, sir, Scarlatti replied, apparently completely oblivious to his irony. Personally, Tourville suspected she was fully aware of it. She was much too smart and competent to be as totally socially clueless as she chose to appear. Of course, there had been the old Shannon Foraker. What I was wondering, Scarlatti continued, is exactly what sort of reinforcements we're going to receive. According to the Octagon's latest numbers, we're going to be reinforced to a total strength of something over 300 of the wall, Tourville said calmly. More than one of the officers around the table sat back in his or her chair as the number hit them squarely between the eyes. Even Scarlatti blinked, and Tourville smiled thinly. I'm well aware of the sorts of rumors which have been circulating around the fleet, he said. Some of them have been so wild as to be outright ridiculous. For example, the one that says we're going to launch a direct attack on the Manticorinum system in response to Lovett. The very idea is preposterous. Several people nodded, and he smiled toothily under his brushy mustache as he saw relief in a few of the expressions. I was completely confident of that when Admiral Theismann invited Captain Delaney and me down to the Octagon to brief us on something called Operation Beatrice, of course, he continued. It was a very interesting conversation. He and Admiral Marquette and Admiral Trenny laid Beatrice out with remarkable clarity. Now, Captain Delaney and I are going to brief you on it. Chapter 60 Well, that wasn't too bad, I hope, Elizabeth Winton asked with a smile as she and Honor stepped into the Admiralty House conference room. Not too bad, Honor agreed. I did think about hanging some more medals on you. 
Elizabeth continued lightly, as William Alexander and his older brother, Sir Thomas Caparelli and Patricia Givens, followed the two of them into the room. I decided to settle for another monarch's thanks instead. How many is that for you? A couple of dozen now? Not quite, Honor said dryly. Spencer Hawk, Tobias Stimson, and Colonel Chimay followed Givens. Hawk and Stimson positioned themselves behind their principals. Chimay took the place waiting for her at the conference table as Elizabeth's intelligence liaison. It wasn't, Honor thought, as the various tree cats settled down in their people's laps or chair backs and the door closed, leaving Joshua Atkins, Clifford McGraw, and three troopers from the Queen's Own on guard in the hallway outside, as if there wasn't enough security in place without requiring the colonel's personal involvement. The other participants in the meeting waited until Elizabeth and Honor were seated, then found their own seats. First, Caparelli said as they all turned their attention to him, I'd like to add my own thanks and that of everyone at Admiralty House for a job very well done, Your Grace. We tried, Honor said. Quite successfully, Caparelli observed. We're still analyzing your after-action report, but it's already obvious you hurt them much worse than they've hurt us anywhere since their opening offensive. The amount of damage you did, coupled with the demonstrated efficacy of Apollo and Mistletoe, has to have knocked them back on their heels. I'd like to think so, Honor said when he paused, inviting comment. In fact, I'm inclined to think it has. I'd feel more comfortable about that if I didn't know how tough-minded Thomas Theismann is, though. She shook her head. He was bad enough as a destroyer skipper at Blackbird. Nothing I've seen indicates that he's turned into any more of a pushover since. Agreed. Caparelli nodded vigorously. On the other hand, Pat and I have discussed this at some length with her analysts. Pat? No one in my shop, with the possible exception of one or two very junior officers who haven't yet learned the limits of their own mortality, is prepared to make any unqualified predictions at this point, Your Grace, Given said. The consensus, however, is that Apollo's effectiveness in particular has to have come as a significant shock to their systems. In fact, it was more effective in action than we expected, even after your exercises, and it came at them completely cold. Given the way Sanskrit has to resonate with what happened to them in Buttercup, she nodded at Hamish. They've got to be wondering if we're prepared to do the same thing to them all over again. I don't doubt that, Anna replied. And don't misunderstand me. I'm not trying to say the analysts are wrong. I'd just like everyone to remember that Thomas Theismann wasn't prepared to roll over and play dead when we introduced the missile pod and they didn't have it. And when we introduced the SDP and MDM, he and Shannon Foraker simply sat down and came up with effective responses to both of them. We're remembering that, Caparelli assured her. I assure you, no one in this building is ever likely to take Admiral Theismann lightly again. I'm glad to hear it, she said. I wish, though, that we could at least find this bolt hole of theirs. I know it's not likely to be as critical to their building capacity as it was, and it's got to be becoming steadily less so as the units under the construction in their other yards progress— but that seems to be where Admiral Forker and her little brain trust are working on their various new weapons and doctrines, and that makes it a target well worth hitting any time. We all agree, Your Grace, Givens told her feelingly. Unfortunately, we still haven't found it, which leads me to suspect that our fundamental assumptions were in error. How? Honor asked curiously. We assumed it was located in a peep star system, Given said simply, and Honor blinked. We assumed that for two reasons, Givens continued. First, because it has to have a certain level of industrial capacity, which suggests a certain level of population to support it, which in turn suggests that it has to be an established star system. Second, we assumed that because we were too intellectually lazy to consider anything else. You're still being too hard on yourself, Pat, Caparelli put in, and Given shrugged. I'm not staying up nights kicking myself, but it's Owen I's job to think outside the box as well as in it. I think I probably agree with Sir Thomas, Honor said. 
What they've accomplished there obviously requires the capacity you were talking about. Yes, it does, but I've been going over some of our older intelligence summaries, looking for clues. Some of those summaries date clear back to before the Pierre coup, and a couple of very interesting ones came out of debriefs of some of the people you brought back from Cerberus as well. On the basis of that, I'm beginning to suspect they didn't move into any star system's existing infrastructure at all. I think they built it from the ground up in one where no one already lived. What? I also think I'd like to sit down and discuss it with Admiral Parnell, Givens told her with a crooked smile. Unless I miss my guess, he's the one who actually started the project even before President Harris was assassinated. Some of the people you brought back from Cerberus have mentioned large labor drafts from the political prisoners there. There was always some of that going on, of course, but assuming their memory of the timing is accurate, we can't account for where quite a few of them might have gone. That's not conclusive. The People's Republic was a big place, and they always had black projects of one sort or another going on somewhere. We couldn't possibly have identified or tracked all of them, but I'm beginning to think Bolt Hole is actually a complete secret colony of theirs somewhere. One the legislaturalists started... I wouldn't be a bit surprised to find out that Pierre and the committee took it and ran with it, probably on a scale Harris had never initially contemplated. But if I'm right, the reason we haven't found it, despite all of our scouting efforts, is because we don't have any idea where to look for it in the first place. It may even be outside the Republic's official borders. That's not a very reassuring thought, Anna remarked after a moment. Even if it's true, it doesn't actually make things that much worse, Your Grace, Caporelli said. As you said, Boltol as a physical production facility is becoming progressively less important to them. Mostly, it's just frustrating to think that the peeps were thinking far enough ahead to do something like this that long ago. And, Givens added sourly, from a professional viewpoint... It's a lot more than frustrating to think about an intelligence failure on this scale. We ought to at least have known they were doing it, even if we didn't have a clue where. Stop beating yourself up over it, Caporelli said, his tone just a bit sharper, and Givens nodded. Whether or not Pat's new theory about Bolthole is accurate, Your Grace, the First Space Lord continued, turning back to Honor. Your point about the peeps' tough-mindedness in general... And Theismann's in particular is well taken. In fact, we believe it's time to give Admiral Theismann another whack as quickly as possible. We need to drive home the fact of his tactical inferiority and hopefully confirm the peeps' belief that we've deployed the new systems broadly across the fleet before he has the time he needs to plan and implement a revised offensive strategy of his own. Honor regarded him thoughtfully. Emily's no-business-talk-when-honors-home decree, and Hamish's efforts to avoid intruding into Caporelli's authority in the operational sphere, had foreclosed the sort of discussion she and Hamish might otherwise have had. But from the little he'd said, and the wisps of anxiety she'd tasted from him, she had a shrewd notion of where Caporelli was headed. Love it, the First Space Lord continued, was an important target, but secondary— it hurt them, no question of that, and it was a major escalation from the sorts of targets we'd been hitting, but as far as their economy and central war effort is concerned, it was still a peripheral target in a lot of ways. The strategy board thinks it's time we went for a first-rank target instead, and we think we found one which may not be Bolthole, but still ought to get their attention. Jewett he paused again, and despite her earlier suspicions, Honor's nostrils flared. The planet of Shadrach in the Jewett system was one of Haven's oldest daughter colonies. The system had been colonized from Haven less than 50 T years after the colony ship Jason reached an uninhabited planet called Manticore, and the system's population was well up into the billions. It was also the site of the oldest of the Republican Navy's satellite shipyards, and its defenses were almost as heavy as those of the Haven system itself. Sir Thomas, she said very carefully into the waiting silence, that's a very audacious proposal, and I imagine it would certainly come under the category of whacking them smartly, but Jewett's going to be a very, very tough target. 
We succeeded at Lovett in large part because they didn't have a clue what was coming. That won't be the case the next time we go in. Two things I think we're all agreed the new management in Nouveau Paris is demonstrating are resiliency and flexibility. My staff and I haven't looked at Jewett closely, since it never occurred to us to include it in our targeting list, given the parameters laid down for cutworm and Sanskrit. Nonetheless, I'd be very surprised if its defenses haven't been upgraded much more comprehensively even than Solon's and Lovett's. We agree entirely, Caporelli said gravely. And before you raise the point, yes, it's possible we're suffering from a degree of operational hubris here. We're trying to protect ourselves against that by being as skeptical as we can, and we're also determined to avoid pushing you and Eighth Fleet into a tactical situation you can't control. I'm certainly in favor of that, Honor said with a wry smile. Then her smile faded and she shrugged. Assuming it's possible, of course. Of course. Caporelli agreed. First, we have no intention of sending you in without thoroughly scouting the system ahead of time. Second, we're getting a handle on the production bottlenecks we've been experiencing. We're going to have a lot more of the mistletoe-modified drones available, starting in about three weeks, and production of the Apollo pods and control platforms is beginning to accelerate as well. We've got enough now to completely re-ammunition your command and begin establishing a modest stockpile to support your operations. The system defense version is still lagging. We won't be able to begin deploying those pods for another couple of months, but things are definitely looking up on the offensive front. Third, we intend to support any attack on Jewett by shotgunning them with feints all over their inner perimeter— we're going to be scouting every system we can, and after what happened in Lovett, they aren't going to be able to disregard any scouting operation. Hopefully, that will induce them to spread their defenses thinner. Fourth, your battle plan will be designed from the beginning from the perspective of breaking off the attack and withdrawing if the opposition seems tougher than our threat analyses have projected. In other words, this won't be any sort of all-costs target, Your Grace— it's an operation we want to succeed, not one we need to succeed, and your instructions would reflect that. He paused again, and Honor considered what he'd said carefully. All of it seemed to make sense, but she still couldn't shake the fear that they were overreaching themselves. All of that sounds good, Sir Thomas, she said after a moment. But whatever we do to prepare for and support the operation— there's still the question of force levels. I'm as impressed as anyone by what Apollo accomplished at Lovett, but at the moment my entire order of battle is less than a hundred ships, and only fifteen of them can operate the new pods. And while it's true the effectiveness of each shot in their magazines has just gone up, it's also true that we've just taken a 25% hit on our total magazine capacity. In other words, my 15 SDPs only have as many rounds on board as 11 ships with standard pods. Understood. Caporelli nodded vigorously. In fact, we've taken that into consideration in our preliminary brainstorming. And before we continue, I should have mentioned from the outset that all we've done so far is to consider this from a conceptual standpoint— any actual operation against Jewett would be mounted only after the strategy board and your own staff have had an opportunity to look at the nuts and bolts very carefully. As I said, this is a desirable operation, not an essential one. We're not going to commit to it unless we're confident, unless we're all confident that it's practical and that the risks are manageable or at least acceptable." Honor felt an undeniable sense of relief. If the operation was practical, it would obviously be worthwhile. She had no qualms on that point, except perhaps for concern over the continuing level of escalation it represented. Beyond that single qualification, though, it was only a question of whether or not it was practical, and what she tasted in Caporelli's and Givens' mind glows was vastly reassuring. The First Space Lord meant it. As much as he wanted this operation, he had no intention of charging ahead in an excess of blind enthusiasm. And speaking of nuts and bolts, and although we haven't put together hard numbers yet, Caporelli continued, we already know we'll be able to reinforce Eighth Fleet more strongly than we'd anticipated. Honor felt her right eyebrow rise, and Caporelli chuckled. 
Your old friend Herzog von Robinstrange contacted me a couple of weeks ago, just after you'd sorted for Sanskrit. Apparently, the emperor decided a month or two before that to express his displeasure at how long their refit program seemed to be dragging out. Apparently, he expressed it rather vigorously, and his navy decided they ought to take him seriously and reallocated their efforts. Basically, they pulled their yard dogs off of about a third of the total number of ships they'd been working on, the ones farthest from completion at this point, and concentrated the additional effort on the units which were already most advanced. The First Space Lord shrugged. That decision has its downsides, of course. Among other things, it means the ships they were pulled off of are going to be even later in completing, and their concentration only covered about a quarter of their total STP strength. Still, it means that somewhere between 25 and 40 additional pod layers all refitted to handle the Keyhole 2 platforms and the flat pack pods, are going to be coming forward over the next month and a half or so. Our intention at the moment is to assign all of them to 8th Fleet, which will just happen to finally make your command the biggest and most powerful we have. That's what we're planning to commit to Sanskrit too. Honor sat back in her chair. The tardiness of the Andromani Waller's refits had led her to forget almost completely about them. But if they really were going to come forward in such numbers, double or triple the number of Apollo-capable ships under her command, then suddenly Jewett became a much more attractive target. How firm are the Andromani numbers? she asked after a moment. At present, they look very good. Obviously, there's room for slippage. We've already seen that. Again, however, if the proposed reinforcements aren't forthcoming, then the operation doesn't go in. It's predicated on providing you with the strength you need. We'd have to pretty much stand down until they do arrive, she said thoughtfully. I don't really like that. We'll be taking the pressure off of them. But if we're going to hit a target as hard as Jewett, I can't afford any avoidable losses in the interim. It won't do us much good to reinforce if I've lost offsetting numbers— and we'll need to train hard with the Andes if we're going to integrate them properly. The strategy board came to the same conclusion, Caporelli replied. We don't believe you could plan on launching the operation for at least another seven to eight weeks, and you're absolutely right about the need to train with the Andes as they come forward. Fortunately, Trevor Star is well suited for all our purposes. With the entire star system under military control, it's as secure a place to exercise and work up new units as we've got. You can conduct training operations on just about any scale you want without worrying about anyone reporting what you're doing to the peeps. At the same time, you'll be well-placed for us to recall you and your Apollo-capable ships quickly to the home system if we start picking up any indications that Theismann is still feeling frisky. And, of course you're still closer to your potential targets in the Republic than any of the Peep's forward bases are to the home system or Yeltsin Star. While you're getting your new Andy units worked up to operational standards, we'll try to keep the pressure on them by continuing your previous strategy of scouting their systems. As I said, that's been a part of our preliminary strategy concept from the beginning. In that case, I think it's doable, she said. I'd be less than honest if I said I wasn't a little nervous at the prospect of attacking a target that heavily defended. But given a monopoly on Apollo and the force levels you're suggesting, I think we can do it. Good! Caporelli beamed. In fact, everyone around the conference table smiled, except for Hamish Alexander Harrington. Honor tasted his concern, his fear for her, and wanted to reach out and take his hand which would scarcely have comported with proper naval professionalism. Again, Caporelli stressed, we're not going to commit to Sanskrit too until we've got a detailed plan based on hard numbers and the most recent intelligence and scouting reports on Jewett. With that proviso, however, Your Grace, you're officially directed to begin preliminary planning immediately for the operation. Your tentative execution date will be 60 days from today. Chapter 61 
Honor swam strongly down the exact center of the swimming lane, listening to the music playing over the underwater sound system. The pool, below the outer edge of the Bay House Terrace, was what was still called Olympic-sized, and she was on the 30th of her 40 laps. Much as she enjoyed swimming, lap work could be excruciatingly boring, and she'd insisted on a first-class sound system when she had the pool put in. She'd gotten what she paid for, and now she chuckled inside as the music segued abruptly from classical Grayson to Manticorin Shatter Rock. That transition was guaranteed to send anyone's boredom packing. Her armsmen were accustomed to her mania for swimming, although most of them still thought it was a bit bizarre. All of them had grimly passed the various life-saving courses, just in case, but most of them were perfectly happy that their duties required them to stand alertly about the pool rather than splashing around in all that wet stuff themselves. Nimitz, of course, had always considered her taste for immersing herself in water peculiar, and he was stretched out comfortably, sunning on a poolside table while she indulged her water fetish. She reached the end of the lap, tucked lithely through a flip turn, pushed off strongly from the end of the pool, and headed back the way she'd come on lap 31. She was beginning to feel the strain, especially in her legs. Not surprisingly, she supposed, given how much of her time she'd been spending aboard ship lately, but she'd be back aboard ship the day after tomorrow, and she was determined to enjoy her pool to the full before she had to leave it behind once more. She'd gotten to within ten meters of the end of the lap when James McGinnis's voice suddenly interrupted the music. I'm sorry to disturb you, Your Grace, he said over the sound system. But you have a calm call. It's from Miss Montagna. Honor inhaled when she shouldn't have, surprised by the interruption. She coughed the water back out before she rotated back up to breathe again and swam the last few strokes to the end of the pool. She caught the lip, lifted, twisted, and landed sitting on the pool surround. Spencer? Yes, my lady? Captain Hawk turned quickly towards her and didn't even flinch. He'd had time to get used to Manticoran swimsuits, and compared to the ones Allison Harrington delighted in wearing, honors were positively demure. Max says I've got a calm call. Of course, my lady. Hawk reached into the bag sitting on the poolside table beside Nimitz and extracted honor's personal communicator. He handed it to her, and she smiled in thanks and configured it for video, but without bringing up the hollow display, then keyed the acceptance button. An instant later, McGinnis's face appeared on the small flat screen. I'm here, Mac, she said, reaching up with her free hand and stripping off the swimming cap she'd been wearing over her braided hair. Go ahead and put Miss Montagna through. Of course, Your Grace. Honor swirled her feet slowly in the pool to keep muscles from stiffening and gazed out across the sparkling blue vitality of Jason Bay at the Towers of Landing. Her house's terrace ran to the very edge of the upper tier of the cliffs above the bay. If she looked up, she could see the outer balustrade clinging to its lip. The upper cliff fell away from the terrace in a sheer precipice for ten or fifteen meters to a flattened saddle, almost like a giant stair step halfway between the beach below and the house above. That was where she'd chosen to put the pool, with a vanishing infinite edge on the outer side. From where she sat, the illusion that the pool's water was spilling over in a cascade to the ocean below was almost perfect. Of all the many features of her Manticoran mansion, she often thought the pool was her favorite. The calm beeped softly, recalling her from her thoughts, as the golden-haired, blue-eyed honorable member of Parliament for High Threadmore appeared upon it. "'Good morning, Your Grace,' Catherine Montagna said. "'And good morning to you, Kathy,' Anna replied." To what do I owe the honor? I hope I didn't screen at an inconvenient moment, Montagna said as honor's water-beaded face registered. Actually, you just rescued me from the last nine laps, honor reassured her with a smile. That's right, you actually swim for exercise. Montagna shuddered dramatically. You don't like swimming? I don't like exercise, Montagna said cheerfully. I burn off sufficient energy just charging around in six or seven directions at once. I'm sure you've heard that about me. I believe your ability to multitask enthusiastically has come up a time or two, Honor acknowledged, her smile becoming a grin. I thought it probably had. Montagna looked pleased, and Honor chuckled. 
She knew how much pleasure Catherine Montagna took from her public persona's reputation for shatter-brained confusion. Actually, though, the ex-countess of the tour said, her own smile fading, I had a serious reason for screening you this morning. I have a message for you from Anton. Do you? Honor arched her eyebrows and Montagna nodded. He asked me to tell you that he and his associate believe they may be on the trail of evidence which will confirm the hypothesis they discussed with you last month. Really? Honor sat up a bit straighter. You say he's on the trail of the evidence? I take it that that means he doesn't actually have it in hand? I'm afraid not. It's going to take them some time to confirm what they suspect, but they feel confident at this time that they will be able to. Do we have any idea how long we're talking about? I'm afraid not. Not exactly, at any rate. There's quite a bit of travel involved. I see. Honor's eyes narrowed intently. May I ask where they're traveling to? Since I can't be certain our connection is completely secure, I'd prefer not to answer that one, Your Grace, Montagna said. However, I will say that they'll have to travel incognito this time. I see, Anna repeated, and she did. The planet of Mesa, which she was almost certain had to be Zilwicky's and Kashat's destination, would not be a very healthy place for either of them. Manpower had a long and nasty memory at the best of times, and the slavers weren't likely to forget what the team of Zilwicky and Kashat had produced for them on Old Earth. She tried not to feel disappointed, although in some ways it was even worse to know Zilwicky and Kashat believed they would be able to confirm their suspicions. Whatever they might be able to do in the future, she still didn't have any proof of it now, and without that proof, there was no way to derail the events proceeding inexorably toward Sanskrit too. And after we trash Jewett, the Havenites are going to be a lot less inclined to be reasonable, whatever Zilwicky turns up, unless they do decide Apollo gives them no choice but to surrender, she thought grimly. If you should happen to be sending any messages to Captain Zilwicky, she said aloud, please tell him I very much hope his search prospers. I spoke to the individuals I assured him I'd contact. Unfortunately, they feel that without conclusive or at least very persuasive evidence actually in their hands, there isn't a great deal they can do about the problem. I was afraid of that, Montagna said, blue eyes sad. We'll just have to do our best to turn up the evidence they need. I hope we can find it in time. So do I, Honor said soberly. I'm afraid, though, that events are taking on a momentum all their own. One we may not be able to deflect, regardless of what they discover, if their discovery is delayed too long. We'd already deduced that. Montagna inhaled deeply. Well, at least we still have one friend at court. We'll try hard not to disappoint you. Welcome back, Your Grace, Rafe Cardona said, as the twitter of Bosun's pipes died in Imperator's Boat Bay Gallery. I'd like to say I'm glad to be back, Anna replied with a small smile. Unfortunately, that would be a lie. Not that I'm not glad to see you, of course. It's just that I had to leave a very charming young gentleman and lady behind. But you brought lots of pictures, I hope, he replied, and she chuckled. Only a couple of dozen gigs worth. And I've changed out my personal wallpaper, of course. Oh, of course. Cardonis laughed, and she clapped him on the upper arm and looked at Mercedes Brigham. We've got a lot to discuss, Mercedes, she said, and Brigham nodded. I'm sure we do, Your Grace, just as soon as you're done showing those pictures to all of us. We do have a certain sense of proper priorities around here, you know? So I see, Honor said, and Nimitz bleaked an echoing laugh from her shoulder. All right, the two of you have twisted my arm nearly to the point of dislocation. Solely because of your harshly insistent demands, I'll sacrifice my own desire to plunge immediately back into the official business of this command and force myself to sit through all those awful pictures all over again. That's an impressive itinerary, Your Grace, Dame Alice Truman said. Honor staff and senior flag officer sat around the outsized table in her dining cabin. The familiar cups of coffee, tea, and cocoa had made their appearance on schedule following the dessert dishes, and Judah Yanikov extracted a worn briar pipe from his tunic pocket. He held it up and raised an eyebrow at his hostess. That's a truly disgusting habit, Judah, she told him with a smile of affection, and he nodded. 
I know it is, my lady, and we'd almost stamped it out on Grayson until you mantis came along with all your modern medicine. Now I can indulge myself and know your decadent worldly medical science will preserve me from the consequences of my own excesses. Does Reverend Sullivan know about this hedonistic streak of yours? She asked severely. Alas, he replied sadly, I'm afraid my family's always been known for its lapses. My first Grayson ancestor, for example, there he was, the captain of the colony ship, supposed to be in charge of completely decommissioning and scrapping her as an example of the evil technology we'd fled Old Earth to escape. And what did he do? Kept her intact for almost sixty years, transferred her computers and her auxiliary power plant down to Grayson too. With that sort of a beginning, surely you know the Reverend is going to expect the worst out of me. Stop boasting, Brigham told him with a smile of her own. I read that biography of your great-great-great-whatever your grand-aunt wrote. We all know the Yanikov family was instrumental in preserving human life on Grayson. Did I get that quotation right? Almost, he corrected solemnly. The actual passage you're thinking of says that our family was instrumental, by the tester's grace, in preserving human life on Grayson against overwhelming odds. He smiled admiringly. Aunt Letitia always had a fine, well-rounded way with a phrase, didn't she? Oh, forgive me. How could I have forgotten that bit? Stop it, you two, Honor said with a laugh. And yes, Judah, you can light the reeking thing as soon as Mac readjusts the air circulation to protect the rest of us. I'm reconfiguring now, Your Grace, McGinnis's voice said from the open pantry hatch. Thank God. Alistair McKeon murmured, careful to be sure the comment was loud enough for Yanikov to hear. Infidel? Yanikov raised his nose with a sniff, and McKeon threw a balled-up linen napkin at him across the table. Children! Children! Honor scolded. I should never have left the nanny back on Manticore. The laughter was general this time, and Honor was glad to hear it. She was especially glad, since Yanikov's seniority in the Grayson Navy had made him her official second-in-command. Fortunately, he, Truman, and McKeon had known one another for years and worked smoothly together in the past. No one had gotten his or her nose out of joint following Yanikov's arrival. Nor had Honor felt any qualms. Yanikov had matured considerably from the days when he'd been one of her brilliant but occasionally overenthusiastic divisional commanders in the Grayson Space Navy's second battle squadron. He'd lost none of the audacity, the ability to think quickly and see possibilities others might miss, but the enthusiasm had been tempered by experience and honed to an even keener, more dangerous edge. He still had a gambler's instincts, but now they were those of a coldly capable, calculating, and highly professional gambler. All right, she said, as Yanikov got his pipe properly stoked. I think we can all agree that what the strategy board has in mind is, as Alice says, an impressive itinerary. It's also going to be the most powerful single attack the Alliance or any of its members has ever launched. I had a personal message from Herzog von Robenstrange just before I returned to the fleet. His current estimate is that we should have at least 35 Andermani Apollo-capable SDPs and 16 of their BCPs joining us here. The first 10 or 12 Wallers will actually be here within the next two weeks. The others will arrive as they complete their working up exercises with the new systems. Assuming he meets his minimum estimate of 35, we'll have a total of 53 pod super dreadnoughts, 50 of them Apollo-capable. That's 15% of the Alliance's total SDPs, and until the rest of the Andermani Super Dreadnoughts complete their refits, it's over 27% of the total actually available. It's also more pod layers, not even counting the battlecruisers, than Earl Whitehaven had for Buttercup, and none of his ships had Apollo. She paused to let that sink in, looking around the table at her staffers and flag officers, radiating her own confidence, even as she tasted theirs. And they were confident, despite a certain completely understandable anxiety. Confident of their weapons, confident of their doctrine, and confident of their leadership. She savored that confidence, even as she carefully concealed her own reservations. Not about the practicality of Sanskrit, too, not about the quality of the fleet which was her weapon, or the admirals who would wield it, but about why they were launching this operation in the first place, 
and what its consequences might be. There is nothing they could do about it anyway, she reminded herself once again. So there's no point worrying them with it. The last thing they need right now is to be looking over their shoulders, wondering whether or not we ought to be doing this. Judah, she continued, breaking the small silence she had imposed, you've actually had the most experience using Apollo ship to ship. I've spent quite a while reviewing your after action report and also your ops officer's report, and it seems to me that we overestimated the number of birds necessary to get through to a single target. Would you concur? Yes, I know, my lady. Yes, we overestimated the numbers we needed at Lovett, but that was a freebie. They didn't have any idea what was coming, and they never had time to adjust. That won't be the case next time. No, it won't, McGeehan said. On the other hand, how much good will it do to them to know what's coming? How the hell do you establish a viable defensive doctrine against something like this? Admiral Hempel and the ATC simulators are developing one right now, Alistair. Samuel Miklos pointed out. They're trying to develop one, McKeon corrected. I'm willing to bet they aren't having a lot of luck so far, and unlike the peeps, they know exactly what Apollo can do. I'm not saying no one will ever come up with a doctrine which won't at least knock back Apollo's effectiveness. I just don't see any way the peeps can have done it yet. I certainly can't think of anything they could do about it, and I've spent the odd couple of dozen hours thinking about it. I think you've got a point, Alistair. Honor said. But so does Judah. And let's not succumb to any hubris about Apollo, either. I agree that so far it's proved more effective than my most optimistic estimate, but it's not a god weapon. So far, they haven't had a really good look at it, but all it really does, if you want to come right down to it, is to extend our effective control loop by about a factor of sixty. McKeon's eyebrows rose, and she shook her head. I'm not trying to downplay what an advantage that gives us, especially now, but once we get out beyond three or four light minutes, even the graph pulse com starts imposing a measurable lag in the real time communications loop. We'll be able to adjust and adapt far more rapidly than anyone else can, which is still going to give us an enormous edge, but our powered missile envelope from rest is over three and a half light minutes. At that range, the transmission lag one way is going to be 3.4 seconds. That's a minimum command and control loop of 6.8 seconds. Which equates to a range to target of eight and a half light seconds with a closing velocity of 0.8 light speed, McKeon pointed out. That means that our two way communications loop would be shorter than their one way loop, even if their counter missiles had that sort of engagement range. Of course it does. Honor shook her head again. I admit it's going to give us a huge advantage, at least until someone else figures out how to do the same thing. I'm just saying that as the range extends, our ability to adapt in real time to their electronic warfare and to steer our birds around their counter missiles is going to degrade. That's why Mercedes, Andrea, and I have been stressing the need to get as close to the edge of the enemy's powered envelope as we can without quite crossing over into it in order to maximize our own effectiveness. And don't forget, We carry a lot fewer rounds than we used to. That means we've got to make each of them count. So, even though the Lovett effectiveness numbers would support a pullback of at least 50%, I think we have to factor in Judah's concerns and only cut our original density estimates by 30 or 40%. All right. McKeon nodded cheerfully. I'd rather err on the side of pessimism than be overly optimistic and get my tail caught in a ringer. I've got a few concerns of my own, Truman said. They don't have anything to do with Apollo, but the observed performance of the peep lacks at Lovett has me a little concerned. I wish we'd had more time to examine the wreckage, maybe pick up a couple of intact examples for Buweps and ONI to play around with. What specifically worries you? Honor asked. Well, we really didn't turn it up until we started our intensive post battle analysis back here at Trevor Star, Truman admitted. But when we took a good hard look, it became fairly obvious that they've got at least one, and probably two, new LAC classes. And unless I miss my guess, they're using fission power plants. I don't like the sound of that, Vice Admiral Morris Baez, Commander of Battle Squadron 23, said. From the acceleration numbers, they don't have the new beta nodes yet, Truman said. 
but their energy budget is obviously higher than it used to be, and defensively, I suspect they've added at least bow walls. One of the two possible new classes we've tentatively identified seems to be the closest they could come to a clone of the Shrike. It packs a laser instead of a grazer, but it's an awful lot more powerful than any energy weapons we've ever seen out of a people act before. We're not absolutely certain about the other possible new design. We think they've done their best to duplicate the ferret as well. If they have, they still can't get as much out of the design as we can, though, because of the inferiority of their missiles. The katana seem to have handled them fairly easily, though, Matsuzawa Hirotaka said. At love it, yes, Hiro. Truman nodded. On the other hand, they were present in strictly limited numbers. The vast majority of what they threw at us in Lovett were old-style cemeteries. That suggests to me that these new birds aren't yet available in huge numbers, but it doesn't take very long to build a lack, and we're talking about not launching Sanskrit II for another two months. They could have a lot more of them available by then. And since we hit Lovett, they're going to be reinforcing their central systems with everything they can as quickly as they can. How seriously would you assess their threat to our wall of battle, Alice? Honor asked. That's impossible to say without a better fix on their capabilities and the numbers we may be looking at. I'm not trying to waffle, Honor. We simply genuinely don't know. I've got some highly problematical performance parameters on them, but under the circumstances, I think we have to consider them minimal. They were operating with the older designs, and that would have restricted them to the cemetery's performance envelope. Scotty's been kicking our tentative numbers around with the rest of my colleagues, and what I'd really like to do is to have him set up some simulations built around our best estimates and game out what happens. I think the combination of the katanas and our own wall's defensive fire ought to be able to manage the threat, but I'll feel better if we're able to confirm that, at least in the Sims. I see. Anna regarded Truman thoughtfully, then nodded. It makes sense to me. And let's be sure to draw Buweb's attention to the data you've managed to record on them. I'll see to it, Your Grace, Brigham said, punching a note to herself into her memo pad. Good. In that case, let's look at possible approach courses. Obviously, we're going to want to scout the system thoroughly, so it seems to me that... Her officers leaned forward, listening intently, as she began to sketch out her own preliminary thoughts on the operation. Chapter 62 Admiral of the fleet Sebastian Dorville walked slowly onto his flag bridge, hands clasped behind him, expression suitably grave, and contemplated the perversity of the universe. He'd spent his entire career in the service of the crown, honing his professional skills, amassing seniority, proving his abilities. And what had all those decades of perseverance and professional excellence bought him? the most prestigious command in the Royal Manticoran Navy, of course, which meant he'd spent the dreary month since the Peep's sneak attack doing absolutely nothing. That's not true, Sebastian, and you know it. He scolded himself as he nodded pleasantly to the flag bridge personnel and crossed to the visual display. You've turned home fleet back into a proper weapon after that asshole Janicek let training levels go straight into the crapper, and commanding the fleet charged with protecting the home star system hasn't exactly been the least stressful duty slot you've ever held down. Which hasn't kept it from being boring as hell, of course. He chuckled inside at the thought, but that didn't make it untrue, and he suppressed an unworthy stab of envy as he thought of Honor Alexander Harrington. She always has had a way of putting your nose out of joint, hasn't she? He asked himself wryly starting with the way she blew your flagship out of space in that fleet maneuver back when she was, what, just a commander, wasn't it? He shook his head in memory. On the other hand, I don't suppose it's really fair to blame her for being so good, and she is awfully junior to you. Junior enough she gets the fun command, the one Admiralty House figures it can take chances with, while you get to be the Queen's one and only Admiral of the Fleet, and stay stuck at home with the one command that can't be risked. He chuckled mentally again, and then his thoughts saddened as he remembered James Webster. The two of them had been friends in Saganami Island, and it had been Webster's unenviable lot to command home fleet last time around. 
Dorville remembered how he'd teased Webster at the time, and he snorted. What went round came around, he supposed, and he'd clearly laid up enough bad karma to deserve what had happened to him. Of course, there were compensations. He turned from the visual display to regard the huge master plot and allowed himself a feeling of satisfaction as he studied the icons of the new fortresses. A year ago, the Manticoran Wormhole Junction's permanent fortifications had been virtually non-existent. In fact, they'd been so sparse, he'd been forced to hang home fleet all the way out at the junction to cover the critical central nexus of the Star Kingdom's economy against attack. He hadn't liked that, but the Janicek Admiralty's failure to update the fortresses had left him no choice. And at least the Manticore system's astrography had let him get away with it for a while. Classic system defense doctrine, developed over centuries of experience, taught that a covering fleet should be deployed in an interior position. Habitable planets inevitably lay inside any star's hyperlimit, and habitable planets were generally what made star systems valuable. That being the case, the smart move was to position your own combat power where it could reach those habitable planets before any attacker coming in from outside the limit could do the same thing. Unfortunately, one could argue that the wormhole junction was what truly made the Manticore system valuable. Dorville didn't happen to like that argument, but he couldn't deny that it had a certain applicability. Without the junction, the Star Kingdom would never have had the economic and industrial muscle to take on something the Republic of Haven size, and it was certainly the junction which made the Manticore system so attractive to potential aggressors like Haven in the first place. And therein lay the problem, or at least one of the problems. The junction was almost seven light hours from Manticore A, which meant any fleet stationed to cover the junction was light hours away from the planets on which the vast majority of Queen Elizabeth III's subjects happened to live. As the man charged with protecting those subjects, that was inconvenient for one Sebastian Dorville. The junction's position also put it over 11 light hours from Manticore B, which created Home Fleet's commander's second problem. But fortunately, Manticore B also lay far outside the resonance zone, the volume of space between the junction and Manticore A, in which it was virtually impossible to translate between hyperspace and normal space. Any wormhole terminus associated with a star formed a conical volume in hyper, with the wormhole at its apex and a base centered on the star and twice as wide as its hyperlimit, in which hyperspace astrogation became less than totally reliable. The bigger the terminus or junction, the stronger the resonance effect, and the Manticoran wormhole junction with its multiple termini was the largest ever discovered. The resonance zone it produced was more of a tsunami, and it didn't just make astrogation less than reliable, it made it the next best thing to flatly impossible. Any translation out of the resonance zone risked serious astrogational uncertainty, and any translation into the zone would have been no more than a complicated way to commit suicide. But since the Manticore binary system's secondary component lay outside the resonance and would for the next few hundred years or so, Homefleet had actually been closer from its position covering the junction, in terms of travel time, to Manticore B than to Manticore A. As for Manticore A, the planets of Manticore and Sphinx, Homefleet's major inter-system defensive obligations, had been well inside the same resonance zone when he took up command of home fleet with Manticore, with its smaller orbital radius steadily overtaking Sphinx as it moved towards opposition. Each planet spent half its year inside the zone, and Sphinx's year was more than 5T years long. That meant it took 31T months to cross through the RZ, and it had been almost in the middle of the zone when he took up his command. Actually, Sphinx's position was the third and in many ways worst problem confronting any home fleet CO because the planet's orbital radius was only 15.3 million kilometers, less than nine-tenths of a light minute, shorter than the GEO primary's 22 light minute hyperlimit. In an era of MDMs, that meant an attacker could translate out of hyper with the planet and its entire orbital infrastructure already 50 million kilometers inside his missile range. Even a conventionally armed fleet with old-style compensators and a relative velocity on translation of zero could have achieved a zero-zero intercept with the planet in under an hour. A fleet of super-dreadnoughts with modern alliance compensators could have done it in barely 50 minutes. Which, all things considered, didn't leave the system defense's commander a lot of time in which to react. But with Sphinx so deep inside the zone, he'd actually had much more defensive depth. 
He'd still been able, at least in theory, to cover both habitable planets from his position at the junction, since he could have micro-jumped away from the junction and the primary, and then jumped back in close enough to come in behind any fleet moving in on either planet. He would have found it difficult to actually overtake the attackers, perhaps, but the range of his MDMs would have compensated for that. And because it would have taken the attacker longer to reach engagement range of his target, Homefleet had had time to make those jumps, in theory at least. But theory, as Sebastian Dorville had learned over the years, had a nasty habit of biting one on the backside at the most inopportune moment. That was why he'd never really been happy with his enforced deployment. And now that Sphinx would clear the RZ in less than 14 months, he was even less comfortable with hanging his fleet on the junction. The planet had lost too much of the additional depth the zone had created for him, and even in a best-case scenario, his need to make two separate hypertranslations from the junction would have placed him well astern of his hypothetical attacker, since he couldn't make even the first of them until after the aggressor force arrived and started accelerating towards its targets. In effect, home fleet had been isolated from the rest of the inner system's defenses because any attacking fleet would be between Dorval's ships and the fixed defenses which were supposed to support it. And that attacking fleet would have been able to begin building an acceleration advantage towards its objectives while home fleet was still getting itself organized. Under those circumstances, an attacker without the strength to defeat both home fleet and the inner defenses together might well still have the strength to turn on home fleet which would have no option but to pursue him, and crush it in a separate, isolated engagement. Which was why Dorville was so relieved the new forts were finally operational. Much smaller than the old pre-war fortifications, which had been decommissioned to provide the manpower to crew new construction, they were actually more powerfully armed, thanks to the same increased automation and weapons developments which had gone into the Navy's new warships and each of those forts was surrounded by literally hundreds of missile pods with the fire control to handle stupendous salvos. It would take an attack in overwhelming force to break those defenses, which had freed Dorville to move home fleet closer to a more traditional covering position, locating his command in Sphinx orbit. His new station provided Sphinx with badly needed close-in protection— and with the planet of Manticore still trailing its orbital position, and so still deeper into the zone and, as always, further inside the hyperlimit, he was actually better placed to cover Manticore than he would have been anywhere else. Any least time course to Manticore would require the attacker to get past his position at Sphinx first, and he could easily intercept the opposing fleet short of its objective. The solution wasn't perfect, of course, for one thing, the move left Manticore B and its inhabited planet of Griffin more exposed than it had been when Homefleet was stationed at the junction, since Dorville would now have to get clear of the zone before he could hyper out to the system's secondary component. But the extra danger wasn't very great, now that Sphinx was within eight light minutes of the zone's boundary. And, more vulnerable or not, Griffin had the smallest population and industrial base of any of the Star Kingdom's original inhabited worlds. If something had to be exposed, cold logic said Griffin was a better choice than the other two planets, and the Admiralty had compensated as best it could by assigning the build-up of Manticore B's fixed defenses a higher priority than Manticore A's. In fact, Manticore B's forts and space station were already refitting with Keyhole 2 and would begin deploying the first of the system defense Apollo pods within the next three weeks, on the theory that it would need them worse since it couldn't call as readily on home fleet's protection. And once Manticore B's defenses were fully up to speed, Sphinx would receive the next highest priority, despite the fact that the planet of Manticore had the largest population and the greatest economic and industrial value of any of the binary system's worlds. Like Manticore B, Sphinx was simply more exposed than Manticore. Dorville agreed with both those decisions, although that didn't mean he was happy about the policy they implied. It was merely, in his opinion, the best of several options, none of which could have been completely acceptable. And at least the strategy board's decision that Griffin would have to look after itself, instead of relying upon immediate intervention by home fleet, had enormously simplified Dorville's responsibilities and problems. But today, Sebastian Dorville and half of home fleet were back out at the junction, waiting. Waiting not for an enemy attack, but to welcome back two of the Manticoran Navy's own. 
he had to admit that he felt a twinge or two of anxiety over taking his command so far from its new inner system station, but his qualms were tiny things, and given the way the Solarian League seemed to be pulling in its horns over events in the Talbot Cluster, the entire Star Kingdom owed a stupendous debt of gratitude to the two ships who were coming home today. Queen Elizabeth and her government had chosen to acknowledge that debt, and Sebastian Dorville was out here to do just that. He glanced at the date-time display and nodded in satisfaction. Another thirty-two minutes to go. Honor Alexander Harrington glanced at the date-time display and nodded. If she'd had the choice, she would have loved to have been back in the Manticore system in about half an hour. Unfortunately, she didn't really have that choice— Vice Admiral Liu Young Hasselberg, Graf von Kurtzberg, and the leading elements of his Task Force 16, IAN, had arrived at Trevor Star less than a week earlier. Two of his three battle squadrons were at full strength, and the Imperial Andermani Navy, like the Republic of Havens, still used eight ship squadron organizations. His third battle squadron remained short one of its four divisions, but what had already arrived had added 22 SDPs every one of them keyhole too capable, to Eighth Fleet's order of battle. Unfortunately, none of those ships had ever functioned as part of Eighth Fleet before, and eleven of them had finished their post-refit working-up exercises less than two weeks before they deployed forward to Trevor Star. And, just to add a little more interest to the situation, Vice Admiral Binhui Morser, Grafen van Grau, Hasselberg's second-in-command, was not one of the Royal Manticoran Navy's greater admirers— in fact, she was a holdover from the same anti manticoran faction within the IAN which had produced Graf von Sternhofen, who'd done so much to help make Honor's last duty assignment interesting. The rest of Hasselberg's senior flag officers seemed much more comfortable with the notion of their emperor's decision to ally himself with the Star Kingdom, and she suspected that Chen Lu Andermann had had more than a little to do with their selection for their present assignments. Morser obviously had patrons of her own, however, since she'd received command of the very first squadron of refitted Andermani SDPs. And, Honor admitted just a bit grudgingly, she also appeared to be very good at her job. It was just unfortunate that she found it difficult to conceal the fact that she would have preferred to be shooting at the rest of Honor's fleet rather than accepting her orders. Still, the Grafen's attitude only lent added point to the need to get TF-16 fully integrated into 8th Fleet as quickly as possible. And the best way to do that was to drill the Andermani ships in conjunction with the rest of her units. At least all of the arguments in favor of using Trevor Star as a training site still held good, and Vice Admiral Morser's professionalism was responding to the challenge. She couldn't have enjoyed admitting that the Andermani simply weren't quite up to Manticoran or Grayson's standards of proficiency, but neither could she deny it. Of course, the IAN hadn't spent most of the last twenty T years fighting for its survival against the People's Republic of Haven either. A navy either got very, very good under those circumstances, or else the star nation it was charged to defend got very, very dead, and both Grayson and the Star Kingdom were still here. The complacency the Janicek Admiralty had allowed to blunt the RMN's finely honed edge during the ceasefire had been a major factor in what happened during the Republic's Operation Thunderbolt, but most of it had been scoured away by the grim sandblaster of combat. The less than brilliant but politically acceptable flag officers and captains Janicek had appointed to sensitive positions had been shuffled aside or eliminated in the opening battles and the officers who remained had been given a rather brutally pointed refresher course. The bottom line, though, was that the Manticoran and Grayson navies were the explored galaxy's most experienced, battle-hardened fleets. Their margin of superiority over the revitalized navy of Thomas Theismann was far narrower than it once had been, but it remained the Alliance's most significant advantage. And the Andermani, although they were very, very good by any less Darwinian standard— simply weren't up to their allies' weight. Yet, at least. Hasselberg appeared to have understood that even before his arrival, which was another bit of evidence that Herzog von Robbenstrange had handpicked him for his assignment. Hasselberg clearly intended to bring his command up to Manticoran standards as quickly as possible, and if any of his subordinates, including Vice-Admiral Morser, had entertained any reservations about that, 
They were smart enough to keep those reservations to themselves, and in all fairness, they'd buckled down hard. They still had a way to go, though, which was the real reason Honor had turned down Admiral Dorville's invitation to join him aboard HMS Invictus for today's ceremony. She'd scheduled yet another in her series of increasingly rigorous training problems for Eighth Fleet, and she couldn't justify giving herself the day off while she made everyone else work. She chuckled quietly at the thought, and Mercedes Brigham, standing beside her and watching the master plot with her, looked at her with a raised eyebrow. Nothing, Mercedes. Anna shook her head. Just a passing thought. Of course, Your Grace. Brigham's slightly mystified tone almost set Anna off on another chuckle, but she suppressed the temptation sternly. Anything yet from Vice Admiral Hasselberg, Andrea? She asked instead, turning her head to look at Jerowalski. No, Your Grace. I think it's still a little early. His recon drones can't be fully into position yet. I realize that, Honor said quietly, pitching her voice low enough so that only Jerowalski and Brigham could hear her. But his first wave platforms have to be close enough by now to be picking up at least the outer edge of Alistair's screen. You think he's waiting until he has a more fully developed picture? Brigham asked. I think so, yes. Honor nodded. The question is why he's waiting. Is it strictly because he wants to watch the situation develop a little more, get a better feel for it himself before he reports it to the flagship? And if that's why he's waiting, is it because he's exercising intelligent initiative or because he resents being tied so tightly to our apron strings? And which do you think it is, Your Grace, if I can ask? Honestly, if it were more, sir, I'd call it a toss-up, Honor admitted. In this case, though, I think it's probably the former, and that's good, but we need to find a way to tactfully suggest to him that it's more important to inform us immediately, even if he has only partial information. Kapitän der Sterne Teicher is a tactful sort, Brigham said. I could probably have a little discussion with him, one chief of staff to another. He's pretty good at post-exercise analysis, too. That's an excellent idea, Mercedes, Honor approved. I'd much rather have any suggestions come to him in-house, as it were, rather than sound as if I'm stepping on his toes, especially when he's pulling out all the stops to make this work the way he is. I'll see to it, Your Grace. Estro Control reports that Hexapuma and Warlock are making transit, Admiral. Lieutenant Commander Ekaterina Lazarevna, Sebastian Dorville's communications officer, announced. Very good. Dorville turned from the main plot to the screen which showed his flagship's captain. Let's get it right, Sybil, he said. We'll get it done, sir, Captain Gilraven assured him. Good. Junction transit completed, Admiral, Lazarevna said. Very good. Send the first message, Katanka. Aye, aye, sir. Transmitting now. Dorville watched his chrono carefully as his message congratulating Ivars Tarakov and his surviving personnel for their accomplishments in the Battle of Monica flashed across to HMS Hexapuma. The two damaged heavy cruiser's icons blinked on his plot, accelerating slowly out of the junction, and Dorville felt something he hadn't felt since the day he'd watched the broken and crippled light cruiser HMS Fearless limp painfully home from Basilisk Station. Odd, he thought. The second time, and Warlock was involved in both of them, but a bit differently this time. I'm glad. She needed her name cleared. Now, Sybil, he said quietly, and the 138 starships and 1,700 lakhs of the home fleet detachment brought up their impeller wedges in perfect sequence. The impeller signatures radiated outward from Invictus, but Invictus wasn't in the traditional flagship slot at the center of that stupendous globe. That space was occupied by HMS Hexapuma and HMS Warlock. Second message for Hexapuma, Fleet Admiral Sebastian Dorville said quietly. Yours is the honor. Aye, aye, sir, Lazarevna said equally quietly, 
and home fleet moved steadily in system around the two battered, half-crippled heavy cruisers which had saved their star kingdom from a two-front war it could not possibly have won. Admiral Fisher's task force just came in, sir, Captain Delaney said. I see. Thank you, Molly. I'll meet you on Flatbridge in fifteen minutes. Yes, sir. Delaney clear, she said, and broke the comm connection. Lester Tourville sat at his desk for several seconds, looking around his day cabin, feeling the massive megaton bulk of RHNS Guerriere around him. At that particular moment, his flagship felt oddly small, almost fragile. He stood and walked across to the view screen, configured to show him the diamond-studded depths of space. He gazed deep into it, seeing the dim sparks of reflected light from the nameless star system's red dwarf primary. Each of those specks of light was a starship, most of them as massive and powerfully armed as Guerriere herself. Now that Fisher had arrived on schedule, the reinforced Second Fleet was complete, as was Admiral Chin's Fifth Fleet, and both were under Tourville's command. 336 SDPs, the flower of the reborn Republican Navy, and by any standards the most powerful battle force ever assembled for a single operation by any known star nation. They lay all about him, floating in distant orbit around the star system's second gas giant, waiting for his orders, and he felt a shiver of apprehensive anticipation flow through him. I never really thought it would all come together, even after Tom told me. But it has, and now it's all mine. It should have been Javier Giscard's command, he thought. Javier should have had Second Fleet and overall command while he had Fifth, but Javier was gone, and so the task had fallen to him. He thought about his orders, the different sets of contingency instructions, the planning and coordination and incredible industrial effort his huge fleet represented. The Republic's defenses had been unflinchingly reduced everywhere, despite the Mantis' widespread scouting activities. Hopefully, however, the enemy wasn't aware of that. Not yet. All of his units had been left where they were, each drilling relentlessly in the simulators, until the operation actually began expressly to keep the Mantis blissfully unaware of what was coming. He hadn't liked that. In fact, it was the one part of the operational plan which he'd actually protested. Simulations were all well and good, but no one had ever put a fleet this size together before. He'd needed to practice coordinating with Chin, needed to drill the actual units, put the subunit commanders physically through their paces where he could watch them, evaluate their strengths and weaknesses. He'd asked, almost pleaded, for the chance to do that, but his request had been turned down. And even though he was the one who'd asked for it, he'd understood why Thomas Theismann had refused it. It wasn't because Theismann didn't understand exactly why Torville had made the request in the first place. It wasn't because Theismann disagreed with him either. But for Operation Beatrice to succeed, complete strategic surprise was an absolute prerequisite. Indeed, surprise was so important, it had trumped even the need to conduct extensive hands-on training exercises. Given the activity of the Manti scouting forces, they dared not withdraw their picket forces from the stations closest to the enemy early. Even more, they hadn't dared to combine Tourville's units somewhere where a Manti reconnaissance drone might have picked them up and started their Office of Naval Intelligence wondering just why the Republic might have concentrated such a huge percentage of its total battle fleet in one place. But we still have over a week before we sortie, plus the transit time, he thought. It won't be as good as I would have preferred, but we can do a lot in that much time, and we'd better... Because at the end of it... He let the thought trail off because he didn't really know what would be waiting at the end of it. Except for the biggest naval battle in human history, of course. Chapter 63 How does it look now, Andrea? Better, Your Grace. Captain Jarowalski flipped a sighting circle into the main plot, dropping it neatly around the icons of Battle Squadrons 36 and 38, Imperial Andromani Navy. The light codes of the 16 Super Dreadnoughts burned steadily in the display, giving no indication of how hard they were to find, even for Imperator sensors. The numbers in the CIC sidebar, giving detected signal strength, were another story, however, 
indicating exactly how hard they would have been to detect had Imperator not known precisely where to look for them. Not quite as hard as Manticoran ships might have been, but harder than anyone else's, Honor noted, and nodded in approval. Not so much of the EW capabilities as of Fitze Admiral Morser's tactics. She slipped around behind Admiral Yanukov, Jarawalski continued. I don't think he knows she's there, but he's a sneaky one. He may just be playing dumb until she's got him right where he wants her. Why do you think that might be? Partly because of where he's got his carriers, Your Grace. He's got them pulled round, further ahead of his trailing battle squadron than his usual cruising dispositions. That puts the SDP's onboard point defense between them and Morse's batteries, but they're still far enough astern that he could get their katanas launched to thicken his task force missile defenses in a hurry. It may not mean anything, but it looks to me as if he's at least thinking about the possibility of being jumped from astern. I see. Honor folded her hands behind her, standing beside her command chair while Nimitz draped bonelessly over its back, and contemplated the plot. Andrea had a point, she decided, both about Judah's sneakiness and about his formation. Personally, Honor gave it a 60-40 chance Yanikov didn't know Morser was back there, or at least how close she was. For the purposes of this exercise, he'd been denied the use of Ghost Rider's extended platform endurance, his sensor capability had been stepped down to no more than 20% better than ONI's current best estimate of the Republic's capabilities, and his acceleration rate had been reduced to match that of Republican super dreadnoughts. That meant he was more myopic than he was accustomed to being, and he must feel heavy-footed, slow to maneuver. So it made sense for him to be particularly wary about the possibility of being overhauled from behind. Still, he was sneaky. Then again, so was Binhui Morser. Honor still didn't like her much, and she was aware, painfully one might say, given her ability to taste mind glows, that Morser's feelings for her went far beyond didn't like much. But the Fitze Admiral was a superior tactician, and her very dislike for Manticore had inspired her to drive her personnel even harder over the five days since Ivar's Terakov's return from Monica. She hadn't come off very well in that series of exercises, and she hadn't liked that much either. The last thing she wanted was to look inferior to the RMN. When you're number two, you try harder, Honor thought Riley. Especially when you resent the heck out of your number two status. Well, whatever works. I don't really care why she does it, as long as she does do it. She began to pace slowly back and forth, watching the gradually developing tactical situation. At the moment, Imperator was tagging along behind Contour Admiral Su Tung Waldberg's Battle Squadron 38 at the rear of Morser's formation. Yanikov had his own 15th Battle Squadron and Vice Admiral Baez's 23rd, plus Samuel Miklos's 5th Carrier Squadron, and all four of 8th Fleet's Manticoran and Grayson battlecruiser squadrons. Alistair McKeon's 61st Battle Squadron, most of Alice Truman's carriers, and the rest of Honor's cruisers and destroyers had stayed home, near the Trevor Star terminus of the junction with Admiral Cusack's 3rd Fleet for this one. The object was to give her Andermani units a significant force advantage, since they were tasked as the aggressors in this particular system defense exercise. Any word on Vice Admiral Hasselberg's units? She asked after a moment. Well, Jarowalski said, and Honor looked at her sharply, one eyebrow rising as she tasted the ops officer's emotions. Spit it out, Andrea. Well, I know Admiral Yanukov can't use the all-up Ghost Rider capabilities, and I know we're supposed to be letting Vice Admiral Morse call all the shots on this one. But I couldn't quite resist the temptation to deploy a few drones of my own, Your Grace. None of the take from them is going to more, sir, but it sort of lets me keep an eye on things. I see. And no doubt you simply forgot to display the positions of Vice Admiral Hasselberg and his ships. The fact that you were attempting to conceal your transgression from my eagle eye had nothing to do with the omission, right? Well, maybe a little, Your Grace, Jarowalski admitted with a grin. You want to see him? Go ahead and show me. Coming up now, Jarowalski said. 
and the understrength 41st Battle Squadron of Vice Admiral Hua Zhou Reinke, screened by the 16 battle cruisers of Counter Admiral Hen Chi Seifert and Counter Admiral Tsui Yun Wollenhaupt, and accompanied by Rear Admiral Harding Stewart's Mermaid and Harpy, appeared suddenly on the master plot. Mermaid and Harpy formed Carrier Division 34, detached from Truman's Silex Squadron to give the Andermani a carrier element. At the moment, they and the super dreadnoughts they were accompanying were well ahead of Yanikov's force, closing in on an almost directly converging heading, and Anna frowned. Reinke's squadron had only six STPs, which meant Yanikov's wallers outnumbered him by better than two to one. Stewart's carriers were outnumbered by three to one, and even in battle cruisers, Hasselberg was outnumbered four to three. That was bad enough, but coming in as he was, he'd be in MDM engagement range at least a half hour before Morser closed up from behind Yanikov, and a half hour was a long time in an engagement between pod layers. She started to say something, then changed her mind. She didn't really care for tactics which split an attacking fleet up into penny packets. It was too good a way to fritter away a numerical advantage and invite defeat in detail, especially if your timing screwed up, and that seemed to be what was about to happen to Hasselberg and Morser. It looked as if Hasselberg had planned on a simultaneous attack, enveloping Yanikov from a head and a stern at the same time. If he had, however, his timing was decidedly off. But that was a point for her to make to him privately, where he could be positive she wasn't criticizing him in front of his juniors. She wasn't afraid Jerowalski would have let anything slip to anyone else, even if she'd commented on Hasselberg's error, but it was a bad habit to get into, even with her own staff. And so she possessed her soul in silence, watching the situation unfold. And then... "'Your Grace, look at this!' Jerowalski said suddenly, and Anna frowned. It took her an instant to recognize what she was seeing, but when she did, she decided she was glad she hadn't criticized Hasselberg's timing after all. "'Is he doing what I think he's doing, Your Grace?' Jerowalski asked, and Honor chuckled. "'He is indeed, Andrea, and I'll be interested to see how Judah reacts. This is very like something he once pulled in a training exercise in Yeltsin.' She stepped over closer to Jerowalski, resting her right hand lightly on the ops officer's shoulder as they both watched the plot. Hasselberg had obviously just deployed Ghost Rider drones of his own. These weren't sensor platforms, though. They were EW platforms, configured to counterfeit the emission signatures of Morser's super dreadnoughts, and he was being subtle about it. The signal strength off the drones was very weak, barely more than 10% higher than what could have been expected to leak through a standard Andermani stealth field. Given the way Yanikov's sensor capabilities had been dialed back for the exercise, his tank officers were going to have a hard time recognizing what Hasselberg was doing. In fact, as became apparent a few moments later, they hadn't recognized it. Yanikov was changing course, turning away from the threat he'd just detected, and launching his lax. With only Republican levels of capability allowed to his reconnaissance drones, his lacks were his best long-range sensor platforms, despite their far lower acceleration rates, and he was sending them out to check out the suspect contacts. At the same time, as a precaution, he was deploying the bulk of his katanas between his battle squadrons and Hasselberg. His battle cruisers were redeploying as well, shifting to cover the threat axis with their anti-missile defenses. It was clear Yanikov didn't intend to allow himself to be drawn into automatically assuming he was seeing what his tactical sections thought they were seeing. At the same time, he'd equally clearly decided he had to honor the threat and shift his formation to meet it, which was exactly what Hasselberg had wanted him to do. The next thirty minutes passed slowly as Honor and Jerowalski watched the shifting patterns in the plot. Yanikov's turn away from Hasselberg had the effect of closing the range to Morser even more rapidly, but at such ranges, rapid was a purely relative term. Hasselberg was playing the game well, Honor decided. Once he'd given Yanikov a sniff of his position and drawn an obvious response, he cycled down the power of his decoy signatures. It looked exactly as if he wasn't positive he'd been detected, and he was reducing acceleration to cut back the strength of his impeller signatures and make his stealth systems more effective. 
The maneuver both lent verisimilitude to his deception and made it even harder to penetrate by requiring the reconnaissance lacks to close to much shorter range for positive identification. Honor pursed her lips thoughtfully as the range from Morser squadrons to Yanikov's dropped steadily. Yanikov was already in MDM range, and in another few minutes, his lacks were going to get close enough to see through Hasselberg's masquerade, so if she were more, sir, she'd be firing just about... Vite Admiral Morsus, open fire, your grace, Jarawalski said, and Honor nodded. So I see, she said mildly, folded her hands behind her once again, and walked calmly back to her command chair. Judo was going to be irritated with himself, she thought with a mental grin. He'd obviously taken Hasselberg's bait after all. He might not have allowed himself to go charging after it, but Hasselberg and his skillfully deployed drones had riveted Yanikov's attention on the smaller of the Andromani task groups. His tack crews hadn't been paying as much attention to other possible axes of threat, and when Morser launched, Yanikov's screen and Katana's were badly out of position with very poor shots at the incoming tide of missiles. Moreover, Morser had stacked her pods deeply. Her 16 super dreadnoughts had deployed almost 600 pods. Now they launched a total of 4,608 attack and EW missiles and 576 Apollo control missiles. Flight time was still almost six minutes, which gave Yanikov some time to adjust, but it wasn't long enough to significantly reposition his units, and as the missiles came streaking in, for the first time, 8th Fleet units found themselves on the receiving end of an Apollo attack. It was not, Honor thought, watching the first few damage codes appear on her display, like the first drifting flakes of a Sphinx mountain blizzard, going to be a pleasant experience. Admiral, it's time, Captain Delaney said quietly over the comm, and Lester Tourville nodded. Yes, I suppose it is, he agreed. Send the fleet to battle stations, Molly. I'll be up directly. Yes, sir. Tourville terminated the connection and stood. He patted his skin suit's cargo pocket automatically, checking to be certain his trademark cigars were where they were supposed to be. They'd become so much a part of his image that he probably could have demoralized his entire Flagbridge crew by the simple expedient of giving up smoking. The thought made him chuckle, and he was glad he was alone as he detected the edge of nervousness in the sound. Let's just get that out of our system right here, Lester. No butterflies in front of the troops. They deserve a hell of a lot better than that out of you. He glanced at himself in a bulkhead mirror. It was probably just as well none of his personnel knew he'd been sitting here, already skin-suited for the last fifteen minutes. Not that it had been because of any opening night jitters, or at least not very much so. It was more calculating than that. By suiting up early, he could take the time to do it right and arrive on Flagbridge calm and collected, looking as if he'd just stepped out of a training hollow. Just another of those little tricks to inspire his subordinates to pretend, even to themselves, that he was an unflappable, calm, confident leader. So sure of himself, he would turn up perfectly turned out without a single hair out of place. He ran one hand over the hair in question and chuckled again, much more naturally, just as the music began to play. One of Thomas Seisman's reforms had been to allow the captains of capital units the right to substitute more personalized selections for the stridency of the standard fleet alarms. Captain Welbeck had a fondness for really old opera, much of it actually dating from pre-space old Earth. Tourville had cherished private doubts when she decided to use some of it aboard Guerriere, but he had to admit she'd come up with a suitable selection for this particular signal. In fact, he thought it was an appropriate one even before she told him what it was called. Now hear this, now hear this. All hands, man battle stations. Repeat, all hands, man battle stations. Captain Celestine Welbeck's calm, crisp voice said through the ancient surging strains of Wagner's Ride of the Valkyries. Mom, the Alpha Arrays are reporting, Sweet Jesus! Lieutenant Commander Angelina Turner turned quickly, eyes flashing angrily. Just what the hell kind of report do you call that, Hellerstein? She demanded harshly, 
even angrier because Chief Petty Officer Bryant Hellerstein was one of her best, steadiest people. Commander, ma'am, this can't be right, Hellerstein blurted, and Turner strode quickly towards his station. She'd opened her mouth in another, still sharper reprimand, but Hellerstein's shocked expression when he turned to look at her stopped it unspoken. She'd never seen the tough, competent non-com look terrified before. What can't be right, Bryant? She asked, much more gently than she'd intended to speak. Mom, Hellerstein said hoarsely, according to the Alpha Arrays, 300-plus unidentified ships just made their Alpha translations right on the limit. Chapter 64 all right, Robert, let's get those drones deployed. Aye, sir. Commander Zucker began punching in commands at his console, and Rear Admiral Oliver Diamato turned to his chief of staff. It's not going to take them long to figure out we're out here, Serena, he said, one hand gesturing at the master plot which showed the Manticoran wormhole junction. Just getting this close to the junction made Diamato's skin crawl, because if there was one point... Besides their home system's inhabited worlds, guaranteed to make the mantis respond like a wounded swamp tiger, it was the junction. It's a matter of fact, sir, Commander Taverner replied with a mirthless smile. I sort of suspect they already know, don't you? I'm an admiral. That means I can put the best face on things if I want to, Diamato countered with a taut answering smile. In fact, as both he and Zucker knew perfectly well, the Manti system platforms had detected and pinpointed their hyper-footprints the instant they arrived. There was no point trying to fool those stupendous arrays. With dimensions measured in thousands of kilometers on a side, they could pick up even the most gradual translation into normal space at a range of literally light weeks, much less the signatures of two battlecruiser squadrons only six light hours from the primary. I suppose so, sir. Taverner agreed. Maybe that's why I'm just a commander. And don't you forget it. Diamato could almost feel his flag bridge crew relaxing at the banter between him and the chief of staff, and that was good. But there were more serious things to consider as well. What I meant, he continued, is that I'd like to put as much distance, very stealthily, as we can between us and our arrival points, I doubt we'll be able to drop off their systems, but it's worth a try. Yes, sir, Taverner said more seriously. She gazed at the plot along with him. Their recon drones were out, racing for the junction to keep a close eye on things, and already the faint sensor ghosts, which were all they ever seemed to see of the Mantis' all-too-aptly named Ghost Rider drones, were appearing, headed, as nearly as they could tell, in their direction. What about going to shell game, sir? She asked after a moment. That's what I was thinking, Diamato agreed. His ship's job was to keep as close an eye as possible on the junction for Second Fleet. Even with the FTL com, his reports to Lester Tourville would still be over six minutes old when they arrived, but that was infinitely better than the six-hour delay light speed transmissions would have imposed and at least the Manti defenses had made it easy for the planners to decide against sending in recon lacks, since none of them could have hoped to survive long enough to see a damned thing. That meant he wouldn't have lacked crew's deaths on his conscience, but it didn't exactly solve his other problems. Specifically, his drones, while more capable than they'd ever been before as recon platforms, still were nowhere near as stealthy as the Manti's drones. That meant he had to stay close enough to keep sending in fresh waves as the defenders picked off the earlier ones. At the same time, there was no point pretending his command could fight off what the Mantis could send its direction if they so chose. So instead of any deluded notions of martial glory and stand-up battle, it was time, as Taverner had just suggested, to rely on speed and dispersal. This far out from the system primary— and well to the side of the resonance zone, Diamato's sixteen battlecruisers were free to bob and weave, and once their hypergenerators finished cycling, they could always disappear into hyper if things looked like getting too hot anyway. The trick was to avoid letting anything with MDMs get within four or five light minutes of them. Should I pass the orders then, sir? 
Taverner asked, and he nodded. Do it, he said. Oh, shit. Admiral Stefania Grimm, Royal Astrogation Control Service, said to herself very, very quietly as a soft but urgent audio alarm sounded. The napkin she'd been using to brush cake crumbs from her tunic was suddenly a crushed ball in her hand, and the people who'd just been wishing her happy birthday turned as one to look at the plot. Figures, a corner of her brain thought, they would decide to come calling on my birthday. She looked around at the suddenly taut faces of her co-workers. ACS was a civil service organization, despite its military ranks, and most of her subordinates and staff had never imagined in their darkest nightmares that they might ever actually see combat. But Grimm's position as the commanding officer of the Manticore Junction's Traffic Control Service required her to cooperate closely with its military hierarchy. Not all ACS commanders had been comfortable fits for that side of their duties, but it helped that Grimm was herself ex-Navy. In fact, she'd reached the rank of captain of the list before transferring to ACS, and she'd quickly acquired a reputation among her military colleagues for efficiency and brains. That was especially welcome in the wake of her immediate predecessor, Admiral Alan Stokes, whose sole claim to his position had been his brother-in-law's close ties to Baron Highridge and First Lord Janicek. But right at this moment, knowing she was well thought of was remarkably little comfort to Admiral Grimm. The huge hyper-footprint just outside the system hyperlimit was bad enough, but for her personally, the scattered footprints and spreading impeller signatures eight light minutes out from the junction were just as bad. There were going to be incoming drones very shortly, and there might be more super-dreadnoughts hovering out there on the other side of the hyperwall, waiting to pounce, depending on what those drones told their masters. She wasn't the only one thinking dark thoughts, she noticed, watching the huge astroplot sidebars as the junction forts rushed to battle stations. It would take a lot of SDs to deal with them, she told herself, but that didn't make her feel a great deal better. There were several hundred freighters, passenger liners, mail boats, and exploration vessels, either already in transit through the junction's various termini, or else lined up in the transit queues awaiting their turns, and the thought of MDMs tearing around amidst all that defenseless civilian shipping made her physically sick to her stomach. She flipped up a plastic shield and punched a large red button on her console. A harsh, strident buzzer sounded, and every other sound on the command deck of HMSS De Gamma, the junction's central ACS platform, ceased abruptly. Every eye turned towards her as the saw-edged audio alarm jerked her personnel's attention to her. It hasn't been declared yet, but we have damn sure got ourselves a K-Zulu, people, she announced in a flat, tense voice. I'm declaring Condition Delta on my own authority. Clear the junction, all traffic, wherever it is in the queue, not just the outbounds already on final. I want anything that might draw an MDM's attention way the hell away from here ASAP. After that, Jordan, she continued turning to her exec, who still held half a slice of cake, get ready for the ride of your life, unless I miss my guess, what Admiral Yastremensky had to deal with when Earl Whitehaven took 8th Fleet to Basilisk was a walk in the park compared to what's coming our way. Get a dispatch bird away to Trevor Star with a sitrep immediately, then go ahead and start setting up for a minimum interval transit of everything Admiral Cusack and Duchess Harrington have. I'm not sure what their deployments are, but we could have close to a hundred Wallers coming through that terminus nose to us, and if a couple of SDs misjudge their intervals and collide or bring their wedges up too close together, we are going to have one hell of a mess. No joke, Captain Jordan Lamar said feelingly. So I want our best controllers on that lane, Grimm said. Forget about the standard watch schedule. Pull in the best from wherever the hell they are and get them at those consoles. She jammed a finger at the Trevor Star traffic controller section. Ten minutes ago. Then see what we've got available for tugs. Yes, ma'am, I'm on it, Lamar said. He looked down, saw the cake as if for the first time, and stared at it for just a moment. Then he chuckled harshly, shoved it into his mouth, and turned to his own comm to begin giving orders. Bradley? Grimm went on, turning to her official liaison to Admiral Thurston Havlicek, the Junction Defense Command's commanding officer. Bring Admiral Havlicek up to speed on what we've already done. I'm sure we're going to have drones incoming from these people in the next 30 or 40 minutes, 
and I'm sure he's got his own plans for dealing with them, but ask him if there's anything we can do to help. I'm thinking we may need to be looking at ways to stack the incoming wallers to block the drone's LOS to the terminus, keep them from getting a close enough look to tell the peeps what's coming or when. Whatever JDC needs and we can do, he's got, but I need to know what he wants now. Aye, aye, ma'am, Commander Bradley Hampton said with a grateful smile. I'll get right on it. Good, Grimm said quietly and looked back at the plot. The first Ghost Rider platforms were already 25,000 kilometers out, accelerating at just over 5,000 gravities. She couldn't see them, though she knew they were there. But she could see the blossoming impeller signatures of Junction Defense Command's lax. Over 3,500 were already in space, and more were appearing with metronome precision as the lac platforms launched. You bastards just go right ahead and come in on us, she thought venomously at the impeller signatures of the battlecruisers trying to spy on her command area. Come right ahead. We've got something for you. Sebastian Dorville's thoughts about the boredom of his assignment ran through the back of his brain like a bitter, distant echo as he strode onto HMS Invictus's flag bridge. Despite all his training, all his preparation, all the simulations and war games and contingency planning, he suddenly discovered that he'd never really believed it would happen, that the peeps would have the sheer unadulterated nerve to actually attack the Star Kingdom of Manticore's home star system. And why the hell didn't you believe it? His brain demanded contemptuously. You were ready enough to think about invading their home system during Buttercup, weren't you? Pissed off because San Just's ceasefire ploy stopped the operation, weren't you? Well, it seems they can think big too, can't they? Talk to me, Maurice, he said harshly. They're coming straight down our throats, sir. Captain Maurice Irol, his chief of staff, replied flatly. The only finesse I can see is their approach vector. It looks like they think they're going to take out Home Fleet and Sphinx first, then roll on over Manticore, but they're trying to leave themselves an out just in case, and their astrogation was first rate. They came in right on the intersection of the resonance zone and the hyperlimit and split the angle almost exactly. It's not a least time approach, but it means they can break back across the zone boundary if it gets too deep instead of being committed to the inner system. At the moment, they're eight light minutes out, closing at 1,500 kps, and they're pouring on the Excel. They must be running their compensators at at least 90% of full military power because current acceleration is right on 4.8 kps squared. Well, Dorville said, that's why we deployed this way. What does it look like for a zero-zero intercept on the planet? Just under three hours, Irol said. Turnover in roughly 86 minutes. They'll be up to 26,000 kps at that point. The chief of staff grimaced. I suppose we should be grateful for small favors, sir. They could have cut their time by over 30 minutes if they'd come straight in across the zone boundary. Time to range on the planet if they decide to go for maximum range shots? Dorval asked levelly, hoping his tone and expression hid the icy chill running down his spine at the thought of weapons as notoriously inaccurate as long-range MDMs screaming through the inner system. On a zero-zero profile, 94 minutes. If they go for a least-time approach without turnover, they can shave roughly a minute off of that. Either way, it's about an hour and a half. I see. Dorville considered what Irol had said. Home fleet was still rushing to battle stations, but at least it was standing policy to hold his ship's nodes permanently at standby readiness, despite the additional wear that put on the components. He'd be able to get underway in the next twelve to fifteen minutes. The question was what he did when he could. No, he told himself. There really isn't any question at all, is there? You can't let those missile pods get any closer to Sphinx than you can help. But, Jesus, over three hundred ships? Does tracking have a breakdown yet, Madeline? He asked, turning to his operations officer. It's just coming in now, sir, Captain Madeline Gwinnett told him. She watched the information come up on her display, and he saw her shoulders tighten. Tracking makes it two hundred and forty super dreadnoughts, sir, 
At this time, it looks like they're all port layers, but we're trying to get drones in closer to confirm that. They've also got what looks like 16 Sealax and a screen of roughly 90 cruisers and lighter units as well. Thank you, Madeline. Dorville was pleased, in a distant sort of way, by how calm he sounded, but he understood why Gwinnett's shoulders had stiffened. Home fleet contained 42 SDPs and 48 older super dreadnoughts. He was outnumbered by better than two and a half to one in capital ships, but the ratio was almost six to one in SDPs. He had 12 pot laying battle cruisers as well, but they'd be spit on a griddle against super dreadnoughts. Still, he told himself as firmly as possible, the situation wasn't quite as bad as the sheer number suggested. The new tractor-equipped flat-pack missile pods would allow each of his older super dreadnoughts to tow almost 600 pods inside their wedges, glued to their hulls like high-tech limpets. That was 120% of a Medusa class's internal pod loadout, and the ships were already loading up with them. Unfortunately, they didn't have the fire control to manage salvos as dense as a Medusa could throw. Worse, they'd have to flush the majority of their pods early in order to clear the sensor and firing arcs of their point defense and its fire control arrays. So he was going to have to use them at the longest range, where their accuracy was going to be the lowest. Katenka, he said to Lieutenant Commander Lazarevna, get me Admiral Caporelli. Aye, aye, sir. Caporelli appeared on Dorville's comm display almost instantly. Sebastian? he said, his voice level, but his expression taut. Tom. Dorville nodded back, thinking about how many times they'd greeted one another exactly the same way before, and wondering if they'd ever do it again. I think I've got to go out to meet them, Dorville continued. If you do, you lose the inner system pods, Caporelli countered, and Dorville nodded grimly. The inner system defenses relied heavily on MDM pods, and they'd been deployed in massive numbers. Unfortunately, he thought, the numbers weren't massive enough. They'd been designed to stop any likely attack cold, but the defensive planners hadn't counted on an adversary who was prepared to throw over 200 modern pod knots and all the anti-missile defenses that implied straight into their teeth. They might still be able to beat off the attack, but not without letting the attackers into their own missile range of the hideously vulnerable dispersed shipyards in which the Royal Manticoran Navy's entire next generation of super dreadnoughts was approaching completion. He couldn't let the peeps close enough to do to the home system shipyards what had already happened to Grendelsbane's. And that doesn't even count what could happen if they open fire on the inner system from that far out— and a couple of their missiles run into Manticore or Sphinx at seventy or eighty percent of light speed, he thought with a shudder. If you go out to meet them, Caporelli continued, you'll have to take them on without any support, and they've got a huge edge in numbers. You'll lose everything you've got if you meet them head-on. And if I don't take them head-to-head, I let them into range of the planet, Dorval countered harshly. So far, they've stayed away from anything which might look like a violation of the Eridani Edict, Caporelli pointed out. And so far, they haven't invaded our home system either, Dorville shot back. The Manticoran tradition was that the Admiralty did not second-guess a fleet CO when battle threatened, not even home fleet's commander. What Dorville did with his fleet was his decision. Admiralty House might advise, might provide additional intelligence or suggest tactics— but the decision was his, and it wasn't like Thomas Caporelli to try to change that. But Dorville wasn't really surprised by Caporelli's reluctance to admit what he knew as well as Dorville did had to happen. The First Space Lord knew too many of the men and women aboard Dorville's ships, and he couldn't join them. He would be safely back on Manticore when the hammer came down on Homefleet, and Sebastian Dorville knew Caporelli too well, knew exactly what the other admiral was feeling— the miracle he wanted to find. But there were no miracles, not today, and so Dorville shook his head. No, Tom, he said almost gently. I'd like to hang back, believe me I would. But we can't count on continued restraint where their targeting's concerned. This one is for all the marbles. They've got thirty squadrons of SDPs, the equivalent of forty of our squadrons, with over a million people aboard them, 
coming at us right into the heart of our defenses. That means they're ready for massive losses. I don't think we can expect them to take that kind of punishment without handing out whatever they can in return, and even if they never intentionally fire a single shot at the planet, think about how damned inaccurate end-of-run MDMs are. I can't let hundreds of those things go flying around this close to Sphinx. I know. Caporelli closed his eyes for a moment, then inhaled deeply and opened them once more. I've ordered the K-Zulu message transmitted to all commands, he said, his voice more clipped, his dread of what was to come cloaked in reflex professionalism. Theodosia can start responding from Trevor Star in about fifteen minutes, but most of Eighth Fleet is off the terminus on maneuvers. I don't know how quickly it can get back there, but I'm guessing it'll take at least a couple of hours just for Duchess Harrington to get to the terminus. I'm recalling Jessup Blaine squadrons from the Lynx Terminus as well, but our best estimate on his current response time is even longer than Eighth Fleet's. And even Theodosia can't do it in a mass transit, Dorville said grimly. She's going to have to do it one ship at a time, the same way Hamish did it when the bastards hit Basilisk, because we're going to need everything she's got. Cusack could have put almost thirty super dreadnoughts through the junction in a single mass transit, but the destabilizing effect would have locked down the Trevor Star Manticore route for almost seventeen hours. Even in a sequence transit, each ship of the wall would close the route for almost two minutes before the next in the queue could use it. You're right, Caporelli agreed. Allowing for her screening units, she's going to need almost two hours just to make transit. By which time, these people will be about an hour out from Sphinx, and she can't possibly catch them, Dorval said. We're scrambling every lock we've got, Caporelli said. We should be able to get five or six thousand of them to you by the time you engage. That will help, a lot, Dorval said. But they've got sixteen carriers with them. That gives them over three thousand of their own. I know. Caporelli looked out of the display, his eyes and face grim. All you can do is the best you can do, Sebastian. We'll do whatever we can to support you, but it isn't going to be much. Who would have thought they'd throw something this size at us? Dorval asked, almost whimsically. Nobody on the strategy board, that's for sure. Caporelli's voice was briefly saw-edged with bitter self-reproach, as if there were some way he could have kept this nightmare from coming. Then he got control of it again. Actually, I suspect Harrington's the only one who would have believed they might throw the dice this way, and I honestly don't think even she would have expected them to. Well, they're here now, and my nodes are coming up. It looks like we're going to be pretty busy in a little while, Tom. Clear. Your Grace! Honor stepped back from her sparring match with Clifford McGraw and looked up in astonishment as one of Major Lorenzetti's Marines came skidding through the gymnasium hatch. Spencer Hawk and Joshua Atkins wheeled towards the sudden, unexpected arrival, hands flashing to their pulsers, and she spat out her mouth protector and threw up her own hand. No threat! she snapped. Hawk continued his draw, but his pulser stayed pointed at the deck. He didn't even look at her. His attention was locked on the Marine, who, Honor knew, didn't begin to realize how close he'd just come to being shot. In fact, probably the only thing that had saved him was her armsman's faith in her and Nimitz's ability to sense what was going on inside someone else. But not even that faith was going to get Hawk's sidearm back into its holster until he knew positively what was happening. At the moment, however, that was a completely secondary concern for Honor beside the consternation and turmoil boiling inside the Marine. Yes, Corporal Thaxton, she said, reading the Marine's name off of his nameplate and deliberately pitching her voice into the most soothing register she could. What is it? Your Grace. Thaxton stopped and shook himself. Beg pardon, Your Grace, he said after a moment, his voice under tight control. Captain Cardonus's compliments. He touched the communicator at his belt, as if to physically indicate where Cardonus's message had come from. And we've just received a case Zulu from the Admiralty. Honor jerked fully upright. She couldn't have heard him correctly, but even as she told herself that, her memory flashed back to another day aboard another ship. 
the last time someone had transmitted the code phrase Case Zulu. In the Royal Manticora Navy, those two words had only one meaning, invasion imminent. Thank you, Corporal, she said, her voice crisp yet calm enough the Marine looked at her in something very like disbelief. She nodded to him, then wheeled to Hawk and Atkins while Nimitz came bounding across the gym towards her. Spencer, get on the comm. Find Commodore Brigham. Tell her we're in the gymnasium and that I'll see the staff on Flagbridge in five minutes. Yes, my lady. Hawk reholstered his pulser with one hand and reached for his communicator with the other, and Honor opened her arms as Nimitz leapt into them, then turned to Atkins. Joshua, come back. Tell him I'll need my skin suit and Nimitz's on Flagbridge as soon as possible. Yes, my lady. Clifford, she said over her shoulder to her third armsman as she started for the hatch. Just grab your gun belt. You can worry about the rest of your uniform later. Yes, my lady. Sergeant McGraw snatched up his weapons belt and buckled it over his own gi. Fifteen seconds after Corporal Barnaby Thaxton, RMMC, had delivered Rafe Cardonis's message, Admiral Lady Dame Honor Alexander Harrington was headed purposefully for the lifts, with her armsmen jog-trotting to match her long-legged strides. It seems they've made up their minds, sir, Commander Fraser Adamson observed, watching the icons of the Manticoran home fleet. It's not as if we've left them a lot of options, Lester Tourville said without looking at his operations officer. Adamson was a highly competent tactician, an efficient organizer, and a loyal subordinate. He was also a pretty fair pinnacle player, and Tourville liked him quite a lot under normal circumstances. But outside his area of professional interest, the commander had about as much imagination as a wooden post. It wasn't that he was a shallow person or insensitive in his personal relationships. It was simply that it would never have occurred to him to put himself inside the minds and emotions of the people aboard the ships accelerating away from Sphinx to meet Second Fleet. At the moment, Lester Tourville, who was cursed with entirely too much imagination, bitterly envied that inner blind spot. They can't feel confident we won't bombard the planetary orbitals, or even the planet itself, from long range, he continued, especially if they use the inner system pods. So they're going to come to meet us, try to thin us down to something which won't dare continue inward to hit the fixed defenses at all. Yes, sir, Adamson said. That's what I meant. He seemed surprised by his admiral's restatement of the obvious, and Tourville made himself smile. I know it was, Fraser. I know it was. He patted the ops officer on the shoulder and walked a couple of paces closer to the main tactical display. He stood gazing into it until he sensed a human presence at his side and looked down to see Captain Delaney standing there. Fraser means well, boss, his shorter chief of staff said quietly. I know he does. Tourville smiled again, more naturally, but it was a sad smile all the same. One only those he knew and trusted were ever allowed to see, since it accorded so poorly with his cowboy persona. It's just that he only sees them as targets, Tourville continued equally quietly. Right now, I wish I did too, but I don't. I know exactly what they're thinking over there, but they're going to come out to meet us anyway. Like you said, boss, Delaney's smile was a mirror of his own. We didn't leave them much choice, did we? Forget the screen, Admiral Theodosia Cusack snapped. We can cut 15 minutes off our total transit time if we leave them behind, and it's not like cruisers and destroyers are going to make any difference, is it? No, ma'am, Captain Gerald Smithson, her chief of staff, replied. He was a tall, spare-looking man, his dark hair and complexion a stark contrast to Cusack's red hair and fair skin, and he seemed to be coming back on balance after the shock of the Admiralty's case Zulu. "'Has astral control responded?' Cusack demanded, wheeling around to Lieutenant Franklin Bradshaw, her communications officer. "'Yes, ma'am,' Bradshaw said. "'As a matter of fact, Admiral Grimm's courier boat just came back through from the Manticore end,' She'd already started clearing the junction even before she sent it through the first time. Now she's working out the best dispositions for our units to help screen the arrival terminus from peep drones. 
and she's also moving tugs to the inbound nexus in case any of our units require assistance. A nice thought, Cusack said with a mirthless smile. But if any of our wallers bump, tugs aren't going to be much help. Take what we can get, ma'am, Smithson said with graveyard humor, and Cusack snorted a harsh chuckle. Actually, ma'am, Smithson continued in a low-pitched voice, I've just had a rather nasty thought. What if this isn't their only fleet? What if they've got another one waiting to hit Trevor Star as soon as we pull out for Manticore? The same thought occurred to me, Cusack replied equally quietly. Unfortunately, there's not a lot we can do about it if they do. We've got to hold the home system. If they punch out Hephaestus and Vulcan, take out the dispersed yards, it'll be a thousand times worse than what happened at Grendelsbin. I hate to say it, but if it's a choice between San Martin and Sphinx or Manticore, San Martin loses. At least the system defenses are better than they were when the shooting started, Smithson said. They are, but that's another reason we can't afford to lock down the junction with the mass transit. If they do have something like that in mind, we've got to be able to get back as quickly as we left. What about Duchess Harrington? Smithson asked. She's too far out to rendezvous with us before we make transit. Should we ask her to stay behind and mind the store while we're gone? I wish we could, but we'll have to see what happens with Home Fleet. And, of course, I can't give her direct orders since... Excuse me, ma'am. You have a calm request from Duchess Harrington? Bradshaw interrupted suddenly. Throw it to Jerry's display, Cusack said, bending over the chief of staff's console rather than waste time walking back to her own. An instant later, Smithson's flat screen lit with the image of Eighth Fleet's commander. Harrington had obviously been as surprised as everyone else, Cusack thought, noting the gi she hadn't burned up time changing out of. Admiral Harrington? she said with a choppy nod. Eighth Fleet was almost 78 million kilometers from the terminus. At that range, even the FTL comm imposed a noticeable lag, and eight seconds passed before Honor nodded back. Admiral Cusack, she replied, then continued getting straight to business in light of the delay. I assume you're already planning an immediate transit to Manticore with Third Fleet? I'm sending my battle cruisers ahead, but it's going to take most of my units another two hours plus to reach the terminus. With your permission, I'll temporarily assign Admiral McKeon's battle squadron and Admiral Truman's carriers to you. Thank you, Admiral, Cusack said very, very sincerely. The sooner they get there, the better, Anna replied eight seconds later. And please remember that three of Alistair's super dreadnoughts are Apollo capable. I don't know how much difference it's going to make, but... She shrugged and Cusack nodded grimly. I'll remember, Your Grace. I only wish I had more of them. I'll bring the rest through as quickly as I can, Anna promised after the inevitable delay. And I'll try to make sure there's still a star kingdom when you do, Cusack replied. Well, sir... Commander Zucker said. The good news is that they don't seem to be deploying anything but larks to cover the junction. The bad news is that they've got a hell of a lot of them. So I see, Oliver D'Amato murmured. Like Zucker, he was delighted he wasn't already having to play tag with hordes of Manti battlecruisers, or worse, those damned MDM-armed heavy cruisers he'd heard so much about from Navent since that business at Monica but the shoals of lack impeller signatures sweeping outward from the junction were building a solid wall of interference which made it almost impossible for his shipboard sensors to see a damned thing, even at this piddling little range. The density of that lack shell also augured poorly for the survival of his recon drones when they finally got close enough for a look of their own. On the other hand... All right, Serena, he said quietly. Think with me here... They're covering up big time with lax, and they aren't sending a single hypercapable unit after us. What does that suggest to you? That we don't want to get much closer to them, sir? The chief of staff suggested with a tight grin, and he snorted a chuckle. Besides that, he said. Well, she frowned thoughtfully, running one hand over her hair. I'd say they're probably trying to use the lax as much to blind us keep us guessing about what's going on on the junction as to actually defend it. 
which suggest they're doing something they think we wouldn't like, like bringing bunches of big, nasty ships through from Trevor Star. Yes, it does. But what do you get when you add the fact that no one is heading our way? No battle cruisers or heavy cruisers swanning around trying to nail us, or at least push us further away from the junction. That they're bringing through wallers, not screen elements, Taverner said after a second or two. Exactly. It was D'Amato's turn to frown. Much as we made to admit it, a one-on-one -on -one engagement with one of us would be a Manti B.C. skipper's wet dream. So if they're not sending them after us, then they must have had wallers in place and ready to start coming through almost immediately instead. And they're going right on doing it, which suggests they have quite a few of them on call. He frowned some more, then looked over his shoulder at his comm officer. Record for transmission to Guerriere. Attention, Captain Delaney. So, Cusack or Harrington, or both, are officially on their way, boss, Molly Delaney said quietly, and Torville nodded. So far, so good, he agreed, and looked at Adamson. Start deploying the donkeys, Fraser, he said. Chapter 65 So their acceleration's dropping, Captain Gwinnett said. Dorville stepped across to her console, accompanied by Captain Irol, and she looked up at him. How much is it coming down? he asked. Only about a half a KPS squared so far, sir. What the hell are they up to now? Irol wondered aloud. Putting pods on tow, maybe, Dorville replied. I suppose that could be it, sir, Gwynedd said. Their ports are almost as stealthy as ours are, and the recon platforms wouldn't be able to see them at this range, but those are super dreadnoughts. They'd have to have an awful lot of tractors to be able to tow so many pods they'd have to tow them outside their wedges. Dorval nodded. Pods towed inside a ship's wedge didn't degrade its acceleration. That, after all, was exactly what his own pre-pod designs were doing with the tractor-equipped pods glued to their hulls, but super dreadnought wedges were huge. For the peeps to be towing so many pods they couldn't fit them all inside their wedges, they'd have to have hundreds of tractors per ship. So they had to be up to something else. But what? Maybe they've got tech problems, Irol suggested. Could be one of their SDs has lost a couple of beta nodes and had to reduce Excel, the others might be reducing so she can stay in company. Possible, Dorval conceded. Or it could be even simpler than that. Maybe they've just decided to ease off on their compensator margins now that they know we're coming out to meet them. Irold nodded, but Dorval wasn't really satisfied with his own hypothesis. It made sense, but it just didn't feel right somehow. How far do you want to close before opening fire, sir? Gwynnett asked after a moment, and he looked back down at her. Despite the fact that he and Irol were standing right beside her, she had to pitch her voice very low to keep it from being overheard, because it was very quiet on HMS Invictus's flag bridge. Everyone had had time to realize what was going to happen, and fear hung in the background. There was no panic, no hesitation, but they knew what they faced, and the people on that bridge wanted to live just as much as anyone else. The knowledge that they very probably wouldn't was a cold, invisible weight pressing down upon them. Dorville knew it, and he wished there was something he could say or do, not to make the fear go away, because no one could have done that, but to tell them how much they meant to him, how bitterly he regretted taking them on this death ride. We have to make them count, he told Gwynnett equally quietly. We know our accuracy and penades are better, but we've still got to get in close. They're going to bury us whenever we open fire, and according to the recon drones, every single one of their wallers is a pod design. They aren't going to face the same use-them-or-lose-them constraints we are. So we're either going to wait until they open a fire, or else until the range drops to 65 million clicks. Gwynnett looked at him for a moment, then nodded slowly. I know, I know, 
he said softly. But we've got to get our hits through at all costs. We've got to, Madeline. If we don't, all of this... A slight motion of his head, almost as much imagined as seen, indicated his flag bridge and the fleet beyond it. Is for nothing. Yes, sir, I understand. Which fire plan do you want to use, sir? Iroh asked. We'll go with Avalanche, Dorville said grimly. Madeline, I want you to start shifting formation to Sierra 3. How many lacs have managed to overtake us? Just over 3,500 so far, sir. Another 500 will be here by the time we reach the range you've specified. How many are katanas? I'm not positive, sir. Under half, I know that much. I wish we had more, Dorville said. But what we have is all we've got. Pull them forward and spread them vertically. I want their vipers positioned for the best firing arcs we can build. Yes, sir and set up your firing sequences to have the older ships deploy their pods first. We'll try to hold the internal pods as long as we can. I want the keyhole ships to manage as many of the other units' pods as possible in the opening salvos. Yes, sir, I understand. Good, Madeline, good. Dorville patted her gently on the shoulder. I'll let you get on with it, then. Yes, sir, Captain Gwinnett said. We're in range, Admiral, Commander Adamson pointed out, and Lester Tourville nodded. I'm aware of that, Frazier, thank you. Yes, sir. Tourville tipped back in his command chair and glanced at Molly Delaney. So, Tom was right, he said quietly. It looks that way, Delaney agreed, and Tourville wondered if the relief hidden behind her calm expression could possibly be as great as the one roaring through him. He looked at the master plot with its sprawl of light codes. Second Fleet had been accelerating towards Sphinx for the last hour. Given the system's geometry, Torville's present vector cut a cord at an angle of almost exactly 45 degrees to the outer wall of the hugely elongated, skinny resonance zone. His phalanx of super dreadnoughts was up to 18,560 kps relative to the system primary, and they traveled over 35,600,000 kilometers. The Mantis home fleet had been under acceleration for only 47 minutes, on an almost exactly reciprocal course, but with its higher base acceleration, its velocity relative to the primary was already up to better than 17,000 kps, and it had traveled just over 24 million kilometers from its initial station. Although Tourville's command was still almost half an hour from its turnover point for a zero-zero intercept of Sphinx, the range between the opposing forces had fallen to just a shade over 84 million kilometers, and their closing speed was up to 45,569 kps. That geometry gave Tourville's MDMs an effective range of better than 85,369,000 kilometers, which, as Fraser Adamson had just observed, meant they were in extreme missile range of home fleet. But Mantikoran MDM's acceleration rate was just over 34 kps squared higher than his birds could pull. That gave them a current effective range of better than 90,370,000 kilometers, which meant he'd be in their effective range for over two minutes. It doesn't just look like he was right, he told Delaney after a moment. He was. If they had those god-awful missiles, they'd already be launching. They'd have spent the last ten minutes doing nothing but rolling pods, and they'd be punching them down our throats right this instant. They'd still have a transmission lag, but it'd be less than five seconds one way, while ours would be over five minutes. So they'd have started hitting us now without letting us close into our own effective range. You don't think they might just be letting the range fall a little more for their own fire control, boss? That's exactly what they're doing— and that's another reason we can be confident that they don't have the new missiles. They've got less than a hundred wallers over there. Even assuming they've got heavy external port loads, which they very well could, despite their excel, if Nevens write about their new port designs, they're outnumbered better than two to one. They wouldn't be closing straight into salvos the size they know we can throw if they had any choice at all. Or at least, they wouldn't be doing it without trying to whittle us down a bit first. 
but without the new control system, their accuracy at this range will be almost as bad as ours. They wouldn't get the kills they needed to do any whittling. They've got to get closer to improve their accuracy, just like we do. It's going to be ugly when we do open fire, Delaney said quietly, and Torville nodded again. That it certainly is, he agreed grimly. On the other hand, we planned for it, didn't we? Yes, sir. Torville studied the icons of the oncoming home fleet super dreadnoughts for another few moments, then looked at a secondary display and shook his head in admiration. He'd always known Shannon Foraker had a talent for thinking outside the box. Way back when she'd been his operations officer, he'd recognized her knack for coming up with solutions which simply didn't occur to other people, concepts so elegantly simple everyone wondered why they hadn't thought of them. When Navent reported that the new Mantipods incorporated onboard tractors as a way to allow their prepod ships to tow greater numbers of them, it had seemed impossible for the Republic to respond. Their pods were already too big, and they had too limited a power budget to permit the designers to cram a tractor into them and power the damned thing as well. But Shannon had decided to turn the problem on its head. Instead of fitting additional tractors into the pods, she'd come up with the donkey. That was what everyone was calling it, although it had a suitably esoteric alphabet soup designation, and it was another of those elegantly simple foraker specialties. Instead of the typically manty bells and whistles approach of putting the tractor inside the pod, Shannon had simply built a very stealthy pod-sized platform, which consisted of nothing except a solid mass of tractor beams and a receiver for beamed power from the ships which deployed it. Each donkey had the capacity to tow ten pods, and a sovereign of space-class SDP had enough tractors to tow twenty of them. Better yet, they could actually be ganged together, as long as all the pods in the gang could be lined up for power transmission from the mothership. In theory, they could have been stacked three tiers deep, with each donkey towing ten more donkeys, each towing ten more donkeys, each... If Lester Tourville had so chosen, his 240 super dreadnoughts could, in theory, have towed 4.8 million pods, except for the minor fact that the drag would have reduced them to negative acceleration numbers, not to mention the fact that he didn't begin to have the power transmission capability to feed that many donkeys. Still, he could tow quite a lot of them, and the readiness numbers on the display gave him a sense of profound satisfaction. He studied them a moment longer, then looked at Lieutenant Anita Eisenberg, his absurdly youthful communications officer. What's the latest from Admiral Diamato, Ace? No change, sir. He still can't get a clear look. Their fortresses and the lacks deployed to cover the junction are picking off his recon platforms before they get close enough for that. But he still hasn't seen any hyper-capable units headed his way, and he's positive they're still coming through from Trevor Star. No one started in system yet, though. Thank you, Torval said and cocked an eyebrow at Delaney. The chief of staff clearly had been running through the same mental math he had, and she grimaced. They've been coming through for over 45 minutes now, boss. By my calculations, that means at least 24 wallers so far. And it means they're planning on bringing through a lot more than that, Torval agreed. They could have put 27 through in a mass transit and be netted after us over half an hour ago. The only reason to delay this long is because they figure they can't afford to lock the junction down because they've got one hell of a lot more than 27 wallers waiting to come up our backside. Still, boss, if I were them, I might be thinking about sending some of the ships I've already got through the junction after us. No way. Turvel shook his head. I wish to hell they would, but the Mantis pick their best people to command Home Fleet, Third Fleet, and Eighth Fleet. I've studied Naven's files on all three of them, and they aren't going to cooperate with our plans with a dam. Dorville's probably the most conventional thinker of the three, but he's also got the simplest equation, and plenty of guts. He can't let us get any closer to Sphinx than he can possibly help, so he's going to hit us head-on as far out as he can. He's going to get clobbered. In fact, I'll be surprised if any of his super dreadnoughts survive. But like you just said, it's going to be ugly for both sides, 
and our own losses are going to be heavy. He knows that, and he probably figures he can score at least a one-for-one exchange rate, despite the tonnage ratios. I think he may be being a little optimistic, but not very much. So given the combat strength he thinks he's up against, he probably figures he'll hurt us so badly we won't be able to close through the fixed inner system defenses and missile pods. And if his analysis of the balance of forces was correct, he'd be right. Tourville and his chief of staff looked at one another, and this time their smiles were hard. It was entirely possible RHNS Guerriere would be among the heavy losses the admiral had just predicted his fleet was going to suffer, but at this moment, an even exchange rate was actually heavily in the Republic's favor in the merciless mathematics of war, and those losses were also part of the bait in the trap Thomas Theismann and his octagon planning staff had crafted. Cusack's more of a free thinker than Dorville, Tourville continued. I'm sure what she's doing right now has their admiralty's approval, but even if it didn't, she'd do it anyway on her own initiative. She knows exactly what's going to happen to Dorville and to us, and she knows she can't possibly get here in time to affect that outcome, so she's not going to split up her forces and send them in where we could chop them up in detail. Yes, she could have sent a couple of battle squadrons ahead, micro-jumped out to the side and then come back in directly behind us, assuming their astrogation was good enough. But unless she's got those new missiles, any small force she sent after us would get torn apart by the weight of fire we could send back at it. So she's going to wait until she gets everything she's got through the junction. Then she's going to do her micro-jumping and come in behind us, or more likely, on our flank, especially if we're driven back from Sphinx by our losses as quickly as she can. She'll be too far behind to overhaul us, even with her acceleration advantage if she has to come in astern, but she'll figure to put enough time pressure on us to limit the amount of damage we can do even if we've got enough left to risk engaging the Sphinx system defense pods. At least, she'll figure, she can keep us from moving on from Sphinx to Manticore, and that would save about 70% of the system's total industry. The fact that she's waiting is the conclusive proof that she doesn't have any, or not very many at least, of the new missiles either. If she had a couple of battle squadrons equipped with them, then it would have made enormous sense to send them in, even in isolation. Their accuracy advantage would have been crushing enough to let them do every damage to us before we ever met Dorville. Probably not enough to stop us, but maybe enough to even the odds between us and home fleet. And what about Harrington, boss? Delaney asked quietly when he paused. Harrington's probably the most dangerous of the lot, Torval said. And not just because we know Eighth Fleet's re-equipped with at least some of the new missiles. She's got more actual combat experience than Dorville or Cusack, and she's sneaky as hell. But what's happening out at the junction is tempting me to hope we filled an inside straight on the draw. If Eighth Fleet had been in position to intervene, Cusack wouldn't be coming through the junction— Harrington would, and we'd have had two or three of her battle squadrons ripping our ass off already. Assuming, of course, that Admiral Chin didn't have a little to say about it. So it's beginning to look as if Eighth Fleet really may be off on an operation of its own. I'm not planning on counting on that just yet. There could be any number of other explanations, but that's not going to keep me from hoping. I think I agree with you, boss, Delaney said, then chuckled. I know Beatrice Bravo was specifically planned to mousetrap Eighth Fleet, and I guess I ought to be disappointed if we're not going to get it, too. But having seen what the lady can do, I'll be just delighted if the salamander is somewhere else while we're taking on the Manti home system's defenses. I'm tempted to concur, Turville agreed. Taking out Eighth Fleet on top of everything else would certainly be a death blow, but even with Eighth Fleet intact and Harrington to run it, the Mantis are done if we take out this system's shipyards and both of the fleets they have defending them. We're coming down on sixty-five and a half million kilometers, sir, Commander Adamson said. Thank you, Fraser. Lester Tourville drew a deep breath. 
Eight minutes had passed since Adamson first informed him that they were into MDM range of the Mantis. Second Fleet was still 19 minutes short of its projected turnover point, but the range couldn't keep dropping forever without the Mantis firing. The range between the two fleets had already fallen to 65,767,000 kilometers. Second Fleet's velocity was up to 20,866 kilometers per second, Home Fleet's was 19,923 kps, and they'd closed the range between them by almost 77 million kilometers. Tourville was still better than 98,835,000 kilometers from Sphinx, but from his current base velocity, his MDM's range against the planet was almost 72,030,000 kilometers. The Mantis weren't going to let him get much closer unchallenged. Open fire, Flejo, he said. The first missile impeller signatures began to speckle the plot, and Sebastian Dorville drew a deep breath as the first massive salvo streaked towards his command. Obviously, they had had a lot of pods on tow, he thought, as he contemplated its numbers. More than he'd thought they had tractors for, actually. But their first salvo would be the least accurate against his EW, he reminded himself, and in the meantime, he had a few missile pods of his own. Engage as specified, Captain Gwinnett, he said formally, and watched his own missile's icon streaking outward across the plot. That was when the enemy launched his second impossibly dense salvo. Sebastian Dorville's 48 pre-pod super dreadnoughts carried 27,840 pods externally, and theoretically, they could have deployed all of them in a single massive wave. In fact, Homefleet carried a total of almost 49,000 pods, with well over half a million missiles. Lester Tourville's slightly larger Super Dreadnoughts carried fewer pods, and each of those pods carried fewer missiles, because of the size penalty their bulkier MDMs imposed. So although he had two and a half times as many ships, he had barely twice as many pods, and each of those pods carried 17% fewer missiles. He actually had only 64% more total missiles than home fleet. But Lester Tourville also had Shannon Foraker's donkey, and that meant every one of Sebastian Dorville's assumptions about the number and size of the salvos he could throw was fatally flawed. And what else he had was far more control channels for the missiles he carried. Not all of the 42 Manticoran, Grayson, and Andermani SDPs confronting him were keyhole-capable. Still, the majority of them were— and the pod layers as a group could simultaneously control an average of 400 missiles each. But the older pre-pod ships could control only 100 apiece, whereas each of Tourville's ships had control links for 350 missiles, and by using Shannon Forker's rotating control technique, they could increase that number by approximately 60%. So whereas Home Fleet could effectively control a total of just under 22,000 missiles per salvo, Second Fleet could control 84,000 without rotating control links. Worse, it could have increased that total to almost 135,000 if it was prepared to accept somewhat lower hit probabilities, and the donkey meant Tourville could actually have deployed the pods to fire that many. Manticoran fire control was better, Manticoran electronic warfare capabilities and penetration aids were better, and Manticoran MDMs were both faster and more agile. Sebastian Dorville could confidently expect to score a significantly higher percentage of hits, but that couldn't offset the fact that Second Fleet could control over six times as many missiles. Even if Tourville's hit probabilities had been only half as good as his, the Republic would have scored three times as many hits. It wasn't quite as bad for the Alliance as the raw numbers suggested. For one thing, deploying that many missiles and launching them without allowing their impeller wedges to cut one another's telemetry links was a far from trivial challenge. In fact, Tourville had decided to limit himself to no more than 80% of his theoretical maximum weight of fire, and to clear the firing and control arcs for even that many missiles, he'd been forced to spread his squadrons and their lumpy trails of donkeys and pods more broadly than he'd really wanted to. The separation between his units, necessary for effective offensive fire control, made it more difficult for them to coordinate their defensive fire. On the other hand, Havenite counter-missile doctrine relied so much more heavily than Manticoran doctrine did, on mass as opposed to accuracy, that the sacrifice was less significant than it might have been. 
Even now, no one on either side knew exactly what would happen when fleets of pod layers this size engaged one another. There was simply no experiential meter stick because no one had ever done it before. For that matter, no battle in history had yet seen almost 350 super dreadnoughts of any kind engage in what could only be a fight to the death. Over the centuries, tactical formalism had become the rule, with indecisive battles and limited losses. That might have changed, at least in this corner of the galaxy, but even here, most of the combatants were still feeling their way into the changing realities of interstellar carnage. The Battle of Manticore would be something new and unique in the annals of deep space combat. Everyone in both fleets knew that. But that was all they knew as the missiles began to launch. The range at launch was 65,770,000 kilometers. Flight time for home fleet's faster MDMs was 7.6 minutes, and their closing speed as they streaked into second fleet's teeth was 246,972 kilometers per second. Second fleet's slower missiles took 15 more seconds to reach their targets and had a closing speed of only 237,655 kps. At those speeds, both sides' defenses were stretched to and beyond the theoretical limits of their capabilities. Manticore's longer-ranged countermissiles and the greater capability of the katanas in the fleet defense role gave Dorville's ships a significant advantage, but not a big enough one. Not the one he'd anticipated against the weight of fire he'd expected. Home Fleet's fire plan avalanche called for the pre-pod super dreadnoughts to deploy their pods as quickly as possible. They had to jettison them anyway in order to clear their own defensive systems, and Dorville had known from the beginning that he was going to lose a huge percentage of their total pod loads without ever actually firing their missiles. There was nothing he could do about that, however, and the older ships passed control of as many of their additional missiles as they could to their more capable consorts. The Medusa, Harrington, Adler, and Invictus-class ships didn't deploy a single pod of their own in the initial broadsides. They used solely the pods deployed by Dorville's older ships, reserving their better-protected internally stowed pods for the follow-up salvos it was at least possible they might live to launch. And since they were firing pods which had been effectively deployed in a single massive pattern, Avalanche also fired its salvos in closer, more tightly spaced intervals than the Republican Navy had yet seen out of any Allied fleet. In fact, Avalanche was almost... Not quite, but almost conceptually identical to Shannon Foraker's rotating control doctrine. Each fleet's salvo density took the other fleet by surprise. Neither had anticipated such heavy fire, but Tourville's projections had been closer than Dorville's to what he actually got. Dorville had expected the battle to be short and violent, lasting no more than 15 or 20 minutes. The first half of his expectations was more than fulfilled. In the seven and a half minutes it took the lead salvo to cross between home fleet and second fleet, Sebastian Dorville ships fired seven salvos at 65-second intervals, each of 1,800 pods containing a total of 21,600 missiles. Over 150,000 missiles, the maximum home fleet's fire control could manage, went screaming through space, and 524,000 Havenite missiles rampaged out to meet them. Fire control sensors and reconnaissance platforms all over the star system found themselves half-blinded by the interference and massive impeller source of almost 700,000 attack missiles and many times that many countermissiles. And then the EW platforms began to add their own blinding efforts to the chaos. No human could have hoped to sort it out, keep track of it. There was simply no way protoplasmic brains could do it. Tactical officers concentrated on their own tiny pieces of the howling maelstrom, guiding their attack missiles, allocating their defensive missiles. Counter-missiles and MDMs blotted one another from existence as their impeller wedges slammed together. Decoys, jammers, dazzlers, and dragon's teeth matched electronic wiles against tactical officers' telemetry links and onboard control systems. Standard counter-missiles, Mark 31s and Vipers, hurled themselves into the teeth of the mighty salvos. Great gaps and gulfs appeared in the onrushing wave fronts of destruction, but the gaps closed. The gulfs filled in. Laser clusters blazed in desperate last-ditch efforts to intercept missiles with closing speeds 80% that of light. MDMs lost their targets, reacquired, 
lost them again in the howling confusion. Onboard AIs took whatever targets they could find, and the sudden abrupt changes in their targeting solutions made their final approach runs even more erratic and unpredictable. And then, wave after wave of laser heads began to detonate. Not in scores, or hundreds, or even in thousands, in tens of thousands, in each roaring coma of fury. The battle no one had been able to adequately envision was over in 11.9 minutes from the moment the first missile launched. My God, someone whispered on HMS King Roger III's flag bridge. Theodosia Cusack didn't know who it was. It didn't matter. The imagery coming in from the FTL surveillance platforms was brutally clear. Home fleet was gone. Simply gone. Ninety super dreadnoughts, thirty-one battle cruisers and heavy cruisers, and twenty-six light cruisers had been effectively destroyed in less than twelve minutes. At least twenty shattered, broken hulks continued to coast towards the hyperlimit, but they were only wrecks, gutted hulls streaming atmosphere, debris, and life pods, while deep within them frantic rescue parties raced against time, fighting with grim determination and courage about which all too often no one would ever know, to rescue trapped and wounded crewmates. But home fleet had not died alone. Sebastian Dorville might have been taken by surprise by the weight of Second Fleet's fire, and his computation of the exchange rate might have been overly optimistic as a result, but his ships and people had struck back hard. Ninety-seven Republican ships of the wall had been destroyed outright or beaten into dead, shattered hulks. Nineteen more had lost at least one impeller ring completely, and of the remaining 124 STPs Lester Torval had taken into the battle, exactly eleven were undamaged. Second Fleet's brutally winnowed ranks continued onward, but its acceleration had been reduced to less than 2.5 kps squared by its cripples. At that rate, it would be unable to decelerate for its zero-zero intercept with Sphinx, and the Manticoran system's defenders weren't done with it yet. Home Fleet's lack screen had suffered massive losses of its own, mostly from MDMs which had lost their original targets and taken whatever they could find in exchange. Despite that, over 2,000 of them survived, and they were driving hard to get into their own range of Second Fleet. They could expect to take fewer losses now that they were free to maneuver defensively and to protect themselves, not Home Fleet Super Dreadnoughts, and their crews had only one thought in mind. More lax were still streaming toward Second Fleet from the inner system as well, and it was obvious the Havenites had no desire to tangle with Sphinx's fixed defenses, at least until they could get their own damages sorted out and re-ammunition. Second Fleet was changing course, crabbing away from Sphinx as it shepherded its cripples protectively out of harm's way. But that, Theodosia Cusack thought grimly, was going to prove just a bit more difficult than the bastards thought. How much longer? she asked harshly. Our last unit should clear the junction in the next eleven minutes, ma'am, Captain Smithson said. Good. Cusack nodded once, then turned to Commander Astrid Steen, her staff astrogator. Plot me a couple of micro-jumps, Astrid, she said coldly. Those people have just had the crap kicked out of them. Now we're going to finish the job home fleet began. Admiral Cusack's preparing to head in system, your grace, Harper Brantley said quietly. Thank you, Harper. Honor looked up from the holographic comm display, hovering above the briefing room's table, at which she, Nimitz, Mercedes Brigham, Raphael Cardonis, and Andrea Jarowalski sat under her armsman's watchful eye. The display was separated into individual quadrants, showing the faces of Vice Admiral Hasselberg, Judy Yanikov, Samuel Miklos, and the commanders of every squadron in company with Imperator. Alice Truman and Alistair McKeon weren't there, and she tried to hide the cold, bleak anxiety she felt at their absence. Please inform the Admiral that we're still on schedule for our own ETA, Honor continued. Of course, Your Grace her communications officer said quietly and withdrew. The briefing room hatch closed behind him, and Honor returned her attention to the discussion at hand. Most of the faces on her display showed a greater or lesser degree of shock at the total destruction of home fleet, and no wonder. Not only had the sheer weight of the Havenite's fire come as a complete surprise, but all of the Alliance's partners had taken losses when it hit. 
Of the 90 super dreadnoughts which had just been destroyed, 12 had been units of the Grayson Space Navy, and another 26 had been Andromani. Of all her subordinates, Yanikov seemed least shocked, or at least the least affected by whatever shock he felt. But then Judah had been present when Giscard leveled the Basilisk System's infrastructure in the last war, and his command had been part of Hamish's fleet for Operation Buttercup. And before that, he'd been at the first and fourth battles of Yeltsin. Three-quarters of the pre-alliance Grayson Space Navy had been wiped out in First Yeltsin, and half its super-dreadnought strength had been destroyed at Fourth Yeltsin. And he was the man whose task force had crushed the defensive forces deployed to cover Lovett. Despite his youth, and he was almost as young as his prologue made him look, he'd seen more carnage than any other flag officer on honor's display. Hasselberg had looked almost stunned when the initial reports came in. It hadn't been just the scale of the destruction, it had also been its speed, for the Andermani Navy had never experienced anything like it. Well, to be fair, neither had the Manticoran Navy, until this afternoon, but at least Manticore and Grayson had been granted some prior experience. They'd had first-hand practice adjusting to abrupt, wrenching changes in the paradigm of combat. The Empire had not, and the reality had come to the Fitze Admiral like some hideous nightmare, despite all the effort he'd spent conscientiously trying to prepare himself for the realities of modern warfare. But of them all, Honor thought, Binhui Morser's reaction was the most interesting. She wasn't simply an admiral, she was also Grafen von Grau. Like Hasselberg himself, she was a member of the Empire's warrior aristocracy, and she was clearly one of those who took the Andermani martial tradition seriously. She might cherish doubts about her emperor's decision to ally himself with the Star Kingdom, which had been the empire's traditional rival in areas like Silesia for so long, but that didn't matter. Not anymore, not now. Her dark eyes, remarkably like Alison Harrington's, or Honor's own, now that Honor thought about it, were narrow and intense, focused and fiery with purpose. I wish Admiral Cusack had waited for us, Miklos said after a moment. I'd feel a lot better if we were going in with her, especially after seeing how many birds these people can launch. She's still outnumbered better than two to one in Wallers, and Alice is going to be outnumbered almost that badly in Lax. She can't wait, Samuel, Yanikov disagreed. I don't have any idea how long it took the peeps to deploy that many pods, however the hell they did it, but they had to use up most of their ammo to do it. She needs to hit them before they can pull out and restock their magazines. And even if that weren't a consideration right now, the peeps are edging away from Sphinx. She can't be sure they'll continue to do that if she doesn't move in now. If they get themselves sorted out, decide their damages aren't that bad after all, they've still got the strength, or close to it, to stand up to Sphinx's close-in defenses— and even if the defenses destroyed everything they've got left, they'd last long enough to take out virtually all of the planet's orbital infrastructure. He smiled thinly. We Graysons have had a lot of experience worrying about what might happen to our orbital habitats. Trust me, I know exactly what's going through Admiral Cusack's mind. She's got to keep the pressure on if she's going to keep them running. Judas right, Honor said. Our lead super dreadnought won't even transit the junction for another eight minutes. We'll need another seventy-five minutes just to get the super dreadnoughts and your carriers through, Samuel. That's almost an hour and a half. She can't give them that long to think about things, not when they're already so close to the planet. She spoke calmly, almost dispassionately, but she tasted the emotions of her staffers, and especially her flag captain. They knew what was hidden behind that facade, she thought knew she couldn't forget that the planet they were talking about was the world of her birth, that all too many of the people on it were people she'd known all her life, family, friends, that it was the home world of the entire tree cat species. But what not even they knew was that at this very moment, both of her parents and her sister and brother were on Sphinx visiting Honor's Aunt Clarissa. The question before us, she continued, is what we do after we make transit. We'll probably have instructions from the Admiral to your grace, Mercedes Brigham pointed out. She smiled without any humor at all. 
Thanks to the GravCom, the Central Command can actually give real-time orders at interplanetary distances now. You may be right, Honor acknowledged. So far, though, Admiral Caparelli's been refraining from backseat driving. And even if he doesn't, I want all of us to be thinking on the same page. One thing I don't believe we can do, Your Grace, Cardona said, is commit ourselves before all our units have passed through the junction. Despite his relatively junior rank, the flag officers listened carefully. As Honor's flag captain, he was her tactical deputy. I strongly agree, Your Grace, Brigham said, and at least we should have time to see how the situation's developing before we commit. I agree, too, Honor said. But two things. First, I want to start rolling pods now. Use their onboard tractors to limit them to the hulls. I want a third of our total pod loadout out there, if we can manage it. Yes, Your Grace, Brigham acknowledged. And second, Honor continued, let's get some lighter units through as quickly as we can. Admiral Overstegen, I want your squadron to take lead and transit as soon as you reach the terminus. Admiral Bradshaw and Commodore Fanafi, you and your Saganami Seas are attached to Admiral Overstegen. She smiled grimly. If the Havenites are still trying to keep an eye on the junction, let's give whoever's minding their drones something else to worry about. Chapter 66 Sir, we've got impeller signatures moving clear of the junction, Commander Zucker said sharply. How many? Diamato asked hotly. How to say with all this wedge interference, sir? Zucker grimaced. I make it at least fifty, though. Right, Diamato nodded and looked at his comm officer. Immediate priority for the flag. Tell them we have fifty plus wallers deploying for a hyper translation. Tell them. He broke off as the deploying impeller signatures abruptly vanished. Correction, he said sharply. Inform the flag that fifty plus wallers have just translated out. Captain Welbeck says damage control has that fire in CIC under control, sir. Thank you, Ace. Lester Tourville nodded to Lieutenant Eisenberg and then returned his attention to Captain Delaney. The numbers are still coming in, boss, the chief of staff told him, her expression grim. So far, they don't sound good. At the moment, it sounds like we can write off over half our wall of battle, probably more than that if we don't control the star system when the dust settles. We always knew we were going to get hammered, Turville said, his own voice and expression calmer than Delaney's, and it was true. His losses were 12% higher than his pre-battle estimate, almost 25% higher than the Octagon staff weenies had estimated, because he hadn't anticipated how tightly the Mantis would bunch their salvos. But from the beginning, everyone had understood that Second Fleet was going to take severe losses. But we cost them almost as many ships of the wall as we lost— he continued, and if Navin's estimates are accurate, we've got damned near three times as many of them as they do. Did. Not to mention the fact that we're about to take at least temporary control of their home star system away from them. I know, Delaney said, but I'm a little concerned about their lacks. We've got 2,300 of them still coming in on us, and we're a lot lower on ammo than I'd like. We fired off 60% of our MDMs, and we've lost effectively half our wall. I don't have exact numbers, but the current availability has to be no more than about 200,000 rounds. If we burn them trying to keep their shrikes out of knife range, we're going to be sucking vacuum against Third Fleet. Then we'll have to let the scimitars and the screen fend off their lacks, Tourville said unflinchingly. They'll get hammered at least as badly as we did, but they'll do the job. Yes, sir. Delaney gave herself a little shake, then bobbed her head in agreement. I know we're still on profile for the operation, boss. I guess I just never really thought about the sheer scale of things. Not emotionally. I made myself sit down and do that the day Thomas Theismann and Arnaud Marquette explained Beatrice to us, Tourville said grimly. I didn't like it then, and I don't like it now. For that matter, they didn't like it, but it's a price we can afford to pay if it ends this goddamned war. Yes, sir. Fraser? Yes, sir. What are... Excuse me, sir. 
Lieutenant Eisenberg said suddenly, pressing her hand to her earbug as she listened intently. Admiral Diamato says the mantis have translated into hyper. And so it begins, Tourville murmured softly, then gave his head an irritated shake as he realized how pretentious that sounded. But that didn't make it untrue, and he watched the master plot intently, waiting for Kuzak's ships to reappear upon it. He didn't have to wait long. Less than fifteen minutes after they'd vanished from the junction, eight and a half minutes after they recepted Diamato's warning, they reappeared dangerously close to the RZ's boundary. It was an impressive display of pinpoint astrogation, one that showed a steel-nerved willingness to cut their margin razor-thin, and one which also put the Mantis well out on Second Fleet's flank and headed for Sphinx on a least-time course. Exactly where I would have placed them myself, he said quietly to Delaney, who nodded vigorously. Second Fleet had started edging away from its original Sphinx-bound vector from the moment the shooting stopped. Five minutes later, it had altered course much more sharply, and at the moment, it was very obviously retreating from its original objective. In fact, Tourville had made the decision to sacrifice his worst lamed cripples within ten minutes. Any ship which couldn't produce an acceleration of at least 370 G had been abandoned, scuttling charges set. He hadn't liked doing that, but he couldn't afford to be hampered by them even if the rest of Beatrice worked perfectly. Even without them, Second Fleet's current maximum acceleration was barely 3.6 kps squared, and that was too low for it to completely avoid the Sphinx Defense's missile envelope, whatever he did, which didn't even consider the vengeful presence of Third Fleet coming in from the side to pin him between Sphinx and its own batteries. Under the circumstances, Tourville had had no choice, for several reasons, but to settle on a course which formed a sharp angle from his original vector. Since he couldn't avoid going at least as far as Sphinx, he had pitched up vertically to climb above the plane of the ecliptic while simultaneously changing heading by 135 degrees. That let him pile on side vector to generate as much separation from the planet as he could get as he slid past it, which also happened to be the fastest way out of the system. The Mantecaran resonance zone was so much taller than it was broad that the faces of the cone were almost parallel to one another, even this close to its base. Sphinx lay 102,000,500 kilometers inside the zone, and his original heading had been directly towards the planet, which defined just how much side vector he actually needed. Even on his current profile, his restricted acceleration meant he'd pass within less than 40 million kilometers of Sphinx, but he'd be further out, and longer getting there, than almost any other heading would have produced. If he hadn't changed course at all, he would have overflown Sphinx and its defenses 70 minutes after the brief titanic engagement with Homefleet at an effective range of zero. If he'd changed heading by 90 degrees, he would have made his closest approach to Sphinx eight minutes later than that at a range of only 35 million kilometers. On his current heading, his unit's closest approach would come 83 minutes after changing course, and the range would be 39,172,200 kilometers. He didn't much care for any of those options, given the pounding home fleet had given him, but the one he'd chosen was the best of the lot. It was still going to give the planet's defenders a shot, which he'd hoped wouldn't happen, yet at least— but it would be long-ranged enough to degrade the Mantis' accuracy, and the fire wouldn't be coming straight into his teeth the way home fleets had. His missile defenses would be far more effective against whatever Sphinx had, and he frankly doubted that it had anything as heavy as 90 SDs had been able to hand out anyway. And he'd needed to break back out across the RZ boundary for several reasons. Partly to get his cripples safely out of harm's way, but mostly because, as Taverner had just pointed out, he was critically low on ammunition. He needed to rendezvous with his ammunition ships and restock his magazines before driving back into the system defenses. But Sphinx wasn't all he had to worry about, and Cusack had dropped her own units in further up the zone's outer surface than he had. That put her in a position to move quickly to Sphinx's relief, accelerating directly towards the planet on a least-time course along the shortest passage through the RZ, which would also catch him between her fire and Sphinx's. In fact, Third Fleet would be less than 33 million kilometers from him at the moment of his closest approach to Sphinx. 
Yet if he turned away from her, he would have no choice but to flee deeper and deeper into the resonance zone without re-ammunitioning, and her higher base acceleration would readily permit her to overhaul him there. So he had no choice but to hold his present course. It was a masterful move on Cusack's part, and exactly the one Lester Tourville had hoped for. The orphaned lax survivors of Sebastian Dorville's fleet came slashing in towards Second Fleet screening units. The screen had taken losses of its own, heavy ones, during the massive missile exchange, but like the Manticoran lax, the damage had been purely collateral. No one had been wasting missiles deliberately trying to hit battlecruisers when they were SDP shooting back. But the inaccuracy for which long-range MDM fire had become justly famed had come into play, and lost missiles intended for super dreadnoughts had latched onto whatever targets they could find. There were still 33 battlecruisers and 41 heavy cruisers waiting for the incoming strike, ready to begin punching missiles at it as soon as they had the range, but the Manticoran lacks closing velocity was over 50,000 kilometers per second. Current generation Havenite single drive missiles had a powered range from rest of just over 7 million kilometers. Given the geometry, they had a theoretical maximum range of almost 16.5 million, as did the lax attack missiles. That sounded like a lot, except that at the Manticoran's closing velocity, they would streak straight across the entire engagement envelope in 317 seconds. That wouldn't give much time for a lot of launches, and Republican accuracy against Alliance lack electronic warfare capabilities was poor. Get on them! Get on them! Captain Alice Smirnov barked. She was Second Fleet's senior surviving Kolak, and the crews of her 2,700 lax, positioned between the cruisers screening Lester Twerville's battered ships of the wall and the incoming Mantis, fought manfully to obey her orders. Over two-thirds of Smirnov ships were Cimeter Alpha and Cimeter Beta birds, built around the new fission power plants and improved capacitors Shannon Foraker and her technical crews had been able to produce after the windfall of technical data from Erewhon. The Alphas were equipped with lasers powerful enough to punch through the sidewalls and armor of destroyers and cruisers at normal engagement ranges. They couldn't match the performance of the massive grazers of the Alliance's strikes, but they were far more dangerous in energy range than any Republican lack had ever been before. The Betas weren't a lot more combat-capable than the original Cimeters had been, since they were still armed solely with missiles, and those missiles hadn't been significantly improved. But like the Alphas, they had bow walls and vastly enhanced power budgets and endurance. Now, for the first time, they went up against the Alliance in truly significant numbers. The engagement was brief. It had to be, with the Manticorans barreling in at such a high closing velocity. Smirnov had arranged her lax above and below the sensor and firing arc she'd left open for the screen, and her own shorter-legged missiles streaked towards the incoming strike. She had more units than the Mantis did, but the Alliance's superior EW more than offset her sheer numerical advantage. Her alphas never really got the chance to use their lasers. Their targets were too hard to lock up, streaking across their engagement window too quickly, and her firing angle meant all too many of the laser shots which were fired wasted themselves on the roofs or bellies of their target's wedges. But her beta's missiles, although less accurate and capable than the katana's vipers, were fired in enormous numbers. Six hundred of the Alliance lacks were killed in the fleeting moments Smirnov had to engage them, but at a price. It was the first time the Allied lack crews had gone up against someone else's lack bow walls, but Alice Truman's reports from Lovett had been taken to heart. They might never have encountered it before, but they'd allowed for the possibility, and although the new technology made the new Republican lacks far harder to kill— they still lost at a two-to-one rate as the Allied strike roared past them into the teeth of the screen's fire. The screen killed another 300, but the price it paid for its success was far higher than the one Smirnov had paid. The Alliance lost 6,000 men and women aboard the lax Smirnov's units had killed, and she'd lost roughly 18,000 in return. Now the Alliance lost another 3,000 people aboard the lax the screen had killed— but as the surviving grazer armed shrikes crashed over the screening cruisers, which could not avoid them, they wreaked havoc. There were only 1,600 Allied lacks left, but 900 of them were shrikes, and they ignored the heavy cruisers. 
those they left to the missile-armed ferrets, whose light ship killers were unlikely to do more than scratch the paint of a capital ship. Since they couldn't hurt Wallers anyway, there was no point saving them, and 300 ferrets flung every missile they had into the teeth of Second Fleet's heavy cruisers. They fired at the last moment, at the shortest possible range, when their victims' defenses would have effectively no time at all to engage with anything except laser clusters. They paid heavily to get to that range, but when they reached it, they spewed out well over 16,000 ship killers. Those missiles carried only destroyer-weight laser heads, but a heavy cruiser's sidewalls were weaker than a battle cruiser's, and it mounted very little armor compared to any capital ship. Certainly not enough to survive against a fire plan which hit each ship with 400 missiles from a range at which each laser cluster had time for, at most, a single shot. The ferrets fired at a range of 182,000 kilometers, and it took their missiles barely two seconds to cross the range. In those two seconds, the heavy cruiser's desperate offensive fire killed another 112 lakhs, but when the surviving ferrets crossed the screen's position, one and a half seconds behind their missiles, they did it in the glaring light of the failing fusion plants of the cruisers they had just slaughtered. None of the screen's heavy cruisers, and very few of the 50,000 men and women aboard them, survived. The battle cruisers fared no better. There were fewer of them, and three times as many attackers— True, each of those attackers got only a single shot, but they were using grazers as powerful as most battlecruisers' chase weapons. They drove straight into the teeth of the battlecruisers' broadsides, closing with grim determination, and they fired at a white-knuckle range of less than 75,000 kilometers. 481 shrikes and roughly another 5,000 Allied personnel died, blown apart by the battlecruisers' energy weapons in the brief engagement window they had. In return, 28 Republican battlecruisers were completely destroyed, five more were reduced to shattered, broken wrecks, and 77,000 more of Lester Tourville's personnel were killed. But in its destruction, Second Fleet's screen had done its job. The lacks which survived the exchange were a broken force, streaming through and past Tourville's surviving super-dreadnoughts so rapidly not even the Shrikes had time to inflict significant damage on such massively armored targets— not without numbers they no longer had. I've got the preliminary figures, boss, Molly Delaney said. Her expression and hoarse voice showed the strain they were all under, Twerville thought, and nodded for her to continue without ever taking his own attention from the plot. It looks like only about two hundred of their locks got away, his chief of staff said. The wall's energy weapons managed to nail most of the others as they crossed our vector. Thank you. Torval said, and closed his eyes briefly. My God, he thought. I came into this thinking I knew what the casualties were going to be like, but I didn't. Neither did Tom Theismann, really. No one could have projected this kind of carnage, because no one's had any experience, even now, with this kind of fight. Both sides are so far outside our standard operational doctrines that we're in virtually unknown territory— Podnots aren't supposed to close head-on until they get into mutual suicide range, and we're not supposed to let larks get that close to our starships. Our wall is supposed to be able to kill them before they ever get to us. But I didn't have the missiles left to do it, and they whipped through our engagement window so quickly, our energy weapons couldn't stop them in time either. He opened his eyes again, looking back into the plot. In a galaxy where indecisive maneuvers had been the norm for so many centuries, two decades, even two decades like the ones which had begun at Hancock Station, simply hadn't been enough to prepare anyone for this. But the galaxy had better get used to it, he thought grimly. Because one thing he knew, the lethal genies were out of the bottle, and no one was going to get them back inside it. Any new orders, sir? Delaney asked, and he shook his head. No. I bear footprint at 2.36 million kilometers, Commander Zucker barked. Many footprints! Oliver Diamato's head whipped around as the erupting footprints speckled the plot. There were 18 of them, and he swore with silent, vicious venom as they sparkled like curses in the display. Whoever had taken the Sherman as his intended target had come in far closer than most of the others— 
but all of them showed remarkably good astrogation for such a short jump. Then the vector readouts came up, and he swore again. From their headings, and especially from their velocity numbers, they'd obviously managed to hyper out of the junction without his ever noticing, then come back in after building their velocity in hyper, so the jump wasn't quite as short as he'd thought it was. Not that he had much time to think about it. Missile launch, Zucker said. Many missiles, income... Diamato's mouth had opened before the ops officer spoke, and his order chopped off the end of Zucker's announcement. All units, go zebra, he barked. RHNS William T. Sherman blinked into hyper less than three seconds before HMS Nike's missiles would have detonated. Two of Diamato's other battlecruisers were less fortunate, a bit slower off the mark. They took hits. RHNS Count Marasuki Noji lost most of her after impeller ring, but they too managed to escape into hyper. Diamato breathed a sigh of relief when he realized all his units had gotten out. But however relieved he was by their survival, the fact remained that he'd been driven off his station. Frustratingly incomplete as his observations had been, his had been the only eyes located to watch the junction at all for Second Fleet. Admiral Diamato has been forced to fall back to the Alpha Rendezvous, sir, Lieutenant Eisenberg reported. Damn. Molly Delaney murmured, but Torval only shrugged. It was bound to happen sooner or later, Molly. On the other hand, it may actually be good news. Good news, sir? Well, they didn't bother to send through screening units to chase him off before because they were too busy bringing in their wallers. If they've sent in battle cruisers and cruisers now, it probably confirms that they've already got all their capital ships through the junction, in which case this... He nodded at the oncoming rash of scarlet icons, already well inside their theoretical MDM range of his own battered survivors. Probably is all we've got to deal with. With all due respect, sir, this is quite enough for me. For all of us, Molly, for all of us. Turville considered the plot for several more seconds, then looked back at Eisenberg. Ace, message to MacArthur. Stand by to execute Paul Revere. Aye, sir. Any change in his heading, Judson? Admiral Cusack asked. No, ma'am. He's maintaining exactly the same heading and acceleration, Commander Luttrell replied. What the hell does he think he's doing, ma'am? Captain Smithson asked quietly, and Cusack shrugged in irritation. Damned if I know, she acknowledged frankly. Maybe he just figures he's still got the firepower to take us. After all, he's still got 118 Wallers, and we've only got 55, even with Duchess Harrington's orphans. But he's had the crop hammered out of him, ma'am, Smithson objected. The recon platforms indicate he's got heavy battle damage to at least half his survivors, and his acceleration rate would be proof enough of that, even without the platform's reports. So, say he's got the equivalent of 80 Wallace combat power, which is generous, I'd say, and they're still peep SDPs. We don't have as many units as Homefleet had, but all of ours are Medusas or Harringtons, and that gives us the edge in real combat power. Not only that, but he's got to have used up a lot of ammo. Hell, he didn't fire a single MDM at the Larks, and you saw what they did to his screen. His magazines have to be close to empty. So if his situation is so desperate, Judson Luttrell asked, why didn't he abandon the rest of his ships with impeller damage and run for it at a higher acceleration rate in the first place? I suppose the answer to that depends at least in part on exactly what their actual objective is, Cusack said. She glanced at the master plot. Twenty-six minutes had passed since Third Fleet had translated back into normal space. It was hard to believe that barely two hours ago, Homefleet and all of its units had been safely in orbit around Sphinx. Now they were gone, reduced to spreading patterns of wreckage, and her own command was accelerating steadily towards battle with their killers at 6.01 kps squared. Her base velocity was up to almost 10,000 kilometers per second, she traveled the next best thing to 8 million kilometers into the RZ, and the range to Second Fleet was coming down to right on 60 million kilometers, which meant, of course, that they were already in her range, just as she was in theirs. Whatever they're up to, she said grimly, 
I think you've got a point about their ammunition supply, Jerry. In which case, they aren't going to be hitting us with any more of those monster salvos, and it also means they haven't got enough birds left to waste them firing at long range with their hit probabilities. We, on the other hand, have full magazines. You want to open fire now, ma'am? Commander Luttrell asked, but she shook her head. Not just yet. In fact, not until they do. Her thin smile was cold. Every kilometer the range drops increases our accuracy by a few thousandths of a percent. As long as they're willing not to shoot, so am I. They'll be coming into range of Sphinx in another ten minutes or so, ma'am, Smithson said quietly. A good point. She nodded. But that means the defense ports deployed around Sphinx are going to be coming into range of them, too, and the system reconnaissance platforms are going to give the defense ports very good accuracy. But if they open fire, the peeps will return it, Latrell pointed out. I know, Cusack agreed. I've been thinking about that. She considered numbers and ranges, then turned to communications. Franklin, contact Admiral Caparelli. Tell him I recommend that the Sphinx defenses not fire on these people unless and until they launch against Sphinx. Yes, ma'am, Lieutenant Bradshaw replied. Are you sure about that, ma'am? Smithson asked. Cusack looked at him, and he looked back levelly. After all, one of a chief of staff's jobs was to play devil's advocate. If they're going to bombard the planet, letting them get the first launch off unopposed is likely to cost us, he pointed out. But as Judson's just pointed out, if they aren't prepared to bombard the planet and the near-planet yards and the orbital defenses open fire, they may go ahead and return it, Cusack responded. And they have been hammered hard. If Sphinx doesn't fire on them, they're probably going to reserve their fire for us, since we're obviously a much greater threat. Under the circumstances, I think it's worth risking letting them have one launch against the defenses now that they're all online, especially if they decide not to launch. Yes, ma'am. No change in their dispositions, Your Grace, Andrea Jarowalski reported, and Anna frowned. What is it, Your Grace? a voice asked, and she looked up at her comm display. Rafe Cardonis looked back at her from it. What's what, Rafe? That frown, her flag captain said. I've seen it before. What's bothering you? Besides the fact that somewhere around a million people have already been killed this fine afternoon, you mean? Cardonis winced slightly, but he also shook his head. That's not what I meant, ma'am, and you know it. Yes, I suppose I do, she agreed. She reached up to stroke Nimitz's ears, and the cat pressed back against her hand, purr buzzing as his mind glow caressed hers in reply. She treasured that small moment of unqualified support and love, clinging to its warmth against her cold, bleak awareness of so much death and devastation. Then she looked back at Cardonis. I just can't escape the feeling that there's a shoe somewhere we haven't seen yet, she said slowly. I know there's not a vector available to them which would let them avoid both Sphinx's envelope and Admiral Cusack's. Under those circumstances, I guess it's not too surprising they're simply holding their course. What else can they do? Not much, Your Grace, Mercedes Brigham said when Honor paused. From where I sit, it looks like they're screwed. The bastards hurt us badly enough first, but they're in too deep to get out now, and Admiral Cusack is going to hammer them into scrap. That's what's bothering me, Honor said slowly. They didn't have to come in this way. They could have come in more slowly, left themselves a broader menu of maneuver options. Why did they simply come charging straight in towards Sphinx? They didn't, Brigham pointed out. They cut the angle on the limit and the zone so they could angle back out if they had to. No, Mercedes. Cardona shook his head on Honor's display. I see what she means. It's the acceleration rate, isn't it, Your Grace? That's exactly what it is, Honor agreed. They can't have known exactly what was going to happen when they ran into home fleet, but they had to have known they'd almost certainly be intercepted well short of the planet and hammered. 
but by charging in at such a high acceleration when they didn't have to, they built up a vector they couldn't possibly overcome before whatever we brought through from Trevor Star hit them as well. That's not like Theismann. He should have left his commander on the spot more freedom of maneuver, should have tried to protect his units from getting caught in this sort of trap. Then why didn't he? Brigham frowned as she followed Honor's logic. I thought at first it probably did indicate they were going to try some sort of a two-pronged operation, Honor said. Go ahead and hit us in Manticore, figuring we'd have to pull off of Trevor Star to defend the home system, and then hit San Martin when we uncovered it. In that case, they might have hoped to catch us with Third Fleet and Eighth Fleet between two separate offensives, unable to respond adequately to either. Now that's an ugly thought, Your Grace, Brigham murmured. But that's not like Theismann either, Honor pointed out. He understands the KISS principle, and in their initial attacks, Operation Thunderbolt, he planned each of his operations independently of one another. They all tied together into one overall design, but he was careful to avoid any attempt to coordinate widely dispersed fleets or require them to go after objectives in mutual support. The entire offensive was very carefully coordinated, except for the decision to send Tourville all the way to Marsh, but the success of any one operation didn't depend on the success of any other simultaneous operation. And hitting both Trevor Star and Manticore would... Brigham nodded. It certainly would, Honor agreed, and they wouldn't have any way to communicate with one another, so if either attack force screwed up its timing, it might blow the entire operation by alerting us early. It's still possible that that's what they're going to do, which is the main reason I still don't want to lock down the Trevor Star Terminus with a mass transit, but I don't think it's what's coming. But if they don't have something like that in mind, I'm at a loss to understand exactly what they're doing. According to ONI's estimate of their current fleet strength, this is a huge percentage of their total wall of battle, and they've rammed it straight into the teeth of our defenses on a vector which makes it impossible for them to avoid action with Third Fleet. That's what I don't like about it. It's stupid, and one thing Thomas Theismann isn't is stupid. Boss, with all due respect, Molly Delaney said, I think it's time. No, do you really? Lester Turville replied, his tone so dry that Delaney looked up in surprise. Then, almost against her will, she chuckled. It wasn't a very loud chuckle, but it sounded that way on Guerriere's tense, silent flag deck. Heads came up all around the deck, eyes turned towards the chief of staff, and Turville smiled. He could almost literally feel their astonishment that he could make even the smallest joke at a moment like this. And then he felt that same astonishment breaking at least a little of the taut fear and anxiety which had enveloped all of them as he continued to hold off on Paul Revere, continued to wait. They knew the Beatrice Bravo ops plan as well as he did, and they had to be wondering what the hell he was waiting for. Which was fair enough. A part of him wondered what he was waiting for as well. He looked at the plot. The Manticoran response from Trevor Star had been accelerating in system for almost 50 minutes. Its velocity was up to just over 18,000 kilometers, and it had traveled roughly 27,045,000 kilometers. The range to Second Fleet was falling rapidly towards 33 million kilometers, and he was frankly astonished that they hadn't already opened fire, yet still that nagging little doubt, that voice of instinct, told him to wait. He looked at a secondary plot, frozen with the last tactical data Oliver Diamato had been able to download before being forced off the junction. He considered it for two or three seconds, careful to conceal his own mental frown, lest it undo the beneficial consequences of Delaney's chuckle. You've got to get off the credit piece, Lester, he told himself. You've already waited as long as you can. Molly's right about that. If Eighth Fleet were coming, it should already be here, and you can't justify holding off forever just in case it turns up. Because whether it's coming or not, you can't let the people you know about get any closer. All right, Ace, he said in a calm, confident voice. Send MacArthur the execute signal. Captain Higgins, we have the execute signal from Guerrière. Maneuvering, Captain Edward Higgins said almost instantly, his voice sharp, 
execute Paul Revere. Aye, sir, his astrogator replied, and the battlecruiser RHNS Douglas MacArthur, which had never accelerated in system with the rest of Second Fleet's doomed screen, translated smoothly into hyper. I think we're just about ready to open the ball, whether they want to or not, Theodosia Cusack told Commander Luttrell. How do our firing solutions look? I think the old saying about fish in a barrel comes to mind, ma'am, Luttrell replied. Good, in that case. Hyperfootprint, one of Luttrell's ratings barked suddenly. Hyperfootprint at 41.7 million kilometers, bearing 180 by 176. He paused a second, then looked up, his face white. Many point sources, sir. It looks like at least 90 ships of the wall. Oh, my God, Mercedes Brigham said softly as the plot abruptly altered. The FTL feed from the recon platforms made what had just happened all too hideously clear. You were right, Your Grace, Raphael Cardona said flatly. They aren't stupid. Honor didn't reply. She was already turning to the sidebars of her own tactical display. Sixteen of her thirty-two super dreadnoughts were still in Trevor Star, as were all of Samuel Miklos's carriers and thirty of her battle cruisers. She looked at the numbers for perhaps one heartbeat, then turned back to her staff. Mercedes, send a dispatch boat back to Trevor Star. Inform Admiral Miller that he's in command and that he's to hold all of our battle cruisers there. Tell him he's responsible for covering Trevor Star until we get back to him. Then instruct Judah to bring Admiral Miklos's carriers and all the rest of the Wallers through in a single transit. Her voice was crisp, calm, despite her own shock, and Brigham looked at her for a moment, then nodded sharply. Aye, aye, your grace. Teo, she continued, pointing one index finger at Commander Kagari. Start plotting a new micro-jump. We'll go straight from here, no dogleg. I want us at least 50 million kilometers outside these newcomers. 75 to 100 would be better, but don't shave it any closer than 50. Kagari looked at her for a moment, and she tasted his shock. She was allowing him a much larger margin of error than Admiral Cusack had allowed Third Fleet's units, but she was also requiring him to jump straight from a point inside the RZ to one on its periphery. Safety margin or no... Astrogation that precise was going to be extraordinarily difficult to deliver, given the fact that his start point's coordinates were going to be subject to significant uncertainty, whatever he did. But despite his shock, his voice was clear. Aye, aye, ma'am. Harper, she continued, turning to the communication section. Immediate priority message to Admiral Cusack, copy to Admiralty House. Message begins. Admiral Cusack, I will be moving to your support within... She looked at the chronometer, but nothing she could do could make time move more slowly. Fifteen minutes. If I can reduce that, I will. Message ends. Aye, aye, your grace. Honor nodded, then sat back in her command chair and rotated it slowly to face the rest of her flagbridge personnel. She could see the echo of her own horror on their faces, tasted in their mind glows as they realized what was about to happen to Third Fleet, whatever they might manage to do. They stared back at her, but they saw no horror in her calm expression. They saw only determination and purpose. All right, people, she said. We know what we have to do. Now let's be about it. Chapter 67 Admiral Genevieve Chin, CO 5th Fleet, stood on the flag bridge of RHNS Cannonade and let the background murmur of readiness reports wash over her. We've got them, ma'am, Commander Andriana Spiropolo announced exuberantly. Us will put us less than 50 million clicks behind them, right on the money. So I see. Chin might have quibbled with her operations officer's assessment of their astrogation, since they were several million kilometers further from the limit than they should have been. She suspected that Lieutenant Commander Julian had deliberately dropped them in a bit further out than she'd specified, but Spiropolo's assessment of the tactical situation matched hers perfectly, and she fought hard to keep the exuberance out of her own voice. She also knew she hadn't succeeded completely. Well, maybe I didn't, she thought. But if I didn't, I've earned it. We all have, after the way they pounded us in the last war. But it's more than that for me. 
All right, Andriana, she said, turning her back to the plot and the icons of the Manty Wallers, whose crews were beginning to realize they'd walked straight into a trap. We don't have a lot of time before they run out of our envelope. Let's start rolling pods. Aye, ma'am. Andriana's dark eyes gleamed, and Chin glanced at Captain Nicodem Sabourin. Her chief of staff looked back, and then, unnoticed by the rest of Flagbridge's personnel, he nodded ever so slightly. Chin nodded back. Sabourin was probably the only member of her staff who could fully savor her own sense of completion. She'd come a long way to reach this point. She'd survived being scapegoated by the legislaturalists for the disaster of Hancock Station at the very start of the last war. She'd survived long, dreary years in the service of the Committee of Public Safety, never quite trusted, too valuable to simply discard, always watched by her people's commissioner. She'd even survived Saint-Just's ascension to complete power and the chaos following his overthrow. She'd been rehabilitated twice now, once by Rob Pierre's lunatics, solely because she'd been scapegoated by the previous regime, and once by the New Republic, because she'd damned well done a good job protecting her assigned sector, despite the psychotic sadist they'd assigned as her people's commissioner. This time, she actually believed it was going to stick. She'd still lost a lot of ground in the seniority game, men and women who'd been junior officers, or even enlisted personnel, when she'd already been a flag officer, were senior to her now. Thomas Theismann, for one, who'd been a commander when she'd been a rear admiral. But she was one of only a handful of people who'd made admiral under the legislaturalists who were still alive at all, so she supposed that was something of a wash. And whether the universe was always a fair place or not, she couldn't complain about where she was today. The woman who'd been saddled with the blame for the legislaturalists' disastrous opening campaign against the Star Kingdom of Manticore was also the woman who'd been chosen to command the decisive jaw of the trap which would crush the Star Kingdom once and for all. She'd waited fifteen tea years for this moment, and it tasted sweet. Nicodem Saborin understood that. She hadn't known it for quite some time, but he'd been a second-class petty officer aboard one of her dreadnoughts at Hancock Station. Like her, he was looking forward to getting some of his own back this afternoon. How are your targeting solutions, Adriana? She asked calmly. They look good, ma'am, considering their EW. In that case, Commander, Genevieve Chin said formally, you may open fire. We walked right into it, Theodosia Cusack said bitterly. I walked right into it. It's not like we had much choice, ma'am, Captain Smithson said. The two of them stood staring into the plot, watching the overwhelmingly superior force which had suddenly cut in astern of them as it rolled pods. Waiting. The orders were already given. Their own missiles were already launching. There was quite literally nothing at all Cusack could do at this point, except watch other people execute her orders. She turned her head, looking at her chief of staff, and Smithson shrugged. We couldn't let them punch out Sphinx, and we couldn't let them get away after the price Dorville paid to stop them. That meant coming in after them, he said. You did. I should have seen this coming, she shot back, but quietly, quietly, keeping her voice down. After what Harrington did to them at Lovett, it was the logical response. Oh? Smithson cocked his head, smiling ironically, despite the hurricane of missiles rushing towards them. And I suppose you were supposed to somehow use clairvoyance to realize they had another hundred wallers in reserve? That they were going to throw three hundred and fifty super dreadnoughts at us? Just you, not Admiral Caporelli, not Ornai, not Admiral Dorville or Admiral Harrington. Just you. Because obviously this is all your fault. I didn't mean... She began angrily, then stopped. She looked at him for a moment, then reached out and squeezed his shoulder. I guess I did deserve that. Thanks. Don't mention it. Smithson smiled sadly. It's one of a chief of staff's jobs. All right, Alicon, Alistair McKeon told his ops officer harshly. We're the only squadron with Apollo, 
Admiral Cusack has authorized us for independent targeting to make best use of the system. That means it's going to be up to you. Understood, sir. Commander Slovaki nodded hard. I want to concentrate on this new bunch, McKeon continued. They haven't been hit yet. Their fire control and their tactical departments are going to be in better shape. We'll take them one ship at a time. Understood, Admiral, Slovaki said again, and McKeon pointed at the icons of Genevieve Chin's task force. Good. Now go kill as many of those bastards as you can. Aye, aye, sir. I wish Her Grace were here, sir, Commander Rosley Orndorff said quietly beside McKeon as Slovaki and his assistants began updating their targeting solutions. I don't, McKeon told Orndorff, his voice equally quiet, and shook his head. This is one not even she could get us out of, Rosley. I guess not, Orndorff agreed. And you're right. I shouldn't wish she was stuck in here with the rest of us, but no offense, sir, I miss her. So do I. McKeon reached out and stroked the head of the tree cat perched on Orndorff's shoulder. Banshee pressed back against his hand, but only for a moment. Then the cat pressed his cheek against the side of his person's head and crooned softly to her. Orndorff reached up, caressing him tenderly, without ever taking her eyes from the plot. Unlike Oliver D'Amato's battlecruisers, Third Fleet couldn't dodge the pulsar dart. Admiral Cusack's command was too deep, pinned inside the RZ. Cusack had intended to catch Second Fleet between her command and the Sphinx planetary defenses. Now she was caught between the oncoming hammer of Genevieve Chin's MDMs and the battered anvil of Lester Tourville's surviving SDPs. At least Third Fleet's base velocity was almost 14,000 kilometers per second higher than Fifth Fleet's and almost directly away from it. Given that geometry, Chin's powered missile envelope was only 51 million kilometers, but the range was only 41,700,000 kilometers, and that meant Chin could keep Cusack's ships under fire for 11 minutes before Third Fleet could run out of range. 11 minutes. It didn't sound like such a long time, but it was longer than Home Fleet had survived against Lester Tourville, and Home Fleet hadn't been running directly into the fire of one foe while the fire of a second came ripping into it from behind. Open fire, Lester Tourville snapped. Aye, sir, Fraser Adamson acknowledged, and Tourville watched the icons of his missiles reaching out towards the Mantis. He'd almost left it too late, he thought. Chin's astrogation had been off by a good ten million kilometers, although it was hard to falter for that. She'd had only a handful of minutes to adjust her position after MacArthur's arrival, thanks in no small part to how long Tourville had waited, and making that kind of delicate, short-ranged microtranslation was always infernally difficult. Given that any error placing her alpha translation on the wrong side of the zone boundary would have resulted in the destruction of every ship under her command, it was inevitable, and proper, that she should err on the side of caution. Besides, it had never been part of the ops plan for her ships to move inside the resonance zone or hyperlimit until she and Torville were certain they'd dealt with the defenses. All the defenses. Still, eleven minutes of concentrated fire from ninety-six SDPs should smash the hell out of the Mantis' combat capability, even if it failed to destroy them outright. And in the meantime, he could do a little something to help Chin along. The range for his missiles was only 32,955,000 kilometers, and unlike the range from Chin's ships, it was dropping by over a million kilometers per minute— not to mention the fact that, unlike Chin, his tactical officers had been tracking the Mantis steadily, updating their firing solutions for the last thirty or forty minutes. He checked the time display. Flight time for his missiles was just under six minutes, two minutes less than for Chin. Although she'd fired first, his missiles would reach their targets before hers. We are truly and royally screwed, Skipper. Chief Warrant Officer Sir Horace Harkness said quietly from H.M. Lack to Coit's engineering station. Scotty Tremaine glanced at him, then looked back at the plot, and wished there were some way he could disagree. "'You have a message from Admiral Truman, Captain,' de Coit's comm section A.I. said. "'Personal to you.' "'Except Central,' Tremaine said. A moment later, Alice Truman appeared on his comm display. "'Admiral?' 
he said, watching the missile icons spreading like the tracks of pre-space wet Navy torpedoes. It looks like we're going to get hammered, Scotty, Truman told him bluntly. I want you to detach your katanas, leave them behind to help thicken Admiral Kuzak's defenses, then take all the rest of your birds and head for the in-system force now. Tremaine looked at her for just a moment. He knew what she had in mind. His ferrets and shrikes, especially the former, were preparing to help bolster Third Fleet's missile defenses, yet compared to his katanas, their contribution would have been relatively minor. But by sending them against the survivors of the First Havenite attack force, she might compel it to divert its fire. It no longer had a screen, its attached lacks had taken severe losses, and it couldn't simply run away from him into hyper. It would have no choice but to stand and fight, and if it let him get into attack range without severe losses of his own... Understood, Dame Alice, he said. We'll do our best to keep their heads down. Good, Scotty. Good hunting. Truman clear. Crap, Molly Delaney muttered, and Lester Tourville chuckled harshly. They're a little quicker off the mark with it than I expected, he said, watching the Mantilax arc away from Third Fleet. Missile flight times were long enough, and the Manti reaction fast enough, that their course change was already evident, even though Second Fleet's first salvo had yet to reach attack range. Still, he continued, it was the logical move once we lost the screen. Fraser. Yes, Admiral, Commander Adamson replied. Send Smirnov out to meet these people. Captain Smirnov is dead, sir, Adamson said. Commander West is Kolak now. Tourville winced internally. He hadn't known Alice Smirnov well, only met the woman twice, actually, and then only in passing. But somehow her death, unnoticed in the general carnage, suddenly seemed to symbolize the hundreds of thousands of his personnel who had perished in the last three hours. Very well, he said, an edge of harshness burring his otherwise level response. Send West out to meet them. Aye, sir. Is that going to be enough, boss? Delaney asked quietly, and Tourville shook his head. No, they aren't sending in as many, but these people are fresh, and Smirnov, West, and his people burned too many missiles stopping the last attack. We're going to have to take them with MDMs. Do you want to shift targeting? Not yet. Tourville shook his head. That's what they want us to do, and I'm not taking any pressure off Guzak until we have to, but it's going to limit the number of salvos we can give her. He punched in a command, calling up the fleet status display. He studied it for several seconds, then looked at Adamson. Fraser, tell Admiral Moore and Admiral Jordan to abort their engagement of Third Fleet. I want their squadrons to reserve their total remaining pods for use against the Mantilax. Yes, sir. Tourville nodded and sat back in his command chair. Moore and Jordan had taken the lightest losses of any of his battle squadrons. Between them, they still had 14 SDPs, and much as he hated taking them out of the firing queue at this particular moment, he had a feeling he was going to need their missiles badly in another half hour or so. Here it comes, Wraith Goodrick murmured, and Alice Truman nodded. Countermissiles tore into the oncoming MDMs, and at least this time they hadn't been able to deploy whatever had let them throw such monster salvos at home fleet. These were merely normal double-pattern broadsides from over a hundred SDPs. Nothing to worry about, she told herself. Only 12,000 missiles or so, no more than a couple of hundred per ship, just a walk in the park. Except, of course, that they weren't spreading them over all of Third Fleet's ships. Scotty Tremaine's detached katanas were tucked in close, hovering above Third Fleet, rather than going out to meet the incoming missiles as normal doctrine would have dictated. Normal doctrine, after all, hadn't anticipated a situation in which a fleet would screw up so badly it found itself squarely between two widely separated enemy fleets, each numerically superior to itself and in range of both. The Lax couldn't place themselves between one threat and the rest of Third Fleet without leaving it uncovered against the other, and so they held their position, spitting vipers against the wall of destruction crashing towards Theodosia Cusack's command. Thousands of Mark 31 countermissiles went out with the vipers, and Truman felt Chimera quiver as her own countermissile tubes went to rapid fire, 
but nothing was going to stop all of that torrent of MDMs. Decoys and dazzlers strove to bewilder or blind the incoming missiles, but still they came on. They're concentrating on the 19th, Commander Janine Stanfield, Truman's operations officer, reported. They'll have a lot of strays at this range, Goodrick said, and Truman nodded agreement with her chief of staff. Not that having a few hundred MDMs wander off was going to do Vice Admiral Irene Montague and her command a lot of good. Not with 2,000 missiles targeted on each of her six super dreadnoughts. Even with its attention divided between the salvos rumbling down on it from opposite directions, Third Fleet's missile defense was far more effective than Home Fleet's had been. Partly, that was simply the difference in the numbers of missiles in each incoming salvo. Another part was the difference in closing velocities, which improved engagement times. And especially against Second Fleet, it was because so many of the ships launching those missiles had themselves been damaged, in many cases severely, before they launched. They'd lost control links, sensors, computational ability, and critical personnel out of their tactical departments, with inevitable consequences for the accuracy of their fire. But 12,000 missiles were still 12,000 missiles. 20% were electronic warfare platforms, Another 12% simply lost lock, as Goodrick had predicted. The massed counter-missiles of 3rd Fleet and Alice Truman's katanas killed almost 4,000, and the last-ditch fire of the 91st Battle Squadron and its escorts killed another 1,500. It was a remarkable performance, but it still meant 2,700 got through. The heavy laser heads detonated in rapid succession bubbles of brimstone birthing X-ray lasers that ripped and tore at their targets. The Super Dreadnought's wedges intercepted many of those lasers, their sidewalls bent and attenuated others, but nothing built by man could have stopped all of them. The massively armored Super Dreadnoughts shuddered and bucked as transfer energy blasted into them. Armor and hull plating splintered, atmosphere gushed from gaping holes, and weapons, communications arrays, and sensors were torn apart. HMS Triumph staggered as her forward impeller ring went into emergency shutdown. Her wedge faltered, and then she staggered again like a seasick galleon as a half-dozen more laser heads detonated almost directly ahead of her. Her bow wall stopped most of the lasers, but at least twelve stabbed straight through it, hammering the massively armored face of her forward hammerhead. Her forward point defense clusters went down, her chase energy weapons were pounded into broken rubble, and one of her forward impeller rooms blew up as the massive capacitor shorted across. For a moment, it looked like that was the extent of her damage. But deep inside her, invisible from the outside, the energy spike of that demolished impeller room drove deeper and deeper. Circuit breakers failed to stop it, control runs exploded, power conduits blew up in deadly sequence, and then, suddenly, the ship herself simply exploded. There were no small craft, no life pods, no survivors. One moment she was there, the next she was an expanding sphere of fire. Her squadron mates were more fortunate. None of them escaped unscathed, however, and HMS Warrior lost over half her port sidewall. HMS Ellen Dorville lost half the beta nodes in her after impeller ring, and HMS Bologna's port broadside point defense clusters and gravitic arrays were beaten into scrap. HMS Regulus escaped with only minor damage, but HMS Marduk lost a quarter of her broadside energy weapons. All of them survived, and their ability to deploy pods remained intact, but the follow-up salvo from 2nd Fleet was close on the heels of the 1st, and the 1st salvo from 5th Fleet came crunching in almost simultaneously. 3rd Fleet's defenses were simply spread too thin. 12,000 missiles came pounding down on it from Lester Tourville. Another 11,500 came crashing in from Genevieve Chin, and there simply weren't enough counter-missiles and katanas to stop them all. Second Fleet's second salvo concentrated on the same targets as the first, and those targets were already damaged, their defenses thinned. Warrior blew up, and Marduk took a catastrophic series of hits which virtually destroyed her starboard sidewall. Bologna staggered, impeller wedge dying, life pods beginning to fan out from her hulk, Ellen Dorville took at least 20 more hits, but continued to run, and Regulus moved up on Marduk's naked starboard flank, trying to shield her consort from the third salvo already streaking towards them. 
The gallant effort to protect her sister cost Regulus her life 23 seconds later, as over 800 laser heads took the only target they could see. We just lost by art, sir, Molly Delaney said, and Lester Torville nodded, hoping his expression disguised his pain. Second Fleet had sprung the trap exactly as planned, except for the fact that it had been supposed to close on Eighth Fleet as well, and he tried to feel grateful, but it was hard. There came a time when phrases like favorable rates of exchange, however accurate, were cold comfort in the face of so much death, so much destruction. And however hopeless Third Fleet's position, there was nothing at all wrong with the Mantis determination and sheer guts. They recognized Second Fleet as the greater prize and the greater threat, despite its previous damages. It was still the larger of Tourville's two task forces and the one in the best position to strike Sphinx, and they were pouring fire into his bleeding ranks. He'd already lost three more super dreadnoughts, counting Bayard, and it was only a matter of time until he lost more. Theodosia Cusack stared into the master plot as the Havenites' task forces sledgehammered her fleet again and again. Battle Squadron 91 was effectively destroyed in the first 60 seconds, and Second Fleet's follow-up salvos switched to BS-11. Her own missiles were striking back, and the system reconnaissance platform showed fireballs glaring amid Second Fleet's formation, but she knew the exchange rate was completely in the Republic's favor, and there was nothing she could do about it. "'Incoming! Many incoming!' Commander Luttrell barked suddenly, and HMS King Roger III heaved like a maddened animal as a storm of laser heads blasted into her. Jesus Christ, what the fuck is that? Commander Spiropolo demanded harshly as RHNS Victoria blew up. It's got to be that new targeting system they use at Lovett, Captain Sabarin replied harshly. Somebody over there has it after all, but it can't be coming from more than a few of their ships, thank God. Annie is too goddamned many, Nicodem, Genevieve Chin grated, and I don't like the targeting of whoever the hell it is, she added, and Sabaran nodded. Most of Fifth Fleet's wallers were more than holding their own against the Mantis fire. That was largely because at least three quarters of that fire was still raining down on Lester Tourville's super dreadnoughts. Probably, Chin thought, because Tourville was still headed in system. It looked as if Cusack had decided stopping him was more important than shooting at ships which could vanish into hyper any time they chose, once their hyper generators had finished cycling from their last translation. But if most of Third Fleet's missiles were headed in system, three or four of Cusack's ships were firing on Chin's wall with deadly accuracy. Their missiles threaded through the cauldron of the countermissiles, EW, and blazing laser clusters like awls. It was as if they could literally see where they were going, think for themselves, and they were coming in behind a deadly shield of closely coordinated electronic warfare platforms. Her missile defenses were hopelessly outclassed against them, and whoever was coordinating their targeting had chosen one of her battle squadrons and begun working her way through it. Each individual salvo wasn't particularly large. Indeed, by the standards of pod-based combat, they were ludicrously tiny. But all of them seemed to be getting through. None of them wandered off. None wasted themselves by detonating high or low where their target's impeller wedge might stop them. And as they sent their avalanches of lasers through that target's wavering sidewall in deadly succession, they killed. God damn it, she heard Sabarin say with soft, passionate venom as RHNS Lancelot slewed suddenly out of formation, impeller wedge dying. Is there any way to identify where this is coming from, Andriana? she demanded. No way, ma'am, Spiropolo said through gritted teeth. They could be coming from anywhere in the middle of that mess. She jabbed an angry index finger at the crimson icons of Manticore and capital ships. There's no way to localize who's actually firing the damn things. Just thank God there aren't more of them, ma'am, Sabarin said tightly. It looks like Admiral Deisman was right. If we'd waited until they had that thing in general deployment, we'd have been toast. Dame Alice Truman watched her plot sickly as missile after missile slammed its lasers into Third Fleet super dreadnoughts. Her carriers were taking hits too, but nothing compared to the agony of Cusack's wall. It looked to Truman as if most of the hits on her carriers were overs or unders, 
MDMs which had lost the wallers on which they'd been targeted and found one of her carriers instead. The bastards figure they can always get around to killing carriers later, she thought coldly, and felt an incredible stab of guilt as she realized how grateful she was. Yet she couldn't help it, for the people aboard her ships were her people, the people for whom she was responsible, and she wanted them to live. They're targeting Admiral McKeon, ma'am, Commander Stanfield said suddenly, and Truman's eyes snapped to the icon of HMS Intransigent. We nailed the son of a bitch, sir, Commander Slovaki said, and despite his own fear, his voice was jubilant. Well done, Alicon, Alistair McKeon replied, teeth bared in a wolfish grin of his own. His battle squadron had landed four salvos of Apollo-guided MDMs, and they'd killed a Havenite super dreadnought with each of them. In fact, they'd done better than that. The kill Slovaki had just announced was their fifth. Now, go find another one, he said, and Slovaki nodded. Yes, sir. The ops officer bent back over his displays, eyes bright, and McKeon felt a stab of envy. Slovaki was actually doing something, accomplishing something. In fact, the four Apollo-capable ships of McKeon's squadron were killing Havenite Wallers in rapid succession, and Slovaki was too caught up in his task to realize that while he'd been killing five super dreadnoughts, the Havenites had already killed nine of Admiral Cusack's, and it wouldn't be long before... Incoming! someone shouted, and Intransigent lurched indescribably as the first deadly hits slammed home. Alice Truman watched in horror as the Havenite flail came down on Alistair McKeon's squadron. Was it deliberate? she wondered. Were they able somehow to figure out where Apollo was coming from? Or was it just the luck of the draw? Not that it mattered. Intransigent heaved madly as the lasers blasted into her. Astern of her, HMS Elizabeth I staggered as at least eighty direct hits slammed into her. She seemed to hesitate for a moment, and then, like her older sister Triumph, she vanished in a brief, terrible new star. Second Yeltsin and Revenge shuddered in agony of their own as the focused hurricane of destruction swept over McKeon's squadron. HMS Incomparable, Imperator's division mate in place of the dead intolerant, lurched out of formation, impellers dead, wreckage trailing, life pods launching. Then the last few hundred missiles of the concentrated salvo came punching in, and second Yeltsin blew up while Revenge's wedge went down. She started to fall behind, but before she could, at least twelve lasers slammed directly into the unarmored top of her hull, which was supposed to be protected by her wedge. With no armor to stop them, the powerful lasers ripped deep into the super dreadnought's core, probing until they found her heart. Thirty-one seconds after second Yeltsin, HMS Revenge joined her in fiery death. Intransigent survived. The only survivor of her entire squadron, Alistair McKeon's flagship staggered onward, little more than a wreck, but still alive. Yet another hit slammed into HMS King Roger III. It stabbed deep, ripping through the wounds two of its predecessors had already torn. It breached the flagship's core hull, tearing its way into central engineering, and the super dreadnought's inertial compensator suddenly failed. The emergency circuit shut down her impellers almost instantly, but almost instantly wasn't good enough for a ship under 612 gravities of acceleration. The ship sustained only moderate structural damage. None of her crew survived. Chapter 68 Ma'am, you're in command now, Captain Goodrick said. What? Alice Truman looked at him in disbelief. The flagship's gone, Goodrick said harshly. That puts you in command. What about Vice Admiral Emiliani? Truman demanded. Valkyrie took a hit on Flagbridge. Emiliani is dead. You're next most senior. Truman stood for perhaps two heartbeats. Then she shook herself. Very well, she said. Franklin, she looked at Lieutenant Bradshaw. General signal all units. Inform them that command has passed to Chimera. Yes, ma'am. Bradshaw seemed almost calm, anesthetized perhaps by the intensity of the carnage. Any orders? he asked. No, Truman shook her head. Not at this time. Yes, ma'am. Bradshaw bent over his communications console, and Truman looked at the time date display. 
Nine minutes. Only nine minutes since the peeps had opened fire and almost half of Third Fleet had already been destroyed. She thought about Bradshaw's question. Orders. There were no orders for a situation like this one. Admiral Cusack had already given the only ones anyone could. Now it was a matter of duty, not orders. A matter of Third Fleet's duty to fight to the death and defense of its home, and it would. It's not my fleet, she thought, watching Third Fleet's bleeding ships, punching out missiles even as they died, and her eye unerringly found the icon of intransigent, tagged with the jagged crimson code of critical damage. Not my fleet, but by God, if I've got to die, I couldn't have found a better one to die with. That's two more of them, ma'am, Commander Spiropolo said, and Chin nodded. Third Fleet was finished, she thought, her grim satisfaction tinged with more than a little horror as she contemplated the losses both navies had suffered this blood-soaked day. Thirty of the Manti SDs had been destroyed or hulked, over half the survivors had critical damage, and whoever had been equipped with that new weapon system was among the dead or disabled. Fifth Fleet would lose the range on Cusack's battered remnants in another twenty-five seconds. The last salvo she could bring down on the fleeing mantis would land in another fifteen, but she found it hard to regret it. There'd already been enough blood, enough destruction, to satisfy anyone, she thought grimly. She looked at the tally on one of her secondary displays. Second Fleet was down to only seventy-five ships— only fifty-six effectives, really, out of the two hundred and forty wallers and ninety escorts Lester Tourville had taken into the resonance zone. She herself had lost only eleven super dreadnoughts, and most of the crew had gotten out of three of them. But the back of the Star Kingdom's home system's defenses had been broken. She still had plenty of missile pods left aboard her remaining eighty-five wallers, and Second Fleet, despite its own brutal losses, had enough combat power to finish off Third Fleet's remnants— and then, hyperfootprint, Sparopolo said suddenly. Multiple hyperfootprints at 72.903 million kilometers. Honor Alexander Harrington's eyes were brown ice as Teofil Kagari, in a virtuoso display of astrogation, dropped the massed super dreadnoughts of Eighth Fleet exactly where she told him to in a single jump right out of the center of the resonance zone. She didn't look at the pathetic remnants of Third Fleet's icons, didn't even glance at the other icons representing Lester Tourville's task force. She had attention only for Genevieve Chin's super dreadnoughts, and her voice was a frozen soprano sword. "'Engage the enemy, Andrea,' Lady Dame Honor Alexander Harrington said. Genevieve Chin's heart began beating once again, and her instant instinct to break off eased a bit as the range registered. At almost 73 million kilometers, the new arrivals were well outside even MDM's powered range. Besides, there were only 38 of them, less than half her own strength, even if all of them were wallers and not carriers. Turn us around, Adriana, she said. It looks like we've got some fresh customers. Eighth Fleet released the 5,000 Apollo pods which had been tractored to its SDP's hulls, then spent another three minutes rolling additional pods. In all, it deployed a total of 7,776, almost exactly half its total ammunition allotment, given the Andromani ship's lighter magazine capacity. Then it fired. What the... Andriana Spiropolo looked at the tracking report in disbelief. That didn't make any sense at all. Ma'am, she said, turning to Admiral Chin. The Mantis have just fired. They've what? Genevieve Chin looked up from a discussion with Nicodem Sabourin. They've filed, ma'am, Sparopolo repeated. It doesn't make any sense. They're still at least seven million kilometers out of range. That doesn't make any sense, Chin agreed, walking across to stare at the preposterous missile icons in the master display. Maybe they're trying to panic us, Admiral, Sabourin suggested. She looked at him, eyebrows rising in disbelief, and he shrugged. I know it sounds silly, ma'am, but I don't have any better suggestion. I mean, we've just hammered two entire Manti fleets into so much scrap metal, and these people are outnumbered by at least three to one. Maybe they figure this is the only way to distract us from finishing off the system. I suppose it's possible, Chin said slowly, watching the icons come. 
but it doesn't seem like a manty sort of thing to do. On the other hand, I don't see what else they could expect to accomplish. Honor watched her own plot, sitting very still in her command chair. Nimit sat upright in her lap, leaning back against her chest. She wrapped her right arm about him, holding him, and felt his cold, focused determination, an echo of her own, as his grass-green eyes followed the same icons, watched the missile speeding outward. Apollo had done several things. It provided something verging on genuine real-time control of her missiles, even at this range. By using the Apollo birds to control the other missiles from their pods, it effectively multiplied the number of MDMs each ship could control by a factor of eight, and it provided her tactical officers with unprecedented control over their missiles' flight profiles. Eighth Fleet was the only formation in space fully equipped with the new system, and Honor and her captains had spent long, thoughtful hours exploring Apollo's ramifications. Now she was prepared to use them. They can't be serious, Sparopolo said in exasperation, as every single impeller signature disappeared simultaneously from her plot six minutes after launch. She glared at the plot with an affronted sense of professionalism, then punched a radical course change into the fleet tactical net. Fifth Fleet obeyed the order immediately, rolling through a skew turn which would take it over 30,000 kilometers from its predicted position by the time the Manticoran missiles reached it. What is it, Adriana? Chin asked, looking up from her comm display and a hasty conference with her squadron commanders. Ma'am, you aren't going to believe this, Sparopolo said, but they're sending their birds in ballistic. What? Chin looked back down at her comm. Excuse me for a moment, please, she told the flag officers on its compartmentalized display. I think I need to see this for myself. She climbed out of her command chair and walked over to stand beside Sparopolo, her eyes seeking out the missile icons. She found them, but they were rapidly strobing flickers, not the steady light of the hard position fixes active impeller drives would have provided. They boosted for six minutes at 46,000 gravities, ma'am, Sparopolo said. Then they just shut the hell down. I altered course as soon as their impellers went down, which they have to know is going to play hell with whatever accuracy they might have achieved, and that's not the only screwy thing they're up to. Look at this. The ops officer punched a macro, and Chin frowned as an additional cluster of impeller signatures blinked into existence. For some reason known only to itself and God, the Manti task force ahead of them had just fired another pattern of pods, one pattern of pods with less than 60 missiles in it. And it hadn't fired them at Chin ships. The missile vectors made it obvious the Mantis had fired at Second Fleet, almost 150 million kilometers away from them, inside the resonance zone. Well, at least now we know how they think they can get them to make attack runs once they get them into range, Sabarin said. I suppose, Chin said, but her expression was troubled. Actually, it was their only real option, assuming they were going to fire from such a long range in the first place. At 46,000 G, their missiles had accelerated to almost 162,400 kilometers per second and traveled 29,230,000 kilometers before they'd shut down. That left the MDM's third stage available for a powered attack run when they reached their targets. In 60 seconds of maximum acceleration, the remaining drive would add another 54,000 kilometers per second to the missile's velocity. Or they could go for half that much power and add another 81,000 over the space of three minutes. More importantly, it would permit the oncoming missiles to maneuver to engage their targets. She understood that. What she didn't understand was how they could believe it was anything but an utter waste of their missiles. They'd had to establish the targeting parameters when they launched. That meant they were going to be looking for targets where Fifth Fleet would have been on its original heading and acceleration, and Sparopolo's course change during the long ballistic portion in their flight profile center would hopelessly compromise the weapon's already poor accuracy at long range. She glanced at the time display while she did some mental math. Assume they waited until the birds were, say, 80 seconds out— and then kicked in the last stage at 46,000 gravities. That would give them 80 seconds of maneuver time for however much good that would do them at this extended range. If they let the missiles come all the way in ballistic, flight time from shutdown would be about four and a half minutes. But they won't. So say they 
do bring the drives back up 80 seconds out, that would put them about three minutes before attack range on a straight ballistic profile. They'd still have about 13 million kilometers to go. So if they kick the remaining drive at 46,000 Gs at that point, they'll shave maybe seven seconds off their arrival time, and they'll be coming in somewhere around 200,000 kps, but their accuracy will still suck. And what the hell do they think they're doing with this other little cluster? Andriano was right. It didn't make sense, unless Nicodem was right and they were trying to panic her. But if Third Fleet was what they'd just finished destroying, then these people had to be Eighth Fleet, which meant Honor Harrington. And Harrington didn't do things that didn't make sense. So what? Her eyes opened wide in horror. General signal, all units, she shouted, spinning towards her comm section. Hyper out immediately. Repeat, hyper out. But it had taken Genevieve Chin two minutes too long to realize what was happening. Drive's going active now, Your Grace, Andrea Jarowalski said, and the missiles 13 million kilometers short of Fifth Fleet suddenly brought their final drive stages online. Their icons burned abruptly bright and strong once again as they lit off their impellers and hurled themselves at their targets under full shipboard control. They blazed in across the remaining distance, tracking with clean, lethal precision, and their ballistic flight had dropped them off of the Republic's sensors. Chin ships knew approximately where they were, but not exactly, and their supporting EW platforms and penetration aids came up with their impellers. They hurtled in across the Republican SDP's defensive envelope at over half the speed of light, and the sudden eruption of jamming, of dragon's teeth spilling false targets, hammered those defenses mercilessly. The fact that the missile defense crews aboard those ships had known without question that the attacking missiles would be clumsy, half-blind, only made a disastrous situation even worse. Eighth Fleet had deployed almost 8,000 pods. Those pods launched 69,984 missiles. Of that total, 7,776 were Apollo birds. Another 8,000 were electronic warfare platforms— which meant that 54,208 carried laser heads, laser heads which homed on Genevieve Chin's ships with murderously accurate targeting. Fifth Fleet's missile defenses did their best. Their best was not good enough. Honor sat hugging Nimitz and watched the tactical download from one of the Apollos. Despite the enormous range between Imperator and that missile, the transmission time was under four and a half seconds, and the clarity of the Apollo's enhanced sensors and data processing capability made the tactical feed crystal clear. It felt unnatural, as if she were right there on top of the Havenite fleet, not over 70 million kilometers away. She watched the enemy counter-missiles fire late and wide. She watched the attack missiles accompanying EW platforms beating down the defenses. She watched the missiles themselves sliding through those defenses like assassin's daggers, Fifth Fleet stopped almost 30% of them, which was a truly miraculous total under the circumstances, but over 37,000 got through. It was, she decided coldly, a case of overkill. Lester Tourville stared at his plot in horror as the impeller signatures of 68 Republican ships of the wall abruptly vanished. Seventeen continued to burn on the display for another handful of seconds— then they too vanished in what he devoutly hoped was a frantic hypertranslation. There was total silence on Guerrier's flag bridge. He never knew exactly how long he simply sat there, his mind a great singing emptiness around a core of ice. It couldn't have been the eternity that it seemed to be, but eventually he forced his shoulders to straighten. Well he said in a voice he couldn't quite recognize. It would appear our time estimate on the deployment of their new system was slightly in error. He turned his command chair to face Fraser Adamson. Cease fire, Commander. Adamson blinked twice, then shook himself. Yes, sir, he said hoarsely, and Second Fleet ceased firing at Third Fleet's tattered remnants as Adamson transmitted the order. Dear Lord, Dame Alice Truman murmured feelingly. Talk about last-second reprieves. Did what I think happened really just happen, ma'am? 
Wraith Goodrick's voice sounded shaky, and Truman didn't blame him a bit. Only seven of Theodosia Cusack's super dreadnoughts were still in action, and all of them were brutally damaged. Another three had technically survived, but Truman doubted any of the ten would be worth repairing. All four of Cusack's Sealax had been killed, and of Truman's own eight, three had been destroyed, one was a drifting cripple without impellers, and the other four, including Chimera, were severely damaged. For all intents and purposes, Third Fleet had been as totally destroyed as Home Fleet. But the merciless hail of missiles had at least stopped pounding its remnants. And, Truman thought, with grim survivor's humor, I don't blame whoever gave that order a bit, either. Missile trace, Fraser Adamson barked suddenly, and Lester Tourville's belly muscles clenched. What was left of Third Fleet had stopped firing when he did. Were they insane enough to resume the action? If they did, he'd have no choice but to... Sir, they're coming in from outside the zone, Adamson said. What? Molly Delaney demanded incredulously. That's ridiculous. They're 150 million clicks away. Well, they're coming in on us now anyway, Torval said sharply as Guerrier's missile defense batteries began to fire once more. They didn't do much good. He watched sickly as the missiles which had suddenly brought up their impellers, appearing literally out of nowhere, hurtled down on his battered and broken command. They drove straight in, swerving, dancing, and his sick feeling of helplessness frayed around the edges as he realized there were less than sixty of them. Whatever they were, they weren't a serious attack on his surviving ships, so what— His jaw tightened as the missiles made their final approach. But they didn't detonate— Instead, they hurtled directly through his formation, straight through the teeth of his blazing laser clusters. His point defense crews managed to nail two-thirds of them, despite the totality of the tactical surprise they'd achieved. The other twenty pirouetted, swerved to one side, then detonated in a perfectly synchronized, deadly accurate attack on absolutely nothing. Lester Tourville exhaled the breath he hadn't realized he was holding. He sensed the confusion of his flagbridge crew, and this time he had no answer at all for them. Then, Sir, Lieutenant Eisenberg said in a very small voice, I have a calm request for you. He turned his command chair to look at her, and she swallowed. It's from Duchess Harrington, sir. The silence on Guerrier's flagbridge was complete. Then Tourville cleared his throat. Throw it on my display, Ace, he said. Yes, sir. Coming up now. An instant later, a face appeared on Tourville's display. He'd seen that face before, when its owner surrendered to him. And again, when she had been clubbed down by the pulse rifle butts of state security goons. Now she looked at him, her eyes like two more missile tubes. We meet again, Admiral Tourville, she said, and her soprano voice was cold. Admiral Harrington, he replied. This is a surprise. I thought you were about eight light minutes away. He gazed at her hard eyes, eyes like leveled missile tubes, and waited. The transmission lag for light speed communications should have been eight minutes, sixteen minutes for a two way exchange at that range but she spoke again barely fifteen seconds after he finished. I am. I'm speaking to you over what we call a Hermes buoy. It's an FTL relay with standard sublight communication capability. The expression she produced was technically a smile, but it was one that belonged on something out of deep, dark, oceanic depths. We have several of them deployed around the system. I simply plugged into the nearest one so that I could speak directly to you she continued in that same icy cold voice. I'm sure you observed my bird's terminal performance. I'm also sure you understand I have the capability to blow every single one of your remaining ships out of space from my present position. I hope you aren't going to make it necessary for me to do so. Torville looked at her and knew that last statement wasn't really accurate, knew a part of her, the part behind those frozen eyes, that icy voice, hoped he would make it necessary. But too many people had already died for him to kill still more out of sheer stupidity. No, Your Grace, he said quietly. I won't make it necessary. 
Another endless fifteen seconds dragged past. Then... I'm glad to hear that, she told him. However, my acceptance of your surrender is contingent upon the surrender of your ships and their databases in their present condition. Is that clearly understood, Admiral Tourville? He hovered on the brink of refusing, of declaring that he would scrub his databases, as was customary, before surrendering a ship. But then he looked into those icy eyes again, and the temptation vanished. It's understood, your grace he made himself say, and sat there tasting the bitter poison of defeat. Defeat made all the more poisonous by how close Beatrice had come to success and how completely it had failed in the end. Good, she said at last, after yet another fifteen-second delay. Decelerate to zero relative to the system primary. You'll be boarded by prize officers once you do. In the meantime... She smiled again, that same terrifying smile. My ships will remain here where we can keep an eye on things. Your Grace, Andrea Jirowalski said as Honor turned away from her conversation with Lester Tourville. Yes, Andrea? Honor felt drained and empty. She supposed she should feel triumph. After all, she'd just destroyed almost seventy super dreadnoughts and captured another seventy-five. That had to be an interstellar record, and for a bonus, her people had saved the Star Kingdom's capital system from invasion. But after so much carnage, so much destruction, how was a woman supposed to feel triumphant? Your Grace, we're getting IDs off Admiral Cusack's surviving ships from the inner system recon platforms. Yes? Honor felt herself tightening inside. The pitiful handful of icons where Third Fleet had been mocked her. If she'd been able to get her ships into position even a few minutes earlier, perhaps... She forced that thought aside and looked Andrea in the eye. Your Grace, most of our ships are gone, Jirowalski said softly. But I've got transponder codes on both Chimera and Intransigent. Honor's heart spasmed, and the ice about her soul seemed to crack ever so slightly. Nimitz stirred in her lap, sitting up once again, leaning back against her and reaching up to touch the side of her face with a long-fingered true hand. "'I've been trying to contact them,' Harper Brantley put in, drawing Honor's attention to him, and her eyes burned as she tasted his emotions. Like Jarowalski, he wanted desperately to give her some sort of good news, to tell her someone she loved had survived, something to balance at least some of the pain and the blood.' I can't raise Chimera, Brantley continued. It looks like she's actually in better general shape than intransigent, but her gravcom seems to be down. I've got Captain Thomas on the FTL, though. Put it on my screen, Honor said quickly, and turned to her comm as it lit with the strained, exhausted face of Alistair McKeon's flag captain. Captain Thomas, Honor said with a huge smile. It's good to see you. Intransigent was barely 413 light seconds from Imperator, less than seven light minutes, and the one-way transmission lag was barely six and a half seconds. And to see you, Your Grace, Thomas replied 13 seconds later, and there was something just a bit odd about her voice. I've accepted the surrender of the remaining Havenite vessels, Honor continued. Since you're so much closer to them than I am, it would make more sense to let Admiral McKeon or Admiral Truman handle the final details. Could I speak to Admiral McKeon, please? She sat there, waiting, her mind running ahead to all the things she needed to discuss with Alistair. If he could take over the actual surrender formalities, get some pinnaces loaded with Marines aboard Tourville ships quickly, then... I... Thomas began, thirteen seconds later then paused and closed her eyes for just a moment, her weary face wrung with pain. Your Grace, she said softly. I'm sorry. We took a direct hit on Flagbridge. There were no survivors.